it's back. The biggest and best GT3 race in the world is the Total Energy's 24 Hours of Spa. It's round three of Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup. It is also the 74th running of this legendary event, and it is part of the Intercontinental GT Challenge, powered by Pirelli. 66 cars, 235 drivers from 35 nations, and another key point of the weekend is the parade into town on the Wednesday evening. It's the first time the parade has run since 2019, and it's an opportunity for the fans to see the cars and their heroes. There are some special liveries and special cars as well from 30 years of SRO's organization of GT racing. It's a magical atmosphere. It's the perfect start to the weekend. It's the calm, if you like, before the storm, and it's something all the drivers really enjoy. The people, the atmosphere is just unbelievable. Especially once in the past you have been a winner, the people are so grateful. This is true motorsport fans. We are really, really proud of uh, being here to come back with the fans. It's been three years, so it feels amazing. And hopefully Sunday we have a big smile. We know it's uh, the biggest GT3 race in the world and uh, once we have all these fans here and uh, you can clearly see that they understand what's racing and they, they know so well this race and they come to support us, it's definitely a special race for all of us. It's been absolutely incredible. I mean, it's an absolute dream for me to be here. It's the biggest GT3 race in the world, so honestly, just honored to be here. We definitely want to finish the race, but we're going to be pushing for a podium spot for sure. It's going to be amazing. I mean, 23 pro cars, eight manufacturers going at each other. Completely impossible to say who has the best chance to win that race. So I think it's going to be like every year, different cars in the last lap going for it, and uh, it's going to be amazing. Audi number 32 leads the combined championship, taking endurance and sprint into account. Kelvin van der Linde, eager for a win, though, here this year, having lost out right in the last few laps of last year's event. I'm feeling great. Um, nice to be back here one year later after yeah, an exciting weekend which ended up in P2. So yeah, coming with motivated um, vibes for the whole team. I know how that feeling of pain is when you lose a win. So I think we all, we all have that in the back of our minds and we don't want to repeat that. We want to have that celebratory feeling after the race. So uh, the goal is to be on the top step. There's, there's no, no question about it. The Endurance Championship is led by Iron Lynx and the Ferrari, which won last year's 24 hours of Spa. Davidi Rigon was involved in an accident at Eau Rouge last season, but he's back this year and eager for a good result. Of course, start very bad our 24 last year uh, with the big crash, but in the end uh, I was lucky that, uh, okay, I have a big injury, but uh, I was alive, me and Jack, so in the end uh, we are here to race again. This is the most important thing. We have a very, very strong team as last year, so we are pretty sure that in the race, uh, race pace we are quite fine. And uh, of course we are focused on the 24, but uh, on the championship, we really want to score points and uh, to be on top on the, on the end of this race. Rover Racing upholds BMW's honor this year. Augusto Farfus rather more concerned about the gravel traps new around the circuit and the impact they might have on the outcome of the race. It is a new challenge. Uh, the track has been also resurfaced in many parts, so uh, it's a bit of a kind of adapting. We had a lot of kilometers here already before. Our car is doing very well. I think the race, it is, will not be only down to the performance, but it will be those who can keep the car clean, away from the gravel beds. Let's just hope that the luck stays on our side, we keep it clean, and uh, I'm sure we have a cut win. GP Extreme won here in 2019. It's Porsche then in Gulf Colors. This year, it's Martini livery that adorns the car of that same driver lineup. Of Michael Christensen, Richard Leeds, and Kevin Est. Since we have this generation of 911, we, we won two times here. So for sure, we won and then Rover won. So for sure, the car is a tough one to beat, but there are 30 cars here which can win this race. First, you need to survive. Make sure you go through the night, through the morning, without any scratches, no penalty, no mistakes, and then uh, see if you're there for the last six hours. But it's definitely, for sure, a good package we have there. Apart from the overall contest, there is the Gold Cup to look at, and the Inception Racing McLaren is going to be a potential winner there. One of the drivers, the very quick Brit, Oli Milroy. We're competing in the Gold Cup class, which is super competitive. Um, we had a strong race last time out of Rickards. You know, it was a solid win. Car felt amazing. It feels really good here at the moment. You don't really know what everyone's got until the race starts. But yeah, we're really excited, and obviously 
number one rule here in like any 24 hours to stay out of trouble. So our number one goal is just to get to the end of the race without any scratches on the car, and then you know that you're going to be in a, a sensible position at least. From Iron Lynx comes Iron Dames, the all-girl crew, again Ferrari mounted. And one of the four drivers aboard is Sarah Bovi, the Belgian ace, upholding female honour and looking for a good result in class. I'm glad that we have the, the opportunity to, to defend, you know, women in the sport industry in general. Um, but to be honest, it's, it's not the reason why I'm doing motorsport. I'm doing motorsport because I love it, I love the competition, I love racing, driving fast. Being a racer here is, is always special to me. I have my family, my friends coming for support, and uh, I'm glad that I can finally have my first home race of the season. <laughs> Sky Tempesta Racing has had a frustrating time in 2022, but coming into the Total Energy's 24 hours of Spa, a change of team. The car now operated by the Haup Racing Team, and Chris Froggart is more confident. I think it's about being consistent, making no mistakes, um, no drive-throughs. I think we had like 11 last year, so, you know, no drive-through penalties, track limits, careful of those, and just uh, a clean race. I think that's the most important thing, staying on the lead lap until the last couple of hours and then giving it a real big push at the end. It's always challenging and so much luck involved as well. You know, you never know with the weather here. It's uh, up and down all the time, but uh, I'm excited. CrowdStrike boss George Kurtz is another driver delighted to be on this grid and fully up for the challenge of 24 hours of spot. Not just the race appeals to him, but the whole atmosphere. It's great to be back and the fans make all the difference. Uh, the parade was just tremendous. You just see the energy and the kids were so excited to see everybody and just people everywhere. So on to a great race. I think uh, we've got a good driver lineup. We've uh, driven with uh, some of the folks before and Valley and I have been together and, and Rema, we've done uh, Dubai together. So I think if we just focus on our team, our race, and just stay out of trouble, hopefully we'll be in good shape at the end of the day. Now let's remind ourselves how this race works. Yes, it's 24 hours, and it's part of a championship that enables you to score points in just the Endurance Cup or the overall, where you take Endurance and Sprint together. As far as this race is concerned, for Pro, you need three Pro drivers. The Gold Cup has a maximum of a Platinum, two Silvers and a Bronze. Pro-Am, maximum two Platinums and two Bronzes. And the Silver Cup is all Silvers. There are nine manufacturers from 66 cars. Aston Martin, Audi, Bentley, BMW, Ferrari, Lamborghini, McLaren, Mercedes, and Porsche all going head to head. In terms of pit stops, there's a short stop, a maximum of six seconds, and a long stop, which is a minimum of 41. There's also a technical pit stop for a minimum of four minutes line to line that has to be done between 11 and 22 hours of the race. There's a pit delta time of 71.64 seconds and a maximum stint time of 65 minutes. You get points in the top three after Super Pole and a point for pole in each class. There are points scored at the six and 12 hour marks for the top nine in each class, and then points for the top 10 after 24 hours. And the top five in the overall and silver categories in the Fanatec eSports race take those points for their teams. This race also part of the global Fanatec GT World Challenge, where right now Mercedes leads Audi with Ferrari, last year's winner at Spa in third. The circuit is an awesome lap, just over seven kilometers in length. It'll start on the endurance side of the circuit, going downhill towards Eau Rouge. It's a fabulous climb up through Radion, speed building. The drivers with their feet absolutely nailed to the boards as they try and squeeze every last thousandth of a second out of the car before braking for Les Combes, still climbing as they turn right, then left, and then right again. At that point, you go over the brow of the hill, drop down to Bruxelles. Speaker's corner takes you down towards Pouin. A long double apex, fast left-hander. Gravel trap on the outside line. Bit of runoff tarmac if you get it wrong. And then the flick right and left through Pouin into campus. And then the right-hander of the Cour Paul Frere. Speed building all the time at this point on the run up towards Blanchimont. Another fast left-hander where track limits can be an issue. And if you run wide and get it wrong, you could be in real strife if the car gets speared across the road. Then heavy braking down to first gear for the chicane, right, left, and then back up towards the timing line on the F1 pit. That will be the control line for the end of a lap and the end of the race. La Source hairpin, another tight first gear corner. From there, you plunge downhill with the endurance pits on your right-hand side, and that's a lap of spa completed.
So the grid is formed, the grid is packed, and 24 hours of GT3 action are ahead of us as the teams now get set to go into battle in the most unspa like weather. David Addison and John Watson trackside, just about everybody else at Spa, it seems. John is on the grid. Look at that, it's a mass of people. Well, I don't know how many people are on the grid, but it's got to be in the low thousands. It is absolutely heaving, and there the new grandstands as we look just to get a glimpse of the temperatures 26 celsius air 39 unseasonably almost warm temperatures here spa francochon now let's go to the grid because valentino rossi is about to make his spa 24 hours debut let's hear from the great man before we go racing the star of the show at the moment vale you've brought a whole sea of people with you as always your very first spa 24 how are you enjoying the weekend so far yeah, I, I, I cannot wait to, to start and uh, it's, it's a great experience already already be here on the, on the grid because I have a lot, a lot of people and look at the, the, the new grandstand that is full. Uh, so it's a great, great atmosphere for uh, this fantastic race. Uh, we are there and uh, nothing. Nico will start and I will do from the, second, uh, from the second hour. So we will see our pace and we try to recover some position. And how are you finding the circuit and driving into the night? The circuit is fantastic. It's the perfect place for make a 24-hour race because when you drive you enjoy a lot every corner are very is very interesting uh, so it's great and uh, I have uh, half an hour during the night it's difficult because uh, you don't see very well uh, all the points but uh, but uh, it's great it's, it's a great feeling a great experience and I wish you the best of luck have a great one grazie thank you ciao a tutti ciao, ciao. ciao. Well, Valentino Rossi has really been thrown in at the deep end this year because this is a tough championship to come and race in. This is a tough circuit to race at. It's a tough event to do well in. And this year, particularly, uh, we are fearful of lots of safety cars and interruptions because there are new gravel traps that are being put in around the circuit because motorbike racing has returned to Spa. Uh, those uh, gravel traps need to catch errant bikes, but they also catch errant cars. Let's go back to the grid. Raffaele Marchiello with Amanda Busink. For three years in a row, the 88 Mercedes will lead the world's biggest GT3 race to the green flag. And Raffaele, this one, albeit a surprise, how did you find out the news? On Twitter this morning, uh, I saw we were on pole. I mean, doesn't change so much. As I said, every year uh, we started on pole the last two years and nothing happened. So, I mean, it's good to start on pole, but I'm not happy, not sad. I mean, it's, I don't care to be on pole or to be last. It's just I want to be in the best position at the end of the race. Best of luck. Thank you. So the Mercedes drivers inherit pole position because the car that was quickest in Super Pole yesterday, the K-Pax Lamborghini, excluded from Super Pole for a technical infringement. Uh, and the decision of the stewards was to cancel all the lap times set during Super Pole. So it goes from being fastest down to 20th, then a grid drop of 10 places. So it will start 30th on the grid and a fine of 25,000 euros. The car is at least in the race, but it's got a lot of work to do from the 15th row now. And the, the problem the K-Pax team have got is that the car had to remain in Park Ferme. It wasn't released to the team until around about midday here Saturday afternoon. So they've had precious little time to prepare the car for this event as opposed to what they would have normally expected. Now, Ezequiel Perez Compank is another man to watch this weekend in the Silver Cup. Let's hear his thoughts. He's with Jammer Scott on the grid. As Gil, you're no stranger to this race, of course. You won the Silver Class last year, 2021, starting from not quite midfield, but uh, a lot of work ahead. Yeah, last year we had the same, you know, this is not a one lap race, uh, it's a 24 hour. I think uh, last year we did a good job, you know, also we learned a lot of stuff. Uh, we, we came with new stuff also for this year, you know, every time we try to surpass ourselves. And I think this year also we did a mega job in the preparation of the race. And I think for the race, for sure, even if we don't start in front, I think we are massive contenders for the Silver Cup. So, yeah, look out for us. It's a long way to go. Have a great race. Thank you. Thank you very much and go Pandas. <laughs> <laughs> We've still never been able to get to the bottom of where the Mad Panda reference comes from, but it's a bit of a cult following now. Antonio Fuoco then for Arn Lynx, number 71 Ferrari. He was disappointing in Super Pole yesterday, unfortunately, but uh, certainly going to be a man to watch over the opening few laps of the race. Uh, I'll get John to talk about these gravel traps a little bit more in due course because they are going to play a big impact. One of last year's winning drivers is Com Ledegar. He's gone from Ferrari back to Porsche and he's ready to talk to Amanda. <laughs> Well, last year's race winner returns to the spa 24 hour now in a Porsche. When you compare the Ferrari and the Porsche at the track, what are the biggest differences? 
I would say that the, um, the car are quite different because you have a car with a completely rear engine when the Ferrari is a mid-engine. So let's say our car is quite strong on uh, braking efficiency and traction. And also, if we have some rainy conditions, it would be perfect. It's a long race, 24 hours. As a driver, how do you maintain pace? Definitely. I think the key this year will uh, be to stay out of penalties and to see the day around 3 p.m. and to see where we are. And then we, could, we can finally start to push and to manage the situation, but uh, it will be tough. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to have Kermit Ledegar uh, back in Porsches, in a sense, because that's where he made his name in uh, Carrera Cup France, where he was a, a champion. Uh, the fans are back in force as well. Last year, people were allowed in to watch the race, but in limited numbers and in selected areas. This time, it is uh, open house, if you like. You can go where you want. Yes, one might say it's almost back, 99% back to normality. But interesting in the comments of Kermit Ledegar and every other driver that we have heard in the pre-show interviews. We know what we've got to do. We've got to stay out of trouble, keep the car clean, do, do car scratches. Well, the first lap, well, you said first lap, you reckon there'll be a, maybe a, a full course yellow or even a safety car. I said maybe three laps. So where, what happens to these drivers between being logical, rational, and whatever, and then they put the helmet on and they flick the switch and they go nuts? I think the argument would be they're perfectly rational. It's the other bloke they can never legislate for, isn't it? Uh, yeah, these gravel traps, we, I, I will get John to talk about. We'll rattle through some more interviews before we go racing. But they have made a big impact on the practice and qualifying sessions and on the support races this weekend. The, in the past, where you'd run wide and there'd be tarmac or grass, well, now there's a gravel trap. And in it, you are stuck. Uh, Sandy Mitchell was here last, work, do, uh, last week doing great things in British GT. He's back. Let's hear from him. here before in Spa. The objective today is clear. Yeah, exactly. We've uh, won alongside Barwell in uh, silver and in uh, Pro-Am before. So, yeah, to add another a gold pot uh, next to that would be lovely. But, um, yeah, I mean, a great start to our weekend. Brilliant effort by all four drivers to get the combined pole position for class. So, um, yeah, we'll be pushing on and uh, trying to hold that for as long as possible. But uh, a very, very long way to go, obviously. And, um, yeah, we've got to get stuck in, survive the start. It's looking hectic. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a dogfight for the first few laps yeah it really is going to be a busy first lap yeah we've got quite a few cars out of position you know a couple of pro cars behind us a few silver guys in front of us that i think we have the pace on so yeah i'll be looking to move forward and um yeah get inside that top 20 if we can well have a fantastic race a long one enjoy cheers thank you thanks Andy. So Sandy Mitchell gets set in the very spectacularly liveried uh, Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini. It is, of course, going to be a rolling start. The race starting at quarter to five. So, uh, in a sense, there's not that much of the race before you get into the darkness. But then tomorrow sort of feels longer because you're coming out into the, into the dawn. There's so much more of the race still to go. I think you meant into the, into the sunrise. I know what I meant. <laughs> but you take my point. I do. I mean, it, it will be... <clears throat> Going into night time, it's, it's, okay, it's 15 minutes shorter than it would have been normally, but it seems a lot shorter just because yeah. of the, the later start. And then from you know the sunrise, whatever time, it's going to be up 5.30, 6 o'clock, all the way through to a quarter to five in the evening. You've got 11 and a bit hours of more or less daylight racing. And, of course, as everybody has said, it's the final six hours that maybe where the race will finally begin to unfold and we might get an indication as to which of the teams that are still running are going to be in a position to challenge for the lead and between that the first mm. six hours there's a, a point score after 12 hours another point score so a lot of racing particularly at the six hour and 12 hour mark that teams are mindful of they want to get those points they are almost free points for the teams sure well now bit by bit the grid is going to be cleared we've got uh, two or three cars that are going to have to start from the pits because of engine changes and uh, other related penalties uh, and uh, Fabian Schiller is going to be on the grid itself and we'll hear from him before we go racing right now with Amanda. Fabian, as you get in the car, we're standing at the base of the Eau Rouge. If you had to describe it in one word, what would you say? Crazy. <laughs> yeah. What's the secret to it? Well, it's just special. It's amazing. Have a great race. Fabian Schiller was impressive in Super Bowl. He was one of the uh, only non-pro drivers to get in there running in the Silver Cup. So he gets his balaclava on, he'll get into the car that have got to do battle for 24 hours. Uh, a new Pirelli tyre this year, in addition to these gravel beds. And so the team's quite keen that they have uh, as many laps at a good pace, safety car laps preferable to full course yellow laps. Uh, Felipe Nazarek's Grand Prix driver makes his Spa 24 debut. He's with Gemma. Felipe, your first experience at the Spa 24, it's quite a race. You're going to take the second stint, right? Absolutely. It's been fun. It's been... Uh pretty intense what I've seen so far but my first 24 of the spa you know about to take place here 
What an incredible crowd, uh, a lot of good drivers and teams and uh, you know I'm happy to be part of the number 74 here, Emma uh, Motorsport car. Together with Jam and Campbell, uh, two you know ace drivers, we've been having a lot of fun. So we want to move forward. You know that's the aim. You can see there's a, a few cars ahead, but uh, the aim for us is to keep pushing and uh, move forward for sure. Are there going to be any issues with cold tyres? Are you going to struggle? I know there has been a few few issues throughout the weekend. It's going to be one of the challenges for sure, especially overnight, uh, just to keep temperature in them. If you have like a yellow yellow flag or a full course. Uh, yellow uh, underway or a safety car but it, it's for everybody so uh, we have to anticipate those be flexible it's pretty much a survivor race because there's so much happening there's so much uh, going on between the classes uh, but I'm confident you know we have a pretty good package in our hands and uh, hopefully when we talk again we'll be up further ahead you know absolutely well thanks very much for talking Thank to us Thank cheers you. have a great race Good to have Felipe Nazar coming into GT, and of course he's part of Porsche's future sports car project. And uh, let's try and get to Mirko Bortolotti next, because he's about to leap on board his Lamborghini, and Mirko's going to be a star of the first stint. He's with Amanda. Well, guys, as you can see, the helmet is going on, and Mirko, how do you plot your attack as we kick off this race? Right, it's such a long race. I mean, uh, it's great to be here. We have a good starting position. Good package, but it's so so many factors play a role and play a factor in the end. So let's see. Let's have a good start first, good uh, initial stint, and then uh, yeah, it's a long race. Good luck. Marco Bortolotti, one of the Lamborghini stars. He has won for every Lamborghini team that he's driven for, except as yet Emil Frey Racing. He wants to put that right this weekend. Right, John, let's tick off a few things. Let's talk gravel traps first of all. They've really made an impact on the way the races run. Gravel's returned. Yeah. We got rid of it about eight, ten years ago. Now it's back, back for different reasons. But of course, it changes the circumstance. If a driver runs wide in a number of corners, instead of having that lovely tarmac, you can see there's still tarmac there. These are the gravel traps that we're looking at at Brussels. You can see as you run down, uh, that is on the exit. Is that out of blown? I can't That's the That's the source. It is, it is. You're right. It's a reverse angle out of the source. There is. The, out of the Paul Frau curb, there is still tarmac beyond the demarcation curb, but the gravel is what 20 meters behind that. So if you run very wide or you have a spin, inevitably you're going to end up in the gravel, and, and the gravel does its job. It arrests the car and it buries the rear wheels, so you have to get a snatch vehicle to remove it. Depending whether the car is in a vulnerable part of the circuit when it has gone off, that will determine whether there will be a full course yellow or a safety car deployment. I think the safety car deployment is probably at the minute the favoured option because it gets it done and dusted more quickly. Mm. Full course yellow, you've got to go through that process, then deploy the safety car, and then everybody's got to catch up to the safety car. So I think race director might be looking more at safety car if there are going to be cars sort of harmlessly going off into gravel as opposed to having some of the incidents that we've seen in previous years. What he has said is that if we do go full course yellow first to slow down the race, there'll be a maximum of two full course yellow laps. You'll get the safety car out of there as soon as Quickly possible. As possible. Yeah. So I'm not saying there will always be two no. full course yellow laps, but there shouldn't be any more than that. That's what the teams have been told. So there is a snapshot of the grid. We have got these uh, nine different brands. We have got this massive field of 66 cars, not all of which are on the grid. Kenny Harbel's 75 Mercedes had an engine change. It'll start from the pit lane. Also starting from the uh, pits, Louis Machiels in his Ferrari and Stephen Grove's Porsche, the Yalbamba Motorsport run car. You know, if you aren't at the front three or four rows of the grid, Starting from the pit lane in a 24-hour endurance event, I wouldn't get overstressed about it because no. what will happen is the, the entire field will cross the finish line because it is the finish line that's on that downhill. So, I was actually the start line, the finish line's up at the top. So let the cars go. You've got 23 hours and 59 minutes and 45 seconds to go racing. Well, the green flag is waved then. The cars released onto the formation lap as down to the end of the pit lane comes the uh, Ferrari. So that's going to be Louis Machiel's car that will be first in the queue. And we'll double check the others in order as the cars then scroll out of Rouge up through Radion. 
Raffaele Marcello will start on pole position and Klaus Backler is going to be alongside him. Luca Stoltz starts third on the grid and Mirko Bortolotti in his Lamborghini goes from fourth. Michael Christensen for GPX Racing starting fifth with Christopher Hauser alongside. Then it is Ricardo Feller and Fabian Schiller starting eighth. Ninth on the grid, Maxi Buk and tenth is Antonio Fuoco. Starting 11th, Giacomo Altue. One of last year's winners, Nicholas Nielsen's alongside him, ahead of Sven Muller and Kelvin van der Linde, ahead of Augusto Farfus and Nicky Tim. Before you get to Christopher Meese, 17th and 18th is Benji Goethe. 19th, Konsta Lapalainen, Neil Verhagen, the BMW Junior, starting 20th, ahead of Matt Campbell in the EMA Motorsport Porsche. Ross Gunn in the TF Sport Aston is alongside him. Then it's Tommaso Mosca and Nikolai Sheergaard. Uh, next on the grid, Janis Fitya and Marvin Kirchhofer is behind. It's Sandy Mitchell coming next with Pierre-Alexander Jean alongside him. Lucas Auer is going to line up alongside Jordan Pepper. Then it's Michele Beretta and Diego Menchaca with Mario Zug and Nicholas Bart starting on the 17th row. Row 18 is where you find Nico Muller in the Valentino Rossi number 46 Audi. As you kill Paris Compank is alongside him ahead of the uh, BMW that comes next in the hands of uh, Michael Dynan and alongside him. Uh, you have the uh, car from the Silver Cup going further back down the grid. David Perel right, to meet her alongside each other. Mara Calamir and Benjamin Lessen ahead of Alessio Picariello and Enrique Chavez. Loris Spinelli, Lamborghini Super Trofeo hero, lines up alongside Rahel Frey ahead of Dylan Pereira and Pitti Biron Bakhti. Then you've got Joel Sturm's Porsche, the disabled driver Nigel Bai in the Bentley, Nico Gomar for uh, EGS events alongside Benoit Moulin. Then Samantha Tan's BMW. Uh, Tim Muller, the shoe magnate, is next. Stephen Grove starting from the pit lane alongside, or would have been alongside, Patrick Assenheimer. There's Don Yount and Sebastian Bode. You've got Brendan Leach and Alfred Renauer. And then Nick Tandy, the last of those drivers on the grid. Kenny Harbel's Mercedes also starting from the pits. Uh, Nick Tandy had a, a break issue in qualifying, and that meant that they couldn't take part in all the sessions and therefore have to be relegated to the back of the grid. And that's a car that's going to make its way up through the field, and Nick Tandy behind the wheel. Now, Nick has won this race, he knows what he needs to do, but of course, the key for that 47 Porsche is to do everything to stay on the lead lap that's possible. So he'll make progress very quickly in the opening, let's say 10 or so laps, but he might get himself up onto the top, the bottom of the top 20 in that period, but just keeping out of trouble and, and not getting involved in somebody else's problem as well. So the cars then turn their way through uh, Puan, then out of the piff path and Kelvin van der Linde's Audi, which didn't really go as well in Super Bowl as we were anticipating it to. But you've got then Raffaele Marchiello starting on that pole position. This is a race he desperately wants to win. They've been really short of luck here in the past. But the 2018 sprint champion, winner of the Suzuka 10 hours, winner of the FIA GT World Cup, single seater Formula 3 champion, Raffaele Marchiello will be uh, certainly in fine form I'm sure over the opening laps of the race Samantha Tan starting in the BMW run by her eponymous team that car now making its way out of the court Paul Frere they will get themselves into the Noah's Ark 2x2 formation ready for the start of the race the start is the ceremonial start if you like down towards Eau Rouge but the timing line therefore the finish line is coming out of the chicane so for tradition's sake it is the uh, run down to Eau Rouge. The first lap, therefore, is much, much shorter and doesn't really count for the purposes of fastest laps of the race, and all the timing will be done at the end uh, of the Formula One style lap, if you like, coming out of the chicane. So the cars then make the run to that chicane now, getting themselves into formation. Uh, safety car, incidentally, we talked about the fact you can expect it to be used quite a lot. There are two. Only one will be on the track at once. But uh, one safety car will enter the circuit from the Corp Paul Frere, the other uh, at the top of Radion. It really is dependent on the race director as to where the leader is and which safety car is going to be closest to him to get things scooped up, to get things under control as quickly as. So it could be that you see a safety car join from one side of the circuit or from the other. So the safety car is in. Front row, remember, Raffaele Marciello, Klaus Backler alongside, Luca Stoltz on the second row, and then you've got Mirko Bortolotti alongside. Keep an eye on that k pax Lamborghini starting 30th. One final comment. This race will not be won in Eau Rouge and Radio, but it can be lost 
and no rouge on Rodion. Totally agree. Alessandro Piagridi might agree as well. Absolutely. Remember uh, the celebrated conversation you had all those years ago. Right, everybody, the 2022 Total Energies 24 Hours of Spa is about to get underway. Out of La Source they come. Speed builds up towards the lights. The flags are ready. The lights will change. The race gets underway now. Great start by the Porsche of Klaus Backler. Then as they dive downhill for the first time, the green dynamic motorsport Porsche takes over the lead as they sweep their way through a rouge, ready to make the climb uphill. Lap one of 24 hours of racing. Everybody so far so good as they make the climb up through Radion, heading towards Le Corne. It is Porsche ahead of Mercedes, but on his toes there, looking the number 95 Aston Martin trying to dive up on the inside line. Nicky team, Backlet leads Marcello, leads Bortolotti as they get to the first timing point up towards Le Corne. Just look how busy the racetrack is. I mean, that is an absolute traffic jam as they come into Le Corne, then the drop back down through Almady, the run down to Bruxelles. Everybody apparently behaving extremely well. We don't think well, kicking up dust on the exit of Malmedy, but that's not an issue. But back cars are almost four abreast coming down the Camel Street. On the outside line there, you saw number 32 Audi, Kelvin van der Linde, but it's Backler leading, still trying to get the tyres warmer, isn't he, as he jinks left and right, coming down the hill out of Speaker's Corner, the Jackie Eakes Corner. This is Pouant, Porsche, Mercedes, Lamborghini, then Mercedes, then Audi in fifth place as they come streaming through. An effort made on the inside by Benjamin Goethe there in the Gulf livery, Rothko Audi. There is number 50, the BMW junior team entering the Overhagen at the wheel of it. And there's our first really wide run. That was the Joe That's to McLaren, I think. McLaren, indeed, yes. Way out wide it goes. And now you've got number 77, Lamborghini of Sandy Mitchell from the Gold Cup, also trying to wriggle through on the inside. So out of the piff path they come. And despite the fact that the circuit is very, very busy, you've had a couple of cars running wide, but it's not been quite the drama fest that one or two people feared. Out of the curb, Paul Frere. So the leading car, that of Klaus Backler, trying now to edge away as the field comes towards the end of the opening lap, not the necessarily full lap, but it's where the timing point is going to be. And there, further down the order, more side-by-side -side battles rage on. All of these cars, remember, to the same specification. They're all GT3 across the different classes of Pro, Silver, Gold and Pro-Am. Up towards the timing line, we've also got this round of the European Fanatec GT World counting for the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli. So for some, there are bags full of points on offer across the two championships. Well, the field's making its way, still climbing up into the chicane as the race leaders are now running out of La Source down the hill. A great start by Klaus Backler. I don't know whether he maybe he just hit the right time at the right moment, but he got the jump on Raffaele Marcello, but Marcello has said, well, you know, somebody just runs very wide again on the exit of La Source. I don't think Marcello's overly concerned that he lost the benefits of pole position. He didn't really have it in the first place. He was gifted it because of the, the number six Lamborghini having to uh, start in, back in 30th position. So the field then now streams uphill for the first uh, time, if you like, from a, a proper flying racing lap. Three wide in the mid-pack. Ezequiel Perez compact in the Mercedes with lots of grunts in a straight line. Streams round the outside. Also here, the Sky Tempesta racing. Mercedes out of the Hap Racing Team stable tries to gain places. Loris Spinelli at the wheel of it. He races these cars in America with alacrity and he goes through there. Gets his elbows out a little bit to get ahead of Nicholas Barth in the red Audi. That was a good pass. I mean, it wasn't taking a prisoner. I mean, that was a clear move. You could see him coming up the straight. It was way, way to the left on Campbell Street, but managed to get around the outside of the Audi into Le Coum. So out of Bruxelles, they come then. Now down towards the turn nine left. You see the motorbike route on the inside. Already we're getting track limit warnings. There's a whole page for track limit warnings for the teams uh, and the penalties become worse and worse and worse the further through the race you get. We'll worry about those later as right now uh, Loris Spinelli hustles on trying to gain ground against the Porsche of Eichen Guven. But this is the race leader. This is Klaus Bachler for the Dynamic Motorsport team promoted to the front row of the grid with the k patch Lamborghini being penalised and that car as well has only gained one place on the first lap. Jordan Pepper starting it. He's up to 29th position. And it all, it's all sort of rather surprisingly calm. I mean, we thought there was going to be lap one, maybe a yeah. yellow flag, I said maybe lap three, but right now everything appears to be running. In spite of how close the cars, the midfield is running, Mirko Bottolotti in third place. He's sitting there watching to the tail, but he's got to be careful because directly behind him got Lucas Stoltz in the number two Mercedes, and he will not need a second invitation to see if he can squeeze through. Out of the chicane, this is two laps completed. Only 23 hours and 55 and a half minutes to go as they come across the line. Battle to Marciello then, he's four tenths of a second. Third is Mirko Bortolotti, Lucas Stoltz there is fourth. Fifth is Christopher Hauser. And then sixth, you'll see the back of it there, the Martini livery Porsche, Michael Christensen at the wheel. 
Yeah, the pace, the pace right now at the front is very quick indeed. Dutch Backler's got the fastest lap, lap two, a 219.6, considering these cars are loaded with fuel. But down the hill, side by side, the 32, who's going to concede the Porsche by just, oh, wow, does it ever just cut the nose off the Audi? That's number 100, Sven Muller versus Kelvin van der Linde. And then behind them, you've got Augusto Farfus, and also into that mix now uh, is the Aston Martin. So that's Nicky T, Christopher Meese next in the queue. Uh, in seventh place, incidentally, Fabian Schiller, who is the one uh, silver right up there against all the pros, doing a very, very impressive job indeed. So looking back here from van der Linde's car, that's Augusto Farfus in the BMW behind. And you see, as you run out of Lecom, how little room you have to play with these days. Hardly any grass, but lots of gravel. Yeah, some corners, it's more evident than, than others. The gravel trap on the exit of Roussel is a little bit further off the racetrack, but it's easy to get to down the hill into Poole. Still, Klaus Backler's in control, but really, it's the lead is what is half a second when they came across the line at the end of lap two. Not much difference as they go down to Pujo on lap three. So through that fast, long left-hander they turn. So Klaus Backler it is, currently the overall leader. The leading uh, silver, Fabian Schiller. The leading gold is Sandy Mitchell. And uh, then of the Pro-Ams, Alessio Picariello, the Belgian in the uh, number 24 Porsche, holding sway right now. The field turns out of campus through the court, Paul Frere. And where's the next fight going to come from? It's going to come from Bortolotti, isn't it? Because now the Lamborghini, having got itself up into third place at the expense of Lucas Stoltz, has done absolute best in the middle sector. There is the silver leader, Fabian Schiller. I was just mentioning how well he was going overall. He's seventh, and his next target, Michael Christensen, in the Martini Porsche. Down they come then into the chicane, up towards the end now of lap number three. And Bortolotti, I think, is going to be unleashed very shortly onto the tail of Marciello. Well, he's been running within, uh, what, seven tenths, three tenths, four tenths, just varies literally lap to lap. They come now to complete lap three. So, Mirko Bortolotti, I suppose, like everybody in this line of cars, are all having their basic pace being dictated to by the car directly ahead of them. And it's very difficult to find a way around a car that's got an equal pace to that of the viewers. So, whether that will have to wait until we get into a traffic a lapping situation, which will probably be coming in the next 15, 20 minutes. Round Les Sauls, then they turn. Garage 59, McLaren goes through, and the Allied Porsche was making a move to the inside as they break for the hairpin that time. The field streaming over the top of Radion up the Camel Straight. And so now, Mirko Bortolotti, I said he'd done an absolute best in the middle sector. He's done an absolute best lap as well as he hustles on in pursuit now of the race leaders, Klaus Backler ahead of Raffaele Marciello. That's a very, very strong lap from Mirko Bortolotti. At this early phase, remember, OK, they're on fresh rubber, but they've got a load of fuel on board. There is Sandy Mitchell leading the category in the Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini. He's the Gold Cup leader right now from Lucas Auer, number 57 Mercedes, if you catch a glimpse. But uh, currently, Sandy Mitchell is right on the tail of Marvin Kirchhofer in the Jota McLaren. That's Michael Christensen, who's dropping away just a little, isn't he, from that leading quintet, but there's a long way to go. Keeping out of trouble is part of it. The Rothko Audi a little bit sideways there, perhaps coming down into Poole. That was Benji Goethe. Next wave of cars through, including number 46, then the Audi that has got Nico Muller at the wheel of it. That is the Pro-Am leader, Alessio Picariello, who's done much of his racing out in the Far East, but uh, Belgian by birth. And Alessio Picariello, another very quick, if underrated, driver. So again, it's all the way through the field, it's a follow my leader. The odd Audi dropping wheel off, they exit as they came out of Fania down into campus. So it, those are the, oh, again, the same sort of thing, the second corner in succession. We've seen the Porsche drop a wheel off, and you've got to be careful you drop that wheel off any further. There's a drop between the edge of the tarmac and where the gravel, that also is a concern for tyres. You cut a tyre down very quickly if you do drop a wheel down. fantastic noise that this field collectively makes. We talk about the different shapes and sizes, it's the different sounds as well as the cars then uh, stream down to the chicane. Picariello here in the number 24 Porsche. It's a Herbert Motorsport car. There, Loris Spinelli in the Sky Tempest and Mercedes way up the kerb. Here are the leaders coming down the hill then. It is still Backler just ahead of Marciello. Bortolotti third. Yeah, it's dropped back a little bit at the end of lap four, so whether he's just sitting back and he still holds that fastest race lap he set in lap three, but it's the, 
usual problem. You, you catch a car, you get into the, the arrow wash from the car you're following, then you tend to lose a little bit of the front end bite. It also has a bearing on the overall arrow on the car, the water cooling, oil cooling temperatures, but principally also on those front tires. You start to use the front tire in a different manner to that if you were driving in clean air. Number 100, that's Sven Muller, and he's 13. That's the Toxport WRT Porsche. We get used to talking about that squad in terms of uh, Mercedes, but a Porsche team this weekend. And again, you see how close the cars are there to touching the gravel as they come out of Le Combe. So Sven Muller, 13th. His target is the Giacomo Altue driven Lamborghini just up the road as they drop down now into Speaker's Corner through Turn 9. But we've had four laps and no dramas. Everybody's fulfilled. All objectives, they said we were going to be careful, we're not going to get the car scratched, we're not going to go into the gravel. Certainly there was a lot of gravel uh, relationships between drivers' cars all the way through from Thursday through Friday. But so far, it's run rather metronomically, which is very good to see. It is, and then that gives the teams the chance to get into their strategy and to, to plan the race rather than always having to react to, to dramas. And uh, one driver from a Porsche team was saying to me earlier on in the week that the worst thing you can have is a puncture because with such a long lap, he said, if you if you get a puncture, you get to the pit lane, you might as well park it and go home because you can't afford to drop off the lead lap. No, the lead lap is the key, and that's the key that certainly the 47 uh, Porsche, Nick Tandy behind the wheel, just looking to see where Nick has got himself up to. Well, he's in... 49th. OK, well, he's, he's a lot more work to do. He started back in 64... Well, he would have been 63rd, 4th, because yeah. there were three cars in the pit lane. If cars do go in the gravel, by the way, they can be returned to the race, but they are, first of all, put in a safe zone, so the driver has to try and scoop some of the gravel out so it doesn't shower all over the racetrack. So, again, you lose more time by that, so stay on the tarmac is the main thing. Van der Linde over the timing line. He is currently in 14th place in the WRT Audi, and you might think, gosh, that's a long way back, but we know how WRT can come good in this race and works towards tomorrow afternoon, not this first hour. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of this race will inevitably be won or lost in the pit lane. Pit lane speed limit abuse, a lot of that went on on Thursday, a little bit less maybe on Friday, but that's another area where teams, it's a simple thing, you put your speed limit limiter to... 48 kilometers per hour, not 49.9 recurring, because teams were getting caught out. There were a lot of penalties issued because of speed limit uh, abuse. The other thing to factor into this, of course, you score points at six hours and again at 12 and again at 24. So quite often you'll see the teams using their quicker drivers up to the, the midnight mark to try and get two big hauls of points. So even if you don't do well in the, the second half of the race, you maximize the potential points on offer within the first 12 hours. We know, for example, that the Akonis ASP team have played that very strongly in the past. So right now we're on lap six. It's Klaus Backler leading the way. You're looking at the battle between Marvin Kirchhofer and Sandy Mitchell at the back of this long, long queue of cars. Sandy Mitchell currently 24th. Yeah, he's just literally, now he's got Neil Shellgaard has just managed to find a way around Verhagen in the BMW. So not a lot of overtaking. That's one of the overtakes in the top 35 that we're seeing. So Picarello has also done so in the Porsche up from 33rd to 32nd. But other than that, it's literally, it's follow my leader around the seven kilometer circuit. Now, the Capex Lamborghini struggling a bit here, isn't it? Because Jordan Pepper, when we last updated you in 29th place, well, he's still in 29th place. He is not getting through the traffic here. I think, look, you can look through the entire field. I mean, outside of that pass for 25th position, have we seen an overtake from 25th to 1st? No. Other than the start, Klaus Backler gained the advantage. So it has been very much... You know, so the, the equality of the performance of these cars and the drivers at this, at this level, there's been little or no action at the top 25. The BOP, the balanced performance, works so well, it equates everybody. Uh, what progress of Nick Tandy? 48th, he's uh, got another place just gained. And there you can just see Ricardo Feller closing on to the back of Michael Christensen as they go now into La Source once more. But Klaus Backler doing a good job up front. He's not broken away by more than a second. I mean, we're still talking tiny gaps here, but he is up front and he's doing his level best to get away from Marciello. Uh, assuming it's a green hour, then, of course, you would anticipate uh, people to uh, make their pit stops around the hour mark. But uh, there's a long way to go yet before we need to think about that because we've only had 13 and a half minutes of racing across the timing line. There's the field streaming into Le Combe. And Klaus Backler it is, who is still up front here at Spa. 
Christensen coming under attack from Fowler now. That's for sixth and seventh places as they come over the brow down to Brussel. And it is Klaus Battler then, the race leader. So let's have a quick look at the start of the Total Energy's 24 hours of spa, this enormous grid lining up. And as the lights change, it was a demon getaway by Klaus Backler, who took over the race lead as the cars streamed downhill for the first time. Porsche ahead of Mercedes, Rafael Di Marcello tucking in in second place. And in third was Mirko Bortolotti ahead of the Lucas Stoltz, Mercedes and Christopher Hauser's Audi next. Lots of people fearful of dramas on the first lap, but everybody managed to get through without problems. Aboard number seven, the inception racing McLaren Frederick Schandorf and his view became very crowded indeed. It was tight going through La Source hairpin as well. This long field of 66 cars together. This is the leader. This is Klaus Backler. And to the eye, Raffaele Marciello is just that little bit closer. Yes, it's sort of the, there's a bit of seesaw between the first, third, second, third cars. Marco Bortolotti was the man on the move about three laps ago. He's dropped back from the back of, Porto, of uh, the Mercedes of Raffaele Marcello. Now Marcello looks as if he's maybe running down the lead Porsche or Klaus Backler as they come up into the chicane. This is for the conclusion of lap seven. And there you can see the gap between second and third is a little more than it was. And now Marco Bortolotti has got Lucas Stolz breathing down the back of the Lamborghini just six tenths of a second behind the third place. So the cars come over the timing line. Uh, the start of the race, of course, is on that run down to Arouge, the traditional start line, but the timing line and therefore the finish line is as they come out of the chicane on the so-called Formula One pits. The top speed going through Arouge on our race vision powered by AWS Graphic. Frederick Schandorf's McLaren, 247 kilometers an hour through this section of the racetrack. That is brave. That is quick, believe me. When you stand at the bottom of Arouge and look upwards, the speed that some of these cars are carrying, and just noticing some of them are really sparking heavily as they go through the transition from left to right up the hill to climb over the top of Radio and then onto Camel Strait. But 247 kilometers per hour, that's the thin end of 145, just under 150 miles per hour. I mean, for a GT3 car, these are essentially road going cars, but albeit heavily modified for racing. The lead gap was down by a tenth last time, and Raffaele Marcello is still chipping away, isn't he? So we have barely had 15 minutes of racing, but Marcello in second place now, feeling that perhaps this is the time to push, getting into a rhythm. Mirko Bortolotti safe in third, and Jordan Pepper in the car from k the Lamborghini that was fastest in Super Pole, then for a technical infringement had its times disallowed. So it fell to 20th, given a 10th place grid drop, fell to 30th. It's gained another spot, but it's still only 28th. And Jordan Pepper is not finding it easy to get through the traffic. This is Marcello's view in the box, in the screen, and that's the car from the outside chasing after the leader. Well, just to think about Jordan Pepper and number six Lamborghini, they are now a... just looking to see the gap, but it's 23 and a bit seconds behind the race leading uh, Porsche. Uh, we go back to Klaus Backler and... You can almost imagine that Raffaele Marcello, he's broken clear of the challenge that was coming from Mirko Portolotti in third place, so he can now forget about Portolotti for the meantime and focus solely on what can he do to run down the lead Porsche. He lost the lead as the lights went out, down into Oruge. Backler had a really good start. Maybe Raffaele Marcello was a little bit more apprehensive at the start, but now he sees an opportunity. He's going to create that opportunity to try and... But it'll all maybe be about how are your tyres responding. This has been a really high pace, high speed opening number of laps. Klaus Backler in the green Porsche leads as they come over the line. And then in second place, it is Raffaele Marcello's Mercedes. Third is Mirko Bortolotti, then going through in fourth place, Lucas Stoltz. The rest of the field files through then out of the La Source hairpin with Christopher Hauser in fifth. Michael Christensen, sixth. Seventh, Ricardo Feller. Eighth, Fabian Schiller. Ninth, Maxi Buch, another former winner of this event. And tenth, Antonio Fuoco. Good battle developing here, look. Augusto Farfus under attack from Nicky Tim. BMW versus Aston Martin. That's for 15th. Always watch, always worth a look to see what Nicky Tim is going to be doing. Because he is a genius at creating opportunities for himself. And Augusto Farfus in the BMW, he's not shoddy as well because he knows how to defend as well as attack. But again, you can see as they come down Camel straight, this little that's pick and choose between the top speed. Even if you do get a good run through Eau over the top of Radio, the difference in top speeds of these cars might be a kilometre or two per hour at maximum, and the straight just isn't, isn't long enough to make something out of a Nicky team. You can see how much he's been making progress, trying to keep himself in that battle with Augusta Farfus and the BMW. 
So through they turn, out of Bruxelles then, drop downhill. And right now, Klaus Battler's advantage still hovering around that six tenths of a second mark. A little bit of dust in the air there. Yeah, I think somebody took a little bit of the inside of the corner, kicked up the dust. Those following don't really want that because it gets onto the racetrack, it's onto your tyres. So the track momentarily becomes a little bit less grippy than it would have been one lap earlier as they thunder down out of the end of Pouhon corner, then down to Fania. So Nicky team and the beach team Aston Martin running in 16th place. Got to be aware that Christopher Mies, a major challenger for Audi, whenever Christopher Mies is in an Audi, he is always going to be on his toes. So Nicky team thinking about the BMW, but likewise Christopher Mies thinking about how can I get past these two cars, not just the one. So the field swarms through and the cars now have got eight laps in the book. Race leader remains Klaus Backler, six tenths of a end over Raffaele Marchiello, Marco Bortolotti there in third place. Remember, we don't anticipate pit stops up until the hour mark, so 20 minutes of the race completed as the leader breaks the beam, this time with nine laps done. Through they stream, look at the BMW battle over Nicky Team there. And as they come now down to La Source Happy, we've got then nose to tail. Farfus just ahead of team. Those two virtually as one. Now, this is perhaps where the Aston Martin might have the advantage, but he went a bit wide. Yeah, but he's going to try and get himself into the tail of the, the BMW. So if he can get a cool, clean run up through Au Rouge and Radio, he might have a shot going up into Le Coon, but not close enough. So the car's now parked the hell, and there's our first drama because Nigel Bailly is in the gravel in the Bentley. Nigel Bailly is off the road. That possibly campus. down campus could Paul Frere area. It is. Well done, John. You're absolutely spot on. And Nigel Bailly is in the gravel, and I think this is our first safety car. Well, it certainly is going to need assistance to get out. I think the car is too deeply buried. Certainly the left side of the car has been shoveling all the gravel, so that will be underneath the, the, the body, the chassis of the car, and the left side wheels are probably fairly well buried in it as well. In the meantime, Raffaele Marcello, unaware of what's taken place, is hammering as much as he can, six-tenths of a second, when he came across the line end of lap nine. Klaus Backler has dominated this race since the fact the lights went out. The gap between second and third hovering around one and a half seconds. Oh, the bed has got going on its own. Fantastic. And that's going to be in the way of the leaders, potentially, because as Nigel Bai, the disabled driver, badly injured in a motocross accident many years ago, tries to drop the gravel out of the car. Here's Backler, and the circuit might be changing ahead of him if it's getting the models down. So not only is Klaus Backler then catching up to a slow car, he's being caught by Raffaele Marcello. Look at this gap, it has come down another fraction. Nigel Bai then gets out of the way, drives off the road so that he doesn't impede the leaders. Yeah. Marcello had to come out of the throttle a little bit there because he wasn't quite certain what the Bentley was doing. It was making its way back onto the racetrack, having gone off to allow the lead Porsche to get it through. But look how close the gap between first and second is. So now Marcello within, what, a couple of tenths of a second of the lead Porsche as they come up to complete lap 10. Through they turn. Bentley stays out, so despite the trip into the gravel, Nigel Bai continues on his way. And going through then now over the... Timing line, Antonio Fuoco, number 71, Ferrari, 10th place he is. Just up the road ahead is Maxi Book. Down through the gears into the hairpin, Ferrari breaks that little bit later, closes on the Mercedes. I don't know what the iron links Ferraris did, but they seemingly, when it came to the, uh, the shootout last night, they didn't have the pace they illustrated earlier, both on Thursday and on Friday, so maybe this is going to be a longer game for Ferrari than that of trying to lead from the front. Got good speed going up the hill, and look at the pack bunching ahead here. But he's getting a mega two all the way down. Yeah. He's going to double it. The Bentley's there. He's going with the spin. The Bentley's so. Oh, what a great water! I mean, that I remember Mika Hackett and Michael Schumacher did a very similar thing. And oh, whoa, whoops, runs Foucault. wide. Big slide saves it. Now that's Maxi Book attacking Fabian Schiller. Look, the two Mercedes go absolutely toe to toe. Maxi Book to the inside line. Fabian Schiller, the Silver Cup leader, trying to fend him off to the outside line. Now comes Antonio Fuoco. Goes right round the outside of the Mercedes there, off the corner, and they are absolutely together as they come now into Speaker's Corner as one. Great battle going on between Antonio Fuoco, Fabian Schiller, Maxi Book. Well, brave move round the outside from Fuoco and the Ferrari to get past the Mercedes, but the Mercedes was really boxed in. The two Mercedes were not working together, 
and they allowed the Ferrari to gain that one precious position. And behind these two, you've also got the 51 Nicholas Nielsen car. Now, that was how Nigel Bayer got into the gravel, and I think he might have had a bit of an assist there. That was Kenny Harble, who was very close to him. It certainly was. There's the Mendy. We just had a quick view of that. So the car got going under its own steam. Good for them to be able to get out of the gravel bed because mostly we've seen them once in the gravel trap, they need external assistance. So there's the Bentley again trying to stay out of the way in the battle between Augusta Farfus and uh, Nicky Team. And running behind that is uh, Christopher Meese. So these three cars, are, oh, big, is that a tower? A right front tower, I think, might have gone. I saw a big puff of yeah. smoke. I thought it was the Bentley as well going wide. Maybe, so maybe. maybe that's a legacy of gravel on the tyres. Nigel By possibly in more strife will keep an eye on the field streams up now towards the chicane once more a bit of debris in the road there look watch nicky team he had a little sniff did he think done i'm not benjamin goethe he's taken advantage of that she's getting alongside christopher meese can he make it stick no he's not but it just shows intent goethe very very combative look how close he is to the back of christopher meese's car over the timing line then down towards la source and so those first few laps of being conservative and getting into a rhythm, now battles are developing, aren't they? Now people are getting stuck in more. Side by side out of the hairpin at Nassau's. On the outside line in the Gulf Colours is Goethe, and right there alongside him is Christopher Meese. They could not be closer. An easy way to cut a tower down. And in fact, Christopher Meese has backed out of it, given Goethe the option to get into Eau Rouge ahead, whether he believes that Goethe might be quicker. But now, look what's happening. Christopher Meese has now found himself in Matt Campbell and the Porsche all over the back. So he not only may have lost a position, he might lose a second position. And they're almost side by side again there coming up the hill because, as you see, Christopher Meese being attacked, the Porsche does go through. So that number 74 is Matt Campbell that does go by, but Meese tries to fight back. 74 sideways, that's the car that Felipe Nazza will take over. And then you've got the uh, Aston Martin in the queue behind of Ross Gunn. Another very, very talented young British driver is Ross Gunn. His uh, father used to be a star of Mini Melia Racing, but Ross then comes out of Roussel, eager to mix it with the best in GT3. So that was a good little move from Matt Campbell again, just we get a, a group of cars almost tripping over each other. Started mainly by Benjamin Goethe trying to find a way around Christopher Meese. And that was well read indeed by Matt Campbell. Incident between car 75 and car 107 in T14 under investigation. That's Kenny Harville's attack of Nigel Bay, and the voice you've just heard is Alain Adon, the race director, who is very much part of the commentary team for this race because Alan is normally very, very busy in race control and quick to tell us what's been going on and what's being looked at. Yes, interesting. Nick Tandy in the 47 Porsche, fastest overall down the Camel Straight, looking at that race vision powered by AWS. Graphic, so although not in a great position right now, but Nick Tandy has got out and out pace. And that's the replay again of being up the kerb, Kenny Harble, and going into the Bentley. So, yes, it does certainly look as though Nigel Bai was given more than just an assist there. He was a bit rudely shoved out of the way. To put it in the Australian connection, it, that was a hip and shoulder, mate, hip and shoulder. <laughs> well, Kenny Hamill might have a case to answer as you look there at number 163 uh, Lamborghini, threading its way out of Piff Paff. That's the Vincenzo Sospiri racing team car. And 163 is to be driven by Baptiste Moulin by, and he's at the wheel at the moment, by Mattia Michelotto, Marcus Pavarud and Michael Dorbacher. And uh, therefore, right now, we've got that car of Moulin on the tail of Sebastian Bode's pink pan for Mercedes. There's the sister car, 563, that comes across the line much, much further up the order. That's Michele Beretta at the wheel, going a little bit wide, and you're on board now with Loris Spinelli in 33rd place. Let's ride with him. So down the hill, out of La Source. This will be absolutely flat out as they come down into the compression, into a rouge, listen. Well, I'm not sure there wasn't a little breeze, but you can hear the front splitter, the front left splitter, just, just kissing the tarmac at the compression in Eau Rouge and up the hill, and then you sort of leap out of radio, and then you're onto the Camel Strait. Heading up towards Le Camp, brake late. And again, you can hear that splitter, can't you? Yeah, I mean, that's carbon fibre that you hear against tarmac. So there are little rubbing strips in those splitters, but it always makes you feel every time it bottoms out, it's just removing something from the, the overall part of the, the, the bodywork. And of course, these bodywork panels are very quickly removable and replaceable, but you don't want to have to do that. If you do, you want to do it ideally if it's a, a scheduled pit stop and not have to make a pit stop 
exclusively to replace the body panel, particularly a front splitter. Well, there is number five, six, three, coming out of Gouant, Michele Beretta, ex-single seater racer turned Lamborghini specialist uh, in America. But, uh, a former Sprint Silver Cup champion, Italian GT champion, the LMS GTE champion. And let's keep an eye on the field as they come pouring through the shot there. Nicky Team look in 16th place, 17th Benji Goethe, Matt Campbell's Porsche is 18th, then you've got Meese, then you've got Gunn, 21st going through Tommaso Mosca. And where, 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 there is number six, that's the Lamborghini of Jordan Pepper. The car that was fastest in Super Bowl before it had its times disallowed for a technical infringement. And Jordan Pepper started 30th and 13 laps into the race. He's got as far as 28th. He's absolutely stuck in traffic. Well, uh, just look and see what his best lap is. His last lap certainly was a 121. So his time is being completely dictated to by the group of cars that he's around there. It's the 46. Nico Mulo behind the wheel of that car, Valentino Rossi, Toulouse on the grid. He will be in for the second hour, so it would appear that the 46, as I've done the inside, just didn't quite catch. So there's going to be a change of driver on the hour in the 46 RD. All smiles of Valentino Rossi then. His car is 26, Nico Muller at the wheel of it. It doesn't sound great, but it's just keeping out of trouble. It's where you are tomorrow afternoon, not where you are at the end of the first hour. Uh, we've had just about half an hour of racing now, just over, as the field streams up here. This is lap number 14 in this Total Energy's 24 hours of Spa. Coming into Le Combe then. Now, one or two gaps, John, are opening up a little bit further down, aren't they? But Farfus here has got his mirrors absolutely full. Yeah, and Farfus is now, in effect, the cork of the bottle because you've got uh, Dickie Team, Benjamin Goethe, Matt Campbell, Christopher Mies, and Ross Gunn in the 23 Aston Martin, all beginning to line up. You can see that Farfus has fallen away from Kelvin Madalinda in 14th place in the 32 RD. He's trying to run down Giacomo Waltway. He's only just under half a second behind that 13th place Lamborghini. And then Sven Muller in 12th place in the 100 Porsche. Race leaders then come down towards Piff Paff. And you've got Augusto Farfus in this battle. Now look at 74, Matt Campbell is getting more and more on his toes, isn't he? He wants to get past Benji Goethe and he wants to get on with it soon. Well, getting past Benji Goethe might be easier said than done because he certainly made a big move to get past Christopher Meese, but Matt Campbell, how much closer can you get coming through campus? Now the run through the part of what is Stavlo, but really now the exit, the Paul Frere curve, watch on the outside, don't run too far out, but get yourself in position because your best chance is going to come if you can stay close to the back of the Audi up the hill into the braking zone, but right now I think Matt Campbell is that little bit too far behind unless Goethe gets it wrong. You know, the back end of his Audi is moving around. We've seen it in some of the slower corners, but no, nothing Matt Campbell can do. So he is another one that's a little bit stuck. Through they come out of the chicane and the field behind streams through. I have to say, it's been the most remarkably calm first hour. Now I'm tempting fate, don't look at me like that, John, but it has been the most remarkably calm first hour that I've, I can remember here at Spa. Oops, there it is, I've torn it. Round goes number four, Mercedes. Straight out of my mouth. Yanis Fitcher goes around, spins out of contention. That is the first real casualty other than Nigel By that we've seen. One Bentley spin, one Mercedes spin. You're on your own now. Well, the Bentley was an assist, so that you just can't. That, that was just done, <laughs> just an error. As we look at the 93 making its way through, Laura Spinelli running in 32nd position. He's made improvements. So we go back, there's a replay of what's going to happen. Turns in, looks all very nice, and just, just, it just begins to break away, and then once it's gone, he let it go and then just regroups. And also here, look, Fitcher versus Spinelli. Well, they got a bit close, didn't they? Yeah, the, the left front, right rear. Again, always a concern about just getting close to the sidewall of a tyre. The front splitter on all these racing cars sticks out ahead of the car, so that's the first part of contact. If that catches the sidewall of a tyre, it'll just cut through it immediately. This lead gap still hovering, but it's never been a second it's never been less than half a second either has it so uh, as the cars turn through this is Marciello getting a little bit closer again to the tail of Klaus Battler as they drop now into campus and the Porsche hangs on to the advantage Porsche leads Mercedes through Cup Paul Frey they come lap 15 of the Total Energy's 24 hours of Spa, Klaus Backer's Porsche lead Raffaele Marchiello's Mercedes, gap back third, Mirko Bortolotti not being able to stay with them, but 
in this opening hour, people bringing back data, getting a fuel read. It's not necessarily about ultimate pace in this first 60 minute period. Well, that's, drop the Mitchell. that's a puncture for Sandy Mitchell, isn't it? Yes, it is. Left rear has gone down. He's got half the racetrack to drive around. He needs to, again to be careful. He doesn't want to run back too quickly because of that tire begins to fall apart because of running too quickly. Then there's additional you know, potential bodywork damage, even damage to the suspension. It's a big disappointment for Sandy Mitchell, who had been running in 24th position, but he's going to be falling back, literally. There you can see that left rear tire. And, well, oh. I wonder, was that as a result of contact or was it something on the racetrack? Clearly, disappointment for Barwell at this early phase. Right, I shouldn't have said that about it being a calm hour, should I? Now, look at this. The lead gap suddenly is down to three tenths of a second as we head towards the second half of the first hour, if you're with me. Uh, it's game on. Marcello now has decided it's about time he made his move. Uh, we're also hearing 71 is slow on track with a puncture, but I think that's the, the wrong idea on the car. It's definitely 77 that we saw. So into Lecon, Marcello closing on Bacla, and John, there's traffic up the road. Yes, and traffic is going to be the best opportunity for both of these drivers. Either Bacla can use it to his advantage, or it could be Raffaele Marcello as the beneficiary, so Bacla can control it more than Raffaele Marcello can do. He, he knows where he will find a way around a car that it will then possibly then be a compromise to Raffaele Marcello. But as they come out of Jackie's curve down the hill, they used to be called Speaker's Corner, but now named after the great Belgian Grand Prix endurance driver, even off road in Paris Dakar. So the gap between the cars, the first and second, just three tenths of a second and it's still hovering around a similar... I mean, it, it ebbs and flows by a tenth, here a tenth there. Now, that back marker is, I think I'm right in saying, Donald Yount's BMW, the Valkenhorst car, and is he going to get out of the way? The blue lights are there, but he's got to turn in and get the apex. That's right in the way of Klaus Backler, unfortunately. And that has probably handicapped Backler, I would say, slightly more than Marcello. Marcello was able to deal with it more easily because he didn't have to back off quite as aggressively as Backler did, but Backler's now got the run alongside the BMW and he'll be in position to really gain back the initiative over Marcello. Will Marcello get through before they go into Blanchemont? I somehow doubt it. He's got to get out of the throttle, but make sure that he gets the momentum and the exit of the corner. Now he'll rush past the BMW, but the gap has extended now. It'll probably be almost, what, two-thirds of a second or maybe up to three-quarters of a second when they come across start-finish line, all because of one single car. Indeed. So it worked out fractionally more advantageous to Backler than to Marcello. Over the line goes the leader then. So Klaus Backler was three tenths ahead. He's now eight tenths ahead. Third is Mirko Bortolotti, who has still done the fastest lap of the race, and he's just cleared the Valkenhorst BM as well. Now, Bortolotti dropped away from Marcello, but now that gap is sort of beginning to close back up again. He's now just 1.1 seconds behind the second place Mercedes. So whether that was just an influence of traffic or... And again, was that a little puffs of blue smoke? Oh, the Mercedes. Now, why did that suddenly give a squirrely move in the exit of Radio? The back end just suddenly snapped and Rat Mattiello had to make a small correction. Nothing that initially would be to worry about, but we've still got 23 and a bit minutes of this stint to go. And if you want to go over that, 60 minutes, 65 minutes is the maximum you're allowed. Number 12, that is Christopher Hauser. He's running in fifth place then. And Sandy Mitchell has made it back to the pit lane. And are they going to do a driver change as well? Well, they're certainly going to put fuel in the car. But the first thing is to check the damage and get a new tyre on. So the car doesn't look very badly damaged at all. He's done a good job of bringing that in. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure the team are on the radio saying, do not try to come in too quickly. So a new set of tyres onto the car, whether they refueled or not. But Backler now again with traffic, getting the Porsche between himself and Marcello. And that's where the, the skill in using traffic, Marcello trying to find a way, needs to be careful, because if, that is not a, if that's not a pro car and he has contact with it, he will then be deemed to have been the responsible. But that's given Bortolotti the opportunity now to start making Marcello use his rear view mirror, which he'd sort of forgotten about for yeah. the last 10 or so laps. Yeah, because Bortolotti is right there behind him. That was the Stephen Grove uh, Porsche they were just putting a lap on. Bortolotti then turns his way out of campus. But yes, now, with the traffic, the complexion of the top three has completely changed. Backler on his own, and although Bortolotti is up the kerb, second and third are closer than they were a lap ago. Stoltz is still fourth, and then in fifth place, it's Hazard sixth, is Michael Christensen. And that's a really sedate, in quotes, first stint from Christensen. He's dropped away to the tune of nearly nine seconds. Into the chicane. Comes Marciello then. 
that the Akodis ASP Brains Trust studying all the laptops, all the data, monitoring the speed, the pace, the lap times, the pace of the opposition as well. The three leaders go through, Porsche, Mercedes, Lamborghini, Stolt still fourth. Uh, and as a consequence of the traffic, Mark Marcello has lost half a second, a further half second to the race leader, Klaus Bachler. That's the way the influence of traffic will uh, affect what happens all the way through the field. Out of La Source, they turn. Race leaders now on lap 18. And there, Nicky Team has got himself up past Augusto Farfus and has cleared off into the distance. Yes, he has, and cleared off pretty comfortably. So now you've got a bunch of cars running behind, and uh, again, they've got the same problem. So once you get through, as we go back to the race leader up at Le Coum, the race leading three cars, Mirko Bortolotti thinking, well, maybe my chances are going to come towards the end of this one hour and a bit stint. And then we go into the who can do the pit stops and turn the car around with the least amount of last time. So there, the car's coming through Roussel, down to Speaker's Corner, and it is still Porsche in the lead here, 17 laps done. Into Pouan they come then, so you've got there, number 63, that being Mirko Bortolotti running in that third place. Now he's hustling on in pursuit of uh, Raffaele Marciello. And Sandy Mitchell, having brought that Barwell Lamborghini into the pit lane, has bailed. There's been a driver change to Alex McDowell. Let's hear from Sandy. Sandy, obviously we saw you come in with a quite a severe puncture. What happened? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really too sure. Um, from an early look, it looks like it could have been some debris or some uh, some gravel that sort of punctured the tyre because of the way that it kind of tore apart. So, um, yeah, it's uh, really unlucky. It was a shame because we were doing uh, going along nicely there, leading the class and sort of knocking on the door of the top 20 overall. Um, the car is feeling good, so, yeah, we know we've got some good pace, so obviously lost a bit of time now, but we just need to try and have a clean rest of the race and uh, climb back through the field. Yeah, you've got time to claw it back. Yeah, that's the right. It's uh, the right time of the race for something like this to happen, so we'll give it a good go. Thanks a lot. Cheers. So Sandy Mitchell rated, but yes, 23 hours and 18 minutes. There's time to come back from that. There is, but it's always a disappointment. I mean, how that tyre got punctured, whether it was you know, dropping a wheel off and getting cut on the inside shoulder or whether it was something on the racetrack, we don't know. I mean, the, the key is that Sandy brought it back to the Barbell garage and he brought it back and he didn't do any additional damage to the back of the of the uh, Lamborghini. So a slow return to the pits has paid dividends to the team. We've done 18 laps and Klaus Backler is still clearing the lead, but this is the leading silver, Fabian Schiller in ninth place plunges down the hill once again as the cars then circulate with the uh, first hour away from being completed and the team manager of number 75 Mercedes, Kenny Harbel, car to the stewards immediately. Uh, I, I wonder why. Well, indeed. I wonder why. Yes. In the meantime, Antonio Foco has made progress up to eighth place, getting paired of Fabian Schiller and the 777 Mercedes. So that's the first glimpse we've seen of that. 71, the yellow Ferrari beginning to, and he's what, 1.7 seconds behind Ricardo Feller in the seventh position, 66 Audi. There's Schiller, and now he's got Max Book behind him. Uh, and then the second of the two Ferraris, Nicholas Nielsen. It's good to have Max Book in back in the, the, this level of GT racing. We've not really seen him for a while. It's good to have him back competitively. Yeah, exactly. So the team manager of Kenny Harbour's Mercedes Heading to the stewards, Fabian Schiller still leading silver and way up the road relative to Benji Goethe, who is second. And uh, there is a problem for the Audi. That's the car limping towards us, which is Ricardo Feller, I fear. We'll keep the, it's a puncture tyre, puncture for the Audi. Drama at Spa because the Audi with a puncture limps towards us. That looks to me to be Ricardo Feller's car. And that's the second punctured tyre in quick succession for a car. We've had one Lamborghini, now we've had an Audi. It's a different side, though. It was the left rear, now it's the right rear. Yes, again, whether it's debris in the racetrack or whether it's drivers are dropping that rear wheel off the kerb, as I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, if you drop a wheel off the kerb, here, for example, coming through uh, Paul Frere kerb, that'll be the left rear that'll get the potential damage. Other parts of the circuit, it's the right rear. So whatever the reasons are, now within the space of what, 10 minutes, two cars have had cut down rear tires, and uh, but everything on the racetrack looks 
There's no debris I can see in the racetrack, so I'm assuming it's maybe just being a little bit marginal on how you're using the exit of some of these corners. Well, Ricardo Fella limps on, but the tyre is gone. He's got to try and stay on the lead lap. And also in strife there is the Grove portion. Now, I think that's had a moment coming out of Blanchimont. It's it gone back onto the road. Can't see any marks on the racetrack, but that's certainly beyond the exit of Blanchimont. But we're regaining the racetrack, so it doesn't go into the pit lane to Stephen Grove. And the Earl Bamber Motorsport Porsche continues on its way. Maybe there will be a replay of that in a moment. We can then understand what happened to the Earl Bamber Porsche. So as the leaders now are on to lap number 20, uh, Stephen Grove off the road, 66 limping to the pit lane with that puncture. This might tell us what happened to the Porsche. Oh, it's well off. Well off in the background. It's gone wide and through the gravel, I think, and the momentum brought it out the other side. Yeah, I mean, how you get that far? I mean, you're almost halfway to Verbier when you get that far off the racetrack. I hope he kept his pass with him. He needed it to show to get back in, didn't he? So the leaders come down the hill. Klaus Backler, eight tenths of a second ahead of Raffaele Marchiello last time around. But interesting this, isn't it? How Marchiello has gone back in pursuit of the Porsche and shaken off Portolotti. Yes, Portolotti did close the gap up. That was, again, mainly traffic-related. But now, once they're running in clean air, you can see the pace of Backler, the pace of Marchiello has drawn those two cars ahead of the third-place uh, Lamborghini of Mirko Portolotti. Now, driver changes being anticipated as Ricardo Feller has come in, but the Singer Beer team for Albamba's uh, Porsche squad getting ready to do a driver change. And Ricardo Feller then gets a new set of boots, stays behind the wheel of the car. I'll put the fuel in it. Oh, well, trouble with the right rear. Oh, well, that's, that's no that's wonder the, because. The dead one, yeah. Goodness, that's the danger when you have a tyre that's gone down, the tyre shreds everything, and of course, it cannot bear, have a bearing on how the tyre will be removed. There's the 46, Nico Muller running and running in 24th position behind Nicolas Shelgar in the McLaren, but just ahead of Lucas Ower in the 57 Mercedes. Muller grabs a gear out of the court, Paul Frere. It wasn't flat through, I thought maybe even at this stage in the race, but of course, tyre performance is beginning to drop away bit by bit. There's just 47 minutes or so into this first hour of the stint. Now there's a tube, is that a drinks tube that's hanging down from the umbilical oh, that's mate. popped out of his helmet? I mean, if nothing else, it's distracting me in the commentary, but that's Nicola Muller. And there was another car, slow there, coming into the chicane. They all went charging past it, but I just wonder if somebody else has got a drama. Oh, it it is, it's, it's Bortolotti, isn't it, with a puncture? It is! Mirko Bortolotti then, almost within sight of the pit lane, has had a tyre go down so he can limp in quickly. That's lucky. You don't often get luck like that, if you can call it luck. But Bortolotti with a puncture. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. In this case, Mirko Bortolotti is both lucky and very good. But again, he needs to remember that not try and get back too quickly. Of course, there's pit lane speed limit, so that means he can get down to 50 kilometres per hour anyway. There, a battle coming up into and through. Dear me, got all very messy. Three cars into one inception, McLaren trying to dive, and then well, this is a battle going on in the bottom half of the top 30, or the top half of the bottom, whatever, the bottom top half of the, yes, 30-ish. Is it too easy to blame gravel for these punctures? Could it be the teams running a bit too much camp? I mean, one of the, te the teams are aware of, particularly in these very warm conditions. Another Audi now, the left rear. That's Hauser. That's Christopher Hauser. And he was, of course, up in that leading four. That's the fourth place car in strife. Uh, all I can imagine is, as we've gone through the race, that, that just the tyre temperatures are probably getting higher and higher. It may be another issue with track limits and just running the car. But suddenly we're seeing two of the leading cars in strife with rear tyres. It's not front tyres, it's rear tyres. So that always, for me, indicates that's either too much camber on the rear. Teams know they have a maximum amount they should run, recommended by Pirelli. But everybody is looking for the competitive advantage. And by running a little bit more camber, that can give you that little bit of advantage. But the penalty, and particularly in these very warm conditions we've got here this weekend at spa Frankenstrom, that can be a major contributing factor to a tyre just literally unable to... You know, it's it just the tyre has got nothing left and something fails, and it just means it's overheating on the inside shoulder and then the consequent uh, tyre failure. Twenty-one laps are done, lead gap six tenths of a second, and now the order shuffles because up to fourth comes Michael Christensen. He's gained effectively two places in the space of a lap and a bit. 
and they come then now down to the uh, chicane. That's Alessio Picariello, who is your pro-am leader. Goes right, goes left, and comes up towards the timing line once more. So interesting, isn't it? Some being really good at keeping out of trouble, but you know, you wouldn't label Christopher Hassel as somebody that hurls the car at the scenery, crashes over the curb. He knows how to win long races, and yet he's one that's got a puncture. I agree. I mean, likewise, Mirko Bortolotti, we didn't see him driving in any manner of form or whatever that would have said, well, he was abusing the track limits, he was running the curbs. So there you've got Loris Spinelli still hustling on in pursuit of Michele Beretta. And Jordan Pepper has made a bit of progress up to 22nd, but in part that's because others have had their dramas. This is Spinelli. Now, if he has a big, deep breath and really goes for it, let's see. No, the Lamborghini pulls away there. Yeah, he, he had to back on it, but he didn't want to get too close to the back of the Lamborghini. As a consequence, the gap has increased. Into Lecon comes Spinelli. So, yeah, in a straight line, he lost a little bit of ground at the bottom of the hill, but he didn't make it up again, going towards Another the car. Another car, but Martin again, left, rear. So, all of a sudden, in the space of this last segment of the first... So there is 23, that's Ross Gunn uh, limping on, as John Matty says, punctured tar, yet another one. So left, yep. rear, right rear, all of his at the rear of the cars. So we go for a good few laps without dramas, and then suddenly, bang, 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 they're all coming. Just watching the 46 coming through pool, the reason that the rear tyres are giving up rather than the front is because the attitude of a car in a corner is that the, the rear is always going to be further to the outside of the racetrack than the front. And consequently, if you do get a tyre against a, a sharp object or something might be on the racetrack, a bit of gravel, that's why the vulnerability at the rear is greater than that at the front. That's Lucas Auer that you're looking at, and he now leads the Gold Cup with the demise, for the moment, of Sandy Mitchell. That car taken over by Alex McDowell, incidentally. Ricardo Feller has fallen into last place as a legacy of his uh, puncture and has certainly dropped off the lead lap. I think he might have suffered more damage. You can see the amount of rubber that's on the ground already as the cars stream their way out of Blanchimont down towards the chicane. And now we're being told about Ross Gunn's problems as well. He's got to limp his way back to the pit road. So, yeah, these punctures are going to have a big, big effect on the overall order. A lot of the punctures appear to be happening in Sector 1. Mm. We're, we're picking them up at the end of Sector 1 or into Sector 2. So it must be either coming through Eau Rouge or into the Le Coupe complex. Now, Christopher Meese has just pitted. Conta Lapalainen has just pitted. And uh, that suggests that they are early but routine stops. Jack Aitken, good to have him back after last year. Let's hear from him in the pits. Jack, we're seeing puncture after puncture after puncture, including for your car. What's going on? Well, uh, I think everybody is suffering a little bit uh, since we had the, the track changes with more gravel on the circuit and uh, the cars are also lapping a few seconds or a little bit faster than they were last year, so the load is higher for the tyres. And uh, it's going to be a long race. I mean, everybody has to manage this, so um, yeah, it's not over yet. And it was all caused by debris on the circuit? I don't know, unfortunately. Uh, it looks like it's uh, shoulder failures for everybody, from what I saw on TV. And for me, that's not debris. That is uh, a failure on the... Well, they would say it's uh, too much track limits abuse and this kind of thing, um, but we're not sure. OK, thanks, Jack. So Jack Aitken, who, of course, was involved in that size of an accident last year. Five-second time penalty at the next pit stop for car 75, causing a collision with car 107. Five-second time penalty added at the next pit stop time for car 75, causing a collision with car 107. So here at Spa, we've got a time penalty be given to 75, uh, Kenny Harbel, and... Uh, the number 75 uh, Mercedes is being given a five second time penalty and its next pit stop for causing a collision. So uh, it's all happening. We've got punctures are plenty, penalties are coming. Now it feels like the Spa 24 hours because after a quiet first 40 minutes or so, it's all kicked off, Wattie. Yeah, it's coming towards the end of the first hour. The latter pits for the tower has done all the hard yards and it's probably coming up to the end of its natural life and it's more vulnerable and if you are at the very edge of we just heard Jack Aiken explain to us the pace of this race is very very fast indeed we've seen some I mean unbelievably quick laps still Mirko bought a lot he's got that face at fastest race lap to date set on lap three with the car had loads of fuel on board but lovely fresh Pirelli rubber number 14 there coming out just ahead of the race leaders wants to stay on the lead lap 
doesn't. Klaus Backler goes through, puts a lap on number 14 Lamborghini then that Consta Lapalainen brought in. And that car then gets between him and Marcello. That's brilliant news for the Porsche driver, isn't it? Because now he can build that lead. Yes, but I think uh, Lapalainen is aware that he was in the middle of a battle for the race lead. So he just steps aside, lets Raffaele Marcello, who's got the 32 out here. And that's an early stop for Kelvin van der Linde. It is, but it means they can get a new set of tyres on the car, and maybe people are coming in early now for a new set of tyres, concerned about tyre preservation. And I'm wondering, I assume that they are double stinting their drivers. We didn't catch if there was a driver change. Uh, I think it might be a double stint for Kelvin van der Linde. So you can see how quickly Raffaele Marcello was able to catch to the tail of Klaus Backler and the Porsche, but that's about as far as he's been able to do. He can't really get himself into a position where there's been a serious threat or challenge to, to the lead of this race. Number 14, Stuart White took over the Emil Frey Racing Lamborghini. Right, Marcello again, when he gets clear of the traffic, is able to get within a certain distance of that leading Porsche, but never then be able to jump ahead. No. And, and you can blame the balance of performance for that because the balance of performance has been such a successful formula. It's equalized the performance of all the manufacturers that are here. But the downside is that the, the cars are so evenly matched, it will take usually an external reason for a group of cars, these two lead cars, to find a way of pass one another. So there is Backler, the race leader. Marcello behind in second place. And as they come now into the hairpin, through turns the top two, that's the now lapped number 14 Stuart White uh, Lamborghini, the Emil Frey racing car, but he'll get that place back, the Silver Cup car, uh, when, of course, the leaders serve their pit stops. Tim Muller is leading the uh, Bronze Cup that we have, which effectively is what used to be the AMS, but now the Bronze Cup, and comes into Le Camp, number 20 Mercedes, then the SPS Automotive Performance car, running in 50th overall. And at really at this stage for a Bronze Cup car, they're not looking at overall victory, they're looking at winning their category. Tim Muller, the man behind Bugatti Shoes, he is uh, a shoe magnate and the Bugatti name uh, for footwear, one of his uh, many brands. Missed the driver's briefing the other day because he had a very important business meeting to go to. Got that out of the way, now can concentrate on being a racing driver in this Mercedes that is uh, shared with George Kurtz, the man behind, behind CrowdStrike, Valentin Pierberg, and Rima Jafali, the Saudi Arabian girl driving that car as well as the and Just driver. behind this group, you can see the 32 Audi Kelvin van der Linde did stay on board, so that pit stop has cost time. Kelvin van der Linde currently, uh, well, it was 30 30s where they end up. The timing of scoring is changing literally by the corner. So on board with Raffaele Marcello, out of Pujol, down into Fania. So the gap has been more or less within a second all the way through. We're now, what, 58 minutes and a bit into the first hour, and it'll not be many more laps before the two lead cars will make their first of many pit stops, they hope. Now we're hearing that WRT reduced their uh, camber by 10% pre-race. Some of the Lamborghini teams likewise. We're also being told that Kelvin van der Linde is being investigated for speeding in the pit lane. Audi number 32 possibly has sp sped in the pit lane, although to be fair, normally when an investigation comes up, well, they know exactly what they're investigating. It is being checked rather than is there any doubt. So Kelvin van der Linde, who's back on the track in 48th place, looks like he may be set for a penalty for speeding in the pit lane. I mean, this is where this race is won and lost, and you have got to not... I mean, I, I, I talked about setting your, your pit lane speed limiter at 48.5 or 48.8 kilometers per hour not at 49.9 because it's too close to that 50 kilometer barrier so that's a big setback for the 32 Audi of the WRT stable the one that of all their stable is the most likely one that we would consider to be the car that will take victory in the meantime Marcello still three quarters of a second behind Klaus Backler but further behind Lucas Stolz in third place four and a half seconds behind the second place Marcello there is the third place Mercedes. And behind, he's coming into shot, the Martini Porsche. And uh, we've now got the cars coming up to Le Camp. There is Lucas Stoltz on the back of Ross Gunn, who's lost a lap by having to make that pit stop. And into Le Camp goes Lucas Stoltz. Now then the BVT liveried AMG Team Get Speed entry. 
a solid first in that, and it is in the mix. We are nudging up to the end of the first hour, aren't we, come the end of this lap. So another raft of pit stops you can expect. We've got Altwe in, Chiergaard is in, Beretta is in, Spinelli is in, Pierre-Alexander Jean is in, and uh, there is the pit stop cycling through at uh, Sky Tempesta. So as the driver change goes through, you've got uh, out Loris Spinelli, that uh, is Eddie Cheever, yes. the crash helmet, who's got on board. Do you know how you can tell it's Eddie Cheever? Because it says Cheever. No, look at his eyebrows. That's Eddie Cheever. <laughs> so, door closes and the Lamborghini, uh, sorry, the uh, Mercedes about to be dropped down, ready to rejoin. So, the Mercedes drops down, that's going to blast away. It says Spit for Spinelli. It will change when it gets to the next timing loop and confirm cheap for Eddie Cheever. So the pit lane getting busy and there's the age-old debate, is it better to be in the top pits where it's flat or the endurance pits where it's on a slope? I think we'd prefer to be on the flat, wouldn't we? Normally in Spa there's always rain at some point in the weekend. I always want to be at the top pits yeah. because it's more or less level. The heritage pitch is on a quite a steep decline and if it rains the water runs down there like a river runs through it. Well, that, what a great movie that was. <laughs> Now, there they go, the race leaders, staying out for another lap. And as they break the beam, that's an hour completed. One hour, 33.828 seconds of racing we've done. And it is then number 54, Klaus Backler, leading the way from Raffaele Marciello. And Lucas Stoltz has come into the pit lane out of third place. Good call, I would say, to bring that number two Mercedes in now. Let these two battling for the lead do what they need to do, because they'll probably get one more lap at maybe two at maximum before... Their 65 minutes did probably there wouldn't be marginal, in fact, only one more lap. So they're more than likely both going to be coming in in tandem. While well, Lucas Stoltz has gotten slightly earlier, and uh, just depending on how good that pit stop is for the team, AMG team at Get Speed, we wait to see. But there, the team is waiting for WRT to come in. So Nico Muller and look at that. Who's that in the middle with the familiar yellow and blue helmet? It's Valley! So he is set to be thrown in at the deep end again, isn't he? Ready to go out in this second stint of the race. Just watching Muller as he on... The, the shoulder strap, you're allowed to loosen, but you're not allowed to undo the buckle until you come to a standstill. But he's only loosened the shoulder straps. Now, Valentino, he puts his drinks bottle down beside him. Muller gets out. Valentino climbs in. Luckily, Valentino's a very slender racing driver. There's not an ounce of... I can't even say the word fat because that's not the you can't call anybody fat these days. I'm glad about that. Uh, so the uh, whip it like Italian installed yes. behind the wheel. Yes, greyhound like. That's right. Yes. Or in his case, probably I think whip it is probably the right approach. <laughs> anyway, Nico Muller, he's out of the car. Valentino is in, and now look at uh, WRT. You can see. They're busy. Carl's coming in, Carl's going out, Carl's cycling through. That number two, Lucas Stoltz, Mercedes down the pit lane behind is 75. And the team manager of number 32 to the stewards. So the Calvin van der Linde Schalwitz, Dries van Thor Audi, I think is going to get done for speeding. Team manager going to the stewards right now. So as the uh, Mercedes blasts up the hill, we'll see in a moment where that car drops to after the first pit stop here at Spa. Pit stop cycle through here in the 24 hours of Spa. Number 31 Audi you're looking at that has just been brought in. This is the Lewis Proctor, Diego Menchaca, Finlay Hutchison car. And the top two down the pit lane together. Klaus Backler and Rafael Marciello at the end of 27 laps are in the pit lane. No surprise, of course, the Mercedes will be down in the heritage pit. So they've got all, all the way down the top pit lane, turn around inside the source, all the way down to the bottom. But, of course, when they then return to the circuit, they've only got the very short run before they cross the demarcation line and they can get on the throttle immediately. I always prefer the top garages, but I don't know which is the better way to go. Well, the pit stop for the Porsche already being undertaken. Uh, Raffaele Marcello has to drive down. Both the Iron Lynx cars in together, double stacked. Yeah, that's unusual to bring both your team cars in at the same time. So double stacked, as you can see, and that uh, I wonder who will gain or lose out of this. So driver changes taking place on both those cars. Fuoco out of them, Nielsen out as well. So, Fuoco runs clear to the garage. Nielsen does the same. Oh, don't slam that door. <laughs> <laughs> it's an expensive bit of kit, that. 
don't slam that door is the opposite of Larry Grayson, isn't it? Number two yes. then goes through. So Lucas Stoltz will stay behind the wheel of that car. Uh, that's Mark Yellow's Mercedes. It nicked handy, by the way, from the back of the grid. We've not really we might have another look at that in the second hour of the race and just look at the progress. Jordan Pepper uh, we did look at and he wasn't making stellar progress. Nick Tandy has, has done what he can do in the first hour, but uh, the KCMG Porsche worth a look when we get back to the race order because right now it's all a shuffling in the pit lane. Some of the teams cycle through drivers, don't they? Single stint, single stint, single stint, give everybody a go, then think about doubling up. That's the first car of those that have made a stop. Well, it's the first car at the moment, but what we need to know is if anyone's going to pop out of the pit lane ahead of it, because it's got a long, long way to go down before it comes to the end of the pits. And there, look, is the number 54 Porsche as it comes towards the end of the pit lane and will just, I think, keep the lead. But it's going to be close because it takes a while for it to get up to speed. There in the background is the pink Mercedes, but yet not on the racetrack is Cobb Ledegar. So there is 54, and it will be ahead, but only just. Yeah, but Ledegar is going to have three or 22 cars coming on. In fact, one of them happens to be the 88 Mercedes. As, no, it's not. So, let, so the Mercedes, oh, surely, surely that's not the number 88 that's got self. It got wrong-footed. It did. It was. It got wrong-footed. And that's like that Lucas talks to get ahead of it. So Marcello has stayed behind the wheel of the Mercedes. Come Ledegar is into the Porsche. So you've got a fresh driver for the lead car going up against the two Mercedes with a driver that knows what the cars are all about. And Marcello is deep into Brussels, but then he cuts back and gets the apex for the second part of the corner there. So as the leaders go through, dropped back onto terra firma number 47. Porsche, that is blasting back down the pit lane. Uh, the KCMG car, Nick Tandy brought it in, and Nick Tandy is going to stay behind the wheel according to timing and scoring. Blasts up the hill, goes out of the pit lane. So Nick Tandy, who's won this race in the past, of course, two years ago in the Rover Racing Porsche. Last year, when we bumped into him at the airport on the way home, he said, I'm not doing the Spa 24 again, and yet here he is, and as committed as ever. Well, we all say that, don't we, David? <laughs> well, I've heard more than one person say it. I, I never say it, John. But Nick Tandy had a choice, he reckons. It was either the Spa 24 hours or Knock Hill for Carrera Cup GB, and he thought Spa was, was the, oh, the preferable well, option. Well, there are a few <laughs> cars and splitters from our good friends up north of the border on that one. <laughs> It means he missed out on a night at uh, Cowden B for Lock Gaddy for stock cars as well, which was where he came from, of course, over racing. Uh, right, so back to the plot, Tandy down the hill. But again, that gained places in the course of the first hour. It's gained more on the pit stops. It will gain more perhaps in the next in, depending on any other driver changes in the Pro Am cars. And 95, the Nicky Team Aston Martin is being looked at for speeding in the pit lane. Oh dear. So there is Nick Tandy showing 31st position. But that is uh, apparently, I think we need to update it, it, it on that. Because it's showing 18th, in fact, on timing and scoring. But the message on screen was incorrect. It was probably a lap out of date. Yeah, because, of course, the order now is, is shuffled because of that last round of pit stops. Now, new race leader. It is Lucas Stoltz ahead of Kerm Ledegar. And Ledegar is under attack from Rafael Marcello. So it's change and change again, isn't it? Remember, Stoltz has the advantage of knowing the car and the track. Ledegar, fresh into it. But that's uh, Mercedes, third. Well, fourth for much of, but then third in the first stint, suddenly is the leader. Lucas Stoltz has got ahead of the Porsche. For the first time, the Porsche is not leading the race. No. And it looks as if Raffaele Marcello, oh, come let go, gets it all too wide on the exit of Lake Coombe. Not the ideal circumstance at all when you're under pressure in your opening laps. And, of course, Lucas Stoltz and Raffaele Marcello have been behind the wheel of their car for that first hour. They know where the racetrack is. They know what their car is doing. So Stoltz then, race leader, makes his way once more down the hill with there the chasing Porsche, Kerb Lenegar, trying to sort of regroup here, trying to fend off Marcello, who's way wide up the curve there, having a good go. There we go, here's the overtake. So Lenegar goes one way and Lucas Stoltz makes the undercut. This is the key, get yourself positioned, gets up alongside the Porsche, gets the better drive. Now down the hill, who's going to be brave? Wow, not an awful lot pick and choose, but the fractional advantage towards Lucas Stoltz and there was a little bit of contact from Lenegar. Oh, I don't like any of that. I think I don't think that was the fault of Lucas Stoltz. I think Cum Lenegar got himself a little bit too far wide. He could have backed out of that. He didn't need to go as wide and the run down into into late into 
Oh, Rouge and uh, then Radion. Well, Cole Redegar now not only has lost the lead, he's in danger of losing second place, but there's much more urgency in the way the cars are being driven now. Oh, they're in this second stint, so the race is coming alive very definitely. Redegar deep into the chicane. Marcello up the kerb there in his game on for second place as Marcello tries to get the drive out of the corner. Down to La Source, Porsche versus Mercedes. They're absolutely together, but Redegar just hangs on ahead. Into the hairpin. Turn through the corner. There's the Porsche. Stays ahead, but only just. Yeah, but again, the momentum has gone towards Mercedes. This time, it's a little bit of a more even match as they run down the hill. But look at the pace that Raffaele Marcello has. He's going to take that second position away from Kim Ledegar. Actually, Ledegar needs just to settle down, calm down. He was forced to run very, very hard, having not driven this car since last night. Now he's trying to come back on Marcello. He gets a better run onto Camel straight, but Marcello's on the inside as they come up the hill. Oh, oh, very, very aggressive from Ladegar, but Marcello holds his ground. Ladegar's got a back out. He has indeed, but he served intent there, didn't he? Don't mess with me. So as Klaus Backler watches what's going on, and right now the car that rather dominated the first hour down in third place, the question mark is going to be whether now that he has dropped back, Ledegar starts to lose pace and whether the Mercedes is now are going to come into their own. Now, just thinking about this, Stoltz is slightly further into a stint, isn't he, uh, by about a lap. Uh, let's hear from Klaus Backler then. He really did a good job in that first stint. Let's go to him. Klaus, quite difficult for you to watch there after your stint, having held the lead and now come obviously struggling. I mean, I would not say uh, we are struggling. Uh, in the end, uh, Marcello has the second stint. Tom is uh, first time in the car. Uh, I think everything is uh, OK. Uh, it's still a very long race. Uh, the most important is that we stay out uh, of any troubles and that we don't get damaged. So, for example, this uh, downhill to Rouge, um, it's not the best what you want to see uh, when you go out of the car. Uh, but in the end, uh, luckily, the car is still OK. So. All good. And looking there at the clip that we can see, it looked like there was a little bit of contact between him and the, the Mercedes. Yeah. I mean, it's still early in the race. As I said, uh, luckily nothing happened, but uh, also this uh, kind of things uh, can end up really bad. And uh, if you have this in a little bit more than one hour, we don't like it. Thank you very much. Thank you. You just heard the race director say that there's a five-second uh, penalty to go to number 32, Kelvin van der Linde, for speeding in the pit lane. I, I tell you what, that's a result. That is a result for the 32 ID. Five seconds added to your pit stop. I'll take that every and any day of the week. Race leaders then down into La Source. There is 54, Kerm Redegar makes his way out of the hairpin now. Still trying to get back on the terms with Marciello. 30 laps are done at Spa. Lucas Stoltz leads the way. Raffaele Marcello is second. It's a Mercedes 1 2. And here, Comrade Gar third in the car that dominated the first hour. Now you're riding on board with Eddie Cheever, the American Italian, and he is currently in 26. That Mercedes ahead is Jens Liebhauser, and that battle is for the lead of the Gold Cup as Valentino Rossi goes deep into the chicane, gets himself in a little bit of strife with cars attacking him left and right and centre. Yeah, he just overran under brakes into the chicane, and as a consequence, the Ferrari slipped through. There's an, an Audi coming up behind. You can see now three abreast as they come up into La Source. So the Porsche and the Audi, well, they all gave one another space, which is at this stage of the race, the sensible thing to do. So the lead of the Gold Cup is 57. Jens Liebhauser, this is Eddie Cheever on his tail, looking to try to fight back if he can, but right now, with so much of the race to go, it's staying in touch. This is the second place car, then this is Cheever, that's Liebhauser ahead in the Windward Racing car that Lucas Auer started, and Cheever is brave through a Rouge and up Radio. Yeah, he got the momentum, he's got a little bit more speed over the top of Radio and trying to run down the BMW on the run up the Camel straight. You know, gained initially on the uh, early part of the straight, but nothing more at the tail end, so he's got to... He put the nose of the car into the mirrors of the BM, but nothing of any benefit to him, so he's got pressure behind him, so he needs to be thinking and be careful, because Nicholas Schuller in the 99 uh, attempt to ID is all over the back of Eddie Cheever, and again, behind that, you've got uh, Verhagen in the number 50 young BMW driver car.
Now look at this, Chiva better through turn nine, tries to commit to a gap on the inside going down towards Pouin, evenly matched cars, but through on the inside dives Chiva, that was brave stuff and it's worked for him. Yeah, it's a good move and that, and Lieberhausen may be, may be vulnerable now to the uh, Nicholas Schuller and uh, Verhagen because he stepped out of the way, look you can see they're already trying to get up on the inside of the Mercedes, and again the BMW sitting hovering, just waiting to see whether those two cars will get a little bit too close for comfort. The BMW looks to be the marginally quicker of the three cars in this group we're looking at currently. So through they turn. And Verhagen right there on the tail. So that's the number 50 BMW because it celebrates 50 years of the BMW M brand. It's the so-called junior team. Max Hesse, Neil Verhagen and Dan Harper, former Carrera Cup GB driver. Look at that. Nose to tail. Verhagen right on the tail of the Audi. Looks to the inside. Can't do it. No, I wouldn't think that's a good idea to try and knock the inside of a car running at this pace. So, up the inside. So, there is. Oh, the Audi slips through, and that was timely. Timely. Now, Luca Schultz, four seconds to the good. And the overall race leader, Amber Hagen makes his move up on the inside. So Jens Liebhauser here falling back. He's lost that class lead, as we saw, to Eddie Cheever. And in fairness, Jens Liebhauser is not that experienced a racer, certainly not at this level. And so his pace doesn't quite reflect those around him. He's dropping back. As here, Valentino Rossi under attack. Yeah, and he was using a lot of the inside of the curb at Radio, trying to get the maximum drive possible up through that sequence of corners, but just didn't have the pace and finds himself uh, being overtaken. And as they come into Lake Coombe, now, as we ride on board with Valentino Rossi, let's hear from Loris Spinelli. He, he had a very uh, busy first stint. His car's just taken over the Gold Cup lead. Loris is with Amanda Music. Loris, your car just took over the lead in gold. You started on track 47th in your stint. What did you find in this track that allowed you to be so successful? Yeah, I mean, uh, really good stint. Uh, Funny time, the, the first part, I mean, uh, the, the car was uh, so strong. We, we knew this from yesterday, a bit unlucky yesterday do, during the quali. But uh, it's OK. Uh, we are running in P2. I'm so happy, but uh, we are just at the beginning. Now it's uh, at the time of the car, so let's see, and uh, we keep pushing until then. seen some uh, left rear tire issues. Do you think that'll be a concern with the Mercedes? Yeah, I mean, uh, yesterday we worked a lot for the base. So riding on board then with the Mercedes, and right now Chief has got the road to himself. You don't get this very often at Spa. No, you don't, and uh, that's a nice situation to find yourself in because before long you will be back in a, in a battle of cars going on ahead of you. But one driver who's made progress, if you're a McLaren fan, the Team 38, Jojo McLaren, Mervyn Kirchhoff from behind the wheel, he's managed to find a way around Stuart White and his Lamborghini, so up into 15th place, lead McLaren. Now there's the Rothko, Benji Goethe driven Audi, Marvin Kirchhofer behind. This is a good little battle going on now for 14th and 15th places. Goethe ahead of Kirchhofer, Audi ahead of McLaren, although Marvin Kirchhofer makes his move in the Jota car to the inside line, goes through both of those drivers in their second stints. Yeah, Kirchhofer shows you how to do it, got the run, got the position, and Benjamin Goethe just realised he didn't have anything left to defend and wisely allowed the McLaren to go through because if you start getting uber, uber aggressive, then that's when things can happen and you don't want to start doing that. No, OK, it was the last lap after 23 hours and 40 or 55 minutes, a different deal, but we're only, what, into the second hour by an hour? We're fifth, what, an hour and what, 15, 20 minutes into this yeah. race. And Jana tells us from the pit lane that one or two of the team's meteo data is saying light rain within about 10 minutes. So what? we haven't been told about any rain at all, but there's the thought, the threat of light rain coming in about 10 minutes, and that's going to liven things up, if that's true, and if it does well, come to pass. I mean, so far this weekend, there's been absolutely clear skies, whichever way you look at it. On a track that's not seen rain, if it does fall heavily, it'll be a skating rink initially until the wet weather tyre cut through and, and form their own line. Well, we'll wait and see whether it uh, pans out. It's not as, as sunny as it was. It's overcast. It's quite a pleasant, cool temperature. 
and the cars currently work lap number 34 here as battles rage on all the way down the field of the classes there the iron links ferrari up on the inside to just put a lap on the mercedes so that was Miguel Molina going Car through, picking up the place. Five second time penalty to be added to the next pit stop time for speeding in the pit lane. 95 Nicky Teams Aston then, five second uh, penalty for speeding in the pit lane. So again, it's not good, but it could be a lot worse. And we just see Nicky Team in the Ferrari making his way around Max Book. Or was that? I don't know, anyway, anyway, the, the 95 Aston Martin. Again, a five second time addition to your pit stop and I'm glad to see that these penalties are actually in relative terms something you can handle you can take a five yeah. second pit if you're going to have to do a drive-through penalty in effect it would destroy your entire remaining 23 and a half hours and you can do it as you've been hearing at your next pit stop so you don't have to make a separate one and therefore lose lots of time coming down the pit road there is the bronze leader Valentin Pierberg he's taking the car over from Tim Muller so single stinting getting everybody a, a, a chance to drive the car the early part of the race. So the background is that the Mercedes that was in contact with the Bentley early on. Drama here coming into campus. 57 Jens Liebhauser being roughed up by the Audi. Yeah, that was a bit a bit obvious. Yeah. And the Audi does go through on the inside, just trying to identify which Audi that was. It depends if it was a pro car or not, because on a, a, a silver, or certainly on a, a bronze, you would not want to be seen to do that. Uh, up into the final two corners. So it was the Ledegar, some nine seconds behind the leading Mercedes. Yeah, and this is what I was asking about a few laps ago, you know, having dropped off the back of, of having lost the lead and then losing second would he fade away and, and fade he has to a degree in fact kevin estra i think may well have overtaken come just i thought i saw that car directly ahead but anyway timing and scoring still shows letter in third and estra in fourth the gap had been 1.2 seconds so here we go timing and scoring is updating so is it estra now in third place as i well it's still showing letter but uh, the gap is only half a second to third to fourth So Stoltz leads Marcello. There is Luca Stoltz. We'll run through the order in a moment as the Mercedes powers towards us on this lap number 35. Luca Stoltz leads here at Spa, and it is a Mercedes 1-2 because there is the second place car, Raffaele Marcello. The gap was five and a half seconds over the line. Then third is the green-nosed Porsche of Kerm Ledegar. You'll see it just in the background. Uh, that's Marcello going into Lecom. Fourth is now Kevin Estra, up into fifth, Davide Rigon. And sixth, still going great guns, the silver leader, that is Fabian Schiller. So there's the second-placed car, Raffaele Marcello. That Mercedes is a lap back in 52nd, Jeff Kingsley. There's Kerm Ledegar, and right on his tail now is Kevin Astra. Yeah, it was half a second when they came across start-finish line. The Kevin Astra, as close as you could get to the sister, not the sister car, or sister team, but the sister in terms of other things, identical cars, whether the Porsche or like other teams have looked at the cameras, especially at the rear, whether they're taken a small de degree, maybe half a degree out of those rear wheels to stand them up more upright, to give a more even tire temperature spread across those rear tires, bearing in mind the conditions that we've been focusing on all through the weekend and a, a very warm start to this 24 hours at Spa. So now the car that dominated R1 has dropped back, a car that was rather anonymous in R1 is catching up, so the dare I say this, the dynamic between the Porsches, the dynamic motorsport and the GPX cars is shifting. So one is coming good, one is dropping back a little bit. And uh, we know what a gun Kevin Estra is. If anybody can make that car fly, it is him. Uh, we've not really seen too much of it because it has been having a quiet start. But for my money, it's one of the great liveries, the Martini colour scheme. And on that 911, it just works beautifully. And I think the fans agree because the, the range of merchandise that the team has brought has been selling like hot cakes. Yes, I mean, I remember the 917 Porsche in 1970 in that livery and I had a significant 24-hour victory a little bit further west of where we are this weekend at spa Francorchamps. So the Porsches go through together, Mercedes 1-2, and then just under seven seconds back, Ledegar versus Estra. So 2-2-1. Why is it 2-2-1? Because the initial silver 
Porsche 917 uh, was number 21. And uh, so you've got a second, 21. And that's where the team got the number of 221 from. Yeah. Uh, Kom Ledegar appears to have settled down. He certainly was unsettled in his opening three or four laps when he was under pressure from Marcello and Lucas Stoltz. Now he's driven himself in. He's, he's got his confidence, if you wish, back to the level that would normally be expected at. But never, never feel comfortable with Kevin Estro directly behind you because Kevin, they don't call him Revan Kevin for nothing. He's a lovely bloke as well. Very fast, very spectacular. Just every so often he has one of those moments and oversteps the line, but uh, he's just a joy to watch and takes no prisoners. You mean a rush of blood to the throttle food? Something like that, yes. We have seen it occasionally in the past, Le Mans qualifying last year as a recent example, but 99% of the time he's fast and utterly dependable. He's another driver that's going to make his uh, Porsche prototype bow next year with the new programme that Porsche has, but uh, let's hope we don't lose him from GT racing because he comes through poor there, Ledegar getting away just a little bit, but Kevin Estra then accelerates down towards the pith path. Remember, he and Michael Christensen and Ricard Leitz, who drive for Porsche in the World Endurance Championship, have had a chance to race here with these gravel traps and the effect they have earlier on in the season, albeit on a different tyre. Yes. Uh, and that makes a considerable amount of difference because the character of, of the respective tyre manufacturers is quite significant but Kevin Estra going through Pujo and losing that little that's purely the aerodynamic wash coming off the back of Cum Ledegar's car and that's what causes the front of Kevin Estra's car to lose that little bit of bite in the front so he, he can't attack and of course that means as he comes down to Fania that right left is that little bit too far behind to think about making a lunge up the inside down through the gears down 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 to first Gets right back onto the tail there of the green Porsche. Kerm Ledegar at the wheel of it as the cars then now accelerate up over the timing line. And Ledegar, in a way, could just be advised to let him go. And I think he does there. Estra around the outside again, down to first gear into the headpin at La Source. And through he has gone because Ledegar hasn't got the pace to match him. He hasn't got the pace to go after the Mercedes. But they've got Davide Rigo in fifth place hovering around the back of these two Porsches. So maybe that was a, a strategic Porsche team call, although these are operating as two different teams, they're all part of the Porsche family, but they don't want to allow Davide Rigo in that fifth place, number 71 Ferrari, any opportunity to make it a, a, a trio of cars battling over that third position. So whether it was a call or whether it was just come let a guard deciding, look, Kevin Estra, I think you're quicker than me at the minute. I'm going to let you go, and I will be your shotgun, and I'll ride shotgun to keep Davini Riga away from you now that you've got that third position. Well, it could be a good plan. Davini Riga, after his sizable accident here last year, that was the same one that uh, involved... I think Kevin Estra involved in it, was me as well. Yes, but was. also, uh, of course, Jack Aitken. It eliminated three or four top cars early on in the race. Davini Riga has uh, bounced back as quick as ever. But yeah, look, Esther having cleared Ledegar is getting away. No question about that. And now as they come into Pouin, that mini Rigon starting to hunt down the green Porsche, the bright yellow Iron Lynx Ferrari. Iron Lynx last year's winning team and that dramatic finish. And coming into Piff Path now. So Ledegar is coming under attack from number 71, the Ferrari there behind. Yeah, and you're just seeing the last lap times between Cum Ledegar and the Ferrari. Clearly, the Ferrari quicker with these two cars. So there is Kevin Estra. He powers his way out of the court, Paul Frey. And this is the battle for now fourth place because Ledegar is certainly under attack from Davide Rigon. And as they come in a Blanchimont Porsche versus Ferrari, just a quick word about Valentino Rossi. He's 24th. And, of course, he's on the lead lap, and it's going pretty well for him at the moment. He's got Nick Tandy behind him. And number 32, Audi, is also just worth touching on because he's got that penalty to serve at the next stop. But Calvin van der Linde is behind Davide Rigon. He pitted a bit early, and, yes, he's got five seconds to, to drop in the pits, but uh, van der Linde running in the top six, that's not bad because the car was a long way back in the first hour. Yes, uh, but he's, what, some 11 and a bit seconds behind Davide Rigon. I think the Ferrari... Had, to me, clearly, is the quicker of these two cars. It's just a matter of not if, but when. The Ferrari will find a way around the uh, number 321 Porsche. I was thinking about the 54 Porsche with Cum Ledegar. 
the dynamic motorsport so can Rigo get a good run through certainly he's closed onto the tail of the Porsche at the exit of, Re of Radion now it'll be a matter of whether Comletegar is going to go combative and defending his position or can Rigo shoot down the inside under brakes I thought he might have had a go but he decided the wiser of it but clearly that was the nearest that the Ferrari has gotten to the tail of the 54 Porsche so far in this battle for fourth position well, Estra has absolutely scarpered up the road, hasn't he, now in third place. He's well clear of Lenegar, who's got to make this car as wide as he possibly can do now to keep uh, Rigon at bay. So the Iron Lynx Ferrari turns through out of Bruxelles. This is down to the Jackie Eats corner, turn nine. And Stolt still leads the way from Marchiello, although last time Raphael is slightly quicker, and that is 87, which is the Casper Stevenson car, isn't it? Prime rear, I suspect, or maybe not. Oh, it should have a puncture because it's a bit lumpy, but yes. it does look like it's got a flat suspension There's issue. Something, something. I mean, certainly the car was coming in slowly. Reason for that, we initially thought it might have been a, a tyre again, uh, but maybe there was something more mechanical that will mean the car's got to be a longer stay, push it back into the garage and let more than the two mandatory people in the pit lane work on the car. All will be revealed then as you go back on board with David Rigon. He is in fifth, let a car ahead. Out of the core, Paul Frere. This is lap number 38 then with about an hour and a half of the race now completed. So it's Mercedes 1 and 2, Porsche 3, Porsche 4, Ferrari 5, Audi 6 here at Spa. We're watching this battle now for fourth and fifth places. Com Lenegar in the Porsche that led the first hour of the race has fallen back into fourth place and he's under real attack from Davini Rigon's Ferrari. Yeah, and Rigon was a lot neater on the entry into the chicane. Come let it go around slightly wider, compromises his exit. That should have given a marginal advantage to the Ferrari in the run up into the source. Rigo again shows the nose of the Ferrari, but nowhere near close enough now. Can he get the drive off? Remember the Porsche, the engine hangs out behind the rear axle, so its traction is always going to be very strong. Whereas the Ferrari is a true mid engine GT car. So Lenegar consolidates down the hill. But where are we going to be through? Oh, Rouge and over the top of Radio. Has the Ferrari got the pace? to close the Porsche down, now getting onto the Camel straight. Let's see, the top speed of anybody up through Radion is Ben Goethe's Audi, 245 kilometers an hour, 244 from Raffaele Marchiello, 243 from Nick Tandy, and Rigon's car, when Antonio Fuoco drove it at that point, 243 kilometers an hour. But Com Ledegar able to keep him at bay, even if he's not able to get away from the Ferrari. I think it's the other way around. If the Ferrari did get ahead of the 54 Porsche, it would just vanish. Oh, you look at this the long way, the rude way around the outside of Bruxelles. But he, well, cleverly, Comletegar closed down the run into Jackie Eek's curve by denying Rigon the opportunity. But it shows his. I mean, Rigon's probably getting a bit, let's say, impatient. Oh. oh, wow, what's happened to this? That's a big impact. And uh, that's the Nicholas Bart Gilles Magnus Audi, which I think he says Argazzo now at the wheel of it. It is, and Cesar Gazzo has gone off the road, presumably coming out of Blanchimont. He's done damage to the front of the car. Uh, he's got the Santa Dot Junior team Audi, in, or what's left of it, into the pit lane. Damage, sizable damage on the left front, and here he goes. And around he sideways. Goes. Yeah, it was Blanchimont. Wait for the bang. Yes, indeed. Oh, I mean, that's a heavy impact on the left front. And uh, the bodywork, apart from anything else, being shredded. And the left front tire, I mean, that's a heavy impact and uh, whether there's just bodywork damage, but I suspect there'd be significant front suspension damage, and of course the concern would be an impact of that weight is the damage more than just the suspension does it go into the suspension locating point, which then ultimately could lead to the car's retirement. Well, the fact that Cesar Gazza carried on and drove it into the pit lane after that whack into the wall is pretty impressive, because that was a, a heavy oh, hit. They build them strong in Germany. <laughs> That's well, an Ingolstadt, I think it is, where yes. they're actually manufactured. But a lot of that impact through the driver. You saw the car lift off the road as there. Over the line go Ledegar and Rigon and Davidi Rigon possibly close enough to have a dive now. Yeah, but again, cut off cleverly at the last moment by Con Ledegar. So Rigon on the outside and the advantage goes. And look at the way Ledegar just allows his car to drift out to the exit of the corner and forcing Rigon to back out of it and lose the momentum as they go down the hill. Yet again, coming into Oruz, the compression. Here it is now, then up the hill. Car gets light here across. Ready up, but look how close the Ferrari is to the tail of the Porsche. Surely this is going to be the best chance that Davide Rigo is going to have. 
Let's ride with him. Let's wait to see whether he darts up the inside now as they make that run up towards Lecott. He's just not quite close enough at the end of the Campbell straight. Porsche just got enough performance at the straight. Doesn't have it necessarily through radio, but at the end of the straight, you've got an extra kilometre or two miles, or a kilometre or two, maybe one mile per hour gain over the Ferrari. And David Regan did all the hard yards to get into position, but didn't have enough left in the tank at the end of the straight. So as they round Bruxelles now, drop down the hill once more into turn nine. Rigon is getting a bit frustrated, I suspect, here, because he knows he's got the pace and must be thinking what he could do were he to be able to clear that Porsche. Down they come now through Pouan. This is lap number 40, two seconds between the top two Mercedes, by the way. And what this battle right now for fourth position is doing is inviting Kevin van der Linde in sixth place to get closer. He's six and a half seconds right now behind the Ferrari, but the longer Rigo stays behind the tail of Kum Ledegar, the more gain that will give the 32 Audi of Kelvin van der Linde. I mean, Lind van der Linde's last lap was at 20.8 against these two cars. Davidi Rigo last lap and Kum Ledegar was two minutes 22. So all of a sudden the battle is on, not just between these two cars, but where is van der Linde? He'll be coming very soon into picture. Well, that is Kevin Estra. Now, his lap times are quicker than the Mercedes ahead, so this car is very definitely now coming into the mix. They had a good, solid first stint, kept out of trouble, brought back data, and now Kevin Estra has been unleashed, hasn't he, to see whether he can get that car closer to the Mercedes, and he is doing as still Ledegar fends off the Ferrari. And for the first time, I've seen Kelvin, Kelvin van der Linde in sixth place, exiting Longchamp, and these two cars are still under braking, coming into the turn, into the chicane, turn 18 and 19. Down towards La Source then, Porsche versus Ferrari. And through on the inside goes Davidi Rigon, he's done it then, diving into La Source. So he's done it, he's gone up into fourth place. Lenegar tries to fight back then as they come out of the corner. And side by side down the hill, Porsche goes back ahead. And yes, Lenegar just gets the job done and retakes the place at Oruz. That was brave stuff. Yeah, good racing between two good top level professional GT3 drivers. So. And Davide Rigo finally, finally find a way past the Porsche, but unfortunately, he compromised himself on the exit of La Source, which gave Kum Ledegar the benefit, the opportunity to back into fourth position. So through Le Con they come, and as the field accelerates, they're down to Bruxelles. Good, good racecraft, that by Kum Ledegar. And Davide Rigo must have thought he got it nailed, but then the Porsche, which has got good grunt, was able to go back through. This is where the beauty of GT3 and the balance of performance works. The car's so evenly matched. It's downhill once more. Porsche fends off Ferrari. And I keep referring back to Kelvin van der Linde. He's now down to 4.9 seconds behind this batting. There is the Audi just coming into view through the Jackie Eakes curve. He is still running quicker per lap than these two cars running in fourth and fifth position. Out of Pouan. They swing then through that fast left. And as uh, David Rigon comes into the piff path, he will go right. But if you run a little bit wide, you find it all dirty, then he will go left. And down now towards the right-hander of campus, they turn through the right-hander. And Porsche, for the moment, stays ahead. Now, let's go to the pit lane. French interview, we'll have a synopsis at the end for our international audience. Nigel Bailly, uh, ce premier relais, vous avez pris le départ de ces 24 heures, ce premier relais, comment ça s'est uh, passé Vous avez été quelque peu secoué. Effectivement, donc un très bon départ, j'étais directement dans le rythme, je me suis, je me suis senti très bien dans la voiture, j'étais régulier en 2.25, donc c'est ce qui m'avait été communiqué au départ. Et puis ben voilà, forcément, il y a eu une touchette avec un concurrent, qui n'est pas de ma faute puisque l'autre concurrent a été pénalisé. Et donc euh, voilà, mais c'est un fait de course, c'est comme ça. Maintenant, on essaie de remonter du mot qu'on peut. Je pensais qu'à un moment donné, on allait être euh, bloqué dans, dans le bac à gravier, qu'il allait y avoir une grue qui allait nous sortir de là. Heureusement, les commissaires euh, ont fait leur travail et je leur remercie grandement. Merci beaucoup, Nigel. Nigel Bailly, so uh, the first uh, thing that was uh, yeah, quite okay for the, for the beginning, then there was this incident with another car who has been penalized, and uh, he was uh, very we are lucky because the marshals have been able to push him out of the uh, gravel bed. Now uh, the objective is to uh, moving in front of the classmen. Double ranking. Anthony Bravo, thank you for that. Good to hear from Nigel Bay, and uh, good that the car's still in the race. I was rather fearful for it as the cars then now steam their way. Look at this, John, they're tripping over themselves. I mean, you, you get bunches of cars all of a sudden just find themselves in a bunch, and that's what we've got right now, and it's got to be careful. Those are trying to move up the inside. The car on the outside may not be looking on that inside mirror, so potential danger 
moments. And about six, seven cars all back. Some are going to be lapped, some are going to be overtaken on position only. But again, Davide Rigo having momentarily seen clear air ahead of the Porsche, but he's again having to back out of it. Come the Edgar is that has the high ground as they go into the Jackie Eakes curve. Now down the hill towards Pujol. Again, this is where the aero at wash from the Porsche probably is going to harm the front of the Ferrari. Watch and see whether the gap extends as they come through the corner and get to the exit. So Rigo having to wait, wait, wait. OK, it's maybe only a very small amount of distance, but it's always working to the advantage of the Porsche. Uh, Rigon is further frustrated as Lucas Stoltz, clear of traffic, has upped his pace a little bit. And Kelvin van der Linde behind, just under four seconds, still chipping away, still trying to close in the Audi. So, I mean, it's going to be a real frustration for David Rigo. He's done what he can do. As we... Neil Verhagen, the fastest man through uh, Blanchimont, which is this corner that they're approaching now, 258 kilometres an hour. It's quite impressive stuff, that. Yeah, I mean, that's a little short of 160 miles per mm. hour. And there, look, the Porsche on this part of the circuit just gaps the Ferrari by another couple of lengths. So down to the chicane they come, and this is bringing them to the end now of lap number 42 with Ledegar still ahead of Rigon. It's Mercedes, Mercedes, Porsche, Porsche, Ferrari, Audi in the Total Energies. 24 hours of Spa, because here, as the leaders have down 42 laps, you're looking at the fight for fourth place, where Kum Ledegar is ahead of Davide Rigon in the yellow Ferrari. But look at this train of cars pouring out of the chicane. Well, it's just, I mean, it, it, it'll, it'll dissipate over the next three or four laps, and then they'll all be spaced out all over the racetrack once again. And then in another hour or so, we'll have another group of eight, nine, ten cars, all scratching and scrapping. There's a force that is that the 51 or the 71? 71 Ferrari in the middle of all that. 51. 51. That's the white one, yeah. That's the now Miguel Molina car. You've got Christopher Meese ahead. He's on the back of Arthur Rougier. Behind him there is Nicky Team and Maxi Book and Julian Andlauer and Marvin Kirchhofer. So Kirchhofer is fighter. Well, he's up to 14th from 15th. Benjamin Goethe, who he overtook earlier. Jordan Pepper in the number six, which had to start from 30th position up to 16th position. The car that had pole position until this time were disallowed. And there, look, an effort made. Molina under attack from the Aston Martin. So Nicky team trying to find a way through. Couldn't quite do it. And that now leaves him prey to Maxi Book, who tries to dive to the inside. And right there behind the pair of them, look, number 63, Lamborghini getting back into the mix after its earlier puncture. That's Albert Costa, but he's on a different lap. A very nearly contact between the two of them. Albert Costa is only 51st off the lead lap with that puncture. Yeah, but he's a racer. Oh, side by side. Porsche needs to get ahead of Costa because this is costing him time. Albert Costa, in reality, should allow these group of cars that are racing for much higher positions, allow them the space to go through. But, well, he says, if, I'm, if you're not quick enough to pass me, I'm not going to make it my job to get out of your way. But again, that shows that... that problem that these punctures are giving you because you're dropping off the lead lap which is exactly what people were predicting number 12 Audi is three laps behind number 63 Lamborghini is one lap behind so they, they need others to have problems to bring them back to, to balance it out to give them a chance here indeed and uh, so far there have not been very many opportunities offered up to people that have fallen out particularly if we've had a tire problem and up the hill we go in again to Blanchemont now, number 88, Raffaele Marciello, according to timing and scoring, has executed penalty of 25 seconds for five track limit warnings. So Raffaele Marciello, a penalty coming of 25 seconds for five track limit warnings. There is a team of 20 people in race control getting these reports back from the marshals, keeping tabs on it all, issuing the penalties or referring the information when it gets to that point. So the teams are aware of it. There's a whole separate page full of track limit warnings and the corners and everything else. So that the teams are on top of it. But there's the information confirmed. Car 88 has executed penalty of 25 seconds. Executed as in has now earned rather than served, if you will. Yes. I mean, I can deal with a five second penalty in the pits. That's sort of doable. But 25 seconds, that's putting yourself well and truly out of this leading group of what six or so cars I mean the, the gap between first and sixth place right now is 27 and a half seconds so effectively if that was going to be a 25 second penalty added to your pit stop the best 
Raffaele Marcello can expect to come out is probably in seventh position, and that's a position held by Fabian Schiller, who's leading his category in the 777 Mercedes. But ordinarily, you would say, yeah, but you know, you'll get those 25 seconds back when the safety car next comes out. But it hasn't been out yet. We have gone for nearly two hours, and we haven't yet needed a safety car, which is completely against what everybody expected. Well, I think you're probably right, but you know, let's not wish a safety car because somebody's going to be a winner, of course, but more, yeah. more than likely there'll be more losers than winners. True enough. On board with Harry Gottsacker, then, the American in the Samantha Tan racing BMW. See the speed on the, on the 249, 250 kilometres per hour for the BMW, for the Samantha Tan BMW, all the way up the hill. So that's the best part of 150 miles per hour. We've seen higher than that, we've seen 258. Mm. And that was actually a BMW, it was the Neil Verhagen car. Yeah. Looked good, that car, in the uh, spectacular colour scheme that it runs. So as the leaders go by, 44 laps are done. Just further down the field, just looking to see how uh, to Farfus in the 98 row racing BMW has made a move on Stuart White, so he's gotten ahead of the number 14 Lamborghini. I mean, that's just in the bottom half of the top 20, but it doesn't matter, it's another position earned. Down through the gears goes Regon. He's still stuck behind Cobb Ledegar. Try as he might, he's just not yet found the answer to getting through, has he? Well, he, he made it through, but unfortunately he found himself in slightly out of position in La Source, and that allowed Ledegar to slip by. You can see how much, well, that's what you're only talking about fractions of seconds, that Ledegar is quicker than this person, David e. Regon. So you're riding now with David e. Regon. Let's stay with him for as much of this lap as we can. spent most of this lap doing what he's done on most other laps. He's been close, but not quite close enough to make a proper move against Ledegar. Come Ledegar, in fairness, though, John has done a good job of defending. Yes, he had a difficult start to his stint. He was under pressure immediately. All those around him had already done their first hour, but now settled in, bedded himself in, and again uses the power, the strength that Porsche has around spa Franco Sean to keep David Rigo uh, behind him. So what's going on in the chicane? Oh, well. Did you not see that there was a car up the inside? <laughs> or maybe you didn't. Clearly not. No, that, I think, was the number 20 Mercedes getting in strife out of Tim Pierberg. It was number 20 uh, against what looked to me to be the number four Mercedes that we'd had a spin from earlier on in the race when Janis Fitya was driving it, and it still fit you behind the wheel. And that is 57 off the road, so the car that Lucas Auer drove earlier, Jens Liebhauser at the wheel of it, has come to grief at Bruxelles, and I fear hip and shoulder taking place here. Yes, he was assaulted by the 188 McLaren, and off into the gravel and stuck is Jens Liebhauser. Now, who was at the helm of 188 there? Who was the aggressor? Uh, I don't know, we're looking down to see who was behind the wheel of 188, but whoever Enrique it was. Enrique Chavez, yeah. Uh, that, well, whether that's, it's not a pro car, so that will probably not, it might be considered a racing incident, or there may be a penalty for an avoidable incident, which uh, it, in effect, it was an avoidable incident, but whether there'll be a penalty for that, we have to wait and see what the stewards have to say. 
So yellow flags are out. I'm just wondering whether the car can be moved easily from there. It's not far from the tarmac, but you know it's hard to get lots of marshals out there to give it a push. It sort of went in backwards and it embedded itself in the gravel. So I don't know how many marshals you would need to try and push the car back on. It's in a vulnerable position, so that would maybe preclude marshals. But there we see it. Just trying the marshals trying to kick the gravel away to enable it to to roll. So they're all going to give it a bit of a shit, shit, come on, come on, put your backs into it, guys. <laughs> Feel free to join the job. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, it's, it's a heavier car than you think, I think. Right? I'm an armchair quarterback here this afternoon. So we'll see whether that car can get going as the leader crosses the line again. This Mercedes leads at Spa. Another Mercedes is in the gravel at Spa. There it is, Jens Liebhauser was tapped into it and the marshal having to say, I'm afraid we can't push you out of there. And so the officials have noted the incident. This was it. Enrique Chavez in the McLaren goes for a gap that's not even really there. He was up the curb. He wasn't fully alongside. There's contact around goes against Liebhauser. And the gravel does its job. It stops the car, but he which can't is, drive out. Which is what it's there for. But the penalty is, how do you get the car right without having to bring an external snatch vehicle as we go back to this battle going on for fourth position? Let a car still, and the car that I'm keeping an eye on, I've been talking about it for a long time, and that's Kelvin van der Linde, who's now within less than two seconds of the fifth place Ferrari down the hill. We are the gap between the Porsche and Ferrari has opened up marginally. I suspect Daniel Davidi Rigo has fed up looking at the exhaust pipe of the Porsche and just drops back, give himself a little bit of breathing space, build up his own natural pace and momentum, and see if that's going to help him get past the Porsche. It hasn't been a success when he's run as close as he has over this last, well, virtually the entire stint. Yellow lights flash, that's to warm them as a car off the road up, uh, ahead of them. And as they come over the brow into Brussels, look left, you'll see the Mercedes still stranded. Well, something's got to happen now to get that car out of there. Well, it looks to me as if it's going to be a vehicle has to be deployed. And uh, then that will most likely be a Full course yellow. I was going to say, I was, you got it before. I was about to say <laughs> full course yellow, and you said it before it even popped up, but now it's up on the screen. So, a full course yellow, first one of the race. Everybody's got to get down to a mandatory delta speed. So, there is the gap between fourth and fifth place, and there is the sixth place Audi, which has now cleared the back markers. So, when this gets underway, what we're going to have eight that's eight minutes into the conclusion of the second hour. So a lot of the cars when this racetrack goes back to green will probably use the opportunity. What can you are we allowed to do a pit stop under full course yellows? Uh, yes, you are. So the pit lane remains only, open. Uh, an early stop for any of these cars to do so, but would they use that to their advantage or would it be a disadvantage? I have to work that one out. Well, I think we're going to see that we'll go to safety car relatively quickly, but the field slowed down. That's the main thing. And so, yeah, race control giving the marshals a chance to get the car out, like they did with the Bentley. Uh, but uh, it is not able to be moved from there. So we go full course yellow, and I suspect within a lap it'll be a, a safety car deployment. Uh, so the cars then make their way down through in this little situation, the fourth and fifth, the Cour Paul Frere. And the race leader, Luca Stoltz, then was being caught by Raffaele Marchiello. The gap was down by six tenths of a second last time around, as we've done now 46 laps here at Spa Francorchamps in this Total Energy's 24 hours of Spa. So everybody now at reduced pace, but of course, when the safety car is deployed, then the speed will pick up again. Yeah, but you can see that Davide Rigo has got a tent written all over the yellow Ferrari. He is as close as he can get to the tail of the Porsche as the pit lane starts to become an active pit lane once again. Teams taking advantage of this full course yellow to come in fractionally earlier than maybe they were scheduled to do. But in, maybe in the belief there's the, the, the Iron Dames Ferrari, that pink Ferrari driven by four ladies. And uh, one of them is only, I believe, 18, the youngest driver of the Sorry, team. Pam. Yeah. Yes. What, a, what, a, what a responsibility to take part in a 24 hour race here at Spa Frankershaw. At that young age, we've got our first retirement as well. Okay, the number 26 Audi, which I'm we saw surprised. crashing at Blanchiment. Yeah, uh, I, I, I quite like the way this has been phrased. Really, reason for, for retirement, accident, huge, says the retirement. <laughs> uh, so, so here we go, fourth and fifth into the pit lane. So number 26 Audi out of the race, 
and we're getting reports of very light raindrops in the endurance pit lane. So uh, we uh, hear from the pit crew that uh, there's light rain falling in the endurance pits. And uh, we've also got uh, some drops of rain falling apparently at the chicane as well. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a couple of hundred yards up the road from the chicane and the sun's shining brightly into our commentary position. So it may well be just a very fine mist. It's certainly nothing like biblical rain that we've had here in previous years. Now, this is a bit more like uh, Wilton Park rain than Spa rain. It's just a sprinkling, if it even gets to that. So this is where the teams take the opportunity uh, to sort of preempt the fact that we might go safety car to get a pit stop done. It's almost a free pit stop while it's under a full course yellow like this, so you can do fuel or tyres, and if you need to, driver. Uh, there are, just to make the point again, two types of pit stop under the regulations. There is the so-called short pit stop, which is a maximum of six seconds, so that really is splash, and, splash dash. and dash. And a long pit stop, in other words, fuel and tyres and drivers, is a minimum of 41, and there, look, the dynamic Porsche stays ahead of the Ferrari. Oh, I mean, I, I don't know whether Davide Rigo stayed on board or not. I just, according to our timing and scoring, it looks like he has. He must be gutted. Yeah. I mean, he's done all the work to try and find a way past, and there is the pit stop, and he still comes out behind that green Porsche. <laughs> he's absolutely fed up of staring at it, isn't he? We're under full course yellow conditions at Spa. We're expecting a safety car and lots of the teams likewise, and that's why they're cycling their charges through the pit lane, getting effectively a free stop here. So uh, as the Audi Sport hot air balloon sets off, we've got the uh, top two Mercedes with Maxi Gertz taking over number two, Raffaele Marchiello still shown as being behind the wheel of 88, and Richard Leitz has taken over 221 Porsche. But Marchiello, if he is still him, John, behind the wheel, this is a, a long old stint that he's doing. I mean, a three-hour stint by anybody's standards in these conditions is going to be hard work. But, you know, these are fit guys. They know what they've got to do. And, in fact, you know, these cars, although they are big and heavy GT cars, they've got power steering, they've got a lot of assists within the car, they've got ABS brakes. And as long as you have got balance of a car that is a part of you, in other words, you and the car are as one, where you are out of sync with the car, then it's unpleasant. 93, Sky Tempesta, Eddie Cheever is into the pit lane, so he trundles down. He's one of the early pit boxers in this Formula One pit complex here at Spa. So, of course, where this full course yellow has come, it's about eight minutes before the end of the next hour, so it's a little bit early uh, for uh, a uh, pit stop, but they're taking the opportunity of it. Remember, it's a, a maximum of two laps of full course yellow. It doesn't have to be two, but it'll be a maximum of two, uh, and then a uh, safety car process. So we're anticipating the safety car imminently. That was the race director's bulletin that was issued earlier on today. Richard Leitz behind the wheel of the 221 Porsche now, and Danny Uncadella has taken over from, actually, from Raffaele Marcello, so he, Marcello did two hours only. I think the team felt that uh, as under these these conditions are probably a reasonable stint, so I would imagine Junkadella likewise will do a two-hour stint. And then whether that will then take it into darkness with 88, so wait and see. Yeah, indeed. Well, we are about to nudge over uh, another minute, and we're getting towards the end of another hour, aren't we, here at Spa. We're still under full-course yellow conditions, so it's a, a slow pace. Safety car pace is quicker. We're getting more and more of these penalties uh, needing to be served, but right now, the car of Daniel Serra, 71, you're on board with. This is, it is Danny Juncadea, in fact, that took over 88. So lots of driver changes now for the leading cars. And uh, let us, while we uh, have the full course yellow period, hear from Raffaele Marchiello, because he is with uh, Anthony in the pit lane. His car second in the race currently. Let's hear from him now. Raffaele, it has been a frustrating end of the scene with that penalty. Ah, it's okay, I mean, it's a bit strange with track limit because sometimes I feel I'm not doing it and the car in front is doing it, so because we rely on the marshal, I mean, it's not so easy when the cars are coming so quick, maybe it's not so clear. In fact, they removed two or three track limit to me. It's a bit a pity there is this missing of track limit, but it is how it is. It's going well, so we'll see. And for the with the pace of the car for the moment? Yeah, I mean, the track condition will change a lot, as we know, during the, the stint. It's a bit oversteering, but it's OK to have oversteering car now. Thank you, Thank you, Rafael. Sorry. 
Well done to Anthony Coffey, our French pit lane reporter. There is the 88 Mercedes then, Daniel Juncadea at the wheel of it. And uh, Ricard Leitz behind in third place. So Maxi Gutz, who uh, of course has been a, a winner of this event in the past, back in 2013 with Ben Schneider, with uh, Maxi Book. He has returned to GT racing after a spell in the DTM, and they're back into the DTM because it's gone to GT cars. He leads, and there in second place going through is Juncadea. What I'm really looking forward to is the battle for fourth, fifth and sixth position because all three cars have a driver change. So Daniel Serra into the 71 Ferrari, Dries van Thor into the 32 Audi, but notably the fourth place Porsche number 54, Thomas Greening, having taken over from home at Ledegar. So that is uh, an interesting, because Ledegar only did a single stint there. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the 221 Porsche have cycled everybody through for a single stint. Dynamic have done a single stint, and Iron Lynx have done a single stint. The Mercedes team's playing it slightly differently. Double stint and then a change. But again, some of this, you're having to think on your feet now because yes. that was, a, a you know, 75% of a stint, wasn't it? Yeah, now, now we've had the first full course yellow. That, again, changes the strategy. And there, there, are, there are teams of people behind the garages mm working on laptops, computers, trying to figure out, having now, we've got the first full course yellow. What's that? Here comes the safety car. Look behind the timing graphic. You'll see a white Audi in a minute. And I hope it's got an orange light on its roof flashing. Well, it's got an orange light, but it's not flashing. No, because we've not yet gone to safety car procedure. So the car is okay. out there. It will circulate when it gets the leader behind it, because it, it can go quicker than yes. the car. It can overtake the race cars, find the leader, and then we can go to safety car procedure. So the leader currently is the number two AMG team Get Speed Mercedes with Max Gertz, Gertz behind the wheel. So we're on lap 49 and we've just come to the end of the second hour. We're into the third hour by about a minute and a half. No, even less, half a minute. Well, last year, the Iron Lynx Ferrari that won came from 13th on the grid. There you see the safety car then with the lights flashing. So we are now under safety car procedure. So all of this is quite a long process, isn't it, to get the Mercedes out of the way? It feels like it. You know, from, from the moment that car went off to now we have the safety car, it's taken quite a few minutes. But uh, part of that, I think, was because of the number of people making the pit stops. It appears in the pit stops, actually, the 32 WRT Audi, of course, it has a five second mm. addition to serve out, but it's dropped from sixth place down behind the 777 Almana Racing by HRT Mercedes. Uh, so the safety car will remain on track for three laps. Three laps. Three laps of safety car then. It's quite a long time. It is, isn't it? But again, it's a, a quicker pace, brings these tyres up to temperature, and that's been the concern, that, that, that the tyres need to be at a good speed to, to stay healthy, for want of a better phrase, really. There's 221, that is Ricard Lietz, running in third place in the GPX Martini Racing Porsche. And as the field now starts to quicken the pace, not only will they go faster, they'll also bunch up as well. And safety cars can breed safety cars, so it's going to make the restart very interesting indeed. That is now Thomas Prining in the Porsche, brought in at the 11th hour after Mattia Caroli had to step down, and he's got Daniel Serra behind him in the classification. So it's going to be Mercedes upon Mercedes, Porsche upon Porsche, then the, the lead Ferrari in fifth place, and then the 777 Mercedes, which is in the, is that the can't see the category, is in sixth place. With That's a silver. Yes, Al yeah. Faisal Al Zubar behind the wheel. That's the, the, the leading silver. By a considerable margin. Yeah. By that. Thomas uh, Neubauer is the next car, down to 15th. Yeah. The other thing, John, just going back to a point you were making earlier uh, about the way that some of the teams were doing single stints and others were double stinting. Part of the, the way that they will do this is to use the best combination of drivers up to six hours for points and then the best combination of drivers for the next six hours to 12 hours for points. So if you've got a driver that's slightly slower out of your three, well, you might choose to use him more in the second half of the race, but use your quicker drivers, so you're almost guaranteeing a good haul of points at six, maybe again at 12. 
it's harder to look long term for 24 yep. hours. But if you can't, if you're not guaranteeing a finish there or a good result at 24, use them early in the race. Yep. Get the six hour and oh, the yeah. 12 hour points. And I can understand if only one team in the pit lane had had that eureka moment and said, "Ah, here's the right strategy." But everybody in the pit lane is aiming to do much the same sort of thing. Yeah. When Watson Addison Racing comes to Spa, we'll have it nailed. Won't I'll we? stick to the driving. You can do the management. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe. You know, you drive it because I could probably manage better than you can drive. <laughs> the team manager of the 188 Garage 59 McLaren uh, on their way to the stewards now. So they, uh, Enrique Chavez McLaren that tipped Jens Liebhauser into that spin, into the gravel that's brought out of this safety car period. Uh, the uh, officials want a word with the uh, Garage 59 team management. Maxim Sule is taking over the Bentley, by the way. Another incident between number 20 and uh, 57. That was what we saw at the chicane, wasn't it, when uh, Valentin Pierberg was, was mugged by Jens Liebhauser. That's been noted as well, but Liebhauser is plunging down the classification now because the car's lost two laps by being in the gravel. So notable that pace has picked up considerably behind the safety car, so drivers yeah. behind the wheel would be delighted to get up to a, a pace which is, OK, it's, it's off a race pace, but significantly quicker than they're running at that statutory 80 kilometres per hour. So we're on lap 50, and there is number 47. That's the car that Nick Tandy started. Lawrence Van Thor is at the wheel off from the back of the grid, remember, 24th place it is. Lawrence Van Thor chipping his way up the order, back into contention. And uh, that car with two former race winners, uh, Lawrence Van Thor a double winner, 2020 and 2014, Nick Tandy a winner in 2020. Behind the safety car at Spa, we work lap number 50. Maxi Gertz drives the leading car. Danny Junkadea is in second position. And uh, in the pit lane is Nick Tandy. We've just been looking at 47, his Porsche, which is currently in 24th. Anthony Coppi is with Nick Tandy. Nick Tandy, it was uh, quite an intense start for you with a uh, 44 position gained. <laughs> it was fun. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, our strategy, just be careful. We expected some, some earlier full course yellow and safety car than we've had now. And we thought we need to keep safe. We, we, yes, we're starting at the back, but um, we can always close up as long as we have a good car. We have no damage, we have no penalties, but it looks like many people are getting penalties. But uh, yeah, the car is, is really tough to drive in traffic. And this is, I think, something that is good to learn early because when you run out front, it's very different to running in traffic. Um, so we might have learned some things. It was, it was hard work, but uh, it's nice to come forward rather than go backwards, of course. Can we say that the hardest job of the beginning of the race has been done now? Yeah, I think it probably has, and also for the car, you know, because with the temperatures coming down, um, the track temp especially coming down, it's hard for the car, it's hard for the tyre, it's hard for the driver, for everything. So, you know, I think the race should calm down a bit, hopefully, from a kind of stress on the car point of view through the night and then of course it's going to ramp up in the morning which is when uh, when everyone's going to be really going for it again of course thank you Nick. thumbs up from nick tandy anthony copy our pit reporter and uh, we have got the safety car still on circuit as the race leader works lap uh, 51. you can see the lights just saying the safety car is still out there uh, yellow flags still show uh, and uh, Nicola Goma has been out on track in number eight, and he is with Gemma Scott in the pit lane. Nicola, your first time at racing here in the Spa GT3, and you got to start the car. Votre première fois ici pour le Spa, pour le GT3, et là pour le départ, c'est bien passé? Ça s'est bien passé. Beaucoup de pression parce qu'on est là depuis 10 jours, depuis le GT4 France, donc la fatigue commence à se faire ressentir, alors qu'on est qu'au début de la course. Maintenant, c'est la plus belle course du monde en GT. J'ai eu l'honneur de faire le départ. Maintenant, le seul objectif, c'est d'arriver à avoir le drapeau à Damier. Ça sera une belle victoire pour nous. Merci bien. Just a quick translation there for our English viewers that uh, obviously the first time rolling here in Spa, 24 hour, a lot of pressure for Nicolas taking the start. 
and he's just hoping to have a clean race. It's a lot of history here, and he's hoping to be part of that history. Janet, thanks very much. Yeah, Nicolas Gomar has been a regular in French GT in Lamborghini Super Trofeo. Uh, strange to think, actually, given the number of years he's been racing, that he's not done the 24 hours before. But uh, one of the rookies, and going nicely then in uh, number eight. Their main aim is a class finish to get to the end. And uh, number eight then has now been handed over to Ruben Del Sart, who's had a torrid time this weekend in GT4. Uh, Ruben's father, Raphael Rael Del Sart, Formula First racer in the UK in the late 1980s, had a brief spell in British Formula 3. But Ruben came out of Ginetta Junior Racing into French GT. And as the leading cars go over the line, if... Uh, safety car in this lap, safety car in this lap. You were wondering about the length of the safety car period. It's going to be in this lap, John. Yes, delighted to hear the news from race director Alain Adana that finally everybody is happy and most importantly Alain Adana that everything is appropriate to withdraw the safety car and let this race get underway. We're now 10 minutes into the third hour and uh, I suspect there'll be a bit of impatience amongst the leading group of cars, Max Goetz in the number two, Daniel Juncadella, 88, Richard Dietz in the 221, Thomas Preening in the 54, Daniel Serra in the 71. Those are the top five, those are the top five pro cars. So right now we have got the order being confirmed behind the safety car. It's in at the end of this lap. Everybody eager to get on with it and a spin under the safety car and damage is, there is. number nine Porsche has either hit somebody or been hit by somebody, and that's Antares Al. And, and Al, he shouts as the car's got damaged. Yeah, the right, looks the right front, whether that's contact has led to that. I can't imagine any other manner of how that could have occurred. So the car's crawling, I mean, we've got to do an entire lap. So let's, oh, he got, yeah, he got T-Bone by the Mercedes. Car. It was yeah. the Sky Tempesta Mercedes. Yeah, and that was an avoidable incident yeah. as well. Right, this is Jonathan Hui, this is the onboard look. And there's a gap there, and Jonathan Hui He's stuck committed, his nose in. Yeah, he's committed to a closing gap. Yeah, but under the safety car, why would you put your nose in the gap unless he was slightly caught out by the Porsche slowing uh, at a rate he wasn't expecting? Yes, and it hadn't gone yet to full race conditions, so he couldn't overtake that car. Just he got he made a mistake, plain and simple, an error on the part of Jonathan Weed. So halfway round the circuit of the lowest point, coming down to campus, and then we start the climb all the way up the other side that to damage. complete the safety car lap. Sorry, that damage to the number nine Porsche couldn't have come at a worse place, though, could it? First no, no, corner absolutely. on the lap. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it, he's got to limp around, uh, and it'll probably take him the best part of Lights four up. to five minutes, depending on how much he limps all, all the way around. Removed. So Antares Al, who's done a lot of his GT racing in GT3 cars uh, in Asia, is going to limp round to the pit lane. We are going to go racing, though. The safety car is in at the end of this lap. The lights will be extinguished, and we're going to be up and racing as the cars turn their way to the chicane. David, you've always said safety cars breed safety cars. And I suspect Green flag, there's an, green element, flag. an yeah, element of impatience here amongst not just at the front, but all the way through the field. You can see how close that field is. There'll be drivers thinking, I'll be opportunistic and make a move. Or there'll be others that saying, well, maybe I'll just hang back. But let's hope it's a clean restart. We don't breed yet another full course shallow and safety car. Well, we're back up and running, and Maxi Gertz tries to build the lead there in 2-2-1. He's Ricard Leitz. He's got to work his way through the traffic. And again, an element of caution is needed to make sure you know exactly who you are racing against. You don't want to be getting in the way of the leaders on the lead lap. You don't want to be giving away places, though. The BMW is Samantha Tan racing on the outside of the Ferrari, so she, or the car, needs to be aware that this is one of the lead cars. Daniel Serra behind the wheel trying to run down Thomas Preening. Can Serra do more? than Davidi Rigon did, or can, can Preening pull away from the Ferrari? Well, right now, the cars work lap number 53 here at Spa. Everybody bunched back up, thanks to that safety car procedure. And you're riding with Daniel Serra, the Brazilian, looking for a way through the traffic. Uh, in the meantime, as he tries to squeeze past the Mercedes, his rival, the Porsche of Thomas Preining, is getting away. It's been a little bit more committed through the traffic. Blue lights flash, and look at this. Now, uh, Leitz is under attack from Preining. The Martini GPX racing Porsche coming under attack from the Lizard Green car. There it is. So the two Porsches together, and Serra has dropped back to the tune of two back markers. Yeah, he's been wrong-footed 
at the worst possible occasion. So the Richard Leach trying to find a way as the BMW and he's got the sister car of Thomas Preening all over the back. So the two Porsches, different teams, but same family. Yellow flag sector two. So we've got a car off the road. And as there, look, Thomas Preening gets up the inside of the Falcon Horse BMW. Oh. That's the reason the road that looks like Elise de Pau to me it is Elise de Pau is off at the exit of Le Combe so big big drama Porsches are together we might be getting another interruption if that can't drive out of the gravel well you need to give it a, a moment to see whether it is able to recover itself and the look at this battle coming up the hill Richard Leach gets alongside the Mercedes but it's the sister car or the green car running directly oh. but there's the, the, the Making a limping its way back, yeah. But will Thomas Preening find a way around? Richard Leeds has got all intent as they come up to the chicane. That was Antares Al limping back. Yellow flag still out at the top of Lake Corp. Leeds comes under attack from Priming then as they come down towards the chicane. And great racing, we're enjoying it. Another one is in the gravel. 27 Lamborghini that is easy to Tumlu Lopez, who's gone off the road short to have another safety car. There's a damaged Ferrari smoke billow out of the back of it high drama here at spa there are car road cars with problems it is all kicking off here in belgium every everything at spa is returning to normal there you can see the damage at the rear of the ferrari there's the porsche limping back you've got the walking wounded on the racetrack you've got those that are in the gravel we don't know whether they're able to extract themselves or not full course yellow Second one, and exactly what we were suggesting, safety cars, Reed, safety cars, and there are cars in strive all over the place. That, I think, is just at the sort of regulation pace now, looking like it's got a problem because everybody has slowed right down. Right, let's catch our breath for uh, a moment or two. So as the cars then make their way down through the section of the circuit at uh, Pouin, Full course yellow, number two. We'll take us, no doubt, to safety car number two with two cars to remove. Uh, there's also the walking wounded to catch up on as well. And as the cars then make their way down to the completion of the lap, we go to that regulation delta speed of 50 kilometers an hour. And uh, then once the race director is content that he's got them all under control, and I use the phrase advisedly, then uh, we can get the safety car out to uh, quicken the pace, which in turn is better for the tyres, and uh, then we'll look forward to getting racing back underway. So, yeah, Nick Tandy saying the race should calm down a little bit. Uh, one begs to differ there, because it's all got very leery indeed. And uh, as the cars then make their way under these full-course yellow conditions, it gives us the opportunity to say welcome to the Total Energy's 24 Hours of Spa, one of the two voices that will be taking you through the night. And that's Martin Haven. Martin, good lunch. Uh, it was it was breakfast. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Lunch comes later. <laughs> now then, this um, is the perfect opportunity for you to join because you are something of an expert of yellow flags and <laughs> these sort of interruptions at Spa. Yeah, but it never happens when you're still in the building. <laughs> you, you just leave and set the timer for the red flag and then we pick up your chaos. But uh, this is so absolutely classic after a safety car, isn't it? Absolutely. Everybody's... Yep. Concentration is not everybody's, but concentration drops a fraction, tyre temperatures, brake temperatures drop, things lock up, people just aren't quite on it. Exactly, yes. So we've now got two cars to retrieve, and also we've had, as I mentioned a little while ago, a retirement. Nicholas Bart's car out of the race. Uh, he is with Anthony Coppi in the pits. Nicolas Bart, vous avez pris le, le départ, et puis ça s'est malheureusement vite terminé avec la, la sortie de César Gazo. Hein. Oui, c'est dur à prendre, mais c'est comme ça, c'est la course, c'est euh, les risques de, de cette grande course de 24 heures, et, et voilà, c'est des choses qui arrivent. Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé exactement, vous en savez plus Oui, en fait, on, on souffre d'une grande dégradation euh, au niveau des pneus, et je pense que César a, a emmené un peu trop de vitesse dans Blanchimont, et il l'a perdu, euh, perdu malheureusement, et il a fini dans le mur. Heureusement, il va bien, mais la, la voiture, est, je pense que le châssis est touché, donc on ne peut plus continuer. Merci uh, Nicolas. Nicolas Barso, the driver of the OD26 Santeloc. Uh, he said yes, that the risk of the race, obviously, and uh, he was talking about a tire degradation uh, that may be uh, forced uh, César Gazo uh, to uh, make this uh, mistake. He was surprised probably by the tire in uh, Blanchimont, and that leads to the retirement of this OD Santeloc. Yeah. So, big disappointment then for uh, Nicolas Bart out of the race. They only won notified retirement but uh, the retirement form said accident huge and it's rather hard to argue with that uh, let's have a, a look at 
one or two of those uh, incidents. There's quite a lot to try and catch up on. So we had one at the top of Le Camp. That, having been pulled out of the gravel, having another off was 57. That was the car that Jens Liebhauser triggered the first safety car uh, for. And then this was Isaac Tutumlu Lopez with a bit of help from the Iron Dames Ferrari. Ooh, it I would was, wasn't it? Going into the gravel, yeah. yeah. Oh, and somebody else was spewing fluid and there was a bit of loose bodywork as well. So. Yes, we did see a Ferrari limping back. We need yeah. to catch up on that. Uh, we're still under the full course yellow conditions. Ha! <sighs> So it's feeling more like Spa now, isn't it, <laughs> it, de it definitely is feeling much more like Spa. I mean, almost exactly two hours running green. I, I don't think many people got that in the office sweepstake. No, no. John said to me before the race started, when do you think the first safety car will come? I said the opening lap. Yeah. How wrong could I be? Well, I, I think definitely everybody was looking at single digits. Not in hours, but in laps. <laughs> in laps, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, look, we've had part with this, the fact that cars get tagged and, and go into the, the gravel quite uh, readily. You were here for the WEC race. Did you have yeah. the same issues? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because people aren't used to driving with gravel traps anymore. They're used to there being a runoff area. When you have a lunge and it doesn't go well, you can sort of pick it up. And so yeah. it is going to be a discipline that people are going to have to relearn. Um, to a degree, obviously, it's a little bit be careful what you wish for because mm. everybody says, oh, we should get rid of track limits by bringing back gravel tracks. Well, we've still got track limits problems and we've also, also got, got gravel, gravel tracks. Track problems, yeah. but the, and the one thing with the gravel trap that you don't get with tarmac tends to be that cars can continue and move on, mm. whereas gravel traps, they definitely tend not to. Although, actually... Safety car procedure, safety car procedure. Yeah, pretty much as expected. The voice of race director Alan Adam, our second safety car, um, a maximum of no more than two laps of full course yellow before they go safety car in daylight hours. Now, after the official witching hour, which is 11 p.m., where it officially is dark, uh, I can sense that we might go very, very much more quickly mm. to safety car. I think you might be right. There's uh, Isaac Tumla Lopez, who is now out of the gravel, back up and running. So let's have a look at the highlights of the race thus far, beginning in the sunshine with the cars pouring downhill and a great start by Klaus Backler to jump ahead of Raffaele Marcello and then Mirko Bortolotti third, Lucas Stoltz fourth, Christopher Hauser fifth. That was the order as they swept through the first corner at Eau Rouge and you had uh, Michael Christensen doing the opening stint in the Martini Porter a little bit further back, having a rather more conservative first stint, but he was running in that leading six as the cars climbed Radiant for the first time. Great shots of the cars coming out of the hairpin at La Source as they then plunge downhill once more. And three wide in the mid-pack, Mercedes, Audi, Mercedes. And Porsche not far behind. GT3 cars at fine fighting pace as into the gravel was tapped. Nigel Bailly with a bit of assistance from the Kenny Harbour driven Mercedes. Antonio Fuoco was on a mission as well, trying to get his way up past Maxi Buch. Some good battles raged on as Loris Spinelli tried to find a way through the traffic. It was a bit brutal in the way that he attacked Yanis Fitya, uh, but in the end, uh, it was Fitya who lost it, coming into the chicane. The Mercedes rejoined, and the first casualty in terms of punctures was Sandy Mitchell for Barwell. He certainly would not be the last. Then we had going off the road Stephen Grove in the Porsche. He had a big, big moment at Blanchimont, but went through the gravel, got back onto the circuit, and was able to rejoin the race. As lower down the order, the Aston Martin from the Silver Cup trying to find its way through. Kobe lost out to a charging Lucas Stoltz, squeezing him a little bit towards the grass. Kobe kept his foot in dropped back and then Raffaele Marchiello went through for second place as well so the Porsche that dominated R1 fell to third in the second hour of the race and then uh, dropped to fourth in fact this was the final bit of the move as Marchiello made it stick going into Le Combe. great racing between those two good dive by Eddie Cheever on the inside line coming into Puan that put him into the lead of the gold cup in that sky Tempesta racing Mercedes and uh, then Jens Liebhauser was given a bit of a rough house from the Audi going down through campus this was the demise of Cesar Gazzo, big, big lose, charging the wall, and that with so much damage, even though the car drove back to the pit lane, was the end of the Audi. The first retirement then coming from Santalok. We had this good battle between Kurt Ledegar and Davide Rigon. Rigon going through on the inside at the hairpin, but then Ledegar switching sides and making the move back as they sped downhill past the endurance pits. The Porsche with good grunt, the Ferrari with good brakes, and it was advantage Porsche once again. Jens Liebhauser got involved with Valentin Pierberg. Jens Liebhauser got involved with Enrique Chavez. 
Jens Liebhauser got involved with the gravel and that brought out a full safety court yellow in this and lounge. a safety car. And then we had further drama as Antares out was tagged sideways by Jonathan Hui, damage to the Porsche. And there it is from another angle as the two cars touched. The Porsche went around and was badly delayed. So with everybody bunched up, we had more dramas going up to Le Con. We had another full course yellow period into a safety car. And we are about to go back live and racing here at Spa. Elise de Pau also off the road. We're back live at Spa here. That's Elise de Pau's car in the gravel. So the big frustration is not only the damage, Martin, but it's also the time lost getting it back to the pits and then the time lost looking at the damage. It, it, it never gets any simpler, does it? No, when when no. you're being tagged off or whether you've dropped it yourself, you, you tend to be in a world of hurt. And Tamita there, uh, the Audi up in the air being worked on, looked like quite a lot of work going on. And that, uh, that one retirement, uh, the team were telling us just beforehand that actually it was that Audi was suffering a tyre problem and the Santalot Junior team out because it just came back a fraction too quickly and lost it under braking. So Cesar dropping the car off the road. Uh, very unfortunate. I'm sure he was thinking about getting into the pit lane, getting out and, and getting on with the race. And unfortunately, uh, just took his eye off the ball a fraction too soon. Safety car coming in this lap. Still a beautiful, warm evening here in Spa-Francorchamps. And uh, although there were reports from both pit lanes of tiny drops of water, it certainly wasn't anything uh, that you could notify the Met Office about. So it remains warm, dry, sunny. And the forecast for the evening is that it should remain dry. And that probably will mean that there might be a little bit of early morning fog. Temperature didn't drop down too low last night. I think it went down to about 10 or 11 degrees. That might just be enough for a little bit of morning mist, but it shouldn't be too much to worry about. So hopefully the weather won't be a big factor, although we are in the Ardennes. <laughs> it is four green seasons flag, in one flag. day. I love your confidence and your optimism. Green flag is waved then on instruction of the race director. So let's go racing and let's look also at where the traffic is. Well, the back marking Lamborghini bails. So now there are no back markers between the two Lamborghinis. It is Maxi Gertz in the pink BVT car operated by the AMG team Get Speed squad ahead of the Acodis ASP entry. The silver car behind a Raffaele Marchiello and then look third. It's a great livery. I know I keep going on about it, but 2-2 one then uh, Ricard Leach with Thomas Prining right up behind him one of the advantages of that back marker diving into the pit lane of course is that you're not allowed to pass before the start finish line when you're released from a safety car so yeah. the leader got away much quicker than the back marker however it did allow Raffaele Marcello uh, I bet Maxi Gertz to just get a little jump on Danny Junkadea Richard Leach in third Thomas Prining fellow Porsche racer in fourth and we ride on board right now with Daniel Serra and here's Priding look making oh. his move for third pulls out has nah. a think about it but no <laughs> Ricard Leeks has sharp pointy elbows and he fends him off so this is like an unofficial Carrera Cup battle in the sense isn't it this sort of one yeah. Porsche one battle eight, eight. Ten second time penalty to be taken at the next pit stop for causing a collision we do need to have another chart on the wall, which is most penalties per car. 188 is about four laps in front right now, or four penalties in front, or four incidents in front, maybe. Uh, but that was that was for shoulder charging. It was, yeah. Uh, the 70, yeah. 71, 75 car off uh, the road. Yeah. Fi uh, 57, I think. 57, yeah. yeah then. Now, here, the WRT number 32 Audi, their look, has just got ahead of Daniel Serra. That is Dries Van wow. that's now been unleashed. Yep. That car had a pretty modest first hour, but it's been getting there, getting there, getting there. It has also five-second uh, penalty for speeding in the pit oh. lane and a big, big dive up the inside there. Grass and all from the Audi. That Patrick. was Patrick Niederhauser. Yeah, so suddenly the Audis are starting to come alive a little bit. Oh, they ever. Yeah. So that was the lead Ferrari of Daniel Serra coming under pressure. And the Porsches have changed as well, yes, haven't they? they have, now? haven't they? Uh, you've got Thomas Prining ahead of Richard Lee. So the car that led the first hour is also coming alive again. It was a bit more modest in Kerb Ledegar's hands. Of course, now, perversely, it's getting brighter, but the temperatures are dropping a little bit as we head towards early evening. And so is this having yeah. an effect on the cars, maybe? Not so much track temperature, I wouldn't have thought, because it's been a long, hot day. Mm. So that heat in the tarmac isn't going away. But the lights flashing down the inside comes the Ferrari. That's job well done. That is a good move from Daniel Serra. The Brazilian has been a factory Ferrari star in GT racing, GTE and GT3 for three or four seasons now. Really. That was absolutely classic bus stop stuff. Just sent it late. 
ex Aston Martin, wasn't he, as well? Yeah, yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. Joe's days, yeah. Right, so there, 91, he's being lapped down. 100 Porsche is Marvin Dietz, former German F4 champion. He's another very handy Porsche peddler. And so Marvin Dietz has got himself up now, I think, past Patrick Niederhauser, has he? Or is that another of the back marking Audis behind him? There are so many to account for as the leaders plunge downhill. 58 laps now in the book. 55 Mercedes Picard Grenier. Behind him is Rob Bell, having his first stint in the Jota McLaren. So Goetz leads Junkadea, leads Prining, leads there, leads fifth. Look for Dries Van Thorpe there. So that's yep. the Audi in fifth spot. Sixth should be Daniel Serra in the yellow Ferrari, which will come into shot in the background there with Patrick Niederhauser, seventh up behind him. Dienst is eighth, Mikhail Grenier is ninth, and Rob Bell is tenth. So only a couple of back markers in amongst the lead cars, which makes life a lot more straightforward for the guys in the top ten because, yeah, you're battling with somebody you know it's immediately for position. The problem is that if you are behind another well-driven car that might be a lap or a number of laps down for, through various incidents, accidents or what have you, it doesn't make them any easier to pass. The fact that they're a lap down or two laps down doesn't slow them. Oh, dear. That is the Beach Dean Silver. That is the Beach Dean uh, Aston, Aston Martin off the road. And that is, by the look of it, up at Le Com. It's Teo Nui. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. We know what's coming here. So the car out of the Silver Cup, 97, off the racetrack. It was 33rd. Uh, the, the, the question always leaps into my mind, though. How's it got there? Because uh, it's gone a long way through the car. I thought, yes, it could be a spin. It could have been an assist. But either way, full course yellow is coming in 20 seconds. Jesus These teams met. then get a 10-second count and then we'll go full course yellow, and we've got them like London buses now. They're all in quick succession. Yes. It's caution breeds caution. That's what they always say. That does look like a bit of an assist. He's gone in nose first, and it's aha. Um, I possibly, now I don't want to jump to any conclusions, but there may be some evidence that there was an assist. I don't think that's going to polish out. So Alfaisal Al Zubaya, uh, talk about uh, incriminating evidence. Well, the, the, um, I never touched him, Your Honour. The other problem is, of course, the incriminating evidence is blocking his view <laughs> of, of everything, and he's trying to get back. To, but he, I mean, he's very low, so he's really barely looking over the dashboard uh, top. So actually, most of the detritus it, is out of the way. Yeah. I couldn't, he can. Yes. Um, Yes. Right, I, I shall write on our chart, damage. I think that sums it all up, really, for Treble 7. Uh, and then, comma, huge, huge. exclamation yes. mark. That's actually right. the phrase that pays. Now, it, let's see. Oh, he gets, it wasn't oh. the same incident. He got into the back of the Porsche, coming out of the Coeur Paul Frere. So, Al Faisal Al Zuba ran into the back of the Allied Racing 911, and he's coming into the pit lane, you know. If he sees where it is. He's going to thread his way between concrete walls. It's absolutely well, now, fine. The, now, the other thing, in all seriousness, is if he properly rams the back of the Porsche, then the Porsche may have exhaust damage and floor damage. And so that is, again, totally innocent, minding his own business, shunting a, a couple of cars coming in. And now, yeah. now that's not on pit shop, pit shop, pit stop schedule. It's not, but you might, However, as well, you might as well do this under a full course yeah. yellow. Just throw a bit more fuel in it. Richard Leitz, Dries Van Tour, Grenier, Yellowly, Nick Yellowly in the lead BMW, which was only in 13th place. I mean, they're having a tough time so far. They are. Now, let's have a look at the back. It's 74 Porsche. Actually looks remarkably OK. But, yeah, the, uh, the exhausts are a little bit bent, yeah. but that, that's, that's livable with. That's the Mathieu Jaminet car yeah. that Felipe Nazar will take over, and uh, Matt Campbell has already driven. So, yeah, they've got away with that pretty lightly, I reckon. Yes, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Compared to the Mercedes. Well, I mean, I, and ironically, if he hadn't centre-punched him and had sort of tagged him on a corner, it probably would have done an awful lot more damage or damage that needed attending to a, an awful lot more. So, yeah, the Mercedes was very dramatic, but those body panels, yeah, <laughs> they're large, aren't they? Well, so that's true. When, when the bonnet springs up, it's, it's quite noticeable. I don't think uh, Al-Faisal al, al Zubar had been in that car for very long. Um, uh, so he had done a number of laps. Not, not covered himself many. in glory no. in his openings in. Garage 59 are right below our window, and a board is being made up for 188 that says, NO, in capital letters, radio. Ah. Um, so obviously he can't hear them, they can't hear him, and so they're going to let him know that they can't hear him. They're not just ignoring him because of his... Uh, that slightly sticky time in the car, so... Yeah, Dean yeah. McDonald has been put into that of late, replacing Enrique Chavez, but they've got to serve that uh, penalty, or probably uh, have served it now under these full-course yellow periods, in fact. Uh, how many stops have they done? Only 
Only two. Two? No, uh, they've got to serve it. So they haven't... Anyway. Yeah, they won't have... Because their second stop will have been that full course yellow that everybody took just before yeah. the fuel which, window. Which their incident triggered yes. and the penalty wouldn't have been applied. No, exactly, you can't exactly. So they, they still owe us 10 seconds. More cars coming in through the pits. Uh, who else? Oh, yeah, Volker, Alcibar is in. Yeah. Valentino Rossi is in the car. Fans, so when you see 46, it will be the doctor at yep. large. He took over on that last stop and is staying in, isn't he? So he's just gone So he's out. gone he's, through he's, the pits. He's doing a double yeah. stint. Yeah. Oh, yeah. right, OK. Effectively, he's doing a double. Uh, okay. a, a stint is 65 minutes, but it resets as you come into the pit lane. Yes. So you can stay in the car, you can do a double stint, but 65 minutes, you've got to go through the pit lane to reset it, if that yeah. makes sense. Stay yeah. in the car, but it's 65 minutes line to line. And in terms of fuel, it probably isn't going to go an awful lot more distance anyway is no, it? no 91 Alex Malikin oh, that, that could actually be yeah. the one that was the one that was hit rather than 74 it would make more sense in a sense but yeah you know, it looked like the allied colors yeah it was it must be look it's yes yeah yeah it is it was uh, that's the car that was hit so we were looking at Jaminet but uh, it's the allied racing car that there is in the, the garage and that's not a good sign when it's in its box well the advantage there well, I mean basically you have to do any work other than fuel and tires in the in the garage because you just can't put people out in the pit lane so if it needs a door mirror doing or a door changing it I mean, well, actually not a door change because that's just two pins you will run around and do that but anything that requires more than two people straight in the garage and that's, I mean, that's a, a hugely sensible safety regulation. Is it just a trick of the light or the lights out on the safety car? It doesn't say that we're going green. Um, no, we haven't gone safety car yet. Oh, we, we haven't gone safety car yet. still under full course yellow. So uh -huh. we have a maximum of two laps. Yes. The safety car goes out and circulates. When it finds the leader... Is, it, do, is it, he just doing well, it can, skids? It, it can go quicker. It can yes, overtake. So it goes around, it finds the leader. Yeah. And when the race director is content, then we will go to safety car procedure so uh, yeah we're, we're still under full course yellow even though you are correct you can see a safety car yeah yeah and there then the, lights are, so the now, lights are on so he's gone in fact he was passing but he was putting the leader another lap down behind the safety car that's right, yes. <laughs> safety car is on for third in class and now suddenly everybody releases the pit speed limiter and speeds up to catch the safety car and uh, and again you know when when you go full course yellow, even relatively soon after a safety car, if you looked at the GPS map, there would be about two thirds of a lap full of cars. So they've all got to catch up. And so inevitably then you get another couple of laps of safety car to allow the queue to form, even if most of the debris has been dragged away. And this is also one of those times where, with respect, you see the difference between the AMs and the pros, because the pros are straight on it, they know what yep. to do, they tonk on, they catch the cars ahead as soon as they can, ready for the restart. Yep. The AMs take a bit more persuasion to up the pace, you know, should I be going this quickly under a, yep. a safety car? And, yes. You know, the, the, the pro behind, yes you should, come yeah. on, come on, but <laughs> yeah. you see there are gaps that, that need to come down, they will come down, yeah. but it's, it's more an AM catching a car than a pro catching a car that takes the time. And the frustration is, for the race director, would everybody just hurry up and catch the safety <laughs> car queue, please? I mean, um, there, for example, between third and fourth is a massive gap and a slower car, and that yeah. needs to hurry up. Yeah. Now, let's go back down to the pit lane. Uh, Anthony Coppi uh, has found Alex Riberas from number 23, Aston Martin, that was delayed early on with a puncture, uh, and uh, that car is trying to play catch-up after its problems. Alex Riberas, it has been a rough start of this 24 hours. Can you explain uh, what happened? Yeah, it's been definitely a challenge uh, start to the race for us. Uh, already when Ross was driving, uh, he suffered a, a puncture early on in his first stint. Um, and then a, a second puncture again in the second stint, so we were already last a uh, few laps down. So uh, at the restart, uh, there was some sort of a melee happening uh, with a car that was spinning on the inside of Pit Path. And basically the, the consequence was everybody that was around it had to stop immediately and jump on the brakes, which caused a few contacts, including the front of our Aston Martin. Uh, right now the guys are working as hard as they can to to take it back out there and uh, try to continue learning about uh, how, how the car uh, works, how to make it competitive and, and keep on preparing for the for the future yeah no the objective is to finish the race and it's also uh, like uh, something to give to the mechanics that are already working hard exactly yes uh, that's the the people that deserve all the credit at the end of the day we wouldn't be here without them and i i can only say uh, that i feel really really bad for for them because to start the 24 hours like this is it's certainly disheartening thank you alex thank you 
it, it then becomes a battle of wills, doesn't it? You know, we are not going to let this beat us, mm. either this car or this race or a combination of the two, whichever is being more truculent. And yeah. Here's the replay of Isaac Tutumlu Lopez. And then the Ferrari has just been hit by Rivera. So that, or the, the uh -huh. Aston Martin. So that explains why we have that Ferrari with all the damage. I'm trying to, I think it's the Hugo Delacour car, isn't it? Number 21. The uh, one that got the damage. May there, well be car. since it's. it's yeah. way down, yeah. And currently in the pits, yes, currently. Oh no, it's, it's back out, but uh, yeah. I think it was, looking at the livery, that, that car that's a regular in the uh, Fanatec GT Championship. So Maxi Gertz is the race leader. And now, of course, what we're trying to do is break this cycle of cars having these incidents. Um, and, and can I just point out, I it's broad it. daylight, <laughs> the conditions are perfect. Oh, you know, middle of the night, gravel traps, yeah. safety cars, yeah. and, you know, I mean, the, the chances are we're not going to have weather throwing its, its curveball in as well, but you never can tell. But it will be an awful lot more difficult to get that rhythm back again. The, the ad slight advantage, again, you know, for these guys in the lead group is that they didn't have time after the last safety car to really get in amongst other back markers because the safety car queue and the length of the track means you never quite get there in, in two or three laps. So those back markers that were in the bunch now are not in the bunch. So, yeah, the top six cars are basically the lead six behind the safety car. So obviously it'll be nice and calm when they get the <laughs> <laughs> but in But in all seriousness, they, they are the absolute top pros battling for position yep. rather than trying to get by a back mark who's not quite sure which way to go. We've got the team manager of the Sky Tempesta Mercedes being summoned to the stewards. Yes. We've got a couple of cars that have gone through a red light at the pit exit and they're being oh. looked at. And we've also got a full course yellow infringement that has been noted for number 66, which is the delayed attempto Audi that Ricardo Feller was going really well with early on before he had one of those early punctures. Now, the only thing I would say in possible mitigation for the red light is it's not at La Source at the end of the Formula One pit lane. It's downhill at the end of the endurance pit lane where the sun is shining possibly directly on it. So it may be a little hard to see, but you still got to stop for red lights. Yeah, That's not an excuse on the public road. No. It's probably not an excuse that's going to go down well with the stewards. Not really. Uh, eighth place, Andrea Caldarelli, you just looked at there. Mm. And uh, up from 30th on the grid. Uh, helped OK by incidents, by, the, by the, the pit stop cycle, shuffling the order. But that car was struggling to get through the traffic early on. But it's got up the order now into that eighth place. And, and you say, you know, cars dropping out and everything else. Only a couple and only a couple of incidents ahead of it that have actually taking cars out of the way but it's being it's having the speed to ride those cautions and to and to figure out whether to pit or not to pit whether to drive a change or not to drive a change that's what allows you to creep up the order mm. and we saw it at Le Mans with with the leading Jota car and LMP2 every time there was a caution every time there was a stop they didn't lose and frequently they gained and, and then you end up with that sort of momentum as we go back to green flag racing uh, setting the stopwatch going on this one. And a dive there through the traffic by Danny Junkadea and also Thomas Prining Ooh. tries to get through the traffic as a, well. There was a little touch there, I think, with the Porsche. I think that was yeah, just about another little touch, but he just made a little contact with the Audi going into La Source. That Audi is Arnold Robin in the car that has just been hoiked out of the gravel after Ulysse de Pau's incident. So the, the last thing that needs is yet more strife. Carl's plough uphill then. This is the start of lap number 62. And Thomas Prining is back at the races, isn't he? Because that car had dropped away in the second hour of the race from the Mercedes, but it's certainly coming good now. It's back into the mix as the car's coming towards Lecom and a move is made on the outside line, but it doesn't work. Can't well, go through there. And either he or the car are very good at bringing those tyres on away from the restart because the Mercedes is clearly struggling there for a grip on the on the colder tyre and the Porsche has got grip to throw around all over the place. Looking down the inside into Bruxelles, Rivage, depending on your age and ability to remember new corner names, past the new uh, motorcycle corner down there at Courve Jacques. 
or Speaker's Corner or Turn 9, depending on your preference, yes. <laughs> on your age. Now, look at this battle. Thomas Prining absolutely on his toes, isn't he, yeah. on this restart. So you've got Danny Junkadea, who's a little bit better, maybe, through Pawn. That gap just stretches slightly. Prining is there in third spot. Fourth is Daniel Serra, but he's got a few back markers yeah. to clear. And also, we need to see where Niederhauser is. He's only half a second back, so Serra versus Niederhauser. That is coming alive. Look, as they come under the gantry, they're together. Yeah, the bright yellow Ferrari, that's Daniel Serra. The two cars in front are a lap down on this lead group. And as you say, Patrick Niederhauser is the predominantly black Audi right behind that bright yellow Ferrari. So Daniel Serra with plenty to think about. And this is where all that driver experience comes in because you've got to try and figure out where you're going to go by the Mercedes in front. And as we pointed out before, it's not a slow Mercedes because it's a GT3 car, there are no different classes here. It is just a well-driven Mercedes, and he's going to have to find a gap to get by without giving Niederhauser the chance to get by him as well. So up towards the timing line, you see how aggressive some of them are right. way up the curb, yeah, as yeah, we yeah. had in the Super Bowl yesterday. Well, so Junker go. goes through. Here comes Daniel Serra trying to thread his way through the traffic then. 004 on the Lumirac means fourth place overall. Fifth behind him is Patrick Niederhauser, who is right there. He's really good at getting through the traffic as well. The next car in the queue is going to be 100, the grey Porsche. That's Marvin Dienst, but he's got back markers to clear. And then seventh, another place gain is Andrea Caldarelli. And look at Rob Bell there, coming yeah. steaming up the inside of the McLaren. That was brave. <laughs> well, Rob Bray, Bell's obviously got his brave pants on in this stint. That's, uh, that's, uh, and again, you know, only a lap on those tyres to get them back up to temperature. Teammates side by side, Lamborghinis with Ferrari and Porsches queuing up behind to try and get through. And this is really difficult, you know, whether you're on the same lap battling for position, whether you're a lap or several apart, still the, the first rule is, do not impede and do not hit your teammate. Now, here down the inside, Danny Serra picks up or gets by another back marker, doesn't pick up a place. He's still in fourth place with Patrick Niederhauser right behind. Yeah, those Emil Frey teammates from the Lamborghinis are on different laps, but you're absolutely right. The last thing you need is contact between them as they plunge downhill. They're now out of uh, speaker's corner. You know, in the, in the garage, they're just like watching through their fingers yes, going, yes. please don't, please yes. don't, please don't. Look away now, nothing yes. to see here. <laughs> Where's the next fight going to come from out of this leading group? Now there, number 32, that's Dries Van Thor, and he's dropped back on the pit stop. So 18, that car has dropped to. Uh, so Dries Van Thor is now looking at... How many pit stops has he done? He's done three, so he, yeah. They've made... An extra stop. A fuel stop, haven't they? Did they yes. do a short stop on the... F they can't have done it. That's far too long to have gone on a, on a, a, on a short, short stop. So they must have done a full stop. I think they have, and what they're trying to do, therefore, is, is play this so that they can do a short stop at some point to balance it out. Yeah. Yeah. So In case we go green all the way to the flag. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it, there's sort of... Sort of two rules of American endurance racing that I always think of when you've got a race like this is obviously going to be hugely interrupted. One is track position. Stay on the lead lap at all costs. Now, that obviously is a huge lap, and so you actually want to stay within the top half dozen. But track position is going to be vital and never miss the opportunity to fill up, which is the diametric opposite of maintaining track position. So. You know, now you've just got to read it as it goes. Whatever plan you had before the battle started is, is the first casualty, isn't it? But what surprises me a little bit, if they are taking the decision to keep refueling, is that in doing so, they're jeopardising their place at the end of six hours, and yeah. they're fighting for the endurance and the sprints and the overall combined championships. You'd think, and there is driver oh. for the Sky Tempesta Mercedes, you'd think they'd want 32 Audi always, always, always up at the pointy end of the order. Absolutely. Now, who was at the wheel of it? It was Jonathan Hui, wasn't yeah. it? And Jonathan's had a, a drama coming out of the chicane. Hour three has not been a good hour for that car so far, not. has it? No. What are we now? 30, 45 minutes into hour three, and, and it's, yeah, it's been all drama. Right, there is Dries Van Thor. He's just gained a place. He's up to 14th at the expense of uh, Thomas Tuyula in the Emil Frey Racing Lamborghini. Quick look out of our window to see whether the Sky Tempesta Mercedes has got going. It has, it's just gone past us now, so the road is clear at the end of the lap. Which is all good news, so the circuit remains green and bits of dust and uh, the old bit of gravel all over it. And again, once we get into the nighttime hours, the lights are going to make it very hard 
and the lack of lighting around the circuit and be make it very hard to spot where errant piles of gravel have been left by somebody who went off half a lap earlier. So it, it's all those little trip hazards that get laid out around the track. And certainly even in six hours of world endurance, the line got notably narrower yeah. because, uh, you know, especially places like Piff Path where there are, you know, it, it's a well bunkered green in, in golfing terms. You know, there is gravel everywhere. Down here as well at the bottom of the hill, lots of gravel everywhere. When you go through Campus and, and Paul Freire, there, it, there will be a lot of gravel by the time we get into the night. So they swoop their way now through Blanchiment. Rob Bell is the man on his toes here trying to clear the traffic as they come down to the chicane. That car ahead look in 50th place. He's about to go through on the inside line as he gets up the inside. Yes, should go through. Moves himself ahead of Arnold Robert and in turn tries to fend off the traffic behind. So, over the line, Gutz to Junkadea. That gap is coming down because Danny Junkadea in second place has just done the fastest lap of the race. Wow. The gap is down to 1.8 seconds. Priming is third and going with them. Fourth is Danny Serra. In fifth place, Drive it is Nina Hauser. to car 93 for causing a collision and the safety car procedure. And the penalty coming for 93 for causing a collision under the safety car procedure. That was the attack on the number nine Antares Al Porsche that is back in the race but has lost about 10 laps now with Jackson Evans having taken over that car. Full so. course yellow infringement for the Attempto Racing Audi as well. Car yeah. number 66 has been noted, so there will be a penalty applied for that. There are a number of teams that are going to have longer pit stops a number of times during this race, you sense. And actually, you talked about this earlier with John, it's a really good way of applying it instead of having to do a drive-through, which on this monumental pit lane, you know, it's effectively lost half a lap. So you just add a few seconds to your pit stop. And that's something that you can sort of manage a little bit. Well, right now, you're looking at Lawrence Van Thor, number 47. That car started on the last place of the grid. Yes, there were three that started in the pit lane, but it has worked its way up through the field. Uh, Nick Tandy has been busy tweeting about uh, it taking it back to his oval racing days, where the better you do, the further back you start. And uh, <laughs> the car even had a red flag over the roof of it. So in, in stock car racing terms, if you're really good, you have a red roof, you start at the back. So he's had to work his way through. He said it's just like the old days. Uh, and they've done a good job with that car, getting it into the mix. This is Jonathan Hui. Uh, who is coming into the pit lane to serve this penalty. Yeah, and he is coming all the way down the endurance pits. That side of La Source, keep on going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In your own time. <laughs> it, I, it must just feel forever. And, and particularly on a warm day like today, when you've been working hard, and you've made a mistake, and then you get really like flushed and annoyed with yourself. He yeah. must be absolutely dripping sweat. And very little air getting into the car at that slow speed, of course. As or, this next... or indeed at any speed. Engineers well, like to seal them off. That's don't true. They? That's yeah. true. Uh, this next battle pack comes up towards the chicane. Uh, there, number 19, Lamborghini, which was the car that Arthur Rougier was hustling along earlier on. It's now Giacomo Altway at the wheel of it as it comes out of the chicane. Uh, behind, you've got James Collado there in the white Ferrari from Iron Links. Behind him, there is Matthew Jaminet. And behind Jaminet is 47, the KCMG Porsche of Van Thor. That is Jaminet. That cool. was a dive for position, and that worked beautifully. But does James Collado get the cut back on the inside? It doesn't look Ooh. like he did. Jaminet controlled it at the apex. But here comes the Ferrari side yeah. by side up against the concrete. Look at that. Virtually trading paint, Porsche up the curb. Ferrari goes through. <laughs> that was brave. That's a world champion. At Girls, that's the way it's done. And again, you know, he spends most of his time racing GTE spec cars, which are very different. And now look at Van Thor. Yeah. Van Thor gets a tow, goes to the outside, and as he's trying to find a way past Jaminet, Jaminet comes back right round the outside yeah. of James Collado. He Can't got the tow, it. runs off the road. Yeah, goes through the marina, doesn't yeah. make it through, but takes the place, so he will have to give that back. I would have thought so, because well, he's gained an advantage yeah. by being off the circuit, but he might wait for somebody to tell him that. They're grown-ups, they'll know. Well, what he'll try and do is give it back to Collado, where he can immediately yeah. attack the Ferrari again, and that's not sector two. I think the Ferrari is going to be a little stronger than the Porsche in sector two, but he also wants to make sure that only Collado gets back. So here he goes. Look, he's pulled over to one side. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's like when you... Oh, little tag on the back of James Collado's Ferrari. So Collado will be going, come on. Get that's on not it. how you do it. Yes. Don't tag me as you're giving the place back. Well, James has been a regular on Fanatec GT Endurance Grids this year. Yeah. And, and
set to the championship. Uh, and you can see that he is wanting the Porsche to go past because he's backed off a little bit and he's got them all stacked up behind now. Well, Collado's now got the place back that he unfairly lost. And yeah. so now, again, in sector two, starting just to creep away a little bit from the Porsche. They're not that different in overall lap time. It's how you make your lap time that, that is the real differential between the cars and some will be stronger on brakes, some will be stronger in the tight stuff, some will be stronger in the quick stuff, some will have fractionally better top speed, but it all ends up to, in theory, being identical lap times. Indeed so. And the margin between the leaders still only 1.9 seconds. They're all lapping in the 219. You know, it's a couple of tenths here, a couple yep. of tenths there. It really is. So Gert Junker they are priming, then Sarah fourth, Patrick Niederhauser fifth. Now Niederhauser is in the car that uh, Christopher Mies started, and that's just quietly got on with the job. This is the replay of Jaminet versus Collado. Look how close James Collado was to the wall. He finds all the dirt and all the dust. Totally committed, foot to the boards. They yeah. trade paint almost there. Porsche on the outside, Ferrari on the in, and then Lawrence Van Thor arrives on the scene. Yeah, it, it's more doable this year because they resurfaced that whole dip in Eau Rouge from here down through the dip. That big ripple that was in the middle really unsettled the cars has gone. And you come over the crest and re resurfacing goes, there you go, you can just yeah. see the end of it. And the drivers were saying when we we're here for WEC, so much safer because the car isn't suddenly snapping sideways in the middle of Eau Rouge. Stefano Constantini in the AF Corsa Pro-Am car in 41st place. Probably lost a couple there, did he? Or did he loop round harmlessly? He looped it around harmlessly. Yeah, I lost Certainly a couple of no spots as well. Yeah, so. lost two places yeah. on the road. Uh, there is 221. This is quite a long way down now, which it means that 26 is Richard Leitz. Yeah. Now, that's after the last roll of the dice on the pit stops. It's made an, a, a bit like the 32 WRT Audi. It's made another stop. But still on the lead lap, yeah, and absolutely. because of the safety car compressing everything, lost much less physical track yeah. space to the leader than he would otherwise have done. So, yeah, you know, again, safety cars, you, you have to be a lot brighter than me to know how to use them. It, it takes me a long while to figure out why that was a good idea or, or possibly sometimes wasn't. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm trying to unravel it myself, but the fact that you've got two top teams, GPX and WRT, yeah. that elected to do a, an extra stop, well, we'll find out as the well, race we know goes that on. We know it? for a fact that everybody at WRT is brighter than us. Yes. So, so we'll we'll take that as a given, and I, and I it wouldn't must be the right thing. Then. I, and I wouldn't insult GPX by saying that they're not either. However, everybody else has clearly got their own pet theories about the best way to go and and, and skin this cat. What it does mean is that you are because you're a pit stop ahead. If you fast forward that to the end of the race. You do oh. your last pit stop and you lose places, but then everybody else makes their last pit stop. You buy back those places, so you could be in the lead when everybody else peels in at the end of the 23rd hour for the stops as the Bentley spins. That's my uh, theory. It, it, it's a theory. Keep nodding. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. <laughs> right, Anel. OK, so we're now starting to get uh, tail enders. Who came in? Uh, Tuila. And Tuila in the Lamborghini. On, yeah. Uh, Michael Dorbecker in the Lamborghini. But, but who was the first? Was it Dorbecker who came in first? One of the one of the back markers that was in that sort of top ten group. If that was a green Lamborghini, that was Dorbecker. Yeah, it was dark, so it was either green or blue. Right. Okay. Yeah. That, that's, is that helping? Uh, uh, not really. Uh, absolutely. No, yes. Not really. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good luck in the night. And <laughs> I know, I know. It'll be, be perfect. Honestly, well, at least I'll be able to see the screen because the sun won't be shining in our eyes. There's the and beach. And all the cars will be dark. Yes. Yeah, beach team Aston. Well, it's a headlight identification time, isn't it? <laughs> it's worth tuning in for everybody. I promise you. Um, <laughs> hey, prime time. It is. Yeah, yeah. No, none of your graveyard shift nonsense. It is prime time. <laughs> and again, talking about the low sun, you know, I, I sort of. Uh, suggested that might possibly be part of the reason that, that a couple of drivers didn't see the red light at pit out. When you're coming back up the hill, there is going to be a lot of bright sun in your eyes, but it's just about dropping behind the trees now. And actually, a couple of clouds have got in the way, so um, makes life a little easier. But as you can see, the length of the shadows now, as soon as you turn the corner, you've got a great grimy, oily, fly splattered screen, and you're trying to figure out where the car in front has suddenly vanished to. Well, Lawrence Van Thor, I think, is the man to watch in this uh, group because although 12th, that car is certainly getting itself 
into the mix. Talk about the lead lap. We have certainly got the leading 36 on the lead lap, and that yeah. could be more depending on the, the stragglers coming over the line. So, you know, there is still a lot in this, whether it's overall or for the class positions. Well, and that's absolutely right. And because of the safety cars, because the field has been bunched up again, when you come into the pits, you lose seemingly significantly more places than would be the yeah. case in the first couple of hours when everything was green and everyone is spread out. So here we go. Now we get to the end Leaders of the next hour in. virtually and in come the top three. Yeah. Uh, and again in incidentally comes 32. So uh, quick pit stops in succession there. Yeah. So this is the leading car. So now in, in theory things should start to balance a bit. Uh, 23 in as well. Karim OJ uh, uh, from 23rd place kind of a 10. Uh, so yeah. Daniel Serra in as well in the Ferrari. Yeah, and Thomas Van Neubauer, Tour, Marco Sorensen. Marco Sorensen in that Aston. That's the lead Aston. Lead Aston is currently 16th. Lead BMW was 13th. We'll pick up a few places because there is a slew of stops in front. But of course, if they are running out of fuel, then unless you're running on Miracle. All right, in has just come Dries Van Thorpe. There is Danny Junkadea. They're in the bottom pits. Top pits for WRT. I'm interested to see now whether 221 comes in, Ricard Leet's car, uh, because that was another one that had done an extra stop. Mm. But I, I would have thought that by 32 coming in again, it's not benefiting. It's still going to be behind all those other cars that have come in. It's not you staying think. out to gain places. Yeah. So uh, 221 is in the middle sector of the lap at the moment, and uh, Ricard Leet's will show us whether it's worth coming into the pits or not now to, to try and buy that track position. In terms of what the what the pit stops do to you. Nick, Lella, Nick Yellerly was the lead BMW in 11th place in the 98 Rover racing car. They made an earlier stop and he's now down in 23rd. So it's going to be interesting to see when the 22 cars in front all catch up yeah. onto the same number of stops, where that brings him back. If it brings him back to sort of 10th, 11-ish or where he's, whether he's further down. And again, to a degree, for Lisa Crampton, who's who's helping manage the strategy on that team, it is a little bit of a kind of suck it and see because everybody is so compacted, it sort of skews the normal rules and of engagement. So there's there's I think there's going to be an awful lot more learning in the next few hours before everybody is really. I mean, they, they may be well ahead of that, but I think they're, they're still going to have to adjust to it. Yeah, now that look is Gertz and Junkadeo. They've stayed behind the wheels of the cars, but the gap is markedly down between them. Replay here of more drama up towards Les Combes, and poor old 57 <laughs> yet again gets turned around. Oh, oh, and then gets collected, blimey. When it's not your day, it is not your day. It's still Jens Liebhauser, who has... That door's had a lot of action, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that right-hand door, bloke. the passenger door. He must have a magnet in him, because yeah, everybody absolutely. seems to be driving into him. Well, there are the leads to the Jyoti car. So, who is staying out? Grenier. Grenier. Grenier is going to be leading in the Mercedes, isn't mm. he? Rob Bell's in, having uh, full service. And Leeds has stayed out. So, Ricard Leeds is about to buy back the places he lost on that last pit yes, stop. Yes, because he's already done a third stop. Correct. So... And the Bentley is in again. Now, did the Bentley come in when it spun or did it just carry on? I think it probably just carried, carried on. on. It was actually. in that sort yeah. of situation where they could perhaps have jumped across the road and, and, uh, and didn't, it looks like. So 2-2-1 two, two, stays out and is now up to 13th from wherever he was. Ah, is now up to second yeah, from he's, wherever he was. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's brought back all the places. There is 55, yes. so Mikhail Grenier, whose last pit stop was a short stop, mm. uh, therefore inherits the lead, and there is... But presumably two, two, then, one. is going to owe us a stop and we'll have to come back in and we'll drop back down the order. Well, he's done three, so he's on the right schedule now. Everybody else is balancing. Yeah, but if one him. was a short stop and nobody else did yeah. a short stop, he's still running on fumes. KCMG's Lawrence Van Tour in the pit lane. So who has yet to make a third stop? Dean McDonald in 188. You would think that. Now, the problem is, of course, that the pit stop counter is triggered when they come into the pit lane. It doesn't necessarily the, mean that they did a regulation pit stop. Oh. It could mean they came in for damage, and 188, I don't think, came in for damage. They've only done two stops, but that's the sort of thing that when we're all tired, them and us, mm. tomorrow morning, 
you're going to go, oh, well, they've done 17 stops and everybody else has only done 15. So they should be good to go. Yes. No, because they had damage at, they, at 8 o'clock in the and, evening. And, and, of course, and, some, and some of them can be drive through penalties or stop and go penalties yes. that you have to serve. Yeah. You know, yeah. If you're in the pits, you're in the pits. Doesn't exactly matter right. say, for what reason. It still triggers it. Right, so the cars go back onto the circuit. We are, he says, holding breath, touching wood and all of that, <laughs> looking at a reasonable number of green flag laps now. But yeah. the race order uh, is Patrick Niederhauser. For the moment, it's credited as being the leader, but then as Mikhail Grenier goes across the line, 55 yeah. is ahead of Ricard Leitz. Now, 3.7 seconds between Grenier Mercedes and uh, Leitz Porsche for the race lead. Dean yep. McDonald in 188, uh, which has only done two pit stops anyway, is up into third. And these are the Mercedes a long, long way back, 46th and 47th, where you've got number three, which uh, Jeff Kingsley was driving when we last looked, and it's Valdemar Eriksson now squabbling with Chris Froggart, who's got on board the Sky Tempesta car. Here is Richard Leitz, and he's hustling on in pursuit of Mikhail Grenier. Dean McDonald third in the 188 Mercedes, uh, McLaren rather. Nick Yellowley now up to fourth from, what yes. did we say was, 23rd before the round of pit stop started? Liège, I think yeah, you said he was, yes. Exactly, yes. <laughs> still in France. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Valentino Rossi now up to fifth position in his second stint, and they've all done three stops, with the exception of Dean McDonald, who is currently running in third place, and the top well, Valet there is 15 seconds back, but top four, Grenier, Leitz, McDonald and Yellowly covered by 6.7 seconds. So there's a large amount of real estate ahead of the fifth place car, Valentino Rossi, into which a number of others may well drop. Ralph Bone was up to sixth place in the uh, Herbert Motorsport 911. He's just gone into the pit lane for their third stop. Yes. And an hour and four minutes, 64 minutes and 42 seconds on that stint, 65 minutes the maximum. So that was a, a t time to perfection, I think you could say. Wasn't it though? Yes. Wasn't it though? If there'd been another 10 seconds on the safety car, he'd have had to come in a lap earlier. Well, indeed, although if the safety car is out when you get to the end of your stint, there is a five minute tolerance, yeah. in fairness. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I, I, I take your point. No, but that's, I mean, that's. But that's what you've got to be on top of. That's how Herbert Motorsport have won so many 24 8 series yeah. races by yeah. being really good at stuff like that. Well, right yeah. now, Grenier versus Leitz in the first sector, Ricard Leitz fractionally quicker. In the yeah. second, uh, Grenier slightly quicker. Dean McDonald, as we've been saying, is third. Yellowly fourth, Rossi fifth. And now the order becoming beautifully jumbled yes. because of these full course yellow periods. Uh, another oh, drama here, Garage 59. Is that it's the Stephen Grove? Car this time against the Grove McLaren. Uh, Grove Porsche, yes, you're right. Uh, no, it's Brendan, his son. So Brendan Steve, Grove, yeah. Stephen we saw getting turfed off into the gravel earlier on. So Brendan, both of them raced here last year in Porsche Mobile One Super Cup, but it was moist. Right. <laughs> Absolute stare odds. Of course, because that was the Grand Prix that wasn't. Yes. Uh, exactly yes, right. Well, yes, you know, yes. they managed to race the Porsches, but uh, so so their experience of this track most recently was was less than with Aqualines <laughs> rather yes. than what we have now. Yes, now, now this is the car of uh, number two, Maxi Gertz, and the reason I th think I'm right in saying that you've got the people that have done that jumping on the last round of stops be is because they made shorter stops. There's a regulation short and a regulation long pit yeah. stop, and they made a short pit stop for a splash of fuel. Uh, it still looks like a long stop because of the drive time, but a short stop is a maximum of six seconds to top well... up our fuel, and a short, uh, sorry, a long stop is the minimum of 41. And I think it's because they did a short stop that has got them ahead because the cumulative pit stop time was Drive through relatively penalty less. to car 63 for overtaking under full course yellow procedure. Now 63 is the Emil Frey racing Lamborghini. That's the Bortolotti uh, and Costa and Aitken car. They're too good to be making mistakes like that. Those are the, those are the sort of errors that when you look back and you're six seconds off victory, those are the sort of errors that you just go, oh. Now, all of a sudden, we've had a raft of retirements. When it goes grey on our timing screen, so what that now? means they're out. So, treble seven, that very badly damaged Mercedes of Alfaisal Al Zubair has gone. Teo Nue, number 97, that car has been shown as a retirement. Number 91, the Porsche that was hit from behind by the uh, Mercedes, Alex Malikin, that's retired. Uh, the jury is out as, to, uh, as regarding 23 of Alex Riberas, but all of a sudden, yeah, the, the retirement list has, has totted up, hasn't it? Yes, from from nothing in the first two hours, one then, and then suddenly, ding, 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 they're all 
four lane night nine pins well five pins yes indeed so this is the leading car and it shows how the clever teams use the pit stop strategy this is the car that is in second place and closing so Mikhail Grenier's last pit stop was one minute and 23 so that was a short stop yes uh, Ricard Leitz was a one minute 59.8 which was okay 159 two minutes is of standard, That's isn't the standard yeah, long yeah, stop yeah. time, uh, yeah. but because he was out of sequence, he's now bought back the uh, the places as others ahead of. Have, that's more timing than anything that's given him the positions back. Yeah. Uh, so when he stops next, he'll drop all the way back down, and others will gain places again. Dries Van Tour has made four stops. One of them was for a tyre problem. So uh, Dries Van Tour in 32 car, slow puncture. Oh, OK, right. Um, I mean, not a, not, not a dramatic one. We saw it ripping itself apart, but clearly there was something in the uh, dash going bing, bing, bing. Yeah. And uh, told them uh, time to get in the pits. Richard Leeds there, you saw 2-2-1 in second place. And there is the 32 car with air in all four tyres now. But that Dries Van Tour driven car, 26th, half a second behind. Marco Sorensen, the Aston Martin in front. Also lost five seconds early on with an extra uh, penalty to serve in the pits, didn't yes. it, for, for the pit yeah. lane speeding, yeah. so there was that as well to factor in. But, you know, this is, uh, John said it, you've said it, I've said it, Bruce Jones will say it over the course of the commentary as well. You can't afford to make these mistakes because all those little penalties, all those little losses of time add up, and at the end of 24 hours, it could be five, ten minutes worth. It's that classic quote in the, in the Coke-Pepsi war, the other guy blinked. Yeah. And, and, and literally, that's going to be the difference in, in some of these. It's, I mean, you think about the years that Bentley should have won this race and it was silly seven-second penalties that yeah. cost them and, yeah. and that sort of thing. You know, it's, it's, it's so tight and so professional in all, and so hard, the racing in all the classes, that any kind of frailty is immediately yeah. exposed. We're on for a lead change soon because Ricard Leitz is now 1.8 seconds back only from Mikhail Grenier, so 55 Mercedes leads the way, but 2-2-1, Ricard Leeds is getting closer and closer and closer. Uh, the erstwhile leader, Maxi Gertz, is currently 12, ahead of Danny Junkadea and Thomas Priming, so those that stopped uh, earlier have now jumped ahead after the leading train made it. Somebody going very slowly up the Kemmel Strait was watching the Dayglo. Is that, can, can we have a Grello Aston Martin? It kind Just of is-ish, yeah. isn't it? Was that's that... that's Marco Sorensen anyway, with all the lime green. That, is that Beach Dean's latest flavour? Must be, think? I mean, Andrew Howe's yeah. very busy with business, and this is what he's yes. clearly happened upon. I was wondering if that slow-moving car you pointed out had just come out of the pit lane rather than was having a problem. Yeah, possible, quite possible. Who's on a pit out lap? Uh, no one. Well, they've gone through a sector now, so it'll wipe, so. Yes. Um, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah. Anyway, right now, ride on board with Dries Van Thor because he's always well worth watching. And as the cars charge downhill, then this is currently lap 74 for the race leaders. Down through Pouin. It, it is reminiscent of last year's race, though, this for the Audi. It, it, it just creeps back into the mix. You know, it's not one of the gun cars right from the off, but you get to mid-morning mid on Sunday and, oh, hello, it's in the lead. Any car with that three letters on, W, R, and T, yeah. is if you count them out, it's only because it's either been rolled into a ball of scrap or it's a light or it's on the back of a truck heading home. Yeah, true. If, if it's still got fire in the hold, it's going to be a threat. Uh, there are good three letters to have, aren't they, going back to the history yeah. of Spa 24 hours, because TWR sure was that. quite successful at winning <laughs> yes. here as well. Re reshuffle the letters, W, R, T. Yeah. Uh, what's the link between the two? Sean Walkinshaw. Pierre Giudone, who won for oh, yes. Tom Walkinshaw Racing uh, in the Mazda RX-7s and is part of yes. WRT. There you go, fascinating fact 37. Uh, down to the chicane. I, I, I want answers on a postcard. <laughs> is there a Belgian driver of any significance now not plying his trade behind the wheel that does not work with WRT? Well, Bas Linders, who manages Inception Racing. There's that. That's, there's that one there's possible that. He, He's the outlier. Yeah. Yes, he definitely yeah. is, isn't he? I think Plastic Bertron has a job there now, doesn't he, as well? <laughs> uh, so, uh, out of the hairpin, this is Dries Van Thor you're riding with, and ahead of him in the Aston Martin, Marco Sorensen of the Dane train. If we uh, look out of our commentary window, there's a, a Dane train flag that's yep. uh, uh, joined all the Maxime Martin banners, oppositors. Yeah. Van Thor on the limit going up the hill, and there is the slow Mercedes. That looks like a puncture. That left rear doesn't look like it's entirely doing what it did all to. Oh, no, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I'm not sure it hasn't got air in, but it, it's not riding very well. Tim Muller yeah, from SPS. Down, 
So Tim Muller. Has he back. just taken that back over? Yeah, look at the wheel. Goodness me, that, that shot tells you everything you need. That's a little more camber than it was designed to have. If that was the Mercedes that was slow out of the pits, it makes me wonder that the wheel isn't on properly rather than suspension braking. That's possible. I would have thought it would be wobbling more. Mm. That does look like something has collapsed. Right. Yeah. That's Valentino Rossi's car. And this is for fifth place, place. now. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a battle for position. But look at, well, behind him, look, the Mercedes is in 53rd. That uh, is so Luigi it's... Ferrari. But so has he just gone by Luigi Ferrari then? I think he may well have done. Well, I thought Ferrari was trying to get him back because he was flashing on the lights, wasn't he? He seemed to look <laughs> at the pace, but, you know, we'll yep. see. Well, listen, if you don't get a chance to give Valentino Rossi a flash when you're in the tw Spa 24 hours, then we're with you. Fair point. And uh, uh -huh. this is Valentino Rossi under pressure from a car that's on a different lap. But uh, Valentino, yeah, again, you pick your battles, don't you? It, now, again, you need to race him. we're seeing the end of that. Had he just gone by him at Les Combes and, and mm. then just run out a little wide, here we are a lap later, much more under control. I mean, for Valley, it's, it's such a huge... I mean, it's like us trying to race motorcycles. None of what you know are... Uh, who is that in the gravel, just as David looks away? This is down at the Curve Jackie X, and it is car number 10. So, so that's going to be an interruption on the hour mark, isn't it? Karim Auger at the wheel of it, yeah. so that's down at Speaker's Corner. And as we saw yesterday, you go off and you absolutely shower the road oh God, with gravel. 10 seconds. Yeah, I mean, look at all the tyre marks. It looks like freshly fallen snow, doesn't yeah. it? And again, Five, you know, four, in the middle of the three, night, three, all you're going to see is headlights one, facing full you. Full course yellow now. We're going full course yellow, and that means, therefore, that with the number 10 uh, Audi off the racetrack, there it is in replay. Now then... I want to see that again because the car that went through in front did a massive bit of ditch hooking. I think Karim OJ then found a pile of gravel just as he was turning in on the brakes. That wasn't his. That yeah. was not his, yeah. Yeah, possibly so. Right, well, all that has kept us busy. There's the BMW, well, there's the BMW. That, that rattles some gravel. Here's OJ. Yeah, look, the yeah. dust there. Yeah. That's, that's not tyres. So off the road, Karim uh, OJ, that brings out a full course yellow so that's our fourth full course yellow to add to the chart and uh, John it's getting all very very busy out there and the pit stops now and, and, and reading when to make a stop and play the strategy is becoming ever more important well certainly 46 Ardy about to come in Fred Ravish all prepared Valentino Rossi will bring that car in as we go now a change of commentary i'm back john watson is back and he's joined by bruce jones bruce is going to drive this session for us bruce welcome to the booth and let's get stuck in with another full course shiller we had a, a very sort of early easy stage the first two hours nothing at all now full course yellows driver errors creeping in mechanical issues pit lane infringements and on it goes we have got the lot, John. You're quite right. That first hour, we were all predicting the lap one safety car. It wasn't. They behaved. Then, of course, at the end of the opening hour, we had puncture, puncture, puncture. Every time you looked up, another car was coming in slowly. However, it is becoming a little bit stop-start. No problems with that, though. Valentino Rossi, again, look, those belts just being loosened a little bit. He can't undo them as he comes into the pit, but he would have enjoyed that really good session. Some battling, but also being at the front end of the field. So he's undoing the seat belts, the, actually the waist belts as well as the shoulder harness, but don't undo the buckle, please, because that will be a penalty, a serious penalty. Well, so actually, the my... long run up the, the pit lane for Valentino now swings into the box to hand the car over to Fred Vavish. Yeah, Fred Vavish ready, but so for Valentino, he has worked his way through the rotor of penalties you can actually achieve for speeding in the pit lane, this, that, the other, but he is loving this racing. But every time you hear him, he says, don't, under, don't underestimate the level of this championship. You know, these are absolute pros at the front of the field. He's learning as he goes, but what a great teammate to have in Fred Vavish. Been there, seen it, done it. Born in Belgium, is Belgian, racing in Belgium, just adding a little bit of impetus for that number 47. Is, is mentoring, or ment mentoring, I should say, Valentino through his inaugural season in, in an extremely, that probably the, it is the most competitive GT3 championship across a season in the world. So the doctor walks back into the WRT garage and he will, oh, come on, Fred, don't stall it, so you get the car rolling. So he will go back in and debrief the engineers. I suspect he'll probably have a little something to eat, something light to eat and, and then top up on the fluids 
because it's been a sort of an unusual 24 hours here in Spa in that the weather's been warm all the way through uh, this race, been all the way all the way through the weekend since Thursday when I arrived. I thought, what's this is I'm not in Spa, it's not raining. No, I can't think. I mean, I've been coming to the Spa 24 hours since the mid 1980s, and you never came here without some form of rain clothing. You might have a beautiful weekend, but at some point it might be Friday morning, it might be Sunday evening, there would be rain. Yet, we thought people reported there were little sprinkles of rain about an hour and a half ago, but it came to nothing, absolutely nothing. So, perfect conditions on the circuit, but the full course yellow period is safety out there, car and the safety deployed. car yes. is deployed onto the circuit. So, uh, it's not the first time for this. This is the fourth full course yellow. David Addison has got a great chart on the wall, and in fact, I'm not sure it's going to be long enough to fill in He's got gaps for about 24 full course yellows. We hope we don't go to that. But this element, John, of the gravel traps nearer the edge of the circuit, it is a factor. At the end of the first hour, the teams were looking and trying to work out why their cars were picking up so many punctures. And it's debris on the track. Well, I think debris, debris is... Debris in terms of gravel. Well, I think that's one element. I think the other element is, and we've been also... We spoke about this earlier in the session, that some teams did take a little bit of the negative camber out of the rear wheels the reason they do that is if you run negative camber on the rear it gives you a much better feeling car but it puts a high load and a high temperature into the inside shoulder of a tire and if you in these conditions get that tire super heated then that's where you can lead to a tire failure so take out some of the camber maybe make the car a little bit less comfortable but make the car more consistent so it's a combination of a load of different things and the fact is that we've had a dry racetrack since we got here i got here thursday there was running on tuesday so it's i think it's almost a freak of nature that we've had five consistent days here at spa Francorchamps, and the racetrack has been bone dry all the way through well, it's been magnificent for all the racing last weekend, building up through testing and qualifying through the course of the week, and it's been an absolutely packed day here. We have uh, races for GT4, we have races, uh, fantastic, that celebration race, 30 years of uh, SRO celebrating their brilliant array of cars. We've had the French Formula 4, we've had the Formula Regional Europe. It's been a really, really ba busy, busy meeting, and they've got a lot of racing under their belts. Didn't, didn't that 30-year anniversary didn't quite take me back to my last days behind the wheel? I raced here in the late 80s in Jaguar XJRs and uh, I think a Toyota in 1990. So, um, it, but that was for the Group C Championship. So, looking at the order at the moment, Mikel Grenier leading the way, the 55. Uh, for, uh, the top four cars, we reckon, have effectively they timed their, their pit stops perfectly, got a free pit stop. Mikko Grenier, the 2-2-1 entry, Mike the Porsche, Michael Christensen, Nick Yololi, the 98 BMW, and Fred Verviche, important for Valentino Rossi, yeah, but in he, his he, Audi. He will drop back because Verviche has just returned to the circuit, so until he goes through the timing and scoring, I think he'll be one that will drop back. But then you've got uh, De, Fal De Falco in the number 11 RD in fifth, and then Simononi in the McLaren in 159 in sixth place. The, 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 the car that has been leading this race essentially from the start, the number two Mercedes, Maximilian Goetz behind the wheel, currently in 10th position, Danny Juncadella in the 88 car handed over by uh, Raffaele Marcello is in 11th, and Thomas Preening in the 54 Porsche is 12th, and then uh, um, Antonio Fuoco in the 71 Ferrari, 13th, Patrick Niederhauser, 14th, Andrea Caldarelli in the number six, that was the car that got the, the penalty after the shootout and had to start in 30th position. That car now notionally is in 15th position. But again, this pack is going to be completely shuffled. One car that's really impressed me has been the drive from the last place on the grid. Lawrence Van Torre is at the wheel at the moment. That KCMG Porsche. Nick Tandy, I can't remember how many places someone said he gained in his first stint. I think from something like 40. 40. I think it was 41 was the figure I had in mind. And he said it was great fun. He'd rather not have been doing it. But actually, when you're forced, your hand is forced. He had to have caution. We saw how hard it was to overtake. But, you know, this is a guy who's won here before. He's won but, one more. He I mean, is a craft. Yes, I mean, Nick, first of all, is a star act. Absolute star. Uh, and in a Porsche, is a, is a, is he gets two stars for that. And the fact that he made his way through uh, the field of so many cars, we didn't actually see very much of Nick Tandy's overtaking, but the benefit he had is he's got a super quick car, he's a super quick driver himself, he actually is a very good race driver. So combine all those three elements. So let's have a look and see if we're resetting. So Granny. Granny right. is still ahead of Michael Christensen and Nick Yellowly, so... But there's nothing in it. Those no. first two are covered by, what, a second? There is the BMW now. That's it. OK, third, third place, position looking for fourth now. place. The McLaren in the background, Ethan Simeone, is that coming into fourth place? No, that's one further down the order. 
Uh, so just there saw is, the there is and then the, uh, Fred Vavish. Fred Vavish in the background with the bright yellow flanks on his WRT Audi. It is Ethan Simeone, the Canadian driver. We've got two Canadian drivers in the top four. Michael Grenier leading the race and Ethan Simeone in one of those garage 59 McLarens in fourth place. But the thing you need to know is that 55 Grupa M entry is in the lead of the race, but only by a second. But then gapped from second to third from Christensen to Nick Yololi. Well, it's listed as 16 and a half seconds, but it's the battle between the first two at the moment. But many other people are going to be readjusted in this pack. And of course, when you have these unexpected uh, full course yellows and then ultimately a safety car, and it depends where it falls, whether it falls at a, a beneficial or an advantageous point for some teams to make that early stop and get in and out, or whether other factors have come into play. But whatever it is, those are the issues that are you know, so difficult to anticipate. You, you can have all, you can play your own little sort of internal war games, if you want to call them that, which is what teams are doing. They're, they're coming up with concepts, if and or buts, to try and be able to be on top of a scenario which could unfold at any particular point. So the team has got to know the right call they need to make now, not go away and think about it for 10 minutes, scratch their heads. You know, so much going on. One of the cars we saw just limping back into the pits about 10 minutes ago. It was the number 20 Mercedes. That was the uh, SPS automotive performance car. With David was wondering whether that uh, left rear wheel hadn't been attached properly and they limped I around. Thought it was a suspension Martin thought it was suspension and indeed left rear damper. Oh, damp OK, unusual for a damper to break. Whether it was a damper mounting broken, it looked more like a mounting rather than the damper itself. But whatever it was, the car. There was an example of extreme negative camber. So the safety car is now uh, letting the field get up to a better pace. Uh, exactly so, and closing up. So when I was talking about the big gap between Christensen in second place in that 2-2-1 Porsche and Nick Yololi in third, of course, that is being compressed all the time behind that Audi safety car. In turn, that means Ethan Simeone is getting closer in the McLaren. And then the best of the Audis, Fred Vavish, likewise in fifth place overall. Then a bit of a gap back to the number two. Uh, team Get Speed Mercedes with uh, Maxi Gertz at the wheel of that. That's your top six, but it's not bad, John. Mercedes, Porsche, BMW, McLaren, Audi, and then the first repeat manufacturer, that's uh, Mercedes in six. Yes, place. I mean, poor Ethan Simeone is the only non German manufacturer in the top six, and he's driving for the archetypical British McLaren team. Now, at one point, the I'm just looking to see where the Jota McLaren, because that was at one point the lead. Rob Bell down in 22nd position. So again, probably caught up in this sort of beneficial pit stop, by, almost like a free pit stop for those cars that currently are leading. And the ones that had been dominating and leading the race you know, in, in an earlier phase, when you had the number two, Max Gertz. Well, now Gertz is been called second, uh, sorry, a big one called sixth, Jungadella seventh, preening in the 54 Porsche, that's the Viper Green Porsche in eighth, then Antonio Fucchio in the 71 Iron Lynx Ferrari, and then De Foco in the number 10, and that's second in its class to Ethan Simeone. So that's in the ID. And there's still course vehicles out on the circuit just past the commentary box window, which is overlooking the start finish straight. So just pretty much where this group of cars behind the safety car uh, goes past, there was a tractor driving up the left hand side of the track. Presumably that will be pulling off uh, at the entrance to La Source and yeah, it's never, out never of the way. a great thing to see a, a, a recovery vehicle going against the flow of traffic. But there it is now joining the flow of traffic. Nice line into um, to La Source. What, what nice line in. Put that photograph in, on the internet. What would the caption be? Well, it would suddenly take it to a new market, Tractor Weekly, a fabulous <laughs> magazine. An amazing looking bit of a kit. It absolutely looks superb. I think well, it's, it's, a, not a Lamborghini, it's, it's so in the wrong environment, yeah. Bruce. It's not a Lamborghini, so it's not Jeremy Clarkson off, off the farm. But again, even just looking at that shot, looking down from that source, a little kink past the uh, pit entrance, the lower pitch, you can see still gravel just on the inside of the circuit there, just uh, glowing as the sun caught it. So the 55 Mercedes of Michael Grenier and Michael Christensen not necessarily behind him in this line of cars, but it looks like he is. There is the 221 Porsche. So, I mean, this returns to green flag racing. It's all going to get a bit sort of tasty, I would say. Well, well it certainly is. And the car running in third place is fourth in that queue of cars. That's Nick Yololi. He's got a he's got a back marker between him and Grenier and Christensen, the two, the first two in this race. He's got to move past that back marker very quickly. And for Ethan Simeone, you know, this this is a high standard to be at. And Ethan, you know, short in years of racing, the young Canadian racer, but uh, suddenly to find yourself as the sun is starting to become a little bit magical. Look at that soft evening light 
Here he is at Spa Francorchamps, and he's running in fourth position overall, so he'll be absolutely loving life at the moment in that Garage 59 McLaren. So that's one of the Garage 59 entries, so sharing that car with Nikolai Shelgar, Manuel Maldonado, and, and James Baldwin. James Baldwin, of course, drives, has driven for Bob Neville's RJN team in British GT, and uh, Bob's taking a keen interest in the progress of young James Baldwin. Well, and just to give you James's backstory, he was a, a sim racer who, who won big in that and got a reward to come and uh, race properly, full metal racing, and his first attempt at the British GT Championship, he won the opening round at Alton Park, no less. So, well, of absolutely course, you, phenomenal. Of course you'd win your opening round at Alton Park. What a wonderful racetrack to win your opening round on. Yeah, it was really interesting, actually, this year. Jules Gunion competing in the, in the British GT Championship, uh, and he raced for the first time at Alton Park and came away Oh, I wish we had more circuits like that because simply the thrill well, of I having mean, a circuit with, with very well, small areas off the track. Bruce, well, I mean, OK, we've got large runoff areas here, but effectively what we've got now is what he, what Gilles Gunion was enjoying at Alton Park, and that is limited amount of track. You're not allowed to abuse track limits. We're seeing a lot. I mean, there's a whole load of I mean, on the other timing and scoring screen we've got here. There's about two dozen track warnings for people abusing turn 17. A lot of us at turn 17, which is down at the exit of Blanchemont. Some of it turn four into Lake Coombe. It's basically it's it's only turn 17 and turn four. There's a number of certain parts of the racetrack which are being monitored. I thought track limit abuses, but I mean, I think 17, the exit of Blanchemont, is the one where most drivers are falling foul of track limits. I'd be very interested to analyse after the race because our, when Raffaele Marcello came in after that double stint, he'd earned five penalties for exceeding track limits, and that uh, uh, turned into a 25 second penalty. A big hurt. He didn't really know where he'd got it wrong, but I guess he'll have sat down with the team and they said it was there, it was there, it was there. He needs to know because he cannot afford to go out in the car that's running in seventh position yes. overall and gain another 25 seconds of penalty time. Absolutely not. I mean, I, I, look, a driver of his quality doesn't need to abuse track limits, so safety car, Bruce, thank you for that. Safety in, car. in at the end yes. of the lap was the um, important element there. Fabulous shots as the cars are going up to Eau Rouge Taradi on this and that magnificent grandstand at the top with two layers, two decks yep. uh, beneath them of probably some of the best VIP suites in the world. Well, it's coming up to 8.15 here at Spa Francorchamps. The race has been underway for three, three and a bit hours. So still following the safety car all the way down to Bruxelles. There's Michael Grenier just follows the pace. The safety car is running at it. Can run quicker if it's suit chooses but now we've got everybody more or less line astern the pace is being controlled and ultimately then the safety car will pull away and uh, well Mald uh, to, uh, Maldonado in the 159 that's been a that's been a change a late pit stop for that car so it's come in Maldonado's taken over so that's elevated Fred Vavish up to fourth and Max Max Gertz up to fifth and I suspect it's going to do much the same for Junker Della before the safety car um, what was it, comes across the line. Well, probably an inspired time to make a pit stop while it's still safety car period. But we've seen Fred Favish, you just mentioned him, move up to fourth place overall. We are going to hear from his teammate after great uh, strategy there. Let's hear from the driver who got out, from Valentino Rossi. Valet, watching the timing screens there, uh, the car's up in fourth position. I mean, it's just fantastic. Yes, uh, we gain uh, a lot of uh, position in this uh, first part of the race, uh, and it uh, was good. I enjoy a lot. Uh, you are always in a battle, you are always in the jungle. You have always two or three cars behind, two or three cars in front. But it was good, because especially... In the second, uh, in the second stint, uh, I, have a, I have a good feeling with the tires and with the car, and I, I make a, a good pace. And also, we we were lucky with the, with the strategy, and we gain a lot of position. So now, now we are there. But you know, it's a 20 hours and a half <laughs> to the end. <laughs> yeah, it's a big countdown still to go. Talk to me a little bit about those stop starts because you really suffered a lot with the full course yellow, the safety cars. Green yeah, for flag, me it's completely green new, flag. and uh, it's not easy because uh, in, in MotoGP never happened. But uh, also, if you go slow, uh, you need the to, to keep the tire in um, in, uh, in temperature and also it's very dangerous because everybody break and restart, break, restart. So you are uh, like uh, like uh, in uh, in Rome, you know. So you have to keep attention very much. But uh, I try to, to improve uh, time by time, and uh, it's not easy. But uh, is that these type of races are like this? And it's important to remember you're in here amongst guys who've been doing this for many years, and this is a steep learning curve for you. You're doing a great job, buddy. Grazie, grazie. Thanks a lot. 
Well, great to hear from Valentino there. And just the noise you could hear in the background in the pit lane as the cars really got up to speed. But what I would say, John, at that restart, the drivers who were a lap down very e moved to the side to let the front rows come through. Nick Yololi would be saying thank you very much because he was fourth in that line of cars. First two, nose to tail, Mikel Grenier just ahead of the Porsche, the 221 Porsche from GPX Racing with Michael Christensen up at Le Corbe at the top of the hill. First part negotiated in this wonderful light. But importantly for BMW fans, Nick Yololi is closing right on the tail. Three car battle for the lead of the race. And I love that phrase from uh, Rossi. Yeah. In the jungle, racing yeah, in the that, jungle. And for Fredrovich in fourth place, but he's got Max Gertz directly behind him. Jung Godella likewise just behind Gertz, preening behind Jung Godella. Foco behind, preening. And on it goes to, in the next five or so laps, the group of cars that were the initial lead group of cars will be very much involved with the current top four. But Michael Christensen and the number 221 Porsche is the one that may be more likely to make progress. In fact, he has made progress. No, it's not. It's, look, there it is there. So he's still behind Mikel Grenier. Now, Grenier has got to deal with one of the Audis directly ahead of him. And that, again, is the opportunity that Michael Christensen will be waiting and looking for. But look how Yellowly has closed down to the back of the Porsche since having cleared that back marker at the restart. Right, the big question is how they can get past uh, Ria Chiro Tamita, who is running that Audi just in front of them. They all need to get through, and certainly the advantage, John, at this point is with Mikel Grenier, the first of those three cars, but he's got to pick him up before the bus stop if he can. He's not close enough to do it. They're going to have to go through Blanchimont, get the cars down to slow, slow right down for the bus stop, and it's going to have to maybe be into La Source. Hopefully the Japanese driver has seen them, is aware of them. Yes, they're right behind him, but uh, he has to turn in at some point to the bus stop. So, of course, Mikko Grenier is thinking, right, right, where's the next point? The next point but, is La you know, Source. That's where I the boost got I to believe come. the liability, responsibility in situations as we are watching right now is in the team to say, look, there's the lead cars coming alongside you. Don't get involved. Let it go. He's not in your race. So that's what he does. Good teamwork I suspect from the pit bull but this is the battle in now uh, in effect Christensen I think maybe didn't appreciate that Yellowly has actually closed down so quickly onto the back of the Porsche and the BM looks as if it's got the legs of the Porsche on the run down the hill into Urouge. Yeah and in fact misidentification it was Arnold Robin who's running in 54th position the Audi they got past he was nicely out of the way but the first three cars nose to tail and and Nick Yellowly if he was a car length further, further forward, he'd be really getting a fantastic toe. He's getting like two half toes. That's the good thing about being the third car in a bunch. But Group M Racing leading the way. Mikko Grenny perfectly timed yeah, his move into, into Le Combe to get got, one car between Yeah, him. got the advantage, got that little bit of free air. Now the Porsche and the BM are sort of hung out to dry while Tamita runs through Le Combe down the hill to Melbourne. Oh, well, what is... Oh, well, that's, uh, that's had to turn in. He had to turn in at some uh, point. He did indeed. Line. But uh, gosh, and, and curb hooking there from Michael Christensen as he went through Bruxelles. Now, Arnold Groban, not Tamita, just to point out, I got the driver wrong, uh, goes down the hill. He's still in front of them. Hopefully he'll now pull to, the, pull to one side of the track, make it absolutely clear. And oh, unfortunately for the BMW driver, for Nick Yololi, he thought that he was going the other 34 way. 34 and car 56. Not respect the red lights at pit exit. Oh dear, well that was uh, one of the walking horse motorsport BMWs, that's car number 34 and car 56, one it's of the dynamic, dynamic motorsport Porsches. Porsche, yeah. So that's Mikel Pedersen, Giorgio Roda and Mauro Calami. Cal 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 yeah, Calamia. So on board with the BMW Five second third position. time penalty added at the next pit stop for car 32, speeding in the pit lane. OK, let's take a look at the replay, how busy it was at the restart, coming down the slope. One of the cars was very, very wide at the top of the hill. Let's take a look at it coming up. The white Mercedes at the back of that grouping. That's, it's the yes. Sky Tempest, the racing car again oh, in well, another, I mean, another time zone. <laughs> I mean, a different world. I mean, I don't know quite the reason why that occurred. That's the onboard. Watch it from on board as the car drops down the hill. And, well, it's a very busy racetrack ahead of him, and he's wondering, did he get compromised or did he just take the... the well, again, it was the compromisers in the transition from left to right to No Rouge. You couldn't have done that a year ago because there's a very stout sort of earth bank there. And that's one of the improvements that they made at the top of Urus to give the cars if in the event something had to be done. So it got onto the dirty bit of yeah. the racetrack, actually. That was the main reason. So the Porsche actually slipped through at the same time at the exit of, of Radio. Yeah, Chris Frogger suddenly would have found uh, just not a lot of grip at all. It's uh, one of the most fearsome parts on the circuit. But our front runners are really going at it, hammer and tongs. Mikko Grenier leading by two and a bit seconds, but this battle for second place, Michael Christensen, Nick Yololi, and you know what? Fred Vavich is edging his way towards their tail. If he has a good lap, he is going to get on, on with them. Mikko Grenier has got that half-second advantage principally because 
he got through the traffic up at La Source. And of course, it took a little longer for Michael Christians and Nick Yonani to get through in second and third place. So now that 2.4 second advantage to second to first. Again, head down for Michael Christensen and Nick Yonnelly to try and run that down. As the 46 also slides past the one lap down, I think that's the 33 Audi. So Fred Ravish doing a strong job for the 46. Nick Muller and Fred Ravish, of course, they are the, 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 the seasoned GT3 racers and Valentino Rossi, the doctor, in his inaugural year learning as he goes about his work. I mean, there, there ain't any way to learn how to go quicker in one of these cars. you just got to go out and you know, do the miles. OK, so while he's waving the flag for Team WRT, the best place of the Audi is the best place from this Belgian camp, one of the sister cars, car 31, in the pits at the moment. Lewis Proctor still waiting to go back out, but they fear it's a it may be a clutch problem for him and his teammates, uh, Diego Mencharka and Finley Hutchinson. So that's the other end of the scale, but right now, Fred Vavish is glorying in this fourth place overall. And in the meantime, car 32, the W2 Audi, track warning at turn four. At the next pit stop for speeding in the pit lane. Oh, dear me, that's the one that just makes us shake our heads. Not as much as the team managers, but even as commentators, we just can feel all that good work unwinding. But the point is, John, as you, as you pointed out the first couple of hours of the race it's not a drive in and serve a five second penalty it's just at your next pit stop so you don't have to slow in the slow out no, no, plus that, the that, five that, seconds. That, that's a very severe penalty I, I like adding time to your pit stop okay. because i mean in, in some cases these are these occasions are not necessarily premeditated but there we see the second and third place cars porsche still under the cosh from the bmw then here comes uh, back skirts goes up the inside and likewise Danny Junker Dillard gets hopes to get through on the undercut coming off for the source well he's maybe gonna have to be patient because he's gonna wait until he gets through Eau Rouge and Radion before that move can be executed as the BMW cuts down and then swings back to the right up the hill the compression then the you, you look skyward for about half a second and then all of a sudden it, it, you, you reach the top and then it's all the way down the camel straight but after, after a restart like this, after the safety car period, you've got a jumble. You've got people who are lapped down. You've got people who are two laps down. And some of them are perfectly fast enough. They've just had their problems. But uh, so it's really hard for the top six to pick their way through these cars and keep advancing. Good to see that uh, yellow Ferrari pushing on so hard in the hands of Antonio Fuoco. That's in the top ten in eighth position overall. Its next target is Thomas Prining in the Porsche just up in front. Yeah, but that idea is going yeah, really, really, really well. well. There you see for the yellow Porsche and Ferrari that were locked together all the way through the opening hours. They're still locked together. It doesn't matter who's behind the wheel. Thomas Preening and Antonio De Pocchio, they're all stuck nose to tail. The Porsche's got the advantage at the end of the long camel straight. The Ferrari's probably quicker around other bits of the racetrack. And it's this seesaw in the this weaknesses and strengths of the two uh, differing brands, two totally different philosophies uh, in terms of car, car design. 11, five second time penalty at the well, next pit stop for field, speeding in the pit lane. with 66 runners in the field and these two cars can be stuck together, but I guess they've just been on the same routine, the, the same point of full course yellow has happened and the same time they've turned it to a safety car, they've dived to the pits at the same time. We're not complaining. If this runs all the way for 24 hours, very happy indeed. I'll tell Fabulous you who is battle. complaining and that is Danny Juncadella. He's caught behind the the Audi, there you see it. Uh, that's the car that got cleared by Maximilian Gertz. So Gertz is able to stretch an advantage. There he, where is he? Let's watch it there, okay. Well, that blue and white Audi is four laps down. Yes. But in fact, Arnold Robin is getting great pace out of it. He's lapping at the same pace as the front runners, but Ooh, yeah, you're quite- they ran very wide on the exit of Blanchemont on that occasion. So again, Yucatella looking to find a way through as we're getting this stacking of the cars running behind. And still, still, Yucatella hasn't been able to find a way around the Audi. Now the Audi's pulling over to the left. Hopefully, that's going to let Yucatella go through. So all he needs to do is now lift and coast, and he doesn't even bother doing that. Well, there we go. What can I say? Well, if I say any more, I'll talk myself into an issue. Yeah, well, anyhow, that means 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th on nose to tail. And now Andrea Calderelli up to 10th place. Bear in mind, that's the car that started 30th after its problems, the K-Pax. Racing Lamborghini has been going supremely well since then, and I'm sure more places will come its way. And great to see Lawrence Van Thor in the, the 47 Porsche, the car that didn't get to qualify, and that car is up into the top 15. It's in 13th place, just found his way around Nicholas Nielsen in the 51 Ferrari. So that 47 Porsche is showing really good pace and not making mistakes. And these little penalties, they are going to add up. Five seconds here, five seconds there. Don't forget that the number 88 Mercedes, that was 25 seconds added. 
within the first two hours. Antonio Fofco is looking every way that he can, possibly can to give Thomas Preening a really good workout. He had a look at it going through Lake Coombe. So down the hill, and we're looking to see what the Ferrari can do with the Porsche. So on the brakes for the Porsche, and again, the turn in into Pujol. So the cars accelerate off the corner all the way down into the, the braking at Fania. Well, let's just ride and listen and watch because oh, the Porsche in front really getting quite twitchy there, John. Yes, I mean, everybody's on the, the edge. So there are always going to be little flinches from the cars, depending on which part of the racetrack they're in. So now we're down the lowest part of the circuit, down at Campus Corner. So the Ferrari closes up fractionally in this part of the racetrack. But then we get on to the second quickest part of the circuit, the climb up through Blanchemont. And uh, the Porsche again, because it's earlier on, the throttle begins to stretch that advantage. No matter how hard Fulco pushes on the throttle pedal in the Ferrari, it ain't going to go any quicker. Can't go any further forward. I must say, in the slower corners, the Porsche is really starting to wash out a little bit. But again, as you pointed out, John, that is just simply pushing as hard as you possibly can. This is the battle for seventh and eighth positions. But the Austrian driver Prining in that bright green Porsche is leading that group. But still, Arnold Rabat is in front of half the cars in the top six and top ten. Yeah, and but I think they'd like him to just disappear. Finally, finally, Jungadella has managed to get clear. But uh, look at behind. It's all. <laughs> Yeah, oh, and almost uh, was that a pass by Falk where he tried, he got through. Preening is going to make the undercut again. It's almost a mirror of what we saw earlier in the race. It is different drivers, but the same cars. And Andrea Caldarelli looks like he's picking up a position. He's going past the Audi of Alberto Di Falco. So patience and just seizing the moment when you come, they come your way. And Caldarelli, and I'm sure that whole cap at Capex Racing team, slightly fuming at the start of the race, but they haven't made mistakes. That is the key. And the top sport WRT. Porsche have to keep getting used to saying that. Sven Muller has just gained a place. That's the grey car at the tail end of that grouping, but so tight in the top ten. <laughs> but Sven Muller's got Peter Niederhauser in the 25 body and Lawrence Van Four in the 47 Porsche. So there you can see the oh, oh, oh hip and shoulder. Uh, that was advantage Niederhausen nipping through in that yeah. black Audi and in behind. It's super, super close. Oh, Bentley has stopped another on the start problem. finish line. That's Antonin Borger, and uh, can't see what exactly has happened. There's something on the grass behind it, but that was there at the restart when the safety car withdrew. Some, some bit, bit, bit of debris there. But we, well, don't know we, all, we almost had a yellow flag moment in the pit book. And the, the commentary a little trip up in the commentary booth, but uh, oh, this is a little bit of an advantage for Thomas Prining. He's got past the Ferrari of Fuoco, and he's also managed to put Arnold Rabat in that uh, lapped Audi between the pair of them. And Arnold Rabat sort of moves out uh, to one side and then comes back across. Yeah, and there was no doubt that the Ferrari was going to go through, and following through immediately was Andrea Caldarelli. He wanted to, he was, he was the doppelganger on that two car overtake. Okay. Originally said it was Rio Chiro Tomita in that car, then suddenly it seemed to be Arnold Robin, so I apologise. It's now back as Rio Chiro Tomita in the wheel of that 30, at the wheel of that 33. Well, Audi, it sounds like the, 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 uh, the switch in the car, the transformer there is the number six car, uh, which was a car that actually took pull position in the shootout, but then there was an irregularity with the uh, basically a, a filter in the induction system, so the car had all its times removed. But Andrea Caldarelli is certainly driving the wheels off the K-Packs. Now, we've got this car. There's a yellow flag in this sector, so you are meant to go through it slower than your previous best times. And uh, I don't know what they're going to do with the Bentley. There's something that's black on the right rear corner. I can't yeah, work out whether it's bodywork or that is that, was, is that, that the was, fuel flap? No, that was, that was an enormous <laughs> fuel flap. We had to put the money in there as well. No, that was there just at the restart. I don't know what it was from, but it doesn't appear to have been from this Bentley. It was there before. And still tight up at the top of the hill, the top sport. Uh, Porsche getting a nose full of the car in front, that's Rio Chira to meet his Audi. They're still four laps down, but still lapping at their pace, yeah, but, but he, frustrating he, them all. He turned into La Source, then changed his mind and cut across the front of the Porsche. Right, what's oh, happened? Let's cut the nose off the Porsche. But what's happened just now is Andrea Caldarelli's come in. What was he up to? About seventh place, from yeah. the, or eighth place in the, in the Lamborghini from K-Pax. That's called into the pits right now. All the rest, the top 30, still out on the circuit. Yeah. So Caldarelli had been running directly behind Fuoco in ninth position, so he's now dropping down as he makes his pit stop, so the light light is beginning to fade very gradually. And we're now at 8.30 in the evening. So three and three quarter hours of this race. Again, the Ferrari trying to find space down at Brussels, but down the inside, there isn't going to be space. And I can assure you that Thomas Preening isn't going to open the door and offer the 
the racetrack to the Ferrari. So, I mean, a mirror of what we had with the opening two hours, these two cars going at it absolutely flat out. Yeah, well, Antonio Fuoco, ironically, has just set his fastest first sector of the lap at any point in this race. Uh, but he's actually, if anything, slightly falling off the tail of the Porsche. Now, there's a gap in the pit wall. Is it bentley sized gap or is it just marginally narrow? We'll find uh, out it's shortly. It's difficult to tell from that camera angle. I suspect it is wide enough to get the Bentley through. Uh, it's just we're getting a very narrow angle on the camera mind, uh, camera position. Now, I, I mentioned a while ago that the 31 Audi from Team WRT, we thought it was clutch problems. It's still in the pit garage, so I'm afraid all is not right. So that's uh, listed uh, way down the order in uh, 61st yes, yeah. position of the 66 starters, and it may be joining the retirements, but it hasn't been named as such as yet. So fingers well, crossed there. But this battle car. for second place, John, Michael Christensen in the 221 GPX Racing Porsche in that magnificent Martini delivery is being really given a workout by the BMW uh, from Nick Yaloli, covered by half a second as they cross the start finish line. But it's been a busy, busy race so far. And uh, one of the drivers who's been a, a star from the 221 Porsche crew is not in the wheel at the moment because it's Kevin Estra. Driver at the wheel is Michael Christensen. But let's hear from Kevin down in the pit lane. Kevin Estre, c'est pas forcément évident comme début de course pour l'instant. Eh bien, il faut rester en dehors des problèmes, en dehors des crevaisons et des pénalités aussi. Ouais, non, c'est dur. Euh, mais on savait à l'avance. Euh, les crevaisons, c'est un truc qui est, qui est vraiment compliqué parce que pour l'instant, on n'en a pas eu besoin dans notre voiture et je pense qu'il n'y a pas eu de Porsche, il y a eu une crevaison. Mais on a fait, je crois, qu'un relais de 65 minutes. Le reste, à chaque fois, il y a eu un full cancielo, un safety car, donc c'est difficile à juger. Il faut faire attention, surtout dans les deux, trois premiers tours, quand les pressions sont un peu basses ou un restart de safety car. Ce circuit est très difficile pour les pneus avec la compression du, du raidillon, des, des vitesses assez élevées. Donc, il euh, faut faire gaffe, track limit. Euh, on a pris une pénalité de 5 secondes au début. Là, on est, on est bon. Euh, ouais, ça va être une course difficile. Merci Kevin. Kevin Estan, that was talking about the pressure, tire pressure and uh, how to manage it. It's really difficult here at Spa for no, no push as a, a puncture, but it's uh, really difficult to judge if it's okay for those uh, cars because only one steed has been done with uh, 65 minutes. Thank you very much. Very interesting point there, John. Not a not a Porsche puncture yet, but pretty much every make oh, other make that, of that, car that, has had one. I don't know why that even was that comment was made because it's inevitable that something's going to occur very very soon. But uh, I mean, uh, there's no logical reason why there it hasn't been a puncture. Why would any other manufacturer's car suffer in Porsche or not? So I, I would put the majority of that down, in effect, to the drivers of those cars, and they're mindful that over abuse of the of the racetrack and just as you watch <laughs> Thomas Preening coming through the exit of Fania out to the very, very edge of the racetrack. So, I mean, maybe it's just they're being fortunate they've not picked up punctures. I mean, there's nothing left on the racetrack for the 54 Porsche as it comes out of the Paul Frere Coupe. And he's not, he's not doing anything less than anybody else is doing. No, exactly. So, what, what one could say is, meanwhile, in the lead of the race, it's almost identical lap times from those top three runners. Michael Grenier sitting on that two and a half second advantage in that number 55 Group M Mercedes. But for those behind the bottom end of the top six, it is so, so busy. But uh, Danny Yonkadea has just made a move. And he's got past Maxi Gutz on this lap. The pink Mercedes is now behind the silver nose one. And in fact, uh, the Mercedes is now being pushed and challenged uh, from behind as well. But finally, Danny Yonkadea has made that move come off. Yeah, so that, that is now, I, I was going to say the lead Mercedes, in fact, the lead Mercedes is still Michael Guernier, but up the hill, here's the pass, so actually, it was, uh, Maximilian Gertz was just wrong-footed by the number nine Porsche, and that gave Juncker a, a clear run down the inside. You've got to make your choices as to whether you pass on the outside or the inside, and on this occasion, Maximilian Gertz made the wrong decision. That's not being cruel, that's just a fact of life. Right. That was the gap. We just looked, seeing the cars in second and third. That brilliant battle. And it's a big gap back to the, the yellow nosed uh, Audi in fourth place. It's uh, six and a half seconds between Yellowly in third place, the 98 uh, Rover Racing BMW, and the best of the Audis. Feel quite sorry for Antari Zhao in that number nine Audi, uh, number nine Porsche that rather sorted out that little battle uh, for fifth place. Yeah, that's one of the Herbert entries. Currently running in 60th position, so well and truly out of the race. Yellow flag infringement and causing a collision. Well, car 33 is the one we've seen rather a lot of. That was Ria Chiro Tamita, who, who was in fact, he, when the safety car withdrew, he was third on the road, but everyone in the bottom half of the top 10, well, in fact, from third place down, have been cursing and wanting him out of the way. It's broken up the battle. It certainly helped Mikel Grenier make the break ahead of Christensen, but 33 is possibly heading for problems there. Yeah, so number 47, Lawrence Van Thor. 
it's all over the back of Antonio De Falco in the Audi. So there it is. Uh, that's a big run. That's Sven Muller in the 100. So Sven Muller in the eighth, no, ninth position behind Antonio De Falco. But the Audi in between is. So where is the Ferrari? It's up ahead, up the road ahead of Muller is currently. Well, it's Antonio Fuoco yeah. who's up the road by two and a bit yeah, seconds. Just, yeah, but yeah. Fuoco, well, but guess the, what? He's still between. behind the Porsche, but it's been a better lap for Thomas Priney. He started it uh, in seventh place. He's still in seventh place, but he was only 0.5 of a second clear of Antonio Fuoco's Ferrari. And I'm sure when they car to the f come round to the finish line uh, in the next few moments, that gap will have grown. Still that big gap from third place, which is Nick Yololi, just turning now into La Source. You can see all the way back to, wait for it, crossing the start finish line now. Fred Vavish, 7.4 seconds. So it's gone out. It's increasing the gap between the car in third and the Audi in fourth. And still, the green Porsche is ahead of the yellow Ferrari, as it has been. Doesn't matter, seems to who are driving either of those cars, but uh, the 54 dynamic Porsche always just in front of the 71 Iron Lynx Ferrari. The 87, the Codus Mercedes tried to make a pass, but they're down the hill, so the Mercedes closing, closing all the way down. Right, John, what we want to pick out, of course, we've got uh, the overall class, the pro class, the silver class for the less experienced drivers, the younger drivers, and leading that, but being chased really hard by uh, Lawrence Van Tor uh, is uh, Alberto Di Folco, the number 11 Audi, leading the silver class fittingly in 11th place overall. But uh, still got some other cars working away. That yellow-nosed uh, Mercedes way, way down the order in 59th position, but young British racer Casper Stevenson quicker there, working his way through. You do have these stories, things unfolding and then things going back the other way. And well, uh, that's certainly the 87 Mercedes. I don't know the reasons why it managed to drop all the way down to, what is it? Oh, uh, 59th position, 59th out, of, position. out of 60 cars that yep. are still running. If yeah. I, trouble is, so many things happen. I could flick back through my notebook and find something did happen to that in the first hour of the race or so. But uh, Just got a quick glance of the Barwell Lamborghini number seven, Sam Dahan behind the wheel of that car running in 35th position. But more critically, they are one, two, they're in fourth position in their class. But remember, earlier in the race, that was a car that picked up a tire issue and uh, had to do a long way round to get it back into the pits. Sandy Mitchell was behind the wheel when that occurred. So gradually you know, driving themselves back into the race. Yeah, patience required. It's not going to be an instant game working away back up the order. Hubert Hout leading the gold class, sort of revitalised German, and he's uh, picked up a team a couple of years ago, the Black Falcon team, turned it into Hout Racing Team, and they've had a huge amount of success since then. Their car's always beautifully presented, John. Great yep. livery on that one, really stands more, it's out. It's a more, which I would call an old school livery, and all the better for it. So Sam Hout, uh, Hubert Hout, I beg your pardon, in 22nd position in the number five Mercedes. And that's the gold category. Yeah, and of course we've got the gold category where you have a sort of one of each of the drivers, a gold, a silver, and a bronze. And then we've got the Pro-Am category as well. And Dean McDonald is leading that. He's 24th overall, one of the two Garage 59 McLarens. That's the number 188, which has had, like a lot of its rivals, uh, some penalties coming their way for what's gone on in the early stages of this race. Track limits, we were talking about turn four and turn 17, John, so uh, I'm sure they're still transgressing there. In fact, the screen in front of you with the penalties has still got plenty. We've got a drive-through penalty now, of course, being awarded to that 33 Audi. We mentioned that a short while ago, and we're just waiting for that to be served, and that will drop it even further down the order. Yeah, I mean, every, it's always been at turn four or turn 17, but track limit abuses on turn 19 for car 19 and car 32, which, of course, is the... The Dries van Thor, uh, Audi, Dries van Thor is, where is that 32 Audi? It is a 19th position. Right, here's a, here's a shot of Dean McDonald leading the prime class. So we're, we're getting towards uh, nine o'clock in the evening, still 20 odd minutes to go and flashing its way uh, through Radion there, the garage 59 McLaren. At the back of that pack of five cars, trying to get a slipstream off the Mercedes that's sitting just in front of it. That's Dean McDonald pushing very hard indeed. Patrick Cougiela is probably the car just up the road in front. Yes, he is the number 90 Mercedes. So uh, again, these great mix of cars, but uh, for young Dean McDonald, yeah, he's doing a great job there. Yeah, you've got Mikhail Zoranson, 21st position in the 95. Beach Dean, Aston Martin, if we go back to our race leader, Mikhail Grenier, two and a half seconds. And uh, he's still got that benefit of the, a small advantage over Second place, Michael Christensen. Well, Mikel Grenier leading the way and uh, looking absolutely fantastic after nearly four hours of racing. 
2.4 seconds the good from Michael Christensen's Porsche and the BMW of Nick Yaloli. A lot has happened since the start of the race. It was a slow burner to start with. We didn't have the incidents we feared, but then we had the punctures. So Mikael Grenier leading very tidily, but it stayed static, John. The two, two and a half seconds, 2.4 seconds, the gap back to Michael Christensen. But Christensen's busy in the office. So uh, Michael Christensen in that uh, Porsche 221 being chased all the time by Nick Yaloli. Yeah, once, the, once they've got clear air between first and second, second and third, then the gaps all begin to concertina once again. So the gap first and second now down to just one and a half seconds. But right. inevitably, uh, they'll catch up tail enders. And it's just where you get your brake to get through. Ideally, you would like to do it into the source and then have the car that you've overtaken get between you and those that are pursuing you. Well, clearly the next overtaking maneuver has to be coming for fourth place overall. Fred Vavish hanging on in that bright yellow and black and white Audi, but behind the car on the move, Danny Junkadeo, the number 88, a Codis ASP Mercedes, trying to get the slipstream up the hill. The light is fading. He is on a charge and there's a back marker in front. That stayed fully out of the way. One of the Vulcan Horse Motorsport BMWs. Well done to the driver on board that. So up to the top of the hill they go and they stay in their order. Yes, and it's going to be a slightly more difficult challenge for Danny Junkadeo to find the way around the well-seasoned and very capable Fred Ravish in the 46 ID. So again, we're going to have a concertina effect with Ravish then. Uh, Jorka Della, Maximilian Gertz, Thomas Preening, Fuoco, Sven Muller, Patrick Nisa. Those cars from all the way from fourth to tenth are within tenths of seconds of one another. Um, you can just see now as they go down the hill. And here we are on board with Fred Ravish just having a quick look in the mirror to see where the uh, Yonkadella Mercedes might be just two tenths of a second behind as they came across start finish line. And see how he almost sinks down on the seat as he goes through Pouin, just the, the, the loads that the driver's bodies are subjected to. So down into Fania, the turn a little bit of a correction. And again, it's, oh, and a lot of correction in the exit of Fania. Again, looking in the mirror just to see where is Yonkadella? Is he beside me? Is he still behind me? Again, I mean, he's flicking his eyes up to the mirror as quickly as he possibly can. Well, Valentino Rossi will be delighted. His car is in fourth place with Fred Vervich. But it's been a long time since the start of the race. We've got four hours on the clock, and let's take a look at how it was at the start of the race. Brilliant sunshine, great weather conditions. Raffaele Marcello, the silver-nosed Mercedes on pole position, but a much better start from the green Porsche from Dynamic Motorsport. And De Klaus Backler into the lead of the race. Mirko Bortolotti tucking into third place. And everyone behind behaving beautifully through Oru, through Radion. Probably a few drivers going wide over the curves at the top the hill let's ride on board it was a uh, fantastic for the 221 Porsche at the start of the race brilliant shots right at the sharp end of the grid you could see how busy it was the first six cars went through a uh, line astern but behind they were trying to take Eau Rouge and Radiant side by side and the opening stint to the race uh, people feared with the gravel trap that we may have cars putting themselves off and bringing out the safety cars but the first hour it was all about good racing how's this side by side three cars together the allied racing Porsche trying to take two of them and then unfortunately Nigel Bailly being given a push down at campus into the gravel the car was recovered but it cost them time and for the driver who did the pushing Kenny Harbel a penalty came their way and now riding on board one of the Iron Lynx Ferraris, you could just see how busy it was. The Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes right in the mix as well, giving a bit of a push and a shove there. Gosh, it's Mercedes on Mercedes actions, but some cars seem to have all the time being hit, and the number four Mercedes was certainly one of those. And then punctures started to come. Sandy Mitchell was the first one to limp in in the Lamborghini background. One of the Porsches going wide and really suffering. That was uh, Stephen Grove, the Australian racer. And this side-by-side -side action, I think there was a touch there, the Mercedes number four. And uh, wow, that was quite a manoeuvre down the hill and that was pushing so hard. And this was uh, the battle at the front end of the field. Raffaele Marcello was really in the mix and that 54 Dynamic Motorsport Porsche didn't seem to matter who was in it. It was always in the battle and four hours in, it's still fighting for position, still in the top yeah. 10. And then again, let's take a look, it's number four being attacked again, this time Eddie Cheever on board, but he goes past it in the Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes and makes up ground. And the other Mercedes that seemed to spend all its time being given a bit of hip and shoulder was the 57 car, but then the biggest thump of the race, unfortunately, uh, for Cesar Gazzo, the young French racer, got it wrong coming out of Blanchimont, ran wide across the track into the wall. That was the first retirement from the race. And again, if you have a blue and white Mercedes, it seems everyone else wants to give you a push. And yet again, the number 57 Mercedes was shoved off. That was Jens Lee Bowser trying to mind his own business. 
La, La Source, always a busy place. And unfortunately for Antares out, just into his stint, he was hit. And that uh, brought out a full course yellow. And again, a blue and white Mercedes. Again, the 57 Mercedes being given a little bit of a shove off the circuit. And then things started to settle down a little bit. But ball spins, the Leipzig Motorsport Lamborghini going around. And uh, it suddenly seemed to be, you get a safety car, you get the restart. And there would be many, many incidents. But uh, the cream was rising to the top, as you would expect in this 66 car field. We got to two hours into the race. We still had 65 of the 66 starters. We had a flurry of punctures, and that became a concern because certainly as the tyres got down towards the end of their one-hour stints, uh, that was the time that a uh, little bit of debris on the circuit, a little bit of gravel. And you can see why the gravel uh, is on the circuit. A lot of the drivers uh, wheel hooking. And then, unfortunately, this was uh, not what you want. You cannot see. And uh, body contact. The 91 Alex Malikin. Uh, Porsche being pushed away and for Abdulaziz Al Zubair that was a scary moment in the treble seven Mercedes and that uh, is another one that has now been parked up and Sky Tempesta racing a little bit of a spin there and uh, still nip and tuck at the front of the race and brilliant racing but every time we had a safety car restart the order was jumbled but through this came the Grupa M racing Mercedes working its way to the front is that a replay of the replay? No, unbelievably, it's the 57 Mercedes going round yet again. That's the third one we've witnessed so far. But uh, then, unfortunately, we had Karim OJ going off at Speaker's Corner. We think he uh, went onto some gravel. Another driver had just put there by wheel hooking on the inside of the turn. Fabulous views and sights as the sun started to go down. But it's uh, Group M Racing moving into the lead of the race and staying there. Now from Nick Yaloli has just moved up into second place. But still the action happens at Radion. This is Spa 24 Hour Racing at its very best indeed. Now it's time in the pits and you can see that uh, Danny Junkadea has come in. And that challenge in the 88 Mercedes now having a fresh rubber underneath. And uh, likewise, a busy, and of course, we use the two pit lanes here. We use the Grand Prix pit lane and the downhill pit lane, the original pit lane. And uh, again, it's that time where we're going to have sudden flurry of the order. So just remember the order before the cars came in to make their pit stops. Me yeah, we've we, we got, yeah, we, we got that. So Mikel Grenier leading the race by now just eight tenths of a second from Nick Yaloli. So it's uh, Mercedes AMG leading the race. Mikel Grenier from the Group M Racing crew and the BMW M4, which is a car that's really starting to stretch its legs in GT racing, with uh, Nick Yaloli pushing very hard behind. Michael Christensen, the passing manoeuvre was made just as we were coming out of the highlights package, has fallen back to third place, but they've got that tidy margin. It was about seven or eight seconds over Fred Vavish in fourth place. In fact, it's gone out to 11 seconds now, John, so the last few laps have not been so good for the Team WRT Audi. Just for those fans that, that follow uh, the Bentley, the CMR racing, we saw that car stop on the pit lane, and initially they thought it was a throttle issue. Initially thought it was a transmission issue, then they now throttle transmission, whatever it is. The car's in the pits, and the team are waiting to investigate with the Nigel Bailly, the driver in the car. So that was about 20 minutes ago, and there we are. Uh, it's the Ferrari. The Iron Lynx car has come in and followed in by, is that the BMW behind? I can't quite see it, I no, it's, it is a BMW, yeah, it's, that's the junior, of, it's the BMW Junior Drivers team. You know, that, that's a crew we really need to talk about because they've done an incredibly good job in the last couple of years with BMW support in the uh, Nürburgring Langstrecken Series races and then drifting across the GT World Challenge and really taking Fanatec GT uh, racing, you know, in their stride. Three young racers, the number 50. Uh, BMW crew, international crew as, as well, sort of the essence of racing. But now this is the lead battle for the race. Yes. Nico Granny, no longer two and a half seconds clear yep. because you can see the Porsche is back in third place, but the BMW the, second, yes. in second is really, really so pushing. It's, it's, the, it's the Mercedes AMG that is still in the lead of the race. It most certainly is, but you can see how hard Nick Yaloli was pushing the tail, really coming around at the top of the hill as they went into the first part of the Lecombe. Uh, S is at the top, so now it's about settling down again for the Rover Racing crew. How much longer have they got in this stint? Can Mikhail Grenier hang on? Here is, the, here is the question, but this is exactly what we want. And don't forget, John, it's not going to be too long until it's going to feel really quite dark out on the circuit. The sun has long since gone over the grand set opposite the start-finish straight. Well, what I wait to see is, has the BMW got the legs of the Mercedes AMG? Because it's taken a long time for the BM to find its way around the Porsche, now having achieved that immediately onto the tail of the lead Mercedes AMG and onto the pit straight as we go for one more lap. 94 is completed. 
Yeah, the gap between first and second. 93 is completed on that. 94. So 40.4 of a second. See, the last three laps have been very, very good for Mikel uh, for, for Nick Yaloli since he moved past Michael Christensen. And uh, really, it's a question of just now sorting where he can start to make a move. And now you can see how the light is falling and fading very quickly indeed through Eau Rouge, through Rally on Michael Christensen. He's a second back in third place overall. Actually, looked so he lost a little bit more. Oh, and the walking horse. No, it's the BMW Junior team. Uh, BMW coming out right in their path and didn't fortunately obstruct the no, 2 2 1 Porsche. It, 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 it did exactly the right thing. It doesn't have the side. pace. Yellow Lee goes to the outside to go into Le Coombe, but of course not sufficiently far ahead or alongside even to think about going in and cutting the nose off the Mercedes AMG into Le Coombe. So Michael Guernier is able to breathe momentarily and see that yet again he's not a, a mirror full of Porsche, a mirror full of BMW. Just more news from the pit lane that number three entry having a problem with its pedal box during the uh, during the driver change. That's Valdemar Eriksson who's trying to take over the uh, get speed performance Mercedes AMG. So these little things are niggles as much as uh, little problems with uh, drive through penalties. Well, those are big problems and the, all the time penalties we're seeing for all of those trans transgressions of track limits. So there we are another lap and nothing has changed the top three are beginning to certainly the Porsche of Michael Christensen did drop back from the rear of the BMW but now that's she's got, got a second wind and it's closing back up to the BMW and I don't know if they'll be able to challenge uh, Nick Yellowley or not but here's an opportunity for the BMW because Mikel Grenier in the Mercedes AMG is having to get on the brakes he wouldn't normally want to do that going through the Paul Frere curve to make his way past the back marker and that's going to swing the benefits in my opinion towards the BMW but he go the long way around the outside he's not going to try and dive up the inside because there isn't going to be sufficient room so Man Grenier has been managed to salvage now here's a little one for you BMW they've had this thing since they introduced the BMW M4 into GT3 the steering wheel you see there is the one that's used on the Fanatec sim racing rigs you can take the wheel off this car take it into your rig if you so desire and uh, and you can maybe go the other way around might be easier to afford the grip the rig and the steering wheel than the car and the steering wheel but just look how good the BMW M4 has come the way it's taking the battle to the Mercedes AMG at the front of the field here half a second still between them but I really thought that moment coming up through Blanchemont might no, have just presented that was an opportunity but it wasn't one that was could you capitalize on because Michael Grenier did the right thing and he used his car to preclude Yellowley from getting the run up into Blanchemont and of course he had to then get out of the throttle marginally to check up rather than getting himself getting into contact with the Mercedes AMG but up the hill the BMW has got that straight line performance but not he needs he needs, he needs the straight here to be about double the length to be able to execute what is potentially and Michael Christensen so there is on board with the Porsche GT3 RSR a different steering wheel and you can pay your money and take your choice which of the two you prefer so look how much rubbish is on the windscreen of course now as the light and the, the sun particularly from this point as you head back towards well you're down in the bottom of the valley but the sunlight's dropping with a dirty windscreen uh, and the sunlight it just makes vision that little bit more difficult than it would have been earlier in this race. Well, full marks for Stefan Aust running second in the Prime class, managed to keep out of the way very nicely. I thought it might actually work for Nick Yaloli, but uh, Mikko Grenier didn't have to make one of those choices. The inside line was presented, he took it, and uh, sitting comfortably still in the lead of the race, but he's got another Mercedes AMG in front of him. I'm trying to work out which one it is. We'll get to see it, but the battle for first and second. We're riding on board with the BMW in second place, and Nick Yaloli, again, surely one of these cars in front, one of these cars they're going to have to pass is going to give him a margin. Is And, uh, well, that, that, the first uh, the Mercedes are about to lap, not getting out of the way as yet. Now it's pulled out of the way down the hill, and uh, no damage done to the leader or to the driver in second place. But how about Michael Christian in third place? He's, uh, he's got past as well. He's now started to catch back up. Don't forget, John, he was two and a six bit seconds behind. He was. Uh, again, he was sadly, he, he made a, a brave maneuver through Bronchamore. That was not one you would want to be doing every lap of the race, but he got through cleanly, and he's managed to drag himself a little bit to the closer to the tail of the second place BMW. So what I found in interesting there, John, was look, riding on board in the cockpit shot with uh, Michael Christensen, how clear that rear view video 
camera is in terms of he had a car right behind and you can see exactly where it's placed behind him isn't a car that's fighting yeah, for position but I mean, with him look, but it was so crystal clear yeah, yeah, but you think about cameras on mobile phones these days the imaging on a mobile phone is just phenomenal and that's the size of your little fingernail probably i've got big fat fingernails actually <laughs> so on board with the porsche as another car exits and that's the i was going to say that i thought it was the ferrari it's not the ferrari so on the run up the hill as we go to Lekum, getting the lights just beginning to fade. It'll be like this as we get to about nine o'clock. Oh, and the back end of the Porsche steps out on Michael Christensen and had to take the evasive of action. Uh, but Mikel Grenny has done a great job on the Mercedes AMG. Uh, not put a foot wrong anywhere we have seen. Right, the car we're seeing in the Porsche rear view camera is... Fred I think it's the BM it, No, it's not, because Fred, Fred is... Um, He's nine seconds back. It's the BMW Junior car. We saw oh, it come out of the pit lane, and it's yes. been driven really well by Max Hess. Great driver lineup. American racer Neil Verhagen, British racer Dan Harper, and Max Hess. They've raced together. Northern Irish driver. I didn't want to say it, but thank from you. From Hollywood. Uh, I'm not sure. I, but I, I, think, I, think, I think you might find His that. His parents were even, weren't even born before I was racing. So down the hill into Fania. So there's a little adjustment on the camera again and see how Drive dirty the windscreen is 44 for nine track limits infringement well 44 drive through penalty this is where it starts to hurt but John at this point in the race we're four hours in nearly five hours in and uh, you're talking nine track limit offenses so that's the get speed Patrick Asselhammer Mikel Blanchemont Alex Blumen Jim Pla uh, so that's going to be a penalty that will hurt uh, that most certainly will. At the moment, they're running somewhat down the order. Axel Blom on board, the Swedish driver down in 46th position. But, of course, they've got Jim Plas saved up for whooshing yeah, them back up he's, the he's order. Only, only one quarter of that four-driver lineup, and there's only so much one driver can do. He can try and get it up through the field. So there is the 54 dynamic Porsche, Thomas Preening, who's currently... Where is that 54... Yes, it's a close backler behind the wheel. So it's backler behind the wheel of the 14. He started the race in the 54 Porsche. But what have they done at uh, a Codis ASP? They've undone the cage door and they've taken out a Jules Gunion. So he's on board and he's charging outside the top 10. But uh, expect that 88 car to get back up into about sixth position. Right, I'm going to stand out because David Addison is hopping from foot to foot, ready to come back in to complete the day shift. More later, John. Enjoy it, Bruce. Good to have you here. And I know you'll be here for all of the evening and into the, the first light of sunset. I've got to be careful what I say. But once we come out of night time, goodness knows what will have taken place here at Spa Francorchamps. The number six K Pax Lamborghini looking to find a way around. The BMW goes one side, gets past. So welcome back here, David. And what have I missed? Uh, you, well, all you've missed is that Mercedes are now Mercedes AMG. So that is the, the correct title to the car. Right. And Nick Yellowley's BMW has arrived on the scene up into second place. And yes. Michael Christensen is upholding Porsche on it. And Fred Vervich fourth. Now, I think when I last looked, Valentino Rossi was behind the wheel. And it was quite a long way. Oh, dear. That's the Kenny Hubble Sun One Energy. Mercedes that has gone around, number 75 that was in strife earlier. Kenny Harwell gets going again. So yes, there's a lot going on in terms of shuffling the order. So dynamic motorsport Porsche. They got back behind the wheel. So let's see what Klaus Backler could do. Currently come across the line and uh, in 14th position. So waiting to see. And yes, Backler is in 14th position some eight and a half seconds behind Jules Gugnon, who's for the first time today behind the wheel of the 88 Mercedes. And as Bruce Jones pointed out, can we expect something special from uh, an outstanding long distance driver in Jules Gugnon? What we can expect, I guess, now with uh, four and a quarter hours gone is that the teams are going to start thinking about the next couple of stints because that will get you to the six arm Correct. mark and points and therefore which driver do you have in because in a way you're coming up towards the end of race one aren't you the, the six arm mark for points you want somebody quick there to try and get you back up the order yeah i mean it's it's going to be a strategic move by the the lead teams on board with the 88 akudas 
Mercedes AMG. That's Jules Gunion behind the wheel. Let's ride with Jules. Watch his hand movements through Jackie Yeek's curve down the hill. And a very nice little flick on the paddles on the right hand side to go up the gears. Still in fourth gear down at the pool. Oh. I thought it might have been maybe a higher gear than that, but well, that was that's my thought. But uh, whatever it is, that's the gear that Jules Gunion has selected. How many laps into a stint is he aboard? Uh, just about 88. three laps, two or three laps. He yeah. only taken over quite recently because we had Klaus Backler in the 54 Porsche around Gunio coming in more or less. Same laps. OK. Yeah, so he's, he's about 13 minutes into the stint. I was just wondering whether some of this is that tyres are still going up to temperature, but no, he's just fighting the car, isn't he? Yes. Uh, we didn't see Mar Marcello fight the car very much when we rode on board with him. So... Again, air track temperature beginning to drop away. And whoever that is up ahead of Gunior is using plenty of the racetrack and, and beyond. But he's on a mission, isn't he? Is that Mapelli ahead of him? That is Marco Mapelli. And I reckon that's your battle for 12th and 13th places. So there's the K-Pax uh, Lamborghini. This is Jules Gunon. So 12th and 13th virtually together now as they come across the line. So uh, Marco Mapelli certainly was using plenty of the racetrack up through and into and through Blanchemont. So there is the number six orange one, K-Pax Lamborghini. As this is just, a, I think, a regular service and chamois off. Right, so 188 Dean McDonald pitting. That promotes Mapelli and Gunn on one more place because they were behind him. Uh, so that car gains or those cars there gain a place. And Mapelli in a straight line, just edging away slightly further. Next target for Mapelli is going to be Jens Klingman, number 34. But look, at the top of Radion, so there, Jules Gounon much, much closer to the back of the Lamborghini. This is going to be a really good battle through to the next round of stops, I reckon. Everywhere you look, you've got these battles taking place. I mean, all through the top ten, we've had uh, drivers ensconced in battles and they catch in one part and fall away marginally in other bits and then you catch up to a group of cars that are a number of laps down and they then contribute to where the gaps are going to grow or be cut down so there is 88 that is Jules Gounon he was racing here a week ago in British GT and uh, useful lessons learned there as he comes then now into Piff Paff so Grenier's Mercedes AMG leads the way ahead of Ooh, Miguel and his BMW oh. and Jules Gounon <laughs> <Got> is <laughs> certainly committed. <laughs> no, well, that was coming off Mapelli's, the back wheel of Mapelli. Just gave him a face full of, of corner dust. So, uh, again, that'll adhere to the windscreen. And the thing you don't want to do is use your wipers and uh, washer to try and clear it because sometimes it makes it worse. Uh, better just to leave alone and hopefully uh, you'll your eyes will adjust to the change in vision. There's the Iron Dames Ferrari making its way through the chicane. And that's currently running in ninth place, isn't it? So it's gone pretty well. The way that the pit stops have all staggered the order. Now, is that somebody's gone off there or is that what oh, it is? Yeah. Somebody has gone off. And that was that's, at the Paul Fry Curb. That's Arnold Robb out in number 33 Audi. So. That was the Elise de Pau car Whoa. off early on. He got a big, big tank slap of that. He Whoa. did. Oh, he did. Well, I mean, I think, I think the rear wing, if it didn't, it was as, as close as you can get to ca catching the tire bales. But that was a real snap oversteer for the 47 Audi. And, uh, oh, sorry, not 47, no, the Audi just up ahead. That's the 47 Porsche. That will have caught the attention of anybody. Now, there, over the line, is the Nicholas Nielsen. Ferrari battling with 47 Porsche. So Dennis Olsen at the wheel of it, the former Intercontinental GT Challenge champion, fights with number 51 as they drop down the hill. 47 then now is going for 16th place. They're toe to toe down at the bottom of the hill. Nicholas Nielsen on the inside. On the outside though, Dennis Olsen gets squeezed. Oh, there's contact between the two. Thankfully, the Ferrari didn't come off worse out of all of that. I feared for a moment when they touched that was going to be a big, big drama, but actually the Ferrari stood its ground. And the McLaren's picked up the benefit of all yeah. that because those two cars getting together, the McLaren hasn't been able to make any gain out of it, but it's certainly sitting back watching and thinking, is this going to be the biggest accident I've ever had in front of me? Or, well, it didn't, and both drivers managed to keep the cars in control, but to try and go side by side through erosion over the top of Radion is 
only for the brave and uh, whoever. Well, as they come out of Bruxelles, down now into Jack Eek's corner, speaker's corner, where McLaren is that in the hands of Manuel Maldonado, and he is inching up onto the back of them. This is the contact between the two of them, and as they accelerate up the hill, this is a great angle of it, as they're up the kerb, sideways, and a little nudge from Dennis Olsen against Nicholas Nielsen, and thankfully they got away with that. Yeah, I mean, it's not the part of the racetrack you want to get into contact with another car. I mean, they're doing the best part of 240, 45 kilometers an hour as they crest radio, and uh, any contact can be, let's put it this way, not great. Next round of pit stops. Cycling through, this is the AF Corsa part of the pit lane, where I suspect 52 is due in. There it is. So that car had a spin earlier on. Louis Machiels comes in. You can see the witness marks up the side of it, but a new set of Pirelli's put onto the car. This is going, remember, for Pro-Am honours, and it's second in class behind the slightly delayed McLaren and Miguel Ramos. So both of those leading Pro-Am entries having their dramas thus far. So a quick Look clean of the mirrors and then a appeal a, of the screen. going to take off one of the tear offs. The teams probably have up to half a dozen of these attached to the car. And when you take one of those tear offs off, it's just like magic. All of a sudden mm. you can see. I mean, it's enormous the difference that it makes. So get her rolling. There she goes. Passes the Iron Dames Ferrari that's cycling through its most recent stop. Now here, Marco Mapelli through the traffic, but he's now closing up to... Now, that's Mauro Engel, who has just lost the lead, has he not? Because the car on the Lumi rank, I thought, was saying 002. So Marco Mapelli there has unlapped himself, put himself ahead. And has he now taken over the race lead because he's ahead of Engel? So on that last shuffle, I think Marco Bapelli has been able to make good progress here. He's certainly managed to get away from Jules Gounon, hasn't he? Yes, he has. He's gotten ahead of what was the race leader, but um, that must have been a driver change because it was Mikel Grenier behind the wheel of that 55, and now it's Maro Engel. So we'll count the order across the line at the end of the lap because it's updated after that... Uh, Round of stops. More and more of the teams, of course, having to try to outfox the others, be clever on the strategy. Some doing these short stops to try and gain a place. Others sticking to as close to the hour as you can. A drive-through penalty now coming for number 27, which is the uh, Isaac Tutumna Lopez currently driven Lamborghini. A drive-through penalty for track limit infringement nine times. Well, I mean, how reasonable can you be? There you go. So the race leaders come across the line, and as they do so, it is Marco Mapelli in the lead of the race, from Mauro Engel, from Jules Gounon. That's the order after the stops. Fourth now is Nick Katzberg there, who's taken over number 98. And fifth is Michael Christensen, and sixth, Antonio Fuoco. So for K-Pax, this is the lead that they thought they might have had off the line, but they finally got there. They've worked hard for it. They had to start in 30th position on the grid. Wow, look at the sparks coming from some of the cars going through. I, uh, I often wonder why are, are some cars prone to you know, run those strips, the titanium rub strips so close. Anyway, it's more spectacular as we go into the night time and uh, it adds to the spectacle. It does indeed. Now let's see what Mapelli can do in terms of trying to build the gap over Mario Engel. There's another time penalty coming for 163 Lamborghini for speeding in the pit lane. But Papelli, Engel, Gounon and Katzberg, that's the top four. And they're covered by 2.4 seconds. A further 3.3 back is Michael Christensen. This is going to be a really interesting situation now, whether or not Gounon is going to attack Engel or just sit back and let him try and take the fight to Mapelli. I would think knowing Jules Gounon, he will want to do all he can to put himself ahead of the sister Mercedes AMG and... Clearly, with the Lamborghini now, the whole problem oh, with right, left, right rear, is it, a, it is a puncture. Suddenly, the right rear on the Lamborghini, we saw the puff of blue smoke. Now, whether that's where the tyre let go or whether the tyre had been deflating all the way down the hill, but all of a sudden, Mapelli 
find himself in all sorts of strife and there it is the right rear so again he has to be gentle running the back to the pits otherwise he will do just more more damage trying to get out of the way of all these faster cars so what a disaster for the number six lamborghini having fought its way to the front of the field to have that tire problem and he was about 38 and a half minutes into the stint when it went bang read into that what you will but uh, my point being that it wasn't you know, a, f a totally fresh tire it, it was a few laps into the stint so big big drama now for marco mapelli and he's got to limp it back to the pit lane so mapelli drops out of the leading battle for the moment it means engel versus gunor versus katzberg great noise from the bmw another different engine note compared to others as the cars accelerate now up over the line that's 102 laps done eight tenths between the leaders 1.3 seconds cover the top three so it's Mercedes AMG, Mercedes AMG, BMW, Porsche, Ferrari, and then running out the top six and seven are two further Porsches. Klaus Backler in the 54 and Sven Müller in the 100. Fred Vervich ninth, having taken over number 46. So of course, again, the order shuffles on that last round of pit stops, but it's going to shuffle again because Mapelli has not yet got back to the pit lane and he could go a lap down here if he's oh, not yes, careful. I mean, that was unfortunate where, the where that rear tyre just all of a sudden just lost all of its air or whatever they put into tyres these days. It's not just simply air, it's a, a different science. But it's a long way back, particularly with the pace of the lead car. So if he can get back to the pits and get back out again and not drop outside the top 20, he'll be, I think, pretty lucky. Gunon on a mission in second place, but then equally so is Nick Katzberg here, running in third. Carl's once more come out of the left-hander of the Jackie X curve down the hill. Well, of the top three cars on that last lap, it was Nicky Katzberg who was by about eight tenths, seven tenths of a second quicker than the lead to Mercedes AMG. So whether that was traffic related or whether it's just simply on pure pace, but Katzberg, you can see, is closing up to the tail of the second place Mercedes AMG of Jules Gugnon and just a little bit further up the road there's the lead car of Maro Engel. And that is 31. So the WRT Audi swoops through Pouan. This is Lewis Proctor at the wheel of it, delayed early on and uh, gives up track position to Dennis Olsen but Lewis Proctor after earlier delays down in 61st place. Now, KPAX's Chris Barber, programme manager for the team, has a thought on this puncture. He's with Amanda Busick in the pits. Well, guys, there was a lot of action here in the pits when the right rear went out on the Lamborghinis. The teams jumped off, got into action. I'm with Chris Barber. Four new Pirelli slicks just went on the car. Any idea of why these punctures are happening today? Uh, there seems to be a lot of debris out of the, out of the track. Uh, certainly, the gravel has played a part in it. Um, you know, just unlucky, unfortunate this time. We were anticipating Jordan Pepper to get back in the car within the next 30 minutes. Do you anticipate this to change the strategy? Uh, probably not. We'll probably want a full strategy on this and see how it plays out. Thank you, Chris. No problem. Well, the car, as you saw in the background, has had the tar change. It has gone back out into the race, and Marco Mapelli has gone a lap down as a legacy of that. Yeah, it's dropped outside the top 20 down to currently showing 25th. Well, that will mm. change when we come through for the first flying lap for the Lamborghini. But what a, a disappointment having done so such a good job to get from 30th at the start all the way up to the lead of the race. And a lot of this seems to be pot luck, doesn't it? Just where you do encounter the gravel and at what point. Mauro Engel's car then leads the race. One of the drivers that had been in it earlier is Mikhail Grenier. Michael Grenier, this is your first time in Pro Cup with Mercedes, and for the moment it's going well with this first position, no? Yeah, it's going well. Uh, the team did a really good strategy. We used a short stop at the right time, and then the full course yellow came at uh, also the right time for us, so now we're leading. Um, but it's still a very long way to go, but for sure better to be at the front. And, uh, the team is doing a good job. My teammates are quick, the car is good, so we have full support from AMG, so let's see. The challenge is to find a good balance between the pace, obviously, to stay first, but also avoiding puncture, the track limits penalty. Yeah. This is quite difficult to find that balance. Our car is quite good on tires, so I don't think puncture should be a problem. We had zero puncture here. Uh, but of course, uh, now the night is coming. Uh, 
Uh, the car needs to be good at night and needs to be good in daytime as well. But I think we should be okay. Uh, but as I said, it's still a long way to go. A lot of things can happen. But as I said, better to be in the front at the moment than in the rear fighting. So let's see. Thank you. So that is one of the drivers of the lead car. And Marco Mappelli is expected up towards the timing line imminently but he will drop off the lead lap now because Mauro Engel goes through, breaks the beam, 104 laps done. Marco Mapelli has done 102, so when he crosses the line next, it will confirm him as being one lap behind. And that is a massive of an ensuring now dropping down 34th position and uh, nearly off page one of the timing and scoring here in the commentary booth. Now, of course, others can have the problems and it can all balance out, but right now, Mauro Engel is getting away, isn't he, leaving Jules Gounon to try to fend off Nick Katzberg. Yes, and I mean, that 55 Mercedes AMG, got a lot of experience in the hands of Mauro Engel and, of course, Maximilian Buch, and Mikhail Grenier is the, the least experienced, but he did an excellent job indeed in steering his Mercedes AMG over those that stint he was in and having the car consolidate the lead. So the light's starting to fade. We head towards evening here at Spa. It's just approaching 20 past nine local time and an hour and a half or so before we get the first point scoring period of the race. Uh, the very first puncture casualty was Lamborghini number 77, wasn't it? The Barwell car. And Ahmad Alhathi is now running 40th overall, just plotting its progress back. Uh, but it is now seventh in the Gold Cup, so more work to do. But with 19 and a half hours to go, there's still a long, long way. A lot can happen. We've already had uh, four retirements from the race. The Mercedes of Alfaisal al Zubar, the Aston Martin of Teo Nui, the Porsche of Alex Malikin, and the Audi of Cesar Gazzo all out, largely the results of damage. Yeah, I mean, they, I, I didn't see it live, but uh, Malikin's incident down and the exit of the Paul Freire curb, the bonnet flew up and whatever else. It, Looked, I mean, uh, pretty spectacular stuff. Yeah, yeah, he was the one that was hit. It was the, the Al Zubar Mercedes that had the, the bonnet right. damage. But okay. uh, yeah, poor Al Malikin suddenly got uh, a massive whack in the back. Now, there is Samantha Tan's BMW going up towards the chicane. And you can tell the light is going. Actually, the, the pictures make it look darker because of the headlights coming towards you. We can peer out of our window and it doesn't feel quite so dark but when the light starts to go here it does go fairly fast yeah it will be dropping us now local time is just 20 past nine in the evening so by the time we get to 10 o'clock it will be full dark and then the benefit of these headlights will really in these conditions these are always for me the most difficult conditions because the light is it's half light so up the hill we go once again and there's racing wherever you look there is indeed so manuel maldonado currently leading the silver class in the McLaren, the better place than the Garage 59 uh, pairing. James Baldwin's going to take over that car later on, uh, one of the great eSports stars, but also a real-world British GT race winner. And into the pit lane comes the McLaren. Everybody else funnels through the chicane. All got a bit tight there, didn't it, on the inside line? Yeah, it was all a bit nip and tuck mm. on the exit side by side as they run up into La Source. So they're going on, well, the lead cars are now on their 106th lap. So, as they head down the hill, they're heading down in towards darkness. As they come up towards the source, there's still light up behind the corner. Look at the debris on the outside yeah. of Eau Rouge and then up the top of Radion. And one of the sets of headlights in this train is that of Marco Mapelli. So, Mapelli now is in 34th place. There it is. The Lamborghini goes through, he's chasing after Nico Menzel in the Porsche. That would be his next target to gain a place, but the biggest quest for Marco Mapelli now is to get back onto the lead lap. So the uh, last pit stop that the car did was a 2 minutes 6.7, which is a kind of long stop, so potentially fuel tyres in the car, so it can run for another hour or so, barring any problems, and therefore should be able to get itself back up a few places, hopefully onto the lead lap as others cycle through their next stop. And the McLaren's in the pits. So again, well, this time they're not taking a tear off off, they're just going to give the screen a clean. You're allowed to have an additional man to do that during the, the refueling. 
but there's only two people permitted to do in effect any work. So taking whatever they've got, tearing something off the air intakes on that left hand side. I don't know whether that's for brake cooling or whether that's radiators, but uh, anyway, work carried out on the 155 McLaren. Now, number 63 you've just seen go through. That's got a 15-second penalty brewing for five track limit warnings. Your first two go without penalty. Your third uh, offence, if you like, gets a five-second penalty, and up it goes. And then once you've served the penalty, then uh, you uh, start again. But number 63 has already been done for speeding in the pit lane. Now it's got these track limit penalties to serve as well. Number 11 then, that is Pierre-Alexandre Jean, currently leading Silver. So with all the dramas going on now with Manuel Maldonado pitting as well, Pierre-Alexandre Jean, who remember, won outright at Brands Hatch in Fanatec GT Sprint Cup Europe in a Ferrari at the start of the year with Ulysse de Pau. And here he is in something rather different now. Pierre-Alexandre Jean, for a long time, associated more with Alpines in GT4, but now proving to be a very versatile and very handy GT3 driver. Miguel Ramos leading this group of cars up the hill in the 188. Garage 59, the Pro-Am leader, so he's got a, a small gap to... I'm not sure that it's Sean Walkenshaw in the 90 Mad Panda. Mercedes AMG is currently just four and a bit seconds behind on the road. I wasn't quite sure the car directly behind. And Nico Menzel is the opposition in class. So 26th is Miguel Ramos, and 33rd is Nico Menzel, who is the class rival. It actually is Sean Walkenshaw running behind Miguel Ramos. The gap was four seconds a lap ago, and that clearly has reduced dramatically. It's now 1.2 seconds. OK, then, so as the cars here make the run up Radion. We are on lap 107, and Mauro Engel's advantage is four seconds. He's getting away now from Jules Gounon. This is Arjun Maini who is in the Haupt Racing Team Gold Cup leading Mercedes. Arjun Maini, we've seen most recently, prior to this season, in the DTM, but a, a sports prototype racer and also uh, somebody that's had experience, of course, of single-seaters up to GP3 uh, and then Formula 2 level. So Arjun Maini comes downhill. He is ahead by 8.9 seconds of Robert Renauer in number 911, the Porsche, what else, which is chasing for class honours. But you can see the gap that uh, Miami has pulled. There he is, turning his way, the Indian driver, down through Paul. He's got a very striking livery, those mm. luminous strips that follow the bonnet over the roof line and back to the tail of the car. And now the circuit starts to get that proper magical nighttime racing feel, doesn't it? As the, the lights around the circuit start to take up effect. And there, the second place Mercedes Jules Gounon through the traffic, still being chased by Nick Katzberg. But the circuit with a different feel completely now. Let's ride with Nick Katzberg as he comes out of Le Combe. He is chasing after Jules Gounon. Second is the Mercedes. Your third with Nick Katzberg.
that's a lap with Nick Katzberg, a lap that very nearly netted second place for him through La Source. And you notice Jules Gounard having a little dab on the brakes coming into every corner, a dab, a confidence dab maybe, before he has to stand on the brake pedal. Yeah, well, a confidence dab is a, a, an old racing driver trick. You learn it by hard yards and experience because when you went, or you go for the brake pedal, and you haven't given it that little light touch to make sure that the, the, the fluid and the pads are where they should be. You get a very long pedal and it's a very unpleasant experience. So it's just a, an ex it's something that you learn as a racing driver to do uh, to ensure, particularly when you're coming up to a corner where there's a major braking zone, that you've got full pressure and the pads are where they should be in contact when you put the pedal on and the pads contact to the disc. Well, this is the fight for second and third. It is still Gounon versus Katzberg. And every lap now, just feeling darker, isn't it, as you look at the pictures and, uh, as I say, the natural light fading even out of our window. Gounon looking good, then, as we are approaching half past nine. Local time, he remains second, but while he's having to think about defending from Katzberg, Maro Engel has just very quietly and steadily got on with the job of building the lead, and he's now disappeared as far as Gounon is concerned. Yeah, I mean, I suppose one would say that's what you would expect Maro Engel to do. That's his specialty. He just gets in. He's metronomic and everything he does in the car. He isn't going. He knows it's a 24-hour race. He knows by saving a thousandth of a second in Blanchemont isn't going to make the difference between winning and losing. So everything is done with a margin so that both he and the car are doing the least amount, putting the least amount of effort into the car that would be required. Well, Jules, Jules Gounon, Bathurst winner this year. Bathurst winner two years ago, and it ran previously prior to that, comes into La Source. He has now dropped 5.6 seconds against the race leader, but crucially, at least, he's keeping this car at bay. Fourth is Michael Christensen in number 221, and Christensen is a further five seconds back. The Porsche team is having to almost detune the cars, uh, in quotes, to, to look after the tyres, so they keep telling me. And so they're having to run to a pace in the hope that uh, the speed they sacrifice, they at least benefit by not stressing the tyres too much. Well, the top five cars are all running in the two minutes, 20 points, something or other. And then you drop down to sixth place, Sven Muller. And then the next three cars after that are running in the two minutes, 21. Mm. And then down to Fred Revish and beyond that is 2.22s. With the occasional spike, I mean, the last lap for Marvin Kirchhofer in the number 38, Georgia McLaren, was, a, I mean, a pretty amazing uh, two minutes, 19.7 at this stage. That was his last lap, and that's two and a bit seconds quicker than those around him. So Marvin Kirchhofer has suddenly got a real pace and a, a push with the 38. Jota McLaren running in 13th place, just 2.1 seconds behind Hesse in uh, the number 50. That's the young driver BMW. And there's Fred Verviche, who is ninth, but maybe not for long, because Nicholas Nielsen, winner last year, right there behind him. So, fast Freddy comes down the hill. Fred Verviche in the Valentino Rossi Nico Muller shared Audi out of the WRT stable. And Arjun Mine's Gold Cup rival Robert Renard has just triggered a 10 second penalty for three track limit warnings. So, right now, as you look at the Verviche Audi go through, it's going to be interesting next to see how Valentino Rossi copes in the darkness because he didn't do much nighttime running, if any, at Paul Ricard. That six hour race that we had uh, in uh, early June. The cars now swoop through campus on towards the Corp, Paul Frere and Nicholas Nielsen, part of that winning Iron Link squad 12 months ago, inching up onto the back of Fred Verviche. Ninth and tenth, Audi versus Ferrari. And perhaps surprisingly, the Verviche car is now the best placed of all the Audis. I mean, uh, what a story. And what's happened to the 32? Well, it's down at 19th position. And is there any obvious reason for that? Didn't they have a puncture? I can't yeah. remember, it's such a long time ago now. It had a slow puncture, certainly, yes. Yeah, they did have a slow puncture, yeah. for sure. But uh, they're giving away chunks of time. OK, safety car might help bring that back into play, but the car a long way back, as we say. So upholding Audi and WRT on it is Verviche comes down now towards La Source. Well, I mean, you think that the 32 Audi had a problem, well... That was the change, wasn't was it? it? Has the Ferrari gone through? It has. It has indeed. Yeah, so we looked on board with Verviche, but the move was happening externally and through has gone. Nicholas Nielsen, he's made the place then. Yeah, and was... now tries to get away. Yeah, up into La Source, so he got the pass. We, don't, we may get a review of that in a minute or two. Matt Campbell of 
has also made progress up from 15th up to 14th, having got past Pierre Alexander Jean in the Audi. So Matt Campbell on his way, looking to make further progress in the 74 Porsche. So Vavish is still the best placed Audi, but he's down a place overall, down in 10th. There's a clutch of Audis running around 15th, 16th, 17th. Mm. And then you get the WRT Audi of Vertz and 19th, and then Matthias Zug in the 99 and 21st. Now, this is the replay of Nicholas Nielsen on the inside. Look, the pairs of headlights together, and Vervish gave him racing room. Two of them almost lent on each other a bit coming out of the hairpin, but Nicholas Nielsen goes through, picks up the place. Yes, and I mean, the overtake was done really even before they got into the braking zone, and once he was four wheels square with the Audi, there was nothing that Fred Vervish was going to do to try and preclude the Ferrari taking away that one position. So the Audi hustles on, but now a back marker between it and Nicholas Nielsen's Ferrari. So Nielsen is getting away. That's the, the point in all of this. The Ferrari looking strong, starting to edge away then as the cars come once again up through the fast court. Paul Frere left into Blanchiment. Another long, long, long corner. That in turn brings you back down towards the chicane at the end of the lap. And he just takes sixth gear very soon before he entered into Blanchiment. And up the hill gets alongside. Oh, well, it's one of those quite several situations. Will he, won't he? Will he, won't he? Will he, won't he? And does he lose another position there? That was Joel Sturm's Porsche. He was trying to lap, and I think Sturm went back ahead, didn't he? Yeah, he, he came did. out of the corner. Yeah, so he didn't clear him. Breaks now for La Source. Down to first gear. But this is what they don't need to be battling with cars like this. And I think also, yes, Dennis Olsen has got through as well, hasn't he? So it was the back marker yeah. he didn't clear, and Dennis Olsen and in the KTMG car yeah. was the one that slipped yeah, through. That really right. He read the situation, yeah. slightly compromised for Fred Vervish, and Olsen just read it and saw it and took advantage of it. And that's really all you can hope for, because here in the Camel Strip, we've seen really so few overtakes between competitive cars. Into Le Combe they go. And a dive towards the back of the Porsche of Dennis Olsen comes Fred Vervish. He's closing up in the traffic. Goes right, goes left. But once more here, you've got the cars trying to get their way through the traffic and being slightly delayed just because of the nature of the cars. They just can't find a way by. Uh, let's just remind ourselves how we got to where we are with the race getting underway at quarter to five yesterday afternoon, th this afternoon. And it was the... Porsche of Klaus Backler that took over the race lead with Raffaele Marcello in second place and a quick starting Mirko Bortolotti in third. And the first lap was surprisingly well behaved and calm compared to what people were rather fearing. Uh, Michael Christensen was able to make a decent getaway, slot into the traffic behind Christopher Haas's number 12 car collection by Trezor Audi as the cars turn out of La Source. This wonderful sight and spectacle of 66 GT3 cars, some of which were able to run three wide heading up towards Le Corp. If you've got a toe, you're able to make even better progress. Kenny Harville tagged Nigel Baez Bentley, put that into the gravel. He was able to rejoin and then Antonio Fuoco was on his toes trying to get up past Maxi Book in Mercedes number 55. Loris Spinelli was being pretty aggressive against Yanis Fitjer as well contact between those two as they came out of Le Combe. Drama for Sandy Mitchell, a punctured tyre. And also drama for Stephen Grove, his Porsche off the road at Blanchimont, but he was able to survive the experience after quite a wild ride. Good battle then developed between Lucas Stoltz and the Porsche in the hands by this stage of Kobe Ledegar. Ledegar was losing places, but he then had a great battle with Raffaele Marciello, who finally cleared him going up towards Le Combe after they traded the place going up the hill. Eddie Cheever made a dive against Jens Liebhauser. That put him into the lead of the Gold Cup, the Sky Tempesta racing. Mercedes going through and a big lose for Cesar Gazzo. Charged the wall, and that was the race's first retirement. Although he got the car back into the pit lane, there wasn't a lot of it to rejoin the race in. So out of the race, the Santelot junior team car. Further drama as Jens Liebhauser got roughed up coming into the chicane. Jens Liebhauser got roughed up going into Brussel, and he was tagged by Enrique Chavez into the gravel. Then Jonathan Hui made this move against Antares Au. Turned him around at the source, and Jens Liebhauser was roughed up again 
He got turned around going into Les Combes. They dug out of the gravel once, then further strife came. And also off the racetrack went Isaac Tutumlo Lopez. He got caught up with the Iron Dames Ferrari, and there was more drama as people stood on the brakes, and the concertina effect led to more damage behind. Finally, things started to settle down just a little, and coming out of La Source, the Ferrari of Daniel Serra trying to gain places once again. This time, though, there was a hard-charging Patrick Niederhauser right up behind him. Niederhauser scrabbling up the kerb on the inside and not quite able to make the move. As then, as a full-course yellow was called for, Alfaisal al Zubar ploughed into the back of Alex Malikin. The damage to both cars, putting both out of the race. Marcus Winkelhock was a bit aggressive coming out of La Source. And the Sky Tempesta Mercedes was also on the prowl. But then Jonathan Quee had a spin coming out of the chicane. Thankfully, didn't get caught up with anybody as the Nicholas Nielsen driven Ferrari from Iron Lynx was carving its way into contention as well. Great battles raged on up and down the field. And then guess what? Jens Liebhauser got another bit of contact this time with Christopher Hauser's Audi and he got collected by Garage 59 McLaren. We then lost Carrie Mojé into the gravel down at Speaker's Corner. That brought out the full course yellow and a safety car. So the race neutralised whilst the car was dragged out of the way. And then more drama as way out wide went the Sky Tempesta Mercedes coming up through Radion. Number 71 of Antonio Fuoco diving to the inside line, gaining places very nearly, collecting the traffic so late on the brakes was the Ferrari. Others running wide out of the Cour Paul Frere, the Allied Racing Porsche of Dominic Fishley running way out wide as through on the inside in the traffic came 88. Danny Jonquidea is set to hand over to Jules Gounon, but moving ahead of the get speed entry. Nick Katzberg's BMW number 98 also chipped its way forward in the early evening, and a great battle raged on between Nicholas Nielsen and Dennis Olsen as the cars were absolutely toe-to-toe -to -toe going through a rouge. There was this little touch, which could have been oh so disastrous, but they both survived to carry on the fight. One or two more cars ran wide coming out of Pouin, including Marco Mappelli, who had a tyre go down and he gave away his race lead as he had to limp his way round to the pit lane. Now, it's getting dark. Full course yellow in 20 seconds. We're going full course yellow again because there's a car stationary on the track. Between cut turns 14 and 15, there's a bit of oil and there's a car stationary on the circuit. So yes. full course yellow, that's 10 happened seconds. While we've been looking at the highlights, but a full course yellow is imminent and there's a car slow between campus, Paul Frere, that section of the circuit. And while a lot's been taking place, Nicky Katzberg finally found a way around the 88 Mercedes full AMG. Yeah. So that's full the now. That's caught in a rather precarious part of the racetrack. So Katzberg has finally made his way into second place, splitting the two Mercedes AMGs. So the snatch vehicle will get a two to the back of the Audi. Look, uh, there's everybody <laughs> getting all ready and prepared. Some are, yeah, going through the calisthenics and go on, see how far you can do. Put your knuckles on the ground and see, <laughs> show us how flexible all that yoga and Pilates that you've spent your life doing and getting yourself race fit. I hope that's not a dark visor he's got on his helmet. Yeah. It is night time, by the way. Miguel Molina getting ready. So, uh, yeah, we've got the car stationary of Carrie Moje. Number 10, there it is. He's being towed out of the way. That was the, the reason for the last full course yellow and safety car as well, wasn't it? When it yes. went off into the gravel. In, so. in fairness to Karim Auger, he came down following a car that had mm. thrown a lot of gravity. He got wide in the corner, hit all the rubbish on the outside of the circuit. And that just, the car literally was swept off and into the into the tyre belts. Yeah. Adam Mateki at the wheel of it this time, so it's not uh, a double whammy for Carrie Moje, but it is that car. So it's been towed off the circuit, so shouldn't be long, I wouldn't have thought, to get things back underway. It just depends where the car now has to go to, because it can't really rejoin, because it can't go. So they need to get it to a place of safety. Now people start to roll the dice. So the leader is in. Mauro Engel comes into the pit lane in number 55 Mercedes at the end of 114 laps, nearly at the five hour mark. He comes down the pit road. And that's the Iron Lynx number 71 Ferrari. Antonio Fuoco at the wheel, but he's about to be replaced, isn't he, as the car comes in to serve a pit stop. Yeah, it came in in fifth position. Stein Schornhorst has just found a way around Klaus Backler. I don't know whether that happened 
must have happened prior to the full course yellow. So they are they might bigger, but the Mercedes AMG has gotten ahead of the back of Porsche, the, the car that led initially for the first hour, almost two hours, and again taking off one of those tear offs from the windscreen of the Ferrari. So Fauco gets out of the car and he did a good stint behind the wheel. He did indeed. So Fauco has been a real live wire in his GT career, pretty short career it has been. the beginning of a look at the gravel on the Absolutely. racetrack what a mess that is up at the exit of Lake Coombe. I was speaking to Mick Tandy uh, early evening who and I asked him about how the circuit felt and he just sort of shrugged and wrinkled his nose and he said it's, it's normally not that bad he said because there's so many cars that are generating the air it, it kind of cleans itself it sort of washes it away but other people have said from other races that the line becomes narrower and narrower well, the longer uh, the race goes on. So we will see who's right. Essentially, it will get narrower and narrower, particularly when I mean, you can see there as the cars make their way up to Blanchemont. That is primarily rubber that's been shredded from the, the Pirelli tyre. And that's a natural function of a race tyre. It'll always shed a certain amount of rubber, but you know it'll get at certain parts of the racetrack as a pass coming up into the chicane. So the get speed Mercedes on the outside trying to wriggle its way through. Oh, look at that. It's close, isn't it? Yeah. So that's the 88 and the two. So Scott Shine at start. So the, the, the car that had been leading is now currently down in fifth position. Yeah, but look, Backler's got round the outside, hasn't he, in the green Porsche. So Klaus Backler has just retaken the place coming out of La Source. There he is. So 54 Porsche back ahead of number two. And so Stein's Cockhorse drops back, he clears the traffic, but good reading of the situation by Klaus Battler. He's put himself back up ahead, having lost a place just under the full or just before the full course yellow to Stein's Cockhorse. So Klaus Battler has gone back through. Whether he stays there for much longer remains to be seen. The cars now make the run towards Le Com. Well, as it is in property, it's all about position, position, position. And that pass by Klaus Battler is an example of that. And Having attained it, it's, you know, he's not going to give it up easily. Position, 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 or location, 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 or one location. Dif different, that is, different TV programme. Uh, well, indeed, but I'm, I'm, I'm heading tenuously to a link, which is that uh, we are, as ever, uh, joined by people watching from around the world, and including from Brisbane, Marcus Mai, who uh, used to race, of course, within uh, Fanatec GT events. Marcus had his... Uh, rather sizable accident here a good few years ago from which he made a good recovery which was excellent news and uh, remains a great fan of the race and of gt racing so glad to have you on board marcus and yes, uh, i remember that, that you're in good form i remember that incident was one of the worst ones i think i've ever seen any in any racetrack anywhere now nick katzberg is our race leader because he has jumped ahead of jules gounon we had maro engel pit that short stop i was talking about and so now bmw leads the way Nick Katzberg ahead of Jules Gounon, but I think Jules is going to try to fight back because here, look, Nick Katzberg is about to get involved with traffic. So for the first time in this race, we've got the BMW leading the field. Yeah, having been nowhere in the first hour. Makes a good noise, as we said earlier, the BMW, but now we'll see how much grunt it's got to get past that traffic before Jules Gounon closes right up again. Well, it's got plenty of grunt of V8 twin turbo motor mounted. Well, it's, it's, it's a front engine GT but it's smudged so far back and so low on the chassis. I mean, it's an engineering marvel. So right now it's the 55 Mercedes, Mauro Angle, who made that short splash dash, if you call it, down to 10th position. And again, Klaus Pachter confirming that he's up into fifth place ahead of Stein Schornhorst. Dennis Olsen is just 2.7 seconds behind Nicholas Nielsen in the 51 Ferrari. And Nielsen himself is only half a second behind the sixth positioned 
Mercedes AMG. So Katzberg it is trying to edge away and he did so in the first sector. Gunon now has to try to clear the traffic as we come down towards Bruxelles. Still the best lap of the race. Uh, the number 88, Akodis ASP, uh, Mercedes AMG of Danny Junkadea from lap 64. And as uh, now Nick Katzberg gets up through the traffic, he's still trying to build this lead over Jules Gounon. Nick Katzberg then clears the traffic. His co-driver Nick Yellily is in the pits with Anthony Coppi. Nick Yellily, congratulations. You are now the new leader of the race, thanks to, to Nick. This is the first time that we see the, your BMW in front of the field. Yeah, exactly. We've just, just taken the lead, which is, yeah, it doesn't mean so much now. We have a long, obviously a long way to go in the race, but uh, it's always nice to be to be out front and see the car at, at the top where it should be. Um, so far, the team have done a great job with strategies and the car's working well. Yeah, now we're going into the nine. It's about keeping those uh, mistakes as low as possible and, yeah, surviving. We have seen uh, a few, uh, not, uh, few uh, safety cars in full cruise yellow at the beginning of the evening, but for the rest, uh, the race is maybe more under green than expected, no? Yeah, I mean, usually this race can be pretty wild. I think the last time I did it actually was 2020, and it was still quite wild then. Um, I think the track limits are maybe keeping it yeah, slightly more in line for everyone. Everyone is having to really take care and make sure they don't get stupid time penalties. So, um, yeah, for the moment, it's obviously running well, and we'll see where we, uh, yeah, where we can fight for uh, come the morning. Thank you, Nick. Thanks to Anthony Coppi in the pit lane with Nick Yellily, another Nick, Nick Katzberg leads then. Now remember, we've just tripped into the sixth hour of the race. And I know we've touched on this already, but it is worth making the point again, because at the six hour mark, there will be positions across the classes that count for points. So you get the top nine in each class at the six and the 12 and the top 10 uh, at the 24 hour mark. So there will be, if you like, a result within a result at the six hours and again at 12, and that's across all of the classes. So right now, they're not just racing for position early in a 24 hour race, they're limbering up for this last hour of the first six where points are on the line. And Jules Gunion, I don't know if he's been told or not, but clearly just under a second behind Nicky Katzberg. And in fact, the top three are covered by just a little over two seconds. So. Michael Christensen in the 221 Porsche wanted to really sort of join into this race for the lead behind the AM, Mercedes AMG as we get a different view. And well, there is the pace. There is the 88 in second place and following through is uh, Michael Christensen. Yeah, Christensen is getting closer again, isn't he now? Because he was about five seconds or so further back prior to the full course yellow. There, number 24 goes through Nico Menzel, goes rally crossing, kicks up the dirt at the pith path. He is still chasing after Miguel Ramos for the Pro-Am lead, but 24, and there is 2-2-1, that's Michael Christensen. So, yeah, he's got back markers to clear, but he is closer to Jules Gounon now. Yes, that gap's certainly coming down. Yeah, so Menzel is currently, he's in that battle with Miguel Ramos, is 30 seconds between the two of them both running sort of effectively 27 28 on the road so a battle there between the mclaren and uh, the porsche so on lap 118 with the time at just nudging 10 to 10 local time we've got just under 19 hours of the race still to go uh, a late start to the day you think oh it's gone dark now you must have been going for ages but with a, a quarter to five race start it's uh, deceptive and it tricks people. It, it kind of makes Sunday feel that bit longer because you get to the start of the day when um, up comes the sun. And after that, there's a long way to go to the end of the race. Well, I, I don't know if the sun's got a name or not, but um, certainly the sun will appear. Indeed so. Out of the chicane, it is getting darker and darker all the time. It's got that proper night race feel to it now. The one thing that we don't get from where we are on top of the Formula One pits is a whiff of barbecues. I just took the very thought <laughs> out of my mind. I mean, a big Brock Wurst or whatever. Uh, I mean, of course, David, being a, a Belgian beer lover as you are, I'm sure you'd wash it down with a nice lemonade shandy. Well, absolutely. Or, or, or fizzy water, local spa water, yes. Uh, the fans in the woods, I think, have been on the Jupiler for most of the afternoon. Uh, other beers are available. There, going through then, the next set of headlights we need to dwell on is going to be the Katzberg, Gunnar, Christensen trio, really, where the leading three are now covered by three seconds as they head into 
Lecombe. There is number two. So that is Stein Scotthorst. He's down in sixth place now, but that car has always been in the mix, hasn't it? Right from the get go. Yeah, and it's only 2.2 seconds behind Klaus Backler in the fifth place. Backler's 16 seconds behind Sven Muller in the number 100 Porsche. So Backler is not under challenge or threat yet from Schotthorst in the number two Mercedes AMG. But Nicholas Nielsen certainly is going to give Short Horse a bit of a hurry up because he's less than half a second behind the number two Mercedes AMG. And there is the very car we're talking about down in Pujol and following it is Nicholas Nielsen. I'm indebted to people that know about McLaren cooling. Uh, the, the pit stop we saw a little while ago from that garage 59 McLaren in the pits, and we were looking at uh, the ducts. It was actually large pieces of tape being put over the radiators to keep the temperatures up during the night, I uh, understand. So that boxes that one up. Thank you very much. Nick Katzberg, the race leader on lap 119. Stein Scotthorst here in sixth place. He's 2.222 seconds back in number two from Klaus Backler. So there behind Scott Horse, Nicholas Nielsen is in eighth place. Uh, there, number 47 is Dennis Olsen. That's the car in ninth. So Dennis Olsen threw ahead of Fred Verviche. Uh, and uh, also, having touched on the fact that you do get these points at the 6 and the 12 hour, as well as 24 hour mark, don't forget that a number of the teams are also scoring, but only at the end of the race, in the Intercontinental GT Challenge uh, powered by Pirelli. So there's a lot going on. Into as the, into pits. the pits comes yep. Scott Horse now. And also, Gunon has come in, John, I notice. Yeah. Further down the field in 17th place now, 17th place, Charles Mertz has managed to get away, find a way around. Maxime Martin in the Aston Martin. Backler as well. Yeah, Backler is in. So, again, people stopping on different laps. What you've now got as Scott Horst and Backler arrive is Katzberg leading Christensen, so BMW leading Porsche. And Backler staying on board, so it's going to be a double stint. Having done so at the start of the race, some, what's nearly five hours ago. So this standard, almost lizard green that the Dynamic Motorsport have adopted is a great color, a standout color. I like block colors on race cars. It does make them a lot easier to identify, particularly when they're coming towards you from a distance. Well, that car is about to be dropped down. Don't forget also, after the end of the 11th hour of the race, there is that uh, four-minute line-to-line technical pit stop that the teams need to do as well. Right, away goes the Porsche, and it will stay ahead of the Mercedes. It keeps track position then on the pit stops. Eighteen hours and 49 minutes to go. So, we're just... Not far short of reaching quarter distance. It's hard to imagine there's still over three quarters of this race to run. And these competitors and the people in the pit lane and the, I mean, it is a very, very tough event across the board, whether you're behind the wheel or whether you're working in the garage or whether you're on those laptops and doing the strategy and working out when and where and whatever. And as I mentioned earlier, the scenarios that might arise should something unexpected, such as a full course yellow or a safety car or whichever, they, they do try to build in to their strategy these ifs and ands and buts. Further down the corridor from where we are based on top of the F1 pits is the uh, Porsche area. Uh, which is a, 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 a huge element of the hospitality building, uh, part of which is for hospitality, for guests and for the drivers to go and eat. But another enormous room looks a bit like PC World, and it is absolutely full of tables and computers and Porsche engineers, all of them studying data, not just the timing screens that everybody has access to, but their telemetry, possibly trying to tap into what the opposition is up to as well. Uh, Porsche here in a very serious way. You know, you get used to seeing engineers on laptops at the back of garages, but to take over an entire hospitality suite so they've got nice working conditions because they're going to be up for 24 hours plus trying to read this race and know exactly what to do and when and what to change on the car and when and how and what that effect will have and what the opposition are up to and how you can counter it, it's a full-time job. Well, certainly as far as Porsche is concerned and from what we have seen both within that centre you're referring to and also on a more relaxed side in their hospitality, I mean, Porsche, this is a major, major challenge, an attack on winning this race yet again. Mm. So uh, currently they've got two cars in the top three. 
But uh, Nicky Katzberg in the BMW is 5.3 seconds advantage over Michael Christensen. And has that been an overtake or not? No, it's a changeover because the number 100 has just done a driver change. So Julian Landau is going to be behind the wheel of that car. Now, those drivers that were getting ready earlier uh, may not have had much uh, call to get in the car because it was only a full course yellow. We didn't actually get into the safety car period that people might have anticipated. It could be a, a full course yellow withdrawn very quickly. So Miguel Molina has uh, therefore yet to take over. And Julian Andlauer has just come in. Marvin Kirchhofer is in. Max Hesse, Matt Campbell. So the order is going to shuffle again here as we get to the end of the next clock hour. Heading up towards 10 p.m. evening time, local time. And that clutch of cars running 8th, 9th and 10th, likewise all into the pits. So it's the 38 Jota McLaren, the 50 uh, BMW of Hassa, and then Matt Campbell and the 74 Porsche, all three in the pit, as is Mark Zug and the number 99 RD. That's right. And Laurie Spinelli for Sky Tempesta is in as well. Russell Ward's Mercedes is in. So now the drivers having to cope as in does come, number 51, that's Nicholas Nielsen to bail from fourth place. Now the drivers having to cope with the, the lack of reference points around the circuit. So it, it becomes certainly different to drive, maybe more difficult. Dennis Olsen is in as well in the KCMG Porsche from Paulip's squad. Matt Housen, the Brit that manages it, so he used to be a very proficient racer himself, but now the, the, the team manager and there the Ferrari stops and meanwhile Molina will get on board. But yeah, now you put back into a car, you sent out onto the circuit, but in the darkness, and uh, it's a very, very different feel. A lot of steam coming from the right side, but the door was open now, whether I don't know whether it's almost as if an extinguisher has gone off, and it, obviously it isn't, but I don't know whether that, what was causing that. It's almost as if somebody had put some dry ice mm. in and around, and they. So. Cars are looking grimy already, yeah. aren't they? We've yeah. not done that many miles well, yet. There's a lot of rubber around the racetrack, and a lot of the rubber has been hitting the, the nose of these cars. So, as we look at the Porsche, there's a run around our cars. There's the 51 rolling. So, down towards the end of the F1 pits goes number 51. hidden behind the wall, and then we'll accelerate there, back into view down the endurance pits. So Miro Molina for Arn Link's last year's winning team. So Katzberg to Christensen, the gap is going up again now between the BMW and the Porsche, possibly to do with traffic. But that margin extending ever so slightly. Now this, number 88 Mercedes, is still Jules Gounon, but he was 12th across the line, having pitted when we got that full course yellow a little while ago. So he's got the Lamborghini ahead that is a lap out of sequence, so Gounon now having to try to get through the traffic. Speed building. I wasn't sure whether the, the car had its indicator going to indicate the pass on the left hand side. 27 track limits, drive through penalty car 27 track limits. 27 is the Lamborghini that was in the gravel earlier on, triggered a full course yellow and is now Tyler Cook in 46th place, the yeah. drive through penalty for track limits, so says the race director Alain Adon in the background as Gounon now tries to get himself up and past the VSR Lamborghini. And he's burning the paint off the back of the Lamborghini, the power of these headlights. You can see flashing, flashing, flashing. And, uh, well, it isn't having very much success. And again, it'll be a frustration for Jules Gunion not to be able to get clear of a, a car that's not in his race. It's way out of the, the order in terms of its overall position, but it's still got good straight line performance. Through they come almost as one. But Gunon here being frustrated. He wants to be up and after the Jens Klingman BMW. And out of the GPX garage strides. Kevin Estra yeah, ready for say, the next the, stint. The tall, slender figure of Kevin Estra. So we've just gets his radio plugging in. in. Yeah, just getting yeah. the radio tuned. Hmm. 
if you took his gloves off, well, it might thinking, be a more yeah. simple task. But the screwdriver is out, so clearly the, the radio is an issue here. Needing to retune or tighten something. Maybe he's got Radio Luxembourg or something. <laughs> Not the channel he was looking for. I thought all Porsches had Apple CarPlay these days. You don't need a two-way radio. Michael Christensen is dropping back, so he's coming towards the end of a stint. Uh, both him and Nick Katzberg have done 54 minutes, so within the next 10 they're going to be in. Kevin Estrin is happy now, so he walks across the garage, ready to take over Fred Fatian's team, GPX Racing, run by former racer Pierre Brice Mena, who was one of the real guns in the early days of GT3, and now runs the GPX operation. So Klaus Backler running down the hill, and uh, Miguel, is that Miguel Molina behind him or not? Five-second time penalty at the next pit stop for car five and car 19 for causing a collision. OK, so time penalty is coming. Car five is Arjun Maini, the car sec uh, third currently in the Gold Cup, and which was the other one, number 90. Uh, yeah, which is the Mad Panda. It was, yes, quite. And Sean Walkinshaw was behind the wheel the last time he saw that car. I don't know who was behind the car at that particular point. Well, Jules Gounod is still stuck, isn't he? He can't yet get past this lapped Lamborghini. He's still flashing away. I mean, I thought there was a regulation that stipulated you're only allowed to flash so many times, but clearly uh, it's, it's a, to no avail whatsoever. But this is where the team needs to talk to its driver and Absolutely. say, right, that car behind is a lap up. There's no point blocking it. You're not helping yourself by going slower. You're not helping them. Let it go. Yeah, but maybe the degree of concentration behind the wheel of the Lamborghini is so intense that he may be getting a message, but he may not be able to absorb it. Yeah. Because this is one of the problems. You know, it's having loads of space, mental space, to be able to take in information and, and respond to it. And some drivers can do it standing on their heads, and some drivers have more chance of being struck by lightning than managing anything. Any Here we go, down the inside. So Gunion gets through. I think that was a... a Finally, the message did get through in one form or another. Did indeed, as Kevin Est gets ready. Are we all good? Yep, we are ready to go then. So uh, Kevin Est in the Martini liveried GP Extreme, GPX Racing Porsche. One here in the Gulf Colours of 2019 with Richard Leitz and Michael Christensen, and they're hoping to do it again. Uh, their focus as a team this year isn't so much Fanatec GT, but it is on the Intercontinental GT Challenge, hence the, uh, the team is here. And the Intercontinental GT Challenge announced uh, at Stefan Rattel's press conference yesterday that its final round won't be Kyle Army. Uh, in December, but the Gulf 12 Hours will join the IGTC roster, and Kyle Army will be back next year in March uh, or late March. So you'll go to Bathurst, then Kyle Army. It'll be an early season race, a spring race rather than an end of season blast. I don't think it rains quite as much in the spring as it does in December. That's a relief. Well, I don't know whether it's a relief for, not for us or for the competitors. <laughs> it's a nine hour race, it's a tough race, yeah. and if that was to be a dry race all the way through, changes again how teams are going to have to tackle it well the Gulf 12 hours have been an interesting one at the Abu Dhabi circuit and uh, it's been run traditionally that race as two six hour uh, portions but now it will be a full on 12 hour blast to round out the IGT season which will also introduce drop scores four out of five races you can do because of allowing the teams really a bit of leeway because of the travel situation right we're back on board with Gunon and he is now catching uh, Jens Klingman, isn't he? He's virtually got himself onto the back there of the BMW. Number 38, McLaren through. That's Marvin Kirchhoff, who is in 16th place. I thought it was a car off for a minute, but it's one of the course cars. All the uh, circuit shuttles just off the racetrack. So, Katzberg to Christensen. They are 58 minutes into a stint, and there are now suddenly 12 seconds that's, between the two. That's a bunch of time to lose. And yeah. Whether that's traffic-related, one of us, I would assume it is traffic-related because we've not seen anything indicating the reason why Michael Christensen would lose that level of that amount of time in a relatively few number of laps. So that'll give again Nicky Katzberg a little bit of comfort to know that the gap has extended rather rapidly, and any gain that you can make is a bonus. 
So the car will sweep through once more. And as I say, pit stops are imminent now because we're heading up to the hour mark for the leaders. It's so, so hard to read any proper pattern into this because of the number of interruptions that we've had. We've got now, what, five full course yellows, four of which took us into a safety car period. Penalties are still being offered up. The track limit warning page is non-stop. Every time you blink, there's another line added to it. There is 2-2-1. So Michael Christensen coming up towards the line. And the Porsche goes through, does another lap, 11.4 seconds, the margin. He's actually fractionally quicker that time, but even so, it's a big chunk of time that's been lost. Yeah, I mean, he picked up maybe half a second on that lap, but, uh, I mean, it's still 11.4 seconds, as opposed to just under the 12 seconds the previous lap. But it's a step in the right direction, and has he got clearish road direct? Yes, he has. So he, for the next number of laps, well, he has no traffic around, and particularly those cars that he would probably catch as a group of back markers. He gives a chance to anybody up the road. I can't even see the lights of anybody. Well, there are, yes, going up into Lake Coombe. But he'll have at least a clear lap or clearish until he gets round to the start finish line. So through they turn. Well, actually, he's catching him a lot quicker than I thought. Yeah. Grabs a gear up to fourth. Where are we now? This is Bruxelles, isn't it? Bruxelles, yeah. Just that. Awkward. It's always been an yeah. awkward corner, Brussels. But it's always been difficult to get the, fright, the front of the car to bite, to then enable you to balance the, the car right on the throttle, and then down through what was Speaker's Corner, now the Jackie Eakes curve, down into Pujol. Again, it's a fourth gear corner and a six-speed gearbox. For some reason, I always assumed that maybe it would be a gear higher uh, than the teams are taking it in, but clearly that's what they feel is the appropriate gear. As we go into Fania. The wireless onboard camera working overtime, stretched out in the woods, trying to get the pictures back. Worth staying with it, though, as fourth gear is grabbed through the curve, Paul Frere, back onto the power. Christensen grabs fifth. See that little screen to his right, which is effectively his rear view mirror. And that, in the pit lane and in its garage, is oh, number Nicky, 28, the Samantha Tan uh, racing, yeah, Nick BMW. Fittler, BMW. And that's not good if it's in its box. No, the only reason it's in the box is that it enables more than two people to work on the car. The regulation stipulates no more than two people at any given time in the pit lane. So if you have a problem, you put it on the trolley or the dollies and reverse it back into the garage. So there's Michael Christensen, he's brought the gap down again. 10.4 seconds now, that margin so between that was, the top That was two. about a second in the yeah. last lap, so... I mean, right now, Christensen would be knowing that he's closing in on Nicky Katzberg. Katzberg had the benefit of breaking free a number of laps ago, but that's been pegged now by Michael Christensen in the 2-2-1 Porsche. Now, Christensen's got to get past the BSR Lamborghini. Dives to the inside, goes through. And Mauro Engel has just come into the pit lane after only 28 minutes on track. So that suggests a problem, does it, for number 55? Well, we haven't seen anything. The camera hasn't picked up any reason for him. Either was he going slow, he didn't appear to have picked up a puncture. So until we see that car in its pits, as we go back, there's Kevin Estra limbering up. So you don't want to give your body one of those total shocks by having been out of the car for two or whatever number of hours it is. Then you get in and you put yourself under extreme pressure. So there is the Mercedes up on the jacks. Now, what that, assuming, I'm assuming Maro Engel is there. He is. It's still saying Maro Engel on the right, on the screen. Now, unless because they did a short stop earlier, they've now had to go out of sequence to do a long stop. We'll see off the pit stop time. If it's around the two minute mark, then uh, we'll know that it was a long stop and it's gone over a minute and a half. So I think, yes, it must have been. So uh, 
it's certainly been a full stop of fuel and tyres, but what was the catalyst for it? We don't know whether it, as I say, did have a, a, a problem which brought him in early, mid-stint. We'll try and get to the bottom of What a picture, looking over up towards the source of that lovely, sort of, again, Torquoisey final light at uh, the western end of this racetrack. So in comes second place, Michael. No, it's not Nicky Kisses, but it is the Porsche. Yeah. It's now been flagged up on our timing and scoring. So Katzberg also in. So first place, second place in. Christopher Meese running in sixth place in the 25 Audi is in also. Right, Christensen stops. Wriggles clear. And that's Kevin Astra who folds himself into the car, the tall, lanky Frenchman. When we had a look at the 2023 mm. Porsche, that's why I didn't sit in it, because if I did get into it, you it, needed to get a crane to get me out of it. Yeah. Uh, getting in and out of racing cars is an art, especially as quickly as these guys have well, to do it. New Pirellis go on. Yeah. Roll caged. Yeah. Fully enveloping seats, so the BM is rolling, and the Porsche is still being worked on, so the gap which had been reducing by the lap and that's just that's going to cost this team time so kevin Esther is going to have to really see what he can do so i don't know what the gap will be when they come around at the end of their first lap their out lap well it was 12 and a half when they came in and kevin Esther surely is now the gun for hire to bring that gap down so he's been given the, the, the stint now, and effectively he's got half an hour to try to get the lead of the race and get points at the six-hour mark. Do you think that's why they've put him in? Would that be cynical to say that? No, I think that's absolutely the right thing to do. You want, Ideally, you could have had him in a bit longer, but you'll put him in for this part of the race and try and get that car now into the lead, no question. So we've got half an hour in which to try and get the car, Nicky, or sorry, Kevin Estra behind the wheel to get him yeah. into the lead. And you've also got Nick Katzberg now, who has gone out of the pit lane, but stayed at the wheel of number 98. Well, that, I think, is probably common sense for BMW, because Nicky Katzberg is an exceptionally talented driver who has won here before for BMW. There we go, the Porsche makes its way. This very long pit lane exit. So back onto the racetrack. And look, Esther, I mean, I know this is a job, but straight away he's absolutely flat out isn't he you know, there's no sense of a lap or so to get up to speed and a feel for it straight away flat out up the hill up towards Lake Horn. that's what makes him Kevin Estra absolutely right and that's why Porsche love him uh, and it's why you and I are fans out of Lake Horn, look how gravelly well, it I is there's barely any one line I mean barely a little more than one car widths as they go through the exit that's in, they call it Malmody but it's the exit of Lake Combe down into Bruxelles third gear short throttle then back off again keeps it in third gear be careful on the exit because that can catch you out then the run down so into fifth gear will he go back into fourth gear or is he, he is down one gear well they were quicker by a second in the pit lane so Kevin Esther has already gained a little bit of ground to Nick Katzberg he's still having to set the dash as he wants it make sure everything is as the engineers are telling him. So it's a busy lap, this. Not only is he going flat out, he's also having to press buttons and flick switches. Well, basically, I think part of the tuition that these drivers have to go through is they're blindfolded and they were told, they're told to make changes on the steering wheel or on the dash. So they need to know mm. where those adjustments are. The steering wheel, clearly, you can see right in front of the driver. But it's the other adjustments that are a little bit further. There's a panel just down to his right, and you've got what, one, two, you've got 20 adjustments in that panel. The Porsche absolutely howled its way towards the chicane. Down, 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 down through the gears, into first. And but you've got first gear here and coming up at La Source. It does put a strain on the transmission. It certainly does. I mean, all the way down to first gear. In the meantime, Davide Urigo and the 71 Ferrari has claimed the lead. How long that will be the case for right now, Nicky Katzberg is being seen as seven and a half seconds behind, but I think we're waiting for Katzberg and Kevin Astra to come across the start finish line. More sparks fly for those cars that are now on a heavy fuel load. So it's uh, nearly 20 past 10 local time. We are about half an hour away from the end of the six hour mark of 
the total energy is 24 hours of spa as on board again with kevin est the gap between the two of them as they went across the line last time had become a slightly false one given that there's now gunnar and andlauer between them so uh, we've got davidi regon now with just enough time to lead at the six hour mark so I reckon 71 Ferrari is going to be up front at the end of six hours, ahead of Katzberg, ahead of Gunnar. So Rigon has done 33 minutes and he's got about 29 to get to the end of the hour and 65 to a stint. I think Davide Rigon will stay out and try and take the points for Iron Links now in the lead at the end of six hours. Probably a very good call. In the meantime, Nick Tandy in the 47 Porsche, 276 kilometers per hour on a race vision powered by AWS. Followed by Maxime Sule in the Bentley. We haven't seen much of the Bentley. It certainly had a problem. It thought it was initially a transmission problem. And then they were suggesting it was more a throttle problem. So the Bentley showed great pace, 275 clicks. But Nick Tandy in the 47. And wonder where that 47 is. Well, it's a ninth place, Dennis Olsen behind the wheel. Estra still on a mission. Not totally the quickest in the first sector on this lap, but it's just worth riding with him, isn't it? As he fights the car out of Blanchiment. Nothing is being left on the table, but that said, nor is it being left on the table by anybody that he's chasing. Absolutely not, and that's why these, the Ferraris leading from the BMW, from the Mercedes AMG, from a Porsche, 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 and then the second of the Iron Lynx Ferraris in seventh position. So they're all top drivers driving to the limit traffic permitting and circuit conditions permitting because there is a lot of debris all around the racetrack and if you stray fractionally offline that could be a big penalty good indeed as the cars then swoop once more through a rouge at the tail end of that little gaggle julian andlauer so now it's a case of doing the headlight spotting which is where our TV producer and director are becoming experts there on the inside. Andlauer goes through. That moves him through the traffic. Doesn't give him a place in the classification, but it does get him further up the, uh, the queue of cars ready to challenge Jules Gounon for third place. So that number 100 Porsche is another one doing a nice, steady job. It's always there or thereabouts, and it's, it's not really put itself in any dramatic problems. Klaus Backler has just lost the position to Miguel Molina, so he was sixth, he's now dropped to seventh, so don't know what reason that has happened, other than just simply the fact that Molina has been running quicker and, and find a way around. And pa Porsche, passing a Porsche here at Spa has not been easy for Ferrari, we saw for a long time. The 71 running behind the 54 Porsche and just could do nothing at the end of the straight. Well, as the race leaders now are on that 130, David Rigon up front, six and a half seconds clear, but he is being caught by a second a lap by Nick Katzberg. So both of those are Fanatec GT regulars, so these points matter, as they do to Jules Gounon in third. And just to prove how quickly these drivers are driving, Nicky Katzberg on this lap, lap 130, has recorded his fastest second sector time of the race. Temperatures are dropping, of course, but... Relatively speaking, we've had relatively few retirements. One more has just been notified, and Christopher Hauser, who ran really well in the early part of the race, has, I'm afraid, uh, with the damage sustained, that car now being retired from the race. So Christopher Hauser is uh, now also out of the race. Now, let's head to the pit lane. Gemma has managed to find Santa Lot Racing's uh, Lucas Legere. Let's hear from him. Lucas, you've just handed the car over to Chris, who became a dad, actually, earlier on today. And uh, you said to me that you're struggling a little bit with the car. What's wrong? Uh, I did so well in, uh, during my stint. Uh, I have to check with the engineer what is the problem. Probably I didn't manage the tyre well enough, so uh, I'll check on the data to see what's going on, and I will probably jump out uh, in the car or in the next stint. We noted earlier on in the race that it seemed to be Audi and Lamborghini that are struggling most with the tyres and the punctures, is that right? Yeah, that's totally right, because we saw at the beginning of the, of the race two Audi who got punctured. I think uh, with the setup wise we managed this quite well. Let's see if we have one during the race, but uh, so far 
so good, so it's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Lucas Leisure then, and uh, the dad, Christopher Meese, uh, being referred to, so... Uh, so much for paternal duties. You're still going to go and drive for Audi. Then you're allowed to go and be a dad. Well, he hasn't taken time off for maternity leave, has he? No, exactly. Exactly right. So, David Rigon, 4.7 seconds to the good. The gap is coming down. So, it's between Ferrari and BMW then for honours at the six hour mark here. And we are getting closer and closer to that cut off point, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, I just. I mean, Focusing on Kevin Astro, currently he's 17.7 seconds behind Davidi Rigon. And we've got, it's coming up to now 22 minutes or so past 10. And we've got until a quarter to 11 before we get to the six hour mark. Yeah, that's right. The race then with effectively 22 minutes before you get to that uh, next hour. And a good little scrap here going on as you've got. Ray Foley going on the inside there, moving himself through ahead of Rahel Frey. So the Valkenhorst BMW picks up a spot on the inside line. Valkenhorst's fleet of cars or pair of cars for this weekend. The uh, gold entry, Robbie Foley, I should say, the uh, GT4 America champion a couple of years ago, gains the place and off has gone. Whom? It's a Mercedes by the look of it, Mercedes AMG. Oh, number, number three. three, Sebastian Bode. So the get speed car, it looks like he's up at Le Combe, and it looks like it's facing the wrong way. Without the headlights, that's a very, very risky place to be. Now yeah. the headlights come on. Yeah, wave, double wave, yellow Ooh. flag, so everybody is being warned. Oh, and there is a exhaust fire, so that's just fuel that's in the exhaust system that's ignited. He may have stalled the engine, but he got it going again, and uh, the residue of fuel, that's what ignited. But the give it full throttle, that will soon burn that fuel out, and uh, he's got the car rolling. But whether he got tagged turning into Lake Kuma, whether that was a self induced spin, uh, we may have a view of that in a minute or two. Let's have a look at this then. So, self, self induced. Induced. yeah, a bit of bodywork flies off, others have to take evasive action. And in fact, those that were on the outside having to go through the gravel, lucky to get away with that. But you can see just how rocky the road now is. Right, Regal, 4.1 seconds up on Katzberg for one and two. And this is Nick Katzberg, so down to the chicane he comes, as we've been saying, lap after lap after lap, the gap is down. And whether he can get there in time with 20 minutes effectively now before the six hour points are awarded, we'll have to wait and see. But this is a really interesting battle. Yeah, there's nothing like being able to see your adversary. And that's what Nicky Katzberg now has got. He can see the tail of the lead Ferrari. And uh, that, if you need inspiration, that is inspiration enough. And his last lap was at 2 minutes 19.7 against the Ferrari of 2 minutes 22. He's six tenths of a second up on that last lap. You know, six tenths of a second every lap is probably going to mm. just about get him up to the tail of the Ferrari. But whether it's enough to get him ahead of the Ferrari to lead at the end of six hours, well, that's a separate issue. Well, David Regan is certainly not going to let him go by easily. There is proof of what we've been saying. The gap down, 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 lap after lap after lap. So Katzberg taking the fight to Regan. So the Iron Lynx Ferrari leads the way. Nick Katzberg chases as they go up towards La Source now. The gap, 1.7 seconds. So he's just taken two and a half seconds out on that lap alone. So this is a remarkable effort by Nick Katzberg. He's, of course, on fresher tyres. He's only 12 minutes into a stint, whereas the Ferrari that he is uh, leading and much further into a stint. So Regan has gone 42 minutes, Katzberg just nudging 12 minutes. In other words, although Katzberg's car is heavier on fuel, it's fresher on tyres. Yes, yeah, it's the tyre factor is the dominant factor. When you've got a fresh set of Pirelli rubber, it doesn't have to bring the car to life. You can carry the weight. It's when you're on used tyres and have a heavy fuel load as well, which isn't often the case, but that's the worst scenario. You can mm. see how quickly Katzberg's running down. Davide Rigon was 1.7 seconds, and they came across the line at the end of lap 132. And it's going to be within a second before, or less, a second, around a second by the time they come across to complete one lap 133. 
So in the first sector of this lap, the gap down by another 410, so it's going to be hovering just over a second then. There is Nick Katzberg with that purple strip across the top of the car, so we can identify it, but crucially, so that the mechanics can when it comes down the pit lane. They know exactly which is the car they're looking for, so they can wave the board to get it into the right place. Nick Katzberg goes through. And there, just up the road ahead, is Davidi Rigon. So this lead change is imminent, isn't it, as they come down towards campus. So in the darkness now, it's pretty much full darkness out of the back of the circuit. Nick Katzberg edges ever nearer. They're about to get to the end of the middle sector. And the sector time's there. Another three-tenths pullback by Katzberg. This is a very, very good stint. Yeah, I mean, on their, their last laps, Rigon's last lap was a 2.22 as against a 2.20. Actually, almost two and a half seconds he took out of that that lead of David Rigo, and I can't believe that was a mistake from Rigo. Mm. I have to believe that was traffic came into play. So here we are coming into the final two corners, the chicane. So the gap was 1.7 seconds. It's going to be a point, point 0.7 of a second as they go across the start finish line. Through they go then. So the BMW goes by and from 1.7 to 6 tenths, 0.599, it is game on for the race lead in the Total Energy's 24 hours of Spa. We're nearly at the end of six hours of racing, points are on offer at that mark and David Rigon's Ferrari leads Nick Katzberg as they drop downhill now. Jules Gounon is 10 seconds back in third place. He doesn't look like he's doing any catching at all, he's dropping away if anything, but Katzberg is going to make his move for the lead, possibly even up at Le Con, because now he's almost in the draft, he's almost ready to get a toe. Well, that's what he would be hoping for, but in fact, you can see the gap's not really altering a great deal. It is sort of closing, but Rigon is wise to it, so he plants his car, but that compromises his entry into Le Kumi. He has slowed down Nicky Katzberg in the process, which, of course, he doesn't mind now that Katzberg has closed up to the tail of the Ferrari. It'll be the Ferrari that will be dictating the pace of these two cars, not Katzberg. Katzberg with a flash of the lights there as they get to the first part of Bruxelles, nose to tail now then, in the first sector, he was another four tenths quicker, and you can see now just how close this is, the pair of them tied together as they drop downhill, so the BMW getting closer and closer and closer into Pouin, this is the view from the outside, headlights of the Ferrari, headlights of the BMW, they swoop through Pouin, but where does Katzberg make the move, he's almost now within striking distance. Yeah, catch, but overtake, two different scenarios. And I still maintain that Regal has been run down pretty quickly, but now that Katzberg's caught up to the tail of the Ferrari, it'll be the pace of Regal that's going to dictate the pace of Nicky Katzberg. And this is always the issue. We've seen it from the start of this race. You've got cars that are quicker than cars they're following, but quicker in a lap, but not necessarily quicker on every part of the racetrack or the parts of the racetrack that you can make a clean overtake. Right, this is Katzberg's chance, look, going for the race lead. He's almost, almost, almost in striking distance. He's quicker through Blanchiment. Down to the chicane they come. It's, what, two lengths between them at the end of lap 134. If the move doesn't come into the braking area, a good run out of the chicane should set him up for La Source. Yes, he needs to get a good traction off the chicane, but the Ferrari didn't do a bad job, so the gap as they come across the line was just over half a second. It is now just under half a second, 0.4 of a second. Again, up the hill, Regan goes defensive, gives Nicky Katzberg more options and choice of entry and exit lines. So here we go again. This, this is deja vu, and it's yeah. going to be deja vu until the six hours is eclipsed. So once more, they swoop through Eau Rouge. Fantastic fight for the race lead, this. And as I say, this is absolutely vital for the six-hour points. So the cars together make the run up towards Le Combe, up towards the right, the left, the right sequence. Does the set of headlights dive to the inside? It does. Nick Katzberg tries to find a way through, can't do it. Turns into the corner. He could barely be closer now, but the, the move is not really on, I don't suppose, into Bruxelles, unless he can force a mistake out of Regon and swing him out wide. So, note the Ferrari hangs on in there. Yes, I mean, here we are. We've seen this throughout the race. Katzberg catches, catches, catches. Down through Bruxelles, then the sort of sprint down into Jackie X curve. And again, the Ferrari marginally extends the gap as they go down to Pujol. So it's Ferrari leading BMW here as we nudge towards the six-hour mark.
Now let's have a look at where we have got to thus far here in the Total Energy's 24 Hours of Spa. Great start by the Porsche of Klaus Battler to take the race lead ahead of Raffaele Marcello as the cars swept their way up through Radion for the first time. And despite everybody's fears, it was a very clean, not only first lap, but first hour of the race. Michael Christensen was busy in the GPX Porsche, latching himself onto the back of Christopher Hauser, but keeping out of trouble, which was the main aim for everybody as the cars swept their way around La Source and then headed downhill. We've got the cars running three wide as this all GT3 field underlined why the balance of performance works so well. The first casualty was Nigel Bay, tapped into a spin by Kenny Harville, but the car was able to be pushed out of the gravel by the marshals and Nigel Bay back into the race. Antonio Fuoco was busy looking for a way past Maxi Book, whereas Loris Spinelli was getting a bit physical with Janis Fitcher. Contact coming out of Lecon between the two Mercedes. First casualty in terms of a puncture was Sandy Mitchell. His Gold Cup leading Lamborghini in strife of heading for the pit lane, as also in the wars was Stephen Grove, his Porsche way off the racetrack coming out of Blanchimont. Good fight then raged on between Lucas Stoltz and Kerm Ledegar. The Porsche being given a shove and a squeeze, and the lizard green Porsche almost camouflaged on the grass. He got back ahead of uh, briefly Raffaele Marcello, but then Raffaele made it stick going into Le Corme. And Eddie Cheever made a dive on the inside of Jens Liebhauser to take over the lead of the Gold Cup. A big, big spin for Cesar Gazzo, put the GT4 racers Audi into the wall and out of the race. That the first official retirement. He got back to the pit lane, but the damage was too great. Jens Liebhauser got together with Valentin Pierberg as they came through the chicane. Jens Liebhauser got together with Enrique Chavez down at Bruxelles and then got together with the gravel. Then, under the safety car, Jonathan Hui tangled with Antares Al and got a penalty for his pains. And then, as the race restarted and they headed up towards Le Comte, Jens Liebhauser had yet more contact and that turned him around. He wasn't the only one in strife either because off went Isaac Tutumlu Lopez and as people hit the brakes in avoidance, the Ferrari Hugo Della course suffered rear damage and Alex Rivas's Aston Martin suffered front damage as well. Daniel Serra had been on a mission trying to get the Iron Lynx number 71 Ferrari up the order. That car shared with Antonio Fuoco and Davide Rigon starting to look ever more impressive as Patrick Niederhauser tried to send his Audi up the inside line, having taken over from Christopher Mies. Then, as a full course yellow was called for, Alfaisal Al Zubar ploughed into the back of the Allied Racing Porsche of Alex Malikin. That was the end of the Porsche, and it was certainly the end of the Mercedes. Marcus Winkelhock was being aggressive coming out of the hairpin at La Source, and Jonathan Hui had a spin coming out of the chicane. Nicholas Nielsen, Miguel Molina, James Collado, Ferrari making its way up through the traffic. Brandon E. Reeves, McLaren turned through, and Jens Liebhauser had yet more drama, this time with number 12 Audi. And the Audi also, by the way, is now officially a retirement. Carrie Moget went off the road and brought out a full course yellow and safety car situation, having gone onto the gravel of somebody else. And that car would also bring out a full course yellow not long after when Adam Ateki stopped out on the circuit. The field all bunched up. The Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes running out of road at Radion, having to skip across the escape area. A big dive by the Iron Lynx Ferrari to go ahead of number 54 Porsche of Thomas Priming down at La Source. Others exploring all of the real estate available coming out of the Cour Pour Fred. The Allied Racing Porsche way, way wide. Dominic Fisley getting back onto the circuit as the Mercedes battle saw 88 from the Acredis ASP stable get ahead of number two from Getsby. And another fight was on here between Dennis Olsen and Nicholas Nielsen. Olsen in the Porsche and on the inside line, the Ferraris. The two of them went toe-to-toe -to -toe up through Radion. That contact could have been a whole lot worse as race leader Marco Mappelli's race changed for the worst completely. A punctured tyre a third of the way around the lap meant a slow in-lap and number six would drop off the lead lap of the race and that can be crucial to keeping your hopes alive. So darkness has descended, pit stops are cycling through and we're getting towards the end of six hours, at which point there are points on offer. This was the most recent full course yellow when Adam Eteki stopped, but the car quickly hoiked out of the way. We've had more pit stops, we've had more drama and another recent spin, that was Sebastian Bode getting it wrong up at Le Cong.
Now, Nick Katzberg remains second. David Rigon remains the leader. The margin between them, 0.362 of a second last time. We are effectively now uh, only eight minutes away from the point scoring mark. So this is a mega battle. And David Rigon coming under increased attack from Nick Katzberg then. The gap down a little bit more, look, as they come through Blanchiment. So as Nick Katzberg tries to get this car into the lead, Augusto Farfus looks on, his co-driver from the pit lane. What are his thoughts about this? Well, last pass back, it was four tenths back that Nicky Katzberg was from the Ferrari in front of him with Augustus Farfus. And as you watch along as this battle is happening, how are you processing this? Well, uh, it's still a very early stage on the race, so uh, it's great to see the car running up front see that we we have the pace we knew the night would have helped us so at this stage it's just about trying to keep keep up with the leader or being the leader uh, but there is still 18 hours of battle ahead it's great to see you know it is six hours on the race and have so many cars closing fighting so it is going to be a, an intense battle until the end of the race we can see the onboard right there where is the bmw fast here uh, our car is very good on the high speed corners so uh due to the dimension of the car and the design of the car. The car, it is particularly strong on the high-speed stuff. Uh, so here we can take advantage of it, but of course, turn one, bus stop, it is not our favorite corner here. But the package itself, BMW Motorsport has worked really hard, and, uh, and the car is just performing very well. Thumbs up from Augusto Farfus then, talking to Amanda Busick in the pit lane. Katzberg is even closer this time. The gap had gone up slightly to half a second over the stripe, but now it is down at Bruxelles. But David Rigon just trying to make sure that for another six and a half minutes he fends off the BMW. Well, all he's got to do is ensure he doesn't make an error mm. or get caught in back markers that could force a, a, a wrong decision to pass one side and leave the other side of the road open to the, the BMW which is, well, it's half a second in the last lap pass. It's, it's, it's almost a, a point, as, whether it's a half a second or four tenths of a second or three tenths of a second. The issue is, where can the BMW find a way around the leading Ferrari? And now katzberg has been behind this Ferrari in this position for the last five or so, six laps, and he hasn't got an answer. So as the leaders come through then, they got very close at Blanchimont, a couple of laps back, and Katzberg in the BMW again, really good through this part of the circuit. So now maybe, maybe, maybe the move is on as they come up towards the chicane. Regon has to go defensive. That means that Katzberg drops a length there because they almost touched again, didn't they, coming out of Blanchimont, but down towards the chicane. Katzberg closes. He's got to think about La Source as the option. So the move for turn one starts here. Yeah, as but we heard Augusta Farr was saying, the bus stop doesn't suit their car quite as well as some of the high-speed corners around this racetrack. So the traction that the Ferrari has, remember, it's a mid-rear engine car as opposed to a mid-front engine car. So the strengths ebb and flow all around the circuit. So it gets, I mean, Katzberg gets as close to the rear of the Ferrari in La Source. And then you've got the run down the hill. The BM may well be quicker on a single lap in clear air than the Ferrari, but he ain't on his own and he ain't in clear air. Now, is this a BMW or a Ferrari section of the circuit? We'll find out in a moment because David Irigon is still leading on this. Lap 139, Katzberg tries to get a toe. He's close, he's inching up, he's creeping up, he's having a look to the left, a look to the right, but Rigon arrives at Le Comte, still in charge, but only just. Fantastic battle between the pair of them. The two could hardly be closer, and Katzberg then. He's got four minutes to get through in order to lead at six hours, and I don't think he's going to do it. Well, if he hasn't been able to do it over the last five or six laps, I, I, I don't know whether than other cars coming into play, how he's going to face. He's done everything he's got, every tool in the race car that he's had, he's been adjusting, trying to find a way to get ahead of the Ferrari. And you've got a mixture of high speed, medium speed, low speed corners around the seven kilometers Spa Francorchamps racetrack. And while the car may well be the best balanced, the best car overall on the high speed racetrack, it's a circuit made up of medium and slow speed corners as well. Katzberg has done all he can do. He's drawn himself up to the tail of Rigo in the Ferrari. But, you know, you could almost predict that catching and overtaking are two different issues. Absolutely so. Down they come through the Corp Paul Frere approach out of campus. This is the corner itself. And three and a half minutes are between David Rigon and points for the lead at six hours of the race. 
Nick Katzberg once more. Absolutely, Harry Flatters now coming up through Blanchiment. He was oh so close a lap ago. Where's the gap? There's no gap on the inside. There's no gap on the outside. But then he's not quite close enough to dive up the inside into the chicane. Another flash of the lights to try to unsettle the Ferrari. Good luck with that, Nick. It seems that on the last two laps, Katzberg's had to lift off momentarily on the entry into Blanchiment. Well, that's because he felt he was maybe likely to overrun the Ferrari in the corner, which would not be an ideal situation. So it's a matter of just really assessing of what is the right thing to do. And maybe he's catching the Ferrari too early in the run out of Paul Frere Coeur before they get up to the chicane. I don't know. I'm just trying to second guess what might be going through the mind of both the drivers, but particularly that of Nicky Katzberg. Now, a flying lap is a two minutes 19, so there is this lap and effectively one more before we get the six hour mark completed and the points for it. And again, this is Katzberg making the run up the hill. We are at uh, not far off quarter to 11 local time. We're two minutes away from points at six hours. We're at Le Corbe, but we're going right and then left and then right. And here, Katzberg has closed a touch under braking as well. Interestingly, a little bit further through the field is Jules Gugnon and the 88 Mercedes AMG lapping at the same pace as these two lead cars are doing, as is Kevin Estra in fifth place in the 221 Porsche, likewise matching 2 minutes 20 to 2 minutes 20.1 and 20.2. So there are what, four of the top five cars all running within a tenth of a second of a lap of each other. And here's the blast downhill once more then. Stand on the brakes there from Davide Rigon coming into Pouin. This is the sector that's perhaps not quite so kind to the BMW, but as long as he's there or thereabouts, there's an opportunity to challenge towards the end of the lap, down into the fifth path they come now. Right, then left, but there's also back markers up the road, and if Rigon catches those at the wrong part of the lap, it could all be different again. So the trick in these situations is to gauge how quickly you're catching these cars, but more crucially, whereabouts are you going to catch them? So they're not going to catch them into Blanchemont, but they may catch the tail of those, what's it, three cars ahead under braking. In fact, you can see how quickly, in yeah. fact, the Ferrari has caught up to the tail. He gets past one of the Porsches, it looks like. So Katzberg, probably slightly more compromised, wasn't quite sure whether there was going to be space given for him to get through. I thought that looked like the Kevin Astra livery that was being lapped there. Another spin for number four. Mercedes that's having a pretty torrid race, goes around, rejoins. That's it's going again. Yeah, that was Jordan Love at the wheel of it. So the leaders go through, and we've done five hours, 59 minutes, and 27 seconds. So at the end of this lap, the points for six hours will be on offer. The margin as they went over the line, 0.354 of a second. And the Bentley's back at the races. It that is. was the 107 Bentley we saw stopping in the pit lane, a pit straight, pushed behind the barrier, but it's back running albeit down in 58th position. Sadly, I have to say, Charlie Eastwood in the 23, Aston Martin, is running down in six. I don't know what the problem with that particular car is. That had some front damage early on. I think it lost so much time uh, in the pit lane. Daniel Serra is watching all of this, uh, and uh, he is seeing his number 71 Ferrari leading the way. Nick Katzberg has now got trapped in traffic. Let's hear from Daniel Serra with Amanda. Well, there's just a monitor over our shoulders here as we watch along with this battle. We heard what the benefits were in the BMW. How do you defend the Ferrari and what's good with that, Meg? Uh, it's a great fight. Uh, we are in a different strategy. We are in the end of our steam. Uh, they have fresher tires now, so I think that is doing a great job to, to hold uh, Nick back. And it's good for the championship, for the endurance points as well. We just crossed the six hours uh, mark, so yeah, everything is going well. We are looking at the Ferrari on board, and the guys in the booth have been questioning what might be going on in David's mind. What do you think? Sorry, I couldn't hear. We've been questioning what might be going on through David's thoughts. What would you predict? Yeah, like, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great fight. I think um, he's struggling a little bit with the tires. I think it's his last lap now. Um, anyway, so far, so good. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. So David Urigon still leads the way. Nick Katzberg then in second, and I don't think he is going to be able to do this. David Urigon will complete this lap in the lead and therefore take the points, and he'll have one more lap then to get into the pit lane just because it's 65 minutes. It's going to be 
marginal, but he should just be able to do this as he comes. No, into the pits this time. So, having led all the way up to the mark, is he going to cross the pit lane line ahead, or is Nick Katzberg going to go through into the pits he comes? And Katzberg takes over the race lead. So, he will go through at the end of six hours then to take over the lead. He couldn't do it on the track, but because of the way that the pit stop was needed by the Ferrari, then Davide Rigon gives up, has to give up the race lead, and Nick Katzberg then leads at six hours. And David Rigon stays on board. I mean, having defended as he's done over the last 10 or more laps, keeping the BMW behind, three, uh, uh, three, uh, uh, three, he'll feel frustrated that he didn't lead at that six hour point. In the meantime, Kevin Hester has also found a way around. The 100 Porsche Julian at Mauer. So that's an improvement for the number 221 Porsche. Getting a couple of uh, drive stint infringements, stop go penalties, and drive through penalties. You heard the race director, Joel Doval, in the background, just uh, talking about those. So, uh, Nick Katzberg there, perhaps against all expectations, does lead at the end of six hours and not in the way that we we're anticipating. The Ferrari gets away now. That could be quite important, that uh, point score, come the end of the endurance season, couldn't it? Uh, if you've got, if you've got points, maximum points, you're always going to take them. But they had to make that pit stop so the, the points went to the BMW. So, David Rigon's Ferrari will rejoin as the BMW of Nick Katzberg will take over the race lead and Jules Gounon should go up into second place and Kevin Esther should now take over third. And there is Spa at night time. It takes on a whole different feel. What's really nice is to see so many people still in the grandstands opposite us and uh, up at uh, Eau Rouge watching all of this. Uh, having been really starved of their 24-hour fix for two years, they're back and back in force. And it's been compounded by an absolutely amazing weekend. And, and it, it's outside, I don't know what the ambient is. It's probably, if nothing else, in the high teens, maybe just still in the, the very low 20s, but still a very comfortable evening indeed as we're coming up to 10 to 11 on Saturday evening and an hour and 10 minutes we'll be into Sunday. Well, indeed. So once John's been to church, he'll be back with us in the morning as down the pit road now comes the multi multi denomination. Indeed. Comes number 100 with a puncture by the look of it. Is it a bit wobbly at the back? Yeah, the left has had a tire go down, hasn't it? And yeah. that car was running well up early on. We said it had kept out of trouble. Well, Julian Andlauer has had a slow in-lap, and he's dropped back into 23rd place now. Yeah, that's been a long run back for the Porsche. So, again, the unpredictability of picking up punctures or cutting a tyre or whatever it is that's happening. So it looks like he's going to stay on board and do a double stint. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a slow in-lap like that is very costly. It's, it's dropped him off the lead lap. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's just, a, it is, hate to use the word disaster, but it, that's in effect what it is. Yeah, indeed. So, the race leaders are currently working lap 143. Their number 24 is the Porsche that we had Nico Menzel driving when we last looked. It's another of those looking for a class result. And it is still Nico Menzel, who is leading now in Pro-Am, 26th place overall. So category leader, this car, so significant one to look for. And uh, the Herbert Motorsport entry, looking solid, looking dependable. Nico Menzel knows all about these cars, having been a Carrera Cup Asia champion. The track limit warnings, by the way, for everybody has now been reset. But even though that's happened, straight away there are one or two people give, being given uh, their first track limit warning. So uh, reset means gloves off, you can go again, they, they feel. So Katzberg leading by 11 seconds from Jules Gounon. So BMW with a good history in this race from touring cars as well as GT days. And they're way out wide, goes number five then, the gold cup Mercedes. Penalised a little while ago, Eljan Maini still at the wheel of it, gold class leader comes over the line, but a little bit wayward at the chicane there. Yeah, 19th overall, uh, just ahead of Jordan Love. In a, in a like machine. But look, how spectacular. I mean, it looks like a truck you see running up and down the motorways with all their fluorescent identification. No mistaking that car coming no, you're the right. pit lane. Number 30 is the car that leads silver. That's uh, Jean-Baptiste Simonard now. 
So Jean-Baptiste Simonau, 14th place overall, uh, and that WRT Audi sort of giving the team a bit to cheer for, but it's been a, a tough race thus far for the Audi. Simonau in 14th, leading that silver battle. Yes, and ironically, the lead the lead Audi is only in 11th position. That's the 46, Nico Muller behind the wheel. So between Nico Muller and Fred Vavish and, of course, Valentino Rossi, they are the leading WRT entry. That's right, then. So cars head through Pouin once more, and Nick Katzberg's advantage continues to edge up only a little. Now, they're number six, the Lamborghini of Marco Mappelli. It's now, in fact, Jordan Pepper at the wheel. I say Mappelli because when we last got excited about that car, it was having its tyre issues, and so Jordan Pepper is behind the wheel. But again, that car is still trying to get back onto, somehow, the lead lap, and it is not easy to do. Now, the next fight, looking at Kevin Estra's pace, he actually is not catching, surprisingly, Jules Gounon, the Porsche. And again, if you believe what you're being told from within uh, Porsche Brains Trust, they're having to go to a, a slower pace to look after the tyres. Does seem to be backed up by the fact that Estra isn't, despite the fact that he looks quick to the eye, isn't coming back at the leaders. The next of the Porsches is fifth, Klaus Backler, and he is lapping in the 221s. Now, OK, some of this could be down to traffic. And there's another car in strife. That, I fear, is Matt Campbell coming into the chicane. It is, and has Campbell got a puncture, maybe? Well, he's coming in the pit lane, that is clear. Yeah, but it just looked as though the car was low on a given corner. So Matt Campbell, I fear, has also suffered a tyre drama. And this is what people feared in the night, wasn't it? When people go off, run wide, bring gravel onto the road, you drive over it, and then punctures come. So Matt Campbell down the pit lane. Now it's a bit more illuminated there. Might be able to see there's a driver change imminent, but the EMA motorsport car comes down the pit road. Campbell 17th when he came in and the car stops on its marks then, so the team goes to work, and yet straight away the tyres are readied. Two mechanics to do the four corners. There's only two mechanics allowed for the whole operation, so it's a, it's a, a, a tough ask being a, a wheelie mechanic in this. Very acrobatic mechanic, leaps onto the front of the car to clean the screen. Car so, controller at the front. Yeah, Matt Campbell vacates the seat, so he's done his evening's work and um, wait to see where that car rejoins it's falling down obviously as it's sitting in the pit lane but the gap currently at the lead between the 98 bmw and the 88 mercedes amg is 11 and a half seconds kevin estra further 7.2 seconds behind in third place so this is katzberg this is the leader and ahead at six hours is number 98 then. So Nick Katzberg comes into the Le Combe sequence. The right, the left, the right. So not only has he got the lead, not only has he got the points, he's also extending that advantage just a little over then in second spot, Jules Gounon. And then in third, Kevin Estra as they come down once again through Speaker's corner, turn nine. And keep on pushing, keep going down the hill. The BMW that looked absolutely nowhere in the first hour of the race, certainly now, is much, much more of a factor as the cars again come into the uh, campus right-hander out of Piff Paff. Now, where else do we need to be looking? Marvin Kirchhofer is quietly getting on with the job, as of Rob Bell. I don't know that we've had much of Ollie Wilkinson yet, but I do think that the McLaren team have, have, have used Kirchhofer and Bell certainly more, yes. if not exclusively, to try to get points at six yeah, hours. Yeah, I mean, it would be strange to put Ollie Wilkinson into the car, yeah. you know, having done nothing for six hours, stone cold into the night time. Well, just, by the way, just uh, Nicky Katzberg, just to emphasise his pace, has suddenly done on the last lap of two minutes, 19.7. Kirchhoff at going up to my McLaren point, sixth overall, which is a good run. Often the McLaren seem to have one lap pace, but not the reliability. But that car, again, running to a pace, trying to keep out of trouble and looking pretty decent right now. As here, Katzberg comes across the line. That's another lap in the book. That's 145 done. Out of Lassau's got that Mercedes to negotiate in a moment as the cars again head down to Eau Rouge. This lap 146. The lead gap now is 12 seconds. Katzberg to Gounon. 
I mean, right now, Nicky Katzberg is absolutely flying. Yeah. His last lap was a 219.4, his best overall, which was set on lap 102. Not that long ago, it was a 219.1. That would have been when the set of tyres were absolutely brand spanking new. So Katzberg creeps past the Mercedes AMG up into Le Coombe. And uh, he is on a mission, and that is to extend the advantage over Jules Gugnon, which he has done. Now it's up to 12.2 seconds. And Kevin Estra, a further 8.2 seconds behind the second place, Jules Gugnon. Remember, Nick Katzberg won for Mark VDS Racing back in 2015. The favoured car, if you like, the Linders Martin entry had had its problems. Nick Katzberg's car inherited the lead and hung on in there. Came through to score the win. So Katzberg, he's coming up to more traffic, though, here, John, isn't he? Yeah, there's traffic around the racetrack. It's just a, a question of whether he'll catch it at an inappropriate part of the racetrack. But he's certainly been running, I mean, impressively quickly in these hours of darkness and, and just threading your way around a racetrack that's got a significant, significant amount of gravel and rubber and whatever else has been chucked on or chucked out the racetrack. Right, so the cars make the run again into the end of the, the lap. For some, they're coming towards pit stop time, aren't they? Because Jules Gounon, for example, knows there's a pit stop. He's done 62 minutes, so the car in second place now, Jules Gounon, is heading towards a pit stop. And I would offer you also Klaus Backler and also Stein Scotthorst are due in. And as we head towards the nighttime part of this race, Marvi Kirchhofer just comes in, Maxi Martin is in, Arjun Maini is in. So the teams, when they can go green, suddenly go back to their original plan of trying to get as many laps in an hour as they can before the next pit stops. But it's only when you get these full course yellows that they have to start being creative, roll the dice a little bit and try and do something different so that the, uh, the strategy might be changed and they can try to buy back any of that lost time. And there we time. are, the 88 is in. Yeah. So Gugno into the pit lane. We don't see that on the timing and scoring until he crosses the line there. So now we'll get notification as the 155 Lamborghini makes its way down to La Source, the inside of the tight hairpin bend. So Gunon in, and that's going to give Kevin Estra the chance now to get into second place. He and Katzberg pitted together at the start of, or if you like, the end of the last in the start of this. So they should be back in on the same lap this time around as Gunon makes his way down towards the end of the Formula One pits and turns his way through. And that means that as he accelerates downhill back into the race, we are just about nudging 11 o'clock local time. Uh, it means that we have still got 17 and three quarter hours of the race to go. And it means that Nick Katzberg's BMW leads here in the Total Energy's 24 hours of Spa. And it also means that for the next few hours, uh, Watty and I uh, will be able to leave you in the company of Martin Haven and of Bruce Jones, who are poised, ready to take over and ready to talk you through what promises no doubt to be uh, a very dramatic night indeed, because we've got some great battles raging on, not only for the lead, but also for the classes as well. And so the net result of all of this promises then uh, action all the way. We've had plenty of drama, plenty of incident already. There's more of that to come as well. And and as the Jules Gounon Mercedes then goes through its pit stop and Raffaele Marciello is installed back behind the wheel, the uh, next round of pit stops for the likes of Katzberg and Kevin Est ain't that far away either. As I say, they are running pretty much on the same uh, strategy. There is the WRT team ready for the Silver Cup number 30 Rothko entry that is about to come into the pit lane and with his I Spy book of headlights ready to uh, regale you with the difference between a Mercedes AMG and a McLaren 70, 720S is Martin Haven. And as I say, Martin, along with Bruce Jones, will guide you through what promises to be a very dramatic night here at Spa. Thank you, David. And thank you to John Watson as well. Offer some well-earned kip. Good luck with that. I hope, <laughs> hope it works well. And uh, ready, ready, to <laughs> ready for the red flag and the barrier pairs to commence. And, and a long-standing and always hilarious in-joke <laughs> between myself and David, uh, which date backs actually particularly to the 2019 race when uh, we took over at this stage. We had an hour of absolutely sparkling GT racing. And then the rain, the fog, and the crashes that brought out the red flags for a further nine hours. 
only for us to start to go green just as the ne'er-do-wells that are backing out of the office return from their fine sleep and breakfast at Portia. A very good night to them as well. So wherever you are around the world, thank you for joining us. I know for a lot of you, it will be already Sunday morning. For some of you, it is uh, barely Saturday lunchtime. So wherever you are, uh, hopefully we'll have plenty of entertaining racing. And already, if you popped out after the first couple of hours, you're going, hang on a minute, what happened to the Mercedes Porsche battle? And how has the BMW come from at best mid teens to become the race leader? And the answer is, uh, it's just that kind of a race. There's, the, the, the BMW hasn't suddenly found pace, Bruce, and the Porsche hasn't suddenly lost pace, and the Mercedes are just as quick as they were. In fact, everybody is pretty much just as quick as they were. But in what is a, an enormous battle of almost exact equals, just the vagaries of when safety cars come out and exactly what you're doing and where you... And actually, sometimes, where you are on the lap when the safety car comes out or when a full course yellow is declared can make an enormous difference. If you are right by the pits when we go full course yellow, then suddenly you can duck in. Somebody who's just past the pits is seven kilometers away at 80 kilometers an hour and will lose an awful lot of time when they come in and then lose further when they have to join the, the safety car queue. So it's, it's the most enormous game of snakes and ladders. It, it is entirely, but it is also those at the front right now are the ones who have not had any rucks in their rug. They have managed to keep things running smoothly, smoothly. You know full well this race years ago, decades ago, was an endurance race. It still is pr it's changed to something that's pretty close to a sprint outright for 24 hours. But the teams that they say this at the start, you never know if they mean it or not. Best intentions take it easy for the first six hours have no problems yeah. for the first six hours. yeah 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 off you go but we must say that opening hour where we expected incident galore it was almost incident free in terms of cars having spins okay since then the gravel's been brought onto the track time and time again we've had people knocking each other off possibly a lot of drivers hooking the corners but we think next year they'll be accustomed to where the gravel is and stop yeah. bringing it onto the circuit not all of them some of them but I I, I don't think it's going to be that quick. I mean, there, there are very few drivers in this field who raced or even started racing in a period where gravel traps were the thing, where, where they were during it, where they were everywhere. Almost everybody in this field is now so relatively young, and we have had tarmac runoff areas everywhere, and, and here is, is no exception for so many years, as the uh, Iron Links, the white 51 Iron Links car, one of their three cars in the race. third place. Stop. And Dennis Olsen in from fourth. And just want to yeah. highlight, again, if you've been away for a while, if you looked at the, the top end of the grid, you know, just the top 60 of the, of the 66 runners, you wouldn't have noticed the number 47 entry, the KCMG Porsche. It started stone last, and it's just come in from fourth place. Nick Tandy gained 40-something positions in the opening stint of the race from 66th on the grid. And uh, with the retirement slow to come, we've only had five retirements thus far. I'll run you through those in a second it was chipping away chipping away chipping away in fact let's talk about those five retirements uh, the most recent was christopher harsa the number 12 at uh, one of the two um tracer by car collection audis this was actually the the works entry and uh, christopher harsa was the driver at the wheel after uh, it came to a halt that was out after a mere 92 laps after only 58 laps and 57 laps respectively alex malikin the number 91 Entry that the Porsche the Porsche was hit up the rear by the treble seven Mercedes. Unfortunately, the bonnet came up for Al Faisal Al Zubair. Couldn't see where he was going and clattered into the back of the of the 91 Porsche from Allied Racing. Another car that's out, the TM Nui. Uh, he was at the wheel at the time. The Aston Martin, one of the two from Beach Dean AMR, and the first car to go in the most spectacular fashion so far in this race was Cesar Gazzo. Got it wrong going out of Blanchemont. Yeah, that very, very fast left-hander in the Santa Lock Junior Team Audi. And uh, snap from right-hand side of circuit to left-hand side where the car went round and met with a concrete wall. Yeah, and unfortunately, though he limped back to the pits, the team said, are you kidding? Park it. Met, yeah, met with a near instant fate because uh, the, the team said actually he was coming back with a tyre problem and then just came back a fraction earlier. Well, now, as well as the Spa 24-hour race, there is a Spa sim race going on here. Fanatec 
uh, obviously the, the sponsor of the series, but also hugely involved in sim racing. And yesterday, there was a pro driver race. So there is a pro driver race and there is a pro sim racer race. And it's, you know, from the beginning of lockdown, suddenly everybody became aware of how much time racing drivers spend for work on sims and, and racing on, uh, uh, driving on sims, which then transferred into so many of them also joining the online racing fraternity. Now, there, there were the sort of Lando Norris's and, and uh, Max Verstappen's and so, far, so forth the world who had done a bit, and in Max's case, quite a lot beforehand, but that sudden, suddenly exploded. And now there's an awful lot of pro racing drivers who are still rubbish, but there are an awful lot of pro racing drivers who are really becoming very, very good indeed. Um, so. Right. M meanwhile, out at Speaker's Corner, does this hit? The oh, that's excruciating and very, that's very a fortunate. That's isn't it? But and you I'm know not what sure it's doing? Who, What's it doing there? Missing the barriers. What's it also doing? Bringing lots of gravel onto the circuit. Thank you, yeah. my dear friend there. Uh, but just to go back onto, the, onto the, the, the sim racing world, it wasn't only professional drivers going across to keep their hand in and then finding how competitive they needed to be and get that last bit. We've, of course, had sim racers coming across the other way to compete yes. as well, a lot of whom are even working for the Formula One teams on their sims. Yep. We've got James Baldwin competing here, who came out of the sim world and uh, you know has been phenomenally successful but it has been also engineers race engineers keeping their hand in and they suddenly realized they had a role to play in this and so it kept everyone really really sharp i mean of course we were delighted when we went back as quickly as we could to full metal racing however it is something that means a lot of people still won't get to talk to their families no exactly right <laughs> and, and and certain other people that will have to their girlfriends will have to join their twitch stream just to let them know they're stuck outside the flat um famously now, I d we're spending an awful lot of time, we will spend an awful, awful lot of time with our TV pictures showing you life at the track, on board the cars, in the middle of the battles, and particularly here in the evening when the, when the onboards are just so dramatic. But what has really struck me, being back here at the track for the first time in three years, because I think it's, it's no secret that, uh, well, although I, I wasn't available for last year, the previous two years we've done remotely through the night, being back at the track with the monstrous throng of humanity that there is here. I think David was talking about it just a little bit earlier. You know, everybody is just so excited. And, and John, you know, the grandstands are still half full. There are lots of people still here. But the sea of humanity that's been here, it, it, I, I don't know quite what the gate is going to turn out to be, but it is not going to be a disappointment in, in any way, shape or form, either for, for, for the Fanatec GT series or for spa Francorchamps itself. I mean, it's just, it's just been utterly mobbed. And it hasn't hurt that the weather's been lovely all week. And it hasn't hurt that last week, the beginning of Speed Week, you know, British GT Championship and everything just sort of got everybody there. But I think people had made their plans months and months and months ago to come here. I said to John Watson when we were walking down to have supper when you just came on for your first stint, Martin, I said, the teams, they're so focused on what they're doing in the pit lane, naturally they would be, but they have no idea what is happening. People milling around in the bottom paddock over at the fanfare. We'll have the concert later tonight. There'll be fireworks. It's just an absolute festival. And also another thing, through the course of the week, of course, the, have been the parades down into the middle of a... Of, of Spa and that adds the gate as well and the excitement it's just great to be back you know fully here with tens of thousands of people you're quite right about the weather and it's certainly helping the race we've all commentated on Spa 24 hours where it's a case of surviving through if you're lucky just the drizzle but actually sometimes yeah. the full biblical version as well we've had fog we have all probably had frogs and dogs and cats and dogs and absolutely things I mean, being thrown down there, However, there are races here where you just think okay Noah is you can he's got his carpentry set out and there uh, and there's and it's just it just then it becomes just vile I mean vile for everybody vile for the fans vile 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 for the teams and vile for the drivers so I mean it's this is a wonderful, wonderful roller coaster race circuit, and it's particularly wonderful when it's lovely. But look, look at the track. Don't look at the headlights. Look at what they're illuminating. And that's in the daylight, you get a bit of an idea as you pop up over a brow and there's a sea of gravel. In the darkness, the, the lights really aren't your friend. They're not picking things out far enough ahead for you to be able to really um, spot it. And, and down here, particularly, you know, corner nine, 
where we saw Karim OJ going off, we, we actually saw within five seconds what happens. The car in front of him ditch hooked through lots of gravel or dirt or whatever on the track. And then as Kareem came down, you could just see as he hit the brakes, there was just a sea of dust and dirt and he just sailed straight off. And with, with the following if, car also having a massive twitch yeah. for exactly the same and if reason. if that's the only one, I will be absolutely astonished. Yeah, well, uh, it's not just gravel at the edge of the circuit. Of course, six hours into the race, there's a lot of tyre debris out yep. there as well, the old marbles, but they are completely invisible in the night. But uh, the cameras are picking it out way, way better than the headlights would. But it's a matter of feel. And, and some drivers were saying, actually, you know what? These are big, heavy cars. They, they don't actually get deflected by one piece of gravel. But when uh, it's the point at which you're braking very hard, you've actually hit a bank of gravel effectively, then, of course, things are difficult. Right, lead of the race, 21 seconds the good. Nikki Katzberg, Rover Racing, BMW. They've got a great record here, BMW and Rover Racing, separately and together. But uh, Katzberg, that is a very tidy advantage. But again, we have a screen on the left-hand side of our commentary booth, and it's almost like a wall <laughs> of yellow. It's the screen of punishment. And the most recent one, oh, car numbers 90 and 163, under investigation, but now cleared of contact. But most of the ones on that timing screen are time penalties to be added to the next pit stop. And we're getting refueling uh, infringements. We're getting speeding yeah. in the pit lane. And of course, what else? Track limits. Absolutely. D despite the fact that, that the answer to track limit penalties that everybody has been praying for is gravel traps, it, it isn't the answer to track limit penalties. It's drivers staying within the white lines. But uh, unfortunately, that doesn't give you as good a lap time as, as taking a bit of a chance on the curbs. Um, and so we, we do have track limit penalties. We still have track limits being uh, infringed. And we do have gravel traps to catch the unwary. And, and so far, um, that's exactly what they've done. They have. It, it, it's, it's going to require really a number of years for people to get their heads around these things again, not to, not to have late lunges, not to have really, you know, quarter of a chance dives because there will be no runoff area in which to survive, either you or the person you've dived. And particularly in a race like this, we're, we're a quarter distance now, you know, 18 hours to go, 17 and a half hours to go. If you make a mistake and put it in the gravel, that's your race gone. That's it. There's no coming back from it. Or there's almost no coming back from it. Very unlikely to, to drive yourself out of the gravel. And so it will require years and years and years of younger drivers learning in junior single seaters or in junior, you know, genetic juniors or whatever junior categories to live with gravel traps before top pros have done that all their lives. And, and uh, if, if we are going to go back to lots of circuits having gravel traps, and that seems to be potentially the way that that motor racing is heading. Yeah, Martin, it's education. It'll it's, take time, yeah. It's re-education. Now, talking of young drivers, one's just caught my eye. At this point in the race, everything's settled down a little bit, and there's, you know, finding their night sights. But way down in the, in outside the top 40, 42nd position is a young driver 17, get that. <laughs> Loris Cabaru, he's driving uh, the AGS events Lamborghini in the gold class, and he's just put in that car's fastest lap of the race. So he's settling in very nicely, but it's still, you know, 17 years old. How much yeah. race experience can he have on board? Well, he did French Formula 4 in 2020. Stepped up to GT4 European, that was last year. This year, GT3, racing here in the night. That is big leaps and bounds. And I, I love these little jewels within the overall pattern of the race. So, you know, look out for Loris. You know, very impressive so far. That's all the team can ask of him. And uh, don't put in the gravel. And how impressive is that? Well, he is currently in uh, whatever position he is in. What position is he in? 42nd? 42nd position, yeah. And four cars behind him in 46th position is one Earl Bamber. What's he ever done? Yeah. Oh, that'll be Le Mans, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. But no, entirely so. And you've got... You've got Another drive you need to watch out because his car, he's been the last one into his car, Jim Pla. Of yeah. course, when you put him in a Mercedes, it'll go right towards the potential of that car. He, he is the sort of star in that car, but that is the point. It's in a particular class. And of course, we ought to reiterate, we've got the overall class, we've got the Silver Cup class, we have the Prime class, yeah. we have the Gold class, where you have a mixture of all three driver uh, uh, 
rankings, gold, silver, and bronze. And so, you know, you get many of a story where the, the, the less experienced drivers, the slower drivers, and sometimes do the daylight hours, and you put the star in the car as it gets dark. And that's why you have the likes of Earl Bamber in there, Jim Plow yeah. now burning up the track. And, and there are a couple of spots. And in fact, uh, Kuguru is two spots behind uh, Jimmy Baldwin and, and a further spot behind Mirko Bortolotti. Well, now, we're looking at some of our class leaders. Pro-Am, first and second. Uh, well, I'm now going to have to readjust my eyesight. Well, it's the, uh, Enrique Chavez leading yeah. that class. In fact, he's just um, tumbling down the order, just had a, a, a pit visit. Yes, there's, there's a couple of pit visitors. Mario Engel is in, Christopher Mies is in as well, Mercedes and Audi respectively, out of the top five. So is this the start of the next pit stop sequence, or are they slightly out of sync? Now, they're going to eight and seven stops, respectively. Eight for Engel's Merck, and the seventh for Chris Mies's Audi. So that suggests that Engel's Merck has done one more than probably it ought to, because almost everybody else is on six. Yeah, in fact, Enrique Chavez in the 188 uh, Garage 59 McLaren is no longer leading the class because he's just emerged from his pit stop, whereas Nikki Leutvila is now taking the lead of the class in the the number 24 Herbert Motorsport Porsche. They, they are a crew who know how to yeah, run 24-hour races, but it's just a different point on the cycle. Chavez's car will come back up, but of course, when you've just had a, t a time in the pits and everyone else is still at full racing speed, you can tumble down Leader the order in. pretty quickly. So yeah. this is the beginning of our next. In fact, top two are in as well. Top three are in. Kevin Esch in second in 2-2-1. And Maxi Book in the 55 car in third place. He is in. And there you can just see at the top of the timing pile, Ralph Bone in 9-1-1 leading that gold class. Uh, that car is, I think, the first car that is... N oh, no, he is now back on the lead lap again because of the way that the pit stops sort of cycle in and out. Uh, we did have, at the, at the top of this hour, 27 cars on the lead lap, but that's just the vagary of the pit stops. There goes the leader. Right, just point Katzberg. out that before the pit stops, not, not long before, Nicky Katzberg was leading by 22 seconds, and uh, Kevin Estra chasing him down, got it down to 18 and a half seconds. So, you know, two or three seconds here or there, it could still have a factor to bear in this race. 46 Audi is in, Nico Muller in that car. There's the 52 Ferrari as well. And that is uh, Andrea Bertolini, driver change. So we will wait for that to update itself. Uh, 16 as well. That's the old EBM Giga racing, the old Bamba car. That, yeah. uh, he's not driving, that's one of the cars from his crew. Uh, that's Stephen Grove, the uh, father and son combination, uh, combination Stephen and uh, Brendan Grove. Um, it's, a, it's an all Antipodian crew, two Aussies, two Kiwis in that one. And the uh, 52 Chetelar. Uh, Ferrari heading out, Andrea Bertolini. We saw there was a driver change. Wait for that to upgrade itself. Uh, Sandy Mitchell also uh, has just stopped in the Lamborghini, car number 77. I'll, I'll just reapportion a nationality to Adrian Henry, Henry de Silva, though. He's Malaysian, not uh, Kiwi. As, oh, the, as okay. the fourth member of that crew and longtime supporter of Earl Bamber. And the, in fact, they did the opening round of. Uh, the GT World Challenge Asia at Sepang and have, took have my winning eyes misled me or is he down on my entry list as, as a Kiwi but he's actually it'll be your eyes Malay. fortunately yeah. okay, there, we there go. you go so this is the, the first car to have a puncture in the race Sandy what Mitchell, an accolade yeah. it was yeah. Andy Mitchell in the opening stint but we couldn't yeah. believe we got that far in and he had you know one of those dreadful spa laps where you've got three quarters of the lap to go with uh, only effectively yeah. three tires that are doing their job but well the good news is it didn't seem to damage the car and that's always the worry isn't it I mean the time loss is is a damage anyway but um, a flailing tire can just rip a car apart quicker than a team of piranhas would so they they were lucky to avoid that drama. Sandy Mitchell did well to bring the car back in. And that is now out and heading down the pit lane. Meanwhile, we ride on board with car 28. There you go. I'm looking for an identifier. The teams are usually very good at putting the car number or the driver names or something on the dashboard. OK, Martin, uh, car 28 is there. We have Nick Whitmer, the Canadian racer in Samantha Tan Racing's BMW M4. And again, fantastic seeing that, that uh, rear view camera that yeah. is, is so strong. It really, really helps. And, you, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they just weren't up to the job. But now they're 
crystal clear, which is a massive help. Yeah. And it means that it's, it's right in the driver's eye line as well. I mean, his eyes are not as high as the camera even, probably. They're slightly lower than, than our camera view. Um, but it does keep it right in. And, a, and an awful lot of these also have a sort of proximity indicator. So it warns it. There you go. You can just see it above the lights mm. behind. And it goes sort of amber and then gets either green or red, depending on, on, on the system. And it will show you if there are a series of lights behind you, and that the partic particularly usefully, it will show you which one is closer. So if there's like a, a, a sea of lights, it'll show you that the nearest one is coming on your right or on your left or down the center. So um, yeah, in a way that a conventional rear view mirror doesn't quite give you all that information, especially not at night and especially not through, you know, potentially a, a fairly filthy rear window. Right, Nicky Katzberg got out of the 98 Rover Racing BMW and Augusto Farfus, we had an interview with him a short while ago, looking incredibly sort of a bane and comfortable in, a, in a, a deck chair in the garage, watching the form, and he was being typical of a driver with that much experience, going, OK, we've nearly got through six hours, we will keep working forward. But, you know, you know for well their key is do not make any mistakes, but they're sitting on a lead, well, over at the moment, we'll wait to the end of this lap to see what it is over Davide Regan, in fact, they may eventually just yeah and, and both, saying half a second last time around both of those two 24 hour winners for bmw in entirely different generations absolutely so you know nicky with the z4 augusto with andy preo and all the t touring car guys you know, 20 years ago winning the n24 in uh i can't remember what it was then but it was a uh, it was uh, a, a three series derivative davide regon up to second raffaele marcello up to third kevin estra dropping down to fourth place in that round of pit stops. And why was that, Prey? It's he... simply because of the different point in the cycle, because Davide Regon's yeah. 34 minutes into his stint, whereas uh, Regon, and, sorry, Estra and Farfus, well, they've just gone out on the just, track there, yes, three minutes into on, their stint. Yeah, so, and Marcello is somewhere in between. He's 20-something minutes into his stint. Yeah. Who's lapping fastest to that group? Well, last time around of that group, it actually was Davide Regon in that 71 Iron Lynx Ferrari. That's the yellow one. Well, I'll second you, on the track. Tilly, who is going very quickly at the moment, we saw him in the pits a little earlier, is Nico Muller in the 46 Audi, the Sketches car, car number 10, uh, te place number 10, rather, car number 46, and he but, is currently on his fastest lap of the race so far. But I can that trump car. that because Christopher Meese, who we know is Christopher, father of Paul Meese, after this morning's arrival, first child, is, has just set his car's fastest lap yep. of the entire race. That's down in 13th place. He's well, he's got to find half a minute to catch up with Ollie Wilkinson, who is finally in the uh, Team Jota McLaren. And lest my eyes deceive me, that's the first time he's been in the car uh, this up to this point in the race. First time I've heard his name mentioned, that's for sure, yeah. Well, super busy out on the track, but I think we're about to head down to a man who has won an awful lot of things in Mercedes. His name is Mauro Engel. After his double set, Mauro Ingo is out of the 55 Mercedes AMG. And Mauro, when you reflect, reflect back on the time that you had in the car, what comes to mind? Um, yeah, lots of lots of action out there. Uh, as always, it's it's a lot of fun, but a lot of fighting going on. Initially, uh, everything was good. We were clear up out front, and then uh, obviously we came in under full course yellow, thinking that it was an opportunity to pit, and it went green, so we we dropped back. So that was a shame. But um, car's working well. So um, yeah, long way to go. A double stint from daylight to dark. Just how different is the track under that transition? It is nice. At night, it's pretty cool around this place. Um, you have to adapt, but going from daylight into night is the easiest way to adapt. I think I'm sure it's a bit tougher for Maxi, who now jumped in uh, straight into the dark. But um, yeah, no, it's good. It's good fun and um, always special. And it's off to sleep for you. Yeah, off to sleep now and uh, get some rest. See you soon. I wonder if he gets an office floor to sleep on. <coughs> <laughs> well, you gave it a go, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I managed a full hour. Um, Maxi Book is at the wheel of the 55 Mercedes now, as uh, you just heard, and, and going straight out into darkness. And, um, yeah, he'll, he'll probably do a double as well. Now, now the st stints lengthen, so the drivers get a little bit of time off. And you think, all right, well, you know, the maximum drive time is 65 minutes, and you can do a double because you come in and do a pit stop and go back out again, so that's two hours. And then the next driver does two hours, so the driver gets four hours sleep. Well, he doesn't get four hours sleep because he's been out of the car for eight minutes already, and he's still in the garage. Then you've got to somehow let the adrenaline subside, go out, you know, get out of your stinky, sweaty overalls, try and calm down a bit, try and find somewhere. This is all in the four-hour gap. 
and then you'll need to be back in the garage primed and ready to go at least half an hour before you're due to be so actually you go from four hours to a maximum of three hours and then you've got to try and sleep in there so the adrenaline doesn't help so you probably get a couple of hours of a cat nap and and that's about as much as as you get and and that's it does make it very tough you know all this ost ostensible time off is not time off sleeping but giving your brain a chance to, to rest from the fatigue of driving the cars, particularly in the dark, where it's much more mental um, because you, because your eyes are, are sort of being overruled by the darkness, then that, that's just absolutely survival. Yeah, it is. And also, if you're into the, the sort of final stint before yours, you sort of need to be on standby in case there's a sudden scramble, there's a safety Ooh. car, and it's decided to bring Hello. you in. And uh, again, just becoming accustomed to the points at the bus stop. Yes. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a pillar with a great big light. There's a light gantry. Yeah. But at the top of that, it looked like a pair of headlights uh, as though they'd gone the a little too way. deep into the <laughs> yeah, corner. It really and did. If, if you haven't been at Spa Francorchamps for years, the, the, the only sharp part of the bus stop now is the final part. It used to be sharp right, le sorry, left, right on the way in and another on the way out. But now it's a, go across at an angle, but straight ahead of you when you get to the first tight part, the right-hander, there is a huge area of runoff. But then again, over the years here, I've seen how it's uh, used and needed. Right, let's take a look at the points in the Pro-Am drivers, and it's Dominic Bauman and uh, Valentin Pierberg first and second, but uh, Dominic, uh, again, is he on track at the moment? No, I don't believe he is, but, you know, he's leading by five points. We gathered them through the course of the year, of course, uh, for the Fanatec GT World Challenge, the European Series, you've got the sprint rounds, and this very much one of the five endurance rounds. No, it is the biggest of the lot. It's yeah. the Spa 24 hours, but uh, these the points that can be gained here, there's an allocation after six hours, we've had that, in all of the classes, again, after 12. But of course, the big ones are the, the full points you get at the end of 24 hours. It could have a huge skew on the championship. And you can see that it's full driver team lineups there in third and fourth, but individual drivers first and second. Well, how does that work? Well, that works because not all the same drivers have been in the car when it has scored those points. So the various different teammates over the preceding races will be further down the order and will never be champion even if their teammate does. So it's a, it's a strange dynamic. It, you know, it, it's all about a team race and, and everything, but if for reasons of availability or, or, or what have you, not all of your teammates can do every race, you tend to end up with some of the drivers in the point scoring, and as you saw there, the top two in that class are on their own and then will rely on drivers who aren't going to be a champion to help them become champion. And, and why does why does that happen? Why do drivers suddenly not become available? That's because GT3 racing around the world is now so large, there's so many championships in which you can race a GT car that some yeah. drivers have to do many. Let's take a look at the silver championship and it's uh, the young crew, ben, Benji Goethe, Thomas Neubauer and uh, Jean-Baptiste Simonauer, French racer, yeah. leading the way, but only by 10 points. Axel Jeffries will not be scoring points in this race because, alas for him, his car was one of the ones out early on. That was the treble seven uh, Mercedes that had the bonnet come up on uh, Al Faisal Al Zubair. So the Zimbabwean yeah. will not be scoring points. Oh well, his two teammates, Fabian Schiller and Al Zubair. So that's actually advantage very much for the team WRT Audi crews. And in fact, I must say, in the first stage of the race, Benji Goethe was driving beautifully. Where is he yeah, now? Yeah, he was 14th really, overall. Really on top of it. Also, in fact, we, we talked to Stewie Hall at lunchtime, who sort of uh, obviously uh, won a championship, a world championship, with Raul Goethe, Benji's dad. Uh, and, and Stewie has left. He's gone to the Hungara ring, uh, where the younger of uh, Raul's sons is racing. Um, so he said, I can't do anything for Benji now, except for maybe hold a water bottle or, or what have you. So, you know, he's... He's where he needs to be. The race is going to happen, and he, you know, there's nothing really a driver advisor can do. So, Stewie's off to help his younger brother, um, and uh, yeah, he, he had he had a very good start to the race, Benji, and and that again very encouraging. You know, his dad is such a a massive, massive racing enthusiast, obviously with the Rothko car collection of golf cars and, and so on and so forth. But you know, he's he's probably the antithesis of motor racing dad in that he's actually a racing driver himself and just allows the boys to get on with it. Now, in the Endurance Cup for bronze drivers, look at this, a four-way tie at the top and a four-way tie for second place. So, again, you're looking at 
not two sets of teams with the same points tally, but driver four driver lineups. And in fact, there are a number of four driver lineups in this field, among whom will be those teams. Yeah, it's also worth pointing out those points were all scored at the six hour point in this race because yeah. there haven't been any bronze scorers thus far in the endurance championship. Right, Udasis Depu, one of the very promising young drivers, won the opening race of the opening round of the the Fantasec GT Sprint Series at Brands Hatch, young Belgian racer, and uh, again, Martin, you and I would like a driver like, like him because he's a tall fella. Sensible height, you mean? Yeah, exactly. A, a normal height. 266, 268, 269, 270 kilometres an hour before they hit the brakes. That's 165 miles an hour and change in the darkness. And it will decelerate at a far greater rate than it accelerates there as well. Uh, Ralph? Oh, Maxime Robin just came into the pit lane. He's yeah, because he's going to hand over to Ulysses to power. I was yeah. just about to say I hadn't explained which car. It's the number 33 Audi, and it's it's not where they want it to be. It's had its problems. It's uh, down in 47th position overall. That was the car that actually was running in front of the front runners after a, after a safety car period and was actually lapping at the same pace, which was really yeah. annoying because uh, it was getting in the way. Uh, and it was in front for quite a lot of laps. I understand it's difficult when you're four laps down, you want to not lose any more time. However, it wasn't helpful. And there you can see it, 47th place, highlighted in red. That means it is currently in the pits. And below 60th, we now have 60 running cars. Charlie Eastwood is the Lanterne Rouge at the moment. Below 60th place, those ones that are sort of slightly greyed out, a slightly different red, those are the cars that have retired. So Charlie Eastwood in... Uh, one of just three Aston Martins remaining in the race, two yeah, well, of which they, are, the, uh, are in the last three cars. Yeah, but they had such an unfortunate time in, in that uh, they're 32 laps down, an enormous amount of time in the yeah. pits. Yeah. And that's the heart of racing team. Great to have them over here racing in Europe. You have a problem early on, what are your choices? Well, you don't park it. And, you and fix it and go back out. Yeah. They'll still have, it meant they'll have had effectively 20 hours of clear running. It was just the first four hours in which they had the problems. But uh, good two, that Charlie's there. Yeah, two cars ahead of them. Maxim Soule in, in Bentley. Uh, in, in, oh, sorry, uh, beg your pardon, yes. That uh, was no. the first car oh, to yes, be put that off. That Bentley, was the first yes. car. Yeah, Remember, yeah, yeah. Nigel Bailly was given a thump yeah. up the back uh, down That's at right. Campus in the opening hour. Got out of the gravel. That's in right. fact, since then, that, that, that Bentley has had all sorts of uh, problems. But it's still going. That is the important thing. Now... First to second, it's down to one and a half seconds. Augusto Farfus in that BMW uh, being caught by more than half a second on the last lap by the 71, the bright yellow Ferrari from Iron Links. And who's catching both of them? Why, that'll be young Marcello in third place overall. The number 88, a CODIS ASP Mercedes. So again, look at the makes, manufacturers, BMW from Ferrari, from Mercedes, from Porsche. It's a good combination. Best yeah. the Audis, normally at the front end, but they've had their problems with punctures in eighth position overall. Nico Molo in the car he shares with Valle, the doctor, Valentino Rossi. Uh, Luki Stoltz just making up a position up into 11th place ahead of uh, Ollie Wilkinson and Chris Mees and Benji Goethe. And in 15th place, Nicky Team in the sole remaining healthy Aston Martin. I was talking to his teammate David Pittard, one of the, the uh, two Beach Dean Aston Martins. They were out um, before the end of the second hour. So he's so jolly no mates. He might actually pop up and have a chat with us. Uh, or go to sleep. I'm not, I think it might be uh, beer and frites and mayonnaise and uh, a bit of a gig and then heading off home. Davide Regon in second place overall in that bright yellow Ferrari. The uh, Iron Lynx cars. Iron Lynx with three cars here. A bright yellow one, a bright white one and a bright pink one. Uh, and the Iron Dames car is currently... Rahel Frey in 27th Frey position, 27th. just, yeah. uh, just um, rising up the order a little bit. Just notice, the car in fourth place, Kevin Estra, the 221 yep. Porsche from... Uh, GPX Racing is catching the car in third place, which is Raffaele Marcello, who's catching the car in second place, which is Davide Rigon, who's catching the car in the lead, Agusti Farfus. I like it like that. 13 the, seconds cover the top four. The pace is actually, yeah, just, it's dropped off about two seconds a lap from their very best in daylight. And I think that's probably a pretty uh, reasonable reflection of where they are. What's the countdown time or count up time of there? 48.3, that's 48.37. That's minutes in the car, isn't it? Yeah, just, just, uh, yeah, that that, has that been minutes Samantha in the Tan car. racing BMW again. It could be as if it's car 20. I think that's the one we've been riding on board with before. Nick Whitmer, let's see what he's got uh, to do in. It does have a, a BMW sound, doesn't it? 
Uh, it's interesting to see what's uh, it's, uh, 71 that is. Uh, so that, in fact, that's David Regon. Oh, David Regon, okay, yeah. right. So 48. His stint length at the moment is 47 minutes. So oh, there we are. It's exactly what it's doing. Yeah. So, so it's a rising. Now, when it gets to the an left hour, of the mirror, through. there's a little illuminated signal that says ready. Now, I wonder what that means. Well, David Regon riding on board. He is Point sharing the championship lead, mm. the overall championship with Daniel Serra from Brazil and Antonio Fuoco, young Italian. But it's only by four points from Danny Yucadella, Jules Gugnon, and Raffaele Marcello, who are in third position in this race. So, second and third yeah, one in the race, a first and second in the championship. And then uh, James Colano, Miguel Molina, uh, and who shares that car with them? Because obviously, because we've got an even number of lines on the graphic, but three driver lineups. Well, we're not <laughs> yeah, but it's Molina, Colado, and Nicholas Nielsen. So Nick Nielsen will have done all the races, so it will be those three that yeah. are in that, in, in that uh, tied third position. And because it's a team, it's not first and then fourth and then and then seventh. It, they are all first. They are all third, second, or are all third. So, and so, yeah, top two in the champion, uh, top, yeah, second and third in the championship. First and second in the championship are currently second and third in the race. And where is third in the championship? A fifth in the race. That's Miguel yes, Molina. Yeah, so Miguel is fifth, isn't he? Ferrari, you know, at the start of this race, they weren't really in it, and they started working their way into the top six. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, <laughs> every time you looked, one of the dynamic uh, Porsches was right in front of yeah. uh, that yellow Ferrari for such a long time. But Perseverance has got well, the yellow one up into second place. Talking of dynamic and Porsches and not really in it at the start of the race, in sixth place is Bedfordshire's finest ex mini stocks racer nick tandy that car was the last car that rolled off the grid six and nearly seven hours ago very nearly seven hours ago now and it is now in sixth place it is 49 seconds off the lead and about two seconds off fifth position showing no signs whatsoever of ever having started anywhere other than in the top half dozen i mean it's doing we, we were talking a little bit about, or there, there was talk a little bit about, the fact that because there are likely to be so many safety cars, doing a back to front, coming from a, such a massive, if you like, disadvantage on the grid, was going to be near impossible. Uh, apparently, Nick Tandy didn't read that particular feature because it, it hasn't seemed to have been that case at all. There's the race leader, Augusto Farfus, with the... Um, purple strip yeah, across the top love, of the screen. Lovely One thing I'd lighting. like to see, when we see that KCMG Porsche, when Nick Tandy brings it in, what is the state of the car? In his first stint, he only took about, four, I think it was 41 other cars to come up the order. You'd expect a little bit of a nip and a tuck, a little bit of damage here and there from those, those tight moments where some of the less experienced drivers have sort of moved across his bows. However, last time I looked at it, it all looked pretty mighty. Okay, right. it's harder to tell in the dark. After, but also they, another after thing, they had that problem in qualifying four, Instead of going out in Super Bowl, they were probably just spraying it with Teflon, the way you do. When yeah. You know, when, or, or coating it in lard or something, the way you do when you know you've got to cleave through the field. Yeah, but it's, it's just worth pointing out that driver lineup: Nick Tandy, Lawrence Fantor, they know what it takes to win here. Yep. And Dennis Olsen, who's won some big races. He won the Carl Army nine hours a couple of years ago. And the only one who's uh, missing from when uh, they, they won... Uh, Tandy Advantor won here two years ago is Earl Bamber, who's obviously in another car in yep. the race. But, yep. uh, you know, success can breed success. It's often the small margins you can gain. But talking of small margins, there's only 1.1 seconds wow, margin man. that Farfus has over to Davide Regon, and they're both being caught hand over fist by Raffaele Marcello. So we're with Davide Regon, and right in front, the yellow tail end of the race leader. Exactly so, but within 10 minutes, Davide is going to have to come in and make a pit stop, whereas Augusto Farfus leading the race can go on for another half hour. So they're, very, they're yeah. almost completely half a stint apart from each other. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. But yeah. uh, looking at terms of their lap pace, they're fairly similar, but each lap a little more is gained by the Ferrari driver. Well, well, traffic in his way, though, yeah. that didn't help at all. That's up at uh, Le Combe at the top of the... Sorry, I beg your pardon, it's out of the bus stop. Davide Regon, as you saw in his timer, 51 minutes. There, look, he's flashing the, the Porsche to get out of the way. I mean, some of these light arrays look like they're out of the, the movie Tron, don't they? With, with Particularly that Porsche with the sort of on fire roof bars all the way yeah. around the roof line. It's, a, it's a, a fabulous bit of lighting design. And actually, hello, road car manufacturers. I know, I'm sure there's an awful lot of fast and furious fans that would love road car at light arrays like that. I'm not sure the police would be quite so keen, but you know. 
It's got to be worth a try. Yeah, that Get was some LED strips instead of having them on your bed bedroom ceiling. There's the race leader. And their two cars back is the second place Ferrari. So the gap has opened up a little bit. And, and that's the frustration of, of racing such equal machinery. You know, if you think about Le Mans 24 hours, it's equally frustrating when you're racing in one of four different paced classes. But here, everybody has access to the same machinery. And it's just what the team and driver does with it and what fate does to you that makes the difference where you finish. Because in theory, every single car on the 65 car grid has the pace to win the race. Yeah, but I think that also throws into stark contrast and, and just what a job that Nick Tandy did to, to pick his way past uh, yeah. potentially 40 cars that yeah. could have matched his lap time. And we're not spaced out. No. We're all wedged together. I mean, it, actually, for the first two hours, the field did spread out more than it has at any... Well, when was the last safety car, by the way? So, not that... Not that dear, that didn't, that didn't come out very well at all. That was really tempting fate. Uh, but, no, I, it's, it's just a... You know, when, when drivers can do that, it, it is remarkable. And, and it's... It's a, a measure of the experience that some of these drivers bring to bear because you either have that instinct for where the gap's going to be and what the, what the gap is and how big it is, and, or you don't. And, and the, the more of it you have, the more you can do things like that. And that can only come... Where it's a combination of how your brain works, but, but also with a huge amount of experience. No, entirely, I was going to say, it's, it's down to reading the situation, but experience is what they're banking on. And you think how many thousands of laps these drivers have done. But it's also experience to do it in the dark. A lot of these drivers are relatively new to endurance racing. They've done the sprint races to start. They might have done some of the enduro rounds. But until you've done a 24-hour race through the dark on a proper, proper circuit like this, and we've got yellow flags. Uh, turn 11. The, OK, turn 11. And so that, you know, is uh, Pouin. It's the exit of Pouin, <laughs> where, you know, you start and you think, I've got this corner. Um, I'm running a little wide here. No, I haven't got this corner. There is a fair bit of runoff there. But, There's uh, about a four cross yellow, 20 seconds. It's, a, it's about a metre and a half. And then, I mean, it used to be full cross yellow, 10 acres. seconds. Now Bravo there is a fast gravel trap Bravo. there as well. Bravo. So, Bravo. as you hear, Five, Alain Madin, four, our race three, director, three, we are going two, full course one, yellow. One, full course yellow now. Just trying to pick out who it might have been who's taken a tumble. The car on the screen at the moment with those lurid bars. That's Gabriel yeah. Piana. That was the car that was just being lapped a short while ago. Um, but he's yeah. he's had, he's been the last driver into that car. That's uh, the, one of the Hout Racing Team cars, the brilliant blue and yellow race livery. Right, now then, if you are, let's say, who's up 55 minutes uh, in 20th place in the 90 car, Oscar That's, Tuno. Yeah, this is if the time you to come are, in. Well, if you are, let's say, coming up from, from Stavolo uh, or Coeur Paul Frere, then now's the time to come in. If you're half a, if you're a, you know, a lap away, maybe not so okay, much. Okay, let's talk about someone nearer the front. 55 minutes on the clock. The car yeah, in second Davide place, Regon. Davide Regon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Has he got much to? It'll get up to an hour by the time he's done a lap behind. You know, full course yeah. yellow. It's all slow. Right, trying to pick out who has planted their car deep into the tire wall. It's an Audi. Now, which one's fallen? We had. Uh, Patrese, quite possibly. Yeah, he's tumbled down the orders to 11th place, uh, to 27th place, and he was out just around 20th. So 16-year-old, get that, 16-year-old Lorenzo Patrese. Youngest driver in the race? Youngest driver. Uh, the, yes, he is. The oldest driver in the race when he raced the Honda NSX in 2019... Was our Patrese. ...is here as well. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, it's interesting. The, the, the guys are saying that uh, Ricardo was is here in the garage and taking full interest in everything, as he did when he was racing the Honda. Um, but also, when his son was in, in the sim, was like noting what the others are doing. And when they had a little break, went over and had a conflap and gave him some tips and some pointers. You, you can take the racing driver out of Formula One, but you can't take the Formula One out of the racing driver. Okay, car I think we've got to really watch for is right in front of us is car number 50. It's the BMW Junior Team car. It's now in the top 10. They started down the order, but let's take a look how it was at the start of the race. You or me? OK, well, it, it was beautiful weather. I mean, a stunning week of weather here leading up to this crown jewel of GT3 racing, the, the uh, Spa 24 Hours. Total Energy 24 Hours of Spa got underway at 4.45 Saturday afternoon. Klaus Bachler taking the early lead. And right away, all the doom mongers, I'm holding my hand up here, 
were to be proved wrong because we figured it might be a couple of laps before all the energetic racing at the start brought out the first safety car of full course yellow. First full course yellow was just for a uh, puncture for one of the Bentleys that went off in the gravel, but there was lots and lots of action. Well, that was the Bentley so going around. That was Bentley. Nigel Bay and Kevin Kenny Harbaugh, the Australian racer who put it in there, got uh, the first of many penalties that were awarded to the drivers around the field. And but you can see the drivers making space on the circuit, and it seemed if you had a blue and white Mercedes, you were in trouble, <laughs> because first of all, the number four entry was given a bit of push and shove from the uh, Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes. And then you can see the first car limping in. That was, uh, that was Sandy Mitchell. Sandy Mitchell, and then Stephen Grove getting yeah. it wrong. Big heart in that moment because uh, Blanchimont is the slowest corner on the circuit. Lucas Stoltz in the pink out, uh, pink Mercedes, and Com Ledegar not giving up in his attempts to get by. He lost that place, and then Raffaele Marcello went past him as well. Com Ledegar dropping from first to fourth in that brief stint, and. The racing continued fast and furious. The Sky Attempto Mercedes picking its way up the order. Our first retirement, Cesar Gazur, bringing the car back with what the team believe was initially a tyre issue there on the exit of Blanchiment and walled itself. Uh, uh, accident, full stop, huge exclamation mark. Jens Liebhauser getting uh, edged off in the 57 Mercedes. And more contact, this time behind the safety car. Very clumsy indeed from the Sky Attempto driver. And that's Jens Liebhauser getting spun off at the top of the hill. He's at Tumla Lopez. And a couple of others coming into contact just at the end of a safety car period at the restart there at Piff Path. We had three safety cars in the first four hours, none in the first two, but then one triggered another, triggered another. And as ever, when you go green from a safety car, everybody is super close together. And that means the potential for more drama is always there. But having your bonnet come up across your windscreen isn't a helping hand, and Al Zubert really struggled, well, couldn't see, and whacked the back of Alex Malikin's Porsche. I, I, think, I, think, it, I think that was cause and effect. I think he whacked the back of the Porsche, and that's why the bonnet came up on the ass. And either way, both of them became re retirements. And the Sky Tempesto Mercedes driver just chasing the throttle a little hard. Very, very close racing as James Collado put the Iron Links Ferrari past the Porsche. And it's that man again. Jens Liebhauser's right hand door has been doing a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to protecting the car from drama. Karimoje with a high speed off after the car in front of him ditch hooked down at corner nine. That brought out full course yellow and the safety car. And the next major drama will the Allied Racing Porsche as we got back to green flag racing. I wonder a number of cars going off wide there. This guy, a Tempto machine again getting the highlights and diving down the inside, Antonio Fuoco once more in the 71 Ferrari, picking, picking up a spot with hugely dramatic moments. There is the Allied Racing Porsche again, a long way off and coming back from somewhere near Paris. And as the race progressed, the initial Mercedes versus Porsche battle also featured the Ferrari once more, battling in the lead half dozen as Porsche and BMW and Ferrari and Audi all started to battle with the Mercedes for the lead. So, well, this is a problem. This is Marco Mappelli had just yep. taken the lead of the race in the number six uh, K, K Pax racing uh, Lamborghini, and then a puncture that dropped him out of the lead and a huge loss. But the amazing night sky as the evening turned to the night, and then unfortunately, the number 10 uh, Audi had a second problem this time. At the wheel, it was Adam Itecki who came to a halt, and then a spin with the headlights off as you stalled as the cars went into Lake on Good avoidance, but then proper night time here, and the pit suddenly came alive. People parting up on the roof terrace there. What a vantage point! And for, for the Iron Links racing crew, good pit stops, their cars perpetually going towards the front end of the field, and uh, Davide Rigon was uh, right in the lead battle. But, 
uh, that's just served a pit stop, in fact. So Daniel Serra has now taken that over. And the biggest miss of the evening so far at Speaker's Corner, a driver running right the way through the gravel trap, somehow just missing the tyre wall, rejoining the circuit, bringing his own sack full of gravel to put on the track. Well, there you can see the stage in uh, full action down in the spectator area on the right-hand side of your screen. And we are under full course yellow. These are live pictures once more from Spa-Francorchamps. Uh, the time is now 23.51, so we're heading towards midnight here, uh, local time. And full course yellow, as you said. Driver change, as we sort of anticipated, really, for the 71 Ferrari. Daniel Seller, Serra taking over. Uh, has there been a pit stop as well? Yes, Augusto Farfas has stopped from the lead, retains the lead. Raffaele Marchiello has stopped as well from third place. Kevin Est has stopped as well from fourth. James Collado has just taken over the 51 Ferrari, and there is the reason for our full course yellow. We have not gone safety car yet. Uh, the race director issued a missive. Ah, is that back? No, it's being towed. Uh, issue, issued a missive before the race that no more than two laps of full course yellow during daylight hours before we went to safety car. I'm not quite sure how we measure that. Well, interesting. Looking in at the front of Ricardo, of, uh, of uh, Ricardo, I fell for that trap. Uh, Lorenzo. Uh, portrays these out. We can't see the far side that probably took the brunt of it, but it's not looking too bad. So no. clearly the, the tyre wall did what it needed to do in, in dissipating well, and, and the possibly, energy there. Possibly he'd had a slightly long trip across a gravel trap as well, so that, that may well have helped. Um, right, in terms of pit stops though, Martin, pretty much everybody has come in. I'm just watching the last few who didn't take mm. the opportunity in this full course. You know, a couple who are now in the pits, in fact. Uh, the, Nicky team in the Aston yep. Martin, best of the Aston Martins in 13th place, and Felipe Nazo. That we haven't seen too much of that number no. 74 Porsche. There was, another, there was another driver, Hubert Haupt, as well. He has uh, uh, stopped having done 46 minutes. Maximum is 65 that you can do in one go. Um, now, I'm not sure, and uh, do need clarification, but in previous years, you could come up to your 65 minute limit and then by driving through the pit lane, you could continue. If you had just fueled, say, and didn't need to stop again, stop again, you could continue. Um, I understand that that is no longer the case. You actually do have to stop in the pits and do something for it to reset the timer. Otherwise, you just run out of time. Now, is that a sweeper? It is. The sweeper's doing a little bit of uh, graveling and uh, entire debris sweeping at the exit of the final corner and down the pit straight. In fact, in about a minute, he should come past us. Is it bin day? <laughs> I left home without putting the bins out. I can't no. believe it. Right, everything is going to be is, uh, is sorting itself out now, because what it has done, Martin, it's helped us as commentators in, in the fact that everyone is going to be pretty much on the same pit sequence now it's sort of reappraised don't forget we were sort of like yeah. half a stint out because Augusto Farfas had a, an extra 30 minutes in which he could carry on racing while the 71 Ferrari came in and made its pit stop of course that's rejoined got, and uh, Davide Rigon has been replaced by uh, the Brazilian racer Daniel Serra he used to watch his father Chico race in Formula 3 back, back in the day in the, in the late 70s all Brazilian top two Two Brazilians, Swiss Raffaele Marcello lies in third place. You can see flags of nations down here. I mean, obviously, a lot of European nations involved, but Middle Eastern, Far Eastern, all sorts. And again, Alessio Rivera coming in in the Ferrari from 32nd. I mean, just about everybody. Is there anybody who, who's an outlier? Who has done more than five minutes in the car? Well, still, Nico Muller. He's halfway through a stint, 34 minutes in. It makes no sense for them now. Well, it depends how long we think the safety car is going to go. If they stop now, their outlap will be much quicker than everybody else's outlap. So actually, now we've gone to safety car, depending where they are, because they can now, their inlap will also be quicker because it's no longer at 80 kilometers an hour they now need to come in because his inlap will be quicker and then he'll be able to beetle out depending on where the safety car queue is and the team have to be very careful with that 
if the safety car has not come, let's say, up through Blanchimont when he's due to leave the pit lane, he can go hell for leather, and his in-lap and his out-lap will basically be almost full racing speed. Exactly, and who else has also considered that? A team that always seems to read the rules very well. Team WRT, number 32, Kelvin van der Linde, the sort of lead car for that team. It's down in 20th position, yeah. but they too have stayed out. Two cars further Nicky back. Nicky Lloydweiler. Nicky Lloydweiler. Yeah. Um, in the Herbeth Motorsport Porsche. Jordan Pepper, potentially, he's done 34 minutes, 41 minutes in, Marius Nacken, but he's just stopped, so they've reset, so they've done that. But, but waiting out the full course yellow, if you don't need to come in, and they didn't, 34, 40 minutes in, you don't need to come in, waiting that out and praying for the safety car, that can be a big advantage. That could gain you 20 places. It could, and for Jordan Pepper, the number six K-Pax racing Lamborghini, don't forget that uh, qualified on pole, the time was uh, disallowed and uh, for, for technical uh, reasons, dropped to 30th on the grid. It worked its way into the lead of the race, and how cool is that? You get to the front, you get a puncture. Marco yeah. Mapelli had to limp the whole way around. They need to roll the dice. That is why they're staying out there at the yeah. moment, and we'll have to keep a, an eagle eye to see if they dive into the pits when they get around. But at the, this point, it's uh, quite early. It's only halfway around the lap at the moment, but uh, they've got to have an idea of when the safety car period is going to end. Well, and, as well. and that's where all of the slide rule brains on, on the pit wall really come into play what the pit lane delta is, how long it's going to take when you've done a full stop, because all, all the stops have a minimum time. There's a short stop minimum, there's a full stop minimum. And so you've got to work out, you must ensure that you do not get held in the pit lane while the safety car queue goes through. Otherwise, actually, you'll be much better to stay out. So there is a lot of back timing and very quick calculation going on and as of now nobody is in but wait to see if they do dive in or whether they go with track position and, and it's it, it's that's the either or there's only there's only one cardinal rule here and that stay on the lead lap um, consideration number two when you're looking at the strategy see rule one stay on the lead lap. If it doesn't allow you to stay on the lead lap, don't do it, because you will never get that back. Nick Tandy would say, well, no, it is possible, but actually, you know, you can get back onto the lead lap, but then catching up a whole lap in 18 hours against this field is, is not going to be easy. Nobody else diving in. And so as the field comes across the line behind the safety car, bunched up and with slower cars in amongst them, Augusto Farfus is the race leader by nine tenths of a second from Daniel Serra in the 71 Ferrari. So it's still that Rover racing BMW versus Ferrari battle, but nine tenths of a second, there is room actually for another car to be between them. I'll have to have a look at the queue again to see whether there is 3.5 seconds back. Safety car in this lap, in this lap. Okay. Okay, now who should panic? Nico Muller did not come in from fifth Nick, place, despite Nick having did. a 38. Uh, yeah, Nicky Leutweiler is. Uh, Kelvin van der Linde did not. So no. expect number 32 car. Now they go, it's in this lap. I thought it had another lap. You know, so these yeah. are the moments. You, you're playing a lot of guesswork. Well, no, no, now, because you're coming in out of the safety car queue, you know you're not going to get stuck in the pit lane. Now, uh, 55, where has that... That was a car that was leading the race in the, in the no, hands. 55, that was... that's car number 10, so that's hey, uh, Benny Lesen. Uh, oh, and it's got going, Benjamin Lesen, so yeah. way down the order, that's... Uh... Is, he, is he at the source? He's, he's the wrong side of the tyre wall there, isn't he? Is he, is he driven out there? Okay, well, well, there's a view of our source. Are those? No, that's somebody walking along in a red jacket. That's not his red lights. Well, that means, hold on, that we still need Antoine Leclerc to have a problem in that car because Adam Itecki <laughs> had the problem. We had uh, Karim Oje and now Benjamin Lesen. Oh, three that, out of four ain't bad. That is the sword of Damocles. It is, isn't it? That really is. All three of your teammates have had a problem and, you're, and, and you've still got 17 hours to go, 16 hours, 45 to go. All oh, right, thank you very much, Bruce Jones, for just dropping me in it. So Nicky Leutweiler came, Jim Pla came in as well, actually, as the safety car queue. So the deal there is that your outlap will be much quicker than anybody else around you who stopped two laps ago. And so you should gain ground. But of course, all you're going to do is catch Actually, you'll, you'll probably come out, you'll be in clear air. Yeah. And, and you will have 
If you're half Quote, a lap down, you're off the back of the train and you're, yes. you're, you're coming yeah. up yeah. and uh, you can run your line. And if you're a driver of the calibre of someone like Jim Plyer, who, who's you know got so much experience, safety car, safety car coming in at the end of this lap, yeah. this could be his chance to, to gain four or five positions. And since he's down in 49th position, uh, that is exactly what he's in the car to do. He's in the get, one of the Get Speed performance Mercedes AMG, sharing with Michael Blanchemin, Patrick Asenheim, who did a very long opening stint and Axel Blom, but Jim the, was the uh, last one into the car. The Garage 59 McLaren, uh, car number 188, you know that it's had uh, a problematic race so far. Uh, their problematics haven't stopped. They've just been pinged for speeding in the penalty uh, in the pit lane. So that's five the royal, second that's the royal flash achieved now. So. Uh, yeah, that, that, uh, they are almost going for the full set, aren't they? Green flag, green flag. Now, watch what happens to the driver information light. There you go. As soon as the lights go green, the flag signals change. On board the second place car, green, 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 here we go. No passing before the start finish line, don't forget, after safety car. When you go green from full course yellow, if we go green from full course yellow, the moment it goes green, boom, everybody can attack because everybody comes off the speed limiter theoretically but, at the same time. But importantly for Daniel Serra in second place, there was no traffic, no other car between yeah. him and Augusto Farfa. So Raffaele yeah. Marcello, who's about one and a half seconds further back, there is another car or two to get past. And I'm sure Raffaele will dispatch them pretty quickly, but he could do with them out of being in his way. But we've got BMW from Ferrari, from Mercedes and Porsche and Audi. Five mates in the top five positions. That is why balanced performance works so well. That is why GT3 racing has been such a hit. Well, if you, everybody has a, a bad word to say about, about balance of performance, but I, I can remember coming here and... The fans do. ...after qualifying, having 26 cars covered, covered by, by a second. Yeah. You think, OK, so, again, argue to me that this is a bad thing. And, and it wasn't all 26 of one car and nobody else in it. It was, yeah, everybody was involved. And, and when it's that tight, then I'm afraid you can take your BOP winches and sit down again and shut up because it's it's not a thing, it's not a factor. Now, the blue and yellow Porsche with the uh, lovely groovy roof lights is the one that is splitting the field at the moment. There's the gap. It's a Mercedes. It's, oh, it's, it's a Mercedes. Yeah, it's the number five Hout Racing Team car. Ah, right, okie dokie. In right, which what case, I, what that's I just the one splitting the field a little. Martin, it's again learning which headlights are which. We know Augusto Farfus has the first set of headlights, he's using the race, we know Sarah's in second, <laughs> but I sensed the car that was coming down the hill through speakers in third was gaining on the pair of them. If that's Raffaele Marcello, then our top three are going to be covered by about a second and a half when they get round to the start-finish line. So, BMW leading the way, Augusto Farfus, second place, the yellow Ferrari, yep, their line astern with about a second between them. At the third car, no, it's a Lamborghini. I was going to say, it does look like a Mercedes Lamborghini. Yeah, there's a Mercedes. So, Marcello. so there is a Lamborghini in there. And, and it's Giacomo Alto. So he's a talented driver. Yeah. He's in 19th place overall. He's a lap down. But it'd be quite good if he could be given some flags to get him out of the well, way so we can get Rafael Marcello. That's interesting. Catching. Even after safety car, we've only got 19 cars on the lead lap. We did have 27 half an hour ago or an hour ago. So maybe the safety car has just sort of jumbled that up a little bit. But there are the leads too. Raffaele Marcello still third, Kevin Estian fourth, ahead of Nico Mullage. I'm listening to the talent here. Augusto Farfus, Daniel Serra, Raffaele Marcello, Kevin Est, Nico Muller, James Collado, Nick Tandy, Maxi Book. I mean, it, that's just ridiculous, it the is level of talent in this field. And some of the people have decided they're not watching for a bit because they're at the concert, there'll be fireworks, it's yeah. an amazing area. And that's down in the, in, but the people in the brand new grandstand, they're not leaving, it's the well, best can, seat in the house. You can see it all, you get the fireworks and the racing cars, and from there you can also see them coming up through Blanchiment and along through the back of the pits up to La Source, watch them all the way down the hill, past you as they come through Radion over the rise and they'll be watching all of this action. And there, actually, it's moderately well lit as well, so they'll be able to identify um, with the naked eye who's who and what's what. And right. if they've got their radios in, they'll be able to listen to the streaming commentary as well in their own language or hear the PA. Wow. Just had a new fastest lap of the race from the car in 30th position overall, wow. Alessio Picariello in the Herbert, one of the two Herbert Motorsport uh, Porsches. Again, possibly because the field was... Um, mm. As it is, he's, he's quite a long way back on the next car, which is the Sky Tempesta Racing Mercedes, Eddie, uh, Eddie Cheever. 
at the wheel. But Alessio's just banged in a one minute eight. Sorry, one minute. That'd be a miracle. Two minutes, 18.193 seconds. Uh, and it's just appreciably to, the fastest. Just to point race. on um, on lap 168, it is dark. Yes, it's dry and it's not raining and everything else. That's not just his fastest lap or that car's fastest lap. That is the outright fastest lap of the race. Yeah, the only people who've lapped close to that is the 88 Mercedes is running third. That's half a second slow for its best fastest lap. And likewise, Kevin Estra, six tenths of a second slow on that fastest lap. But anything in the two minute 18s is pretty sensational. And Lucas Stoltz managed yeah. one very early in the race in the number two well, uh, Mercedes AMG. So to put that into the perspective, guys. to put that into perspective, Picariello has just gone a full second faster than the leader who has nobody in front of him. Yeah. That's ridiculous now are we going to see that that gets pinged for track limits because he's shot across somewhere and i mean that's a possibility but you know he i, I don't know that he was in free air i mean he's yeah he wasn't the leader or second place so he's got to have been in traffic he was in the safety car interesting too. one of the best laps of the race has just been done by that car that's a lap down running third in that train of cars that's yeah. the giacomo alto uh, Lamborghini, number 19 in 19th place, but he's just under 2 minute 18.7, so that's right in the ballpark. But again, with driver like Giacomo, young Italian racer, you'd expect that sort of speed. Well, he's However, done, he's I'd done, quite like him to get out of the way. Well, no, 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 but he wants the others to get out of the way. He's done a 2.18.7, the two cars in front are doing 2.19s. So actually, he's trying to unlap himself. So well, he, d he doesn't give a fig for Raffaello Marcello trying to catch the two in front. He wants to get ahead of them. There's 16 and a half hours to go. They want to get on the lead lap. And that's what the team are telling him. Get by them, get by them. Look, he's right up behind them now. And he's brought Marcello with them. Marcello's just done a very quick lap indeed. At yeah. 2 minutes, 18.6. He's dropping Kevin Estra. Kevin's now how far back. He's another five and a bit yeah. seconds further back, whereas he was a couple of seconds further back. Again, it's sorted. But you can see the first four cars running down the hill towards Pujol. Augusto Farfus and the BMW, Daniel Serra in the Ferrari, and then Raffaele Marcello, but between them is that Giacomo Alte yeah. or Lamborghini, but they're dropping the pack behind, which is led by Kevin Estra. That's why the gap's out to five seconds. And the, and the Lamborghini is definitely the team are giving him the hurry up. Like again, you know, a, a quarter of a second, nearly half a second quicker, a uh, quarter of a second quicker than Daniel Serra in second, half a second quicker than Augusto Farfas. Now, I mean, it, that's a tiny amount of time over seven kilometers. And that just goes to show you how closely these cars are being driven. But I guarantee the team have said, whatever it takes, get the lap back. And he is now much closer to Daniel Serra. And, and for Serra, who's trying to take the lead of the race, that's really frustrating because he's trying to focus on finding a way by Augusto Farfus. And actually what he doesn't want is to be held up by Alto getting by him because then Raffaello Marcello has got him between a rock and a hard place, going to attack where he likes. So equally important for Daniel Serra is not to allow himself to be unlapped. Now, one of the things that is the bane of everybody's life is commentators talking through an onboard lap, so we won't.
a lap from Daniel Serra, and we notice he's actually losing a little bit of ground to the race leader, Augusto Farfus, which is actually very good news for a driver we're going to have a word with down in the pits. It's the teammate, and it's Nick Yalili uh, for Rover Racing, his BMW now leading the race. Well, it's good news as we watch this battle over here on the monitor here. And Nick, you, when you took over your stint, the car was still in the 15th spot. You brought it in at the second spot before you handed over to Catsburg. Traffic in passing at Spa. How do you get it done? Yeah, it's obviously quite difficult. We had a, a very good strategy call as well from the team, which obviously helped us have clear air and be able to move to the front. Um, and it's about being patient, particularly even now. We have such a long way to go in the race. We want to try and keep it clean. Obviously, in the lead, it's the best place to be until you come to lap traffic. But, yeah, try and uh, be as patient as we can and keep it on the black stuff. We talked to Augustus before his stint. Was there any information you traded with him before he left? Yeah, a bit on how the car balance, how I treated the tyres start to finish. Uh, but he's a super experienced guy. He'll figure it out. Just, uh, as proven pretty fast. He told us you're back in two hours with us. What do you do until then? Yeah, I'll probably try and get a, li a little bit more kip now. Uh, there's a really big speaker next to the motorhome, so I haven't been, haven't got too much le uh, left uh, to go. But um, yeah, should be uh, all okay. We'll see you soon. Cool. That is such a, f you know, you can do only so much planning when you come to race meeting. You yeah, suddenly yeah. find they've moved the lights in the car park or something. You just yeah. have to try and have a little bit of sleep in your car, but you're fully floodlit. That's not working. But a yeah. speaker next to your motor, that's uh, really <laughs> bad luck. Listen, you know, those those are all the things that you must remember to bring with you. Eye shade, ear plugs, you know, no amount of, of clean underwear, racing un or otherwise, is too much clean underwear to bring racing or otherwise, because it is just such a punishing business. And actually, mentally, they'll be fatigued enough, hopefully by now, to be able to, to get a bit of rest. So, but back in in two hours, so again, it'll be, you know, a 40 minute cat nap. Um, the scientists tell us that 15 minutes with your eyes closed is actually uh, enough to sort of give you a couple of hours of rejuvenation. So but it was. That's all I managed during the Le Mans 24 hours. I tried my hardest, but it was 15 minutes of uh, eye closure. And I uh, made it to the end. About all I managed last night as well. Uh, Gusto Farfus, our race leader then. It is 7.13 on Sunday morning in Sydney. Uh, 8.13 in Sydney. 7.13 in Tokyo. 3.13 Saturday afternoon in Los Angeles, 6.13 in New York. It is just after midnight here, Central European summertime. And so we have 16 and a half hours of the race remaining. The next big points haul will be in 91 minutes time. And already everybody will be thinking about whether that dive into the pits when they needed to when everybody did under full course yellow for fuel is going to be actually what they want right a car that's going to have to come in is uh, nearly at 65 minutes maximum wow. it's, uh, it's car 32 still down in 20th position still kelvin van der Linde on board but they've uh, gone yep. north of one minute and uh, sorry one hour and three minutes now word of praise there Gareth Evans on the Twitter sphere. That onboard lap was superb. So we're very happy to fall quiet uh, and you can listen, listen to an engine note. We love them too, but yeah. sometimes we get carried away. Absolutely, absolutely. But I mean, but just being able to watch and listen to a driver, I mean, that, that's what everybody wants. That's what all the fans want. And, and we are just fans who got lucky to be, to be able to come and, and do an awful lot more at races uh, than some of the other fans. So it's, it's always a pleasure to, to have the sounds of speed, as we used to say. Augusto Farfus, Daniel Serra, Raffaele Marcello, the top three all together with still that errant Lamborghini, well, not errant Lamborghini, that hard-working Lamborghini. It's actually the second place Lamborghini in the race. Uh, number 14, Emil Frey racing car, Stuart White at the wheel, the South African driver, uh, is the best placed Lamborghini. That's in 17th. Giovanni Alto in 19th place, trying to find his way. That's the third car in this lead queue as they come past the cameras. I don't, I don't know that he's going to get his lap back, but it won't be for want of trying, will it? Well, he certainly hasn't lost ground, has he? But those no. first four cars covered, uh, well, first five cars, but one the lap down, the Lamborghini we were talking about, going back to Kevin Esther in fourth place, covered by just under five seconds. Gap, first to second, Farfus in his BMW to Daniel Serra in the lead Iron Lynx of Ferrari is 1.1 seconds. It was last time around, it's 1.4 seconds. Third of a second in the lap, that is a very, very good gain. Yep. And there on screen, flashing in the background is the dark Lamborghini of Giacomo Alto. Emil Fry Racing, they know how to run a 
a Lamborghini, you can be sure of that. In the background of the shot, just coming down the hill past the old pits is Kevin Estra, just a little bit off the tail. 2.7 seconds down in fourth place. Little red strip there over the 17th place car. That means Kelvin van der Linde has pitted. After six, uh, one out, 64 and 48, 48 seconds. seconds. Yeah, 12 seconds to spare. Yeah. When you're planning that, when there's a safety car period, how long is the safety car period? Oh, my yeah. gosh, it's a very slow lap. But uh, they Well, once, had to once the safety car came in and he was still committed to finishing the stint, then it is don't make any mistakes. Because if he'd gone, what's that, 48, that's... 12 seconds, if he'd gone 13 seconds longer before hitting the pits speed limiter line, then they would have had a penalty. 13 seconds in 65 minutes is a pretty fine, hello, is it the start of the race? Suddenly, it's Where's amazing this how this happens. From? You look up and suddenly you've got 20 cars, not nose to tail, but side by side. This so is they've the... been shaping up that it's effectively a compression of the middle order. And it's suddenly got super busy as they go through up over the crest at Radion. So the people in the giant new grandstand will be going, wow, this is rather fine. This is the Paul Truswell theory of racing at night, where cars suddenly develop magnetism and are drawn together. And part of that, I mean, you, you, you'll see it yourself when you're driving on a highway at night, and particularly on an uh, auto route, auto strada, motorway, whatever, cars are clumped together because there's better visibility from lots of headlights and then sort of you gradually go past the clump then it thins out and there's nobody for ages and then you get another clump of cars so it, it's not it's it, it's it's not magnetism but it is some slight human need for better penetration of the dark and obviously when you're racing at this sort of speed the more you can see the better it is so on board in the Sky Attempto with the Sky Attempto Mercedes. That's been having a busy race. OK, it's one of the yeah. cars carrying an onboard camera, so it catches a lot of the action. But uh, certainly for all of the drivers, we saw a big wide moment from Chris Frog at, uh, on the exit of Eau Rouge into Radion. We saw Ross Cheever having his moments, and uh, it was it's just had a busy old race. However, it's still in the mix in 28th position overall. It's running. Yeah third, fourth place in class, so that's a good position. That class in particular is being led by the number number five Mercedes from the Hout Racing Team, and the class of which I talk is the Gold Cup. Yeah. We'll, we'll well, cover, cover those through the, through the course of the race. The leading car in Pro-Am is uh, back to the 188 uh, McLaren from Garage 59, Miguel Ramos, the uh, Portuguese racer in the lead of the class, and uh, just uh, checking the lead car in the Silver Cup class is still the number 14 Lamborghini with uh, South African Stuart White on board. That's running 16th place overall, just ahead of Benji Gertha. When I say just, I mean a quarter of a second. Well, we were riding on board there with Eddie Cheever's grandson and Eddie Cheever's son, Eddie Cheever. Um, uh, other names are available. To, well, as Ross Cheever well knows, Eddie's younger brother. So Eddie Cheever the third in that uh, uh, Sky Tempesto. I said Attempto, didn't I? No, Sky Tempesto racing Mercedes. Again, back on board. Oh dear, Nick oh, Wimmer's oh, had a spin in his BMW and uh, now pointing the right way again. Oh. Well, he, he wasn't. Somebody wasn't there. That was definitely headlights coming in one direction and tail lights going in the other direction. Uh, so, with him. Presumably that was going around with that thick gaggle of cars, the yeah. sort of 20-car train. Well, and, and again, you know, that's what happens with a safety car, is you get a big bunch of cars together, and then it's very hard to separate yourself from any of them. Again, for the reasons we've talked of and, and will continue to talk of, is that all the cars are doing the same damn speed. Because they're basically... That, that's what the whole... That's what GT3 does. It balances all the cars to the same potential. Successfully so. Well, still some cars under investigation. Incident at turn one. We've just seen an incident at turn one. That's the source. And three cars under investigation for that. The 911 Porsche, car number 55, which is the car that was leading the race uh, not so long ago. The Group M racing Mercedes AMG with that stellar crew of Mauro Engel, Mikel Grenier, and Maxi Buk. And car number 83, that is the well, Iron Dames, Dames Ferrari. Rahel Fry sharing that with Sarah Bovey, Michel Gatting, and Dorian Pan. Ooh. And on board at the moment, is it still Randall and, Fry? Uh, there was just a, a little replay there of uh, somebody getting it very wrong at La Source, but avoiding the gravel. Michelle Gatting is the driver on board the Iron Dames Ferrari. Sorry, I, I yeah. lost her on the timing screen for a moment. 25th overall. 25th place. Good yeah. position. They were fourth yeah. in class. They're now up to third in the just, Gold Cup class. Just off the lead lap, which is a, a bit of a bind. Yeah, so... Uh, 
the Haupt Mercedes. You can't say Haupt without saying Mercedes, can you? No. It's I, 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 yes, either father, father or son. There's your race leader, Augusto Farfus. The Haupt Mercedes leading that class. Uh, Michael, no. Yes, it is. No, the timing screen just jumped up and down. Uh, Michael Dynan, uh, Steve Dynan's son, I think, uh, in the BMW in second place, and Michelle Gatting in third place in class. And only uh, a couple of cars between second and third and the leader. And in fact, the battle second to third, Michelle Gatting is just eight tenths of a second behind Mike Dynan. Um, so that's a Ferrari and BMW battle, 34 BMW and 83 Ferrari, the pink Iron Dames Ferrari, eight tenths apart. So that is a no car gap between them. And then Eddie Cheever, fourth, Sandy Mitchell, fifth in that class. Riding on board with Raffaele Marcello and, and Giacomo Alto kicking up the dirt and yeah. possibly a bit of gravel at uh, the top of the hill in front of him. If he, Raffaele is, of course, third overall in the 88 uh, Codis ASP Mercedes, but the car in front is a lap down, but driving at exactly the same pace. And in fact, it's just set another its fastest first sector of any lap. We're 175 laps into this race, so Alto pushing on very hard indeed but Raffaele Marcello didn't enjoy the gravel I don't think being spat up into his face Thomas Prining in the pit lane in the 54 Porsche the dynamic motorsport car that's half a stint in so that is an unplanned stop he's only done 33 minutes and that's a pain for a car that was in 12th place. I'll give you more pain. Alfred Renauer, not yes. so long ago, was sitting in 24th position, right in ahead of, ahead of the sister car that Alessio Picariello was driving so well. That's been in the pits for more than 10 minutes. That's under investigation, as I was saying, for Kelka shows that yeah. might have happened out on the circuit. Well, and clearly, I, that has suffered from some form of damage. You sense that, that he might have not been the cue ball in that one. He might have been potentially... Um, Although, if he ran into the back of somebody, then that would usually necessitate a fairly long stop. Maxim Soule's Bentley in the pit lane. Is that still moving? Has that moved yet? Yeah, no, it's got a... Yeah, yeah. It's got a clock running. Uh, six minutes, a longer pit stop, yeah. so it might lose a bit of ground, but he had a lap advantage over Benjamin Lassen in the in the number 10 uh, car, the, the Audi that we saw it having might, its might problem. Might be losing that. It, it may well fairly be Fairly quickly, yes. Within two minutes, it will have lost that. Thomas Prining... Still in the pit lane, two minutes 25 and counting. That's more than, well, that's more than a fuel stop. It could be a driver stop. So Valentino Rossi getting ready to take over from Nico Muller and off the cars in the lead grouping. That car has done over an hour, an hour and nearly three minutes. So at the end of this lap, I would suggest Nico Muller will come in from fifth place. We'll drop it way down the order. But you know what? They're performing really well, that 46 crew. Yeah. And, of course, after Valentino in the, in the circulation, you get uh, Frederick Verviche, who's just such a brilliant pair of hands. Yeah. Any circuit, but particularly his home circuit at Spa-Francorchamps. And also, it, it, it turns out, quite a... Well, actually, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if anybody said, yeah, Freddie would be a very good driver coach, because he's always been such a good team player in, in touring cars and GTs and everything else. Um, but Freddie... Uh, is turning out to be, yeah, uh, having one of his most fun seasons now then. Who was the other car involved in that? We just saw the 14 Stuart White Lamborghini, Lamborghini bouncing across and the Probably curves. Frank Bird, one would think. Yeah. He was just half a second behind him in the, the number four Mercedes, the other yeah. car from the Hout Racing team. Well, that's that he shares it. with Anna Valen, Hannes Fitcher, who was uh, given a bit of push and shove in the early stages yeah. of the race, and Aussie racer Jordan Love. And uh, Stuart White for Emil Frey Racing is leading their class, so avoiding that drama. Uh, not from a, a, a class rival. Uh, yes, from no, class it is, rival. Uh, no, it is from class rival, yeah. Uh, just um, not, not far behind them is Benji Goethe in yes. third place in so that in fact, Silver Cup class. So, in fact, in that 15th, 16th, 17th, all together in that Silver Cup class, they, they are the top three head of Giacomo Alto, who Gi Giacomo Alto is now up to 18th overall because Thomas Prining is down to 20th place and is still in the pit lane four minutes and 20 seconds into that stop. So that is not a stop and a driver change and an anything else. That is a drama. Car 911 has executed a penalty of 10 seconds for four track limit violations. But there it has is, its own problems a, anyhow, because yeah. it's sitting there, so it's just added insult to injury, effectively. Uh, oh, no, have they just left the pit lane? Um, yeah, they're no longer shown as in the pit. Yeah. So they had a drama 
and they've served a 10 second penalty um, and uh, off they have gone. Right. However, in there from, might be more in to from come. fifth place, Nico Muller. Yep. In from the cold or the warm. It's been a lovely day here. Nico Muller out of the car, but uh, Valentino Rossi taking over that number 46 Team WRT Audi. Best place Audi by six positions. Patrick Niederhauser, the next best in, yep. in the Audi queue for Santa Lot Racing in the 11th place overall. Now, of course, the key for, for the doctor, as with every, you know, bronze, silver driver, I, I mean, I, what is his driver rating, by the way? I oh, know it's hard than that, just because he's been a, been a champion in many things. So, Car 46, you look down the entry list, and he's a he silver. is a silver, yes. Because, in fairness, he's done a couple of rallies and, uh, you know, maybe one or two races, because you can't consider the fact that he's been a multiple world champion on two wheels as actually good preparation for racing a GT car. Yes, he's got savvy. Yes, he's competitive. It, it doesn't make you a fast driver. It makes you a fast rider. So as a silver driver, his job is to lose as little time as possible and also have as much fun as he can. Thomas Neubauer will be back up in the stint in the silver 30 car and lost a couple positions in the last 15 minutes. And your assessment of what's going on with the car, what would you say? I mean, everything is pretty much under control from now on. Uh, the goal is just to avoid being caught in any kind of crash or avoid any issue or problems on track. So for the moment, I think it's uh, pretty well uh, pretty well, pretty well handled uh, by the team and, uh, and the drivers. So I think we just need to keep focus on this uh, on this uh, mentality and then uh, we want to see the end uh, the check flag so that's the goal uh, we are still uh, p3 i think silver the two uh, the two leading cars are right in front of us so we're still in the game and uh, we keep head down for sure we did kick off the weekend with a night practice but what do you feel is the biggest challenge of driving in the nighttime well the we don't think so but the track changed a lot uh, between uh, daylight and night so uh, we need to get used to a car which is different between uh, daylight and, uh, and during night time so, uh, so that's a big challenge and also uh, I haven't driven on the, on the night uh, yet so for me I need to get in the car and be, uh, be fast as, uh, as soon as possible so yeah it's, uh, it's always a bit tough but we'll make it we'll make it are you nervous? I'm always nervous. I think it's part of the game. But uh, yeah, I'm happy and then excited to be back in the car in a, in a few minutes. Good luck. Thank you. That, that's a great combination for a young driver, isn't it? Excitement and nerves and spar at night in, in the heat of battle. Just, you know, dropped in from a very great height. C can I just uh, pick up on something we were talking about earlier, about Nick Yulelli saying he's the speaker right next to the uh, BMW motorhome. <laughs> uh, Nicky Katzberg on Twitter, his teammate. Very cool, this concert at 24 hours of spa, but I'm trying to get some sleep and my motorhome is shaking. <laughs> the poor ah, guy. Well, uh, uh, excuses, excuses, excuses. You'll excuses. probably find that it was either a Ferrari or a Porsche team that wired that speaker up. Yes. <laughs> paid, paid the concert to uh, the yes. guys who are rigging it. Right, can you just run the speaker over to just about there? That's perfect. Yeah, Thank the, you very much. The concert ends, but mysteriously, the music carries on <laughs> through the night. <laughs> uh, puncture for the 54 Porsche, Thomas Prining, we gather, but he's now dropped out of the top 35. Uh, after eight and a half minutes, so clearly the puncture did some damage. Um, yeah, quite a lot of damage. Maxime Soule back in the pit lane in the Bentley. So car number 107, 99 problems, and uh, they're having all of them in one go in one race. Well, every time you cover an endurance race, someone can have a super smooth run, uh, and then just one thing goes down, and the rest of the dominoes just keep on falling yeah. thereafter. It's just. It's just how it is. You just get kicked. Here's Hubert Haupt in the Mercedes, leading in the Gold Cup from Michelle Gatting. Ah, oh, she's got ahead of Mike Dynan, Eddie Cheever fourth, Alex McDowell in fifth place. That's a sort of British GT and, and touring cars, uh, all comers car, that one, the uh, fifth place car. And Hubert Haupt, uh, son of Hubert Haupt. Uh, 20th place overall for the Gold Cup leader. And actually, how far back is Michelle Gatting? She is 30, just, a, just under 30 seconds behind him. So, um, and she's actually put a couple of her 
Michael Dyne has lost a couple of spots. He's lost, uh, dropped behind them, and also dropped behind the 99 Audi. But those first three cars in the Gold Cup class, from Hubert Hout to Michel Gatting to Michael Dyne, they're all lapping at an almost identical mm. pace. So that, that's very good news for Hubert Hout to be sitting on a lead of, what, 27, 28 seconds over Michel Gatting. And you look at this stream of cars coming up the Kemmel Strait, and it, they'll be in a group like that, won't they, where, all right, there's our race leader, but they will be in a group like that where everything is just all arms and elbows and there are different class cars and, and everything else. A little bit of a, just just as we were watching that leaderboard, change of place, so Michael Dynan up to second ahead of Hubert Haupt as he came back out of the pits, has lost the lead. So Michelle Gatting for the Iron Dames leading in the Gold Cup and not at Alton Park. Maxim Soule, as you can see there in that Bentley, 12th place in the class nominally but again, highlighted in red means they are in the pits. Two cars in the pit lane at the moment. That Bentley and the 54 Porsche has still not left. Yeah, unfortunate for Dynamic Motorsport, running pretty well, and uh, for Maxim Sule. It says more than 10 minutes in the pits, but it's been at least, Yeah, I'd say it's getting on towards 15, maybe 20 since it, since it pulled in. It's had its problems early in the race, but we need it to keep going. Everyone likes to have a Bentley in the field. It looks different, it sounds different and has been yeah. such a, a great sort of servant of GT3 racing over the years. Yeah, and the 54 Porsche of, of Thomas Prining has been in for more than 10 minutes as well. I think that's now only just clicked over to... There are, there's the Iron Dames car. So there's Michelle Gatting leading the Gold Cup. A second in the Gold Cup. Hubert Hout is still leading two positions no, further um, up the road. No, because that changed on our little leaderboard on screen when we showed it, although it hasn't shown uh, changed on the main timing okay, screen, well, so you might well be right. Hubert yeah. just gone through on another lap. He's just, yeah, yeah, he's got 180 laps on the board. Michel Gatting's only got 179. So no, she's... It, it did change yeah. on the uh, on the little class pylon when that was on screen, but so the Iron Dame's still definitely in with a podium shout in the Gold Cup. Right, the last few laps have been very, very good for our race leader and not so good for Daniel Serra in second place. Our Augusto Farf is now five seconds clear. That's suddenly really grown, isn't it? I think traffic must have been kind to him and not to well, Serra uh, and Raffaele Marcello. I think Giacomo Alto has had a degree to do with that as well, holding, I, I mean, just keeping Daniel Serra under real pressure. Let's hear from Nico Muller down in the pit lane. Well, you also got to love the human element of these races behind us is Nico Mueller's mom and dad, who you were just speaking to. What did you tell them about your stint? Well, they wanted to know if I was happy with how it went. And, uh, you know, they were here for the first time standing down in Eau Rouge during the night time. So I think they were pretty impressed and a bit shocked of what we're actually doing here. It's a bit crazy, but we love it. So, uh, no, it's, it's been a decent start to the race for us. We've been able to move forward. So, uh, so far, all going OK. We're struggling a bit in, in traffic. Uh, car is a bit tricky there and uh, straight line speed is not really our strength. And especially in traffic, you would like to be able to pass on the straights. But it is what it is. We try to do our best and hopefully keep on moving forwards. We saw Valentino Rossi waiting to take over from you during that driver change. What did you tell him? I just told him to have fun out there. I mean, it's it's one of the best races you can get to do. And, uh, you know, he's been doing so well all year long. The progression has been very, very steep. And, he, you know, he started off of a very good base already. So it's pure a pure pleasure and honor to be a part of, of this project. And uh, we're just, you know, three guys going out there and having fun and doing what we love. So, uh, yeah, really, really cool. Thank you, Nico. I think that that is entirely valentino's mindset he wants to be competitive but if you're not having fun why do it uh, i think absolutely that's the way to get the best out of it and, and nico's right you know he's chosen to come into gt3 racing which is possibly one of the fiercest cauldrons in motorsport they could have jumped into and this is the crown jewel this is the the creme de la creme and actually if he sticks with it next year he can do Nürburgring and Spa and Le Mans 24 hours without even leaving Europe before before we go anywhere else so he sort of emerged into GT3 racing at one of the most exciting times in the last 20 years where suddenly it, it, it's not just going to be SRO but also ACO rules racing as well as uh, IMSA racing which will embrace GT3 wholeheartedly so suddenly the world is your oyster, much more than ever would have been on a MotoGP bike. You, you could, it's almost like being a superbike rider now, that the same machine just goes everywhere. Yeah, 
It's phenomenal, but I'm just looking at the sort of, just having heard from Nico Muller there, he's got experience of bringing the Nürburgring 24 hours, that was back in 2015. Teammate Fred Vavij, three 24-hour victories. Dubai 24 in 2019, 2020 Nürburgring 24, yep. and again this year Nürburgring 24 for Fred Vavij. He shared with Robin Freitz and Kelvin van der Linde and Dries van Tor. So, you know, a stellar, stellar crew in the Phoenix Audi, but, you know, moving around, he's in the WRT Audi. That, we could be looking at a top six position here, I'd say, for that 46 Audi. It's down where it fell down to 17th place, but remember it had been running in fifth overall. It was the car that was out of sync with the others, though. And, and, and that's why, in fact, in the pit stop, I noticed that he went from fifth to 16th. Yeah. Because they're half a, a stint out of sync. So suddenly, by doing nothing other than keeping the car on the island, in. What are we looking at? We're 12 looking at minutes time, 10 minutes time. 50, 15 Suddenly minutes he's going to be boinked back up to yep. top five yep. as everybody in front of him peels off into the pit lane. The real question then for the lead duo, Augusto Farfus and particularly Daniel Serra, is when Giacomo Alto pits in that really annoying Lamborghini that is behind the second place car and trying to unlap himself. Um, because that, that may have a, a germane effect. Thank you to Jamie O'Leary, who is watching at home in Ely. Augusto Farfus and Daniel Serra are one, two. They shared a car in the V8 stock car series in Interlagos late last year. They finished third in both of the series endurance races in an Auto Farmer RC Chevrolet Sonic. Nice Aero. work, Jamie. Yeah. It's uh, half past 11, he's several several beers in but he's still got some random useless facts for us ever wanted to ride with the doctor here's your chance Ride on board like that, you can't imagine, can you? Even remotely, why people would want to do this. What a great looking ride. And Rossi already with a nice rhythm. Let's get down to the 54 Porsche garage and hear from Klaus Backler. What's the drama? Well, it was a tire puncture from contact that brought the 54 Porsche into the pits. And unfortunately, I hate to report this car will not go back out for competition. And Claus, early in the race, you took that car to the lead. When you see that in the pits here, 
what goes through your mind? Yeah, I mean, for sure it's disappointing to see now the car here and also the whole team. There's so much effort uh, what you put into a 24-hour race. And uh, I mean, it's been new that it's uh, not easy to finish here because uh, so many cars on track. Uh, so it's a sprint race. You need to go for the gaps. Otherwise, uh, you lose so much in traffic. And honestly, I don't know 100% what happened because I was uh, sleeping. Uh, I would be yeah, next in two hours into the car. So I think there was a contact somehow. Because of this, we got a puncture. And I think because of that contact, there was something also wrong with the steering. So maybe the steering rack uh, is damaged or broken. We don't know 100%, but the car is not uh, drivable like this anymore. And that's why we retired the car. Thank you. Uh, tough luck there for the Dynamic Motorsport crew. Uh, they were leading early on. And there you can see the 71 car of Daniel Serra. Is that the Lamborghini? Has he got by? Is he coming down the hill in front of the Ferrari? Well, no, it's more to the point. I think it's Raffaele Marcello. Oh, Raffaele Marcello. Right, so where is, where is the Lamborghini gone then? So Raffaele did, did the Giacomo... Uh, yeah, Giacomo Alto was right behind there and he brought Raffaele Marcello in. So all that time with Daniel Serra with a huge sea of lights behind him. What he didn't spot really. was Raffaello Marcello making a move on him. So Raffaello got past that lapped Lamborghini and has now moved up into second place ahead of Daniel Serra. Should be able to pull, pull away clear then, having, having caught past. That's the hard, hard work. And <laughs> you can see how hard that uh, Daniel Serra is having to work now. Yeah. Certainly, the, the, the table has been turned, but uh, Marcello, I expect to be able, already going out of speaker's corner, he's starting to stretch a margin in second place. But he's seven, at the start of the lap, Serra was down to seven seconds behind Agosto Farfa, still leading for BMW. They're getting towards the end of their stints in the next 10 minutes or so. But yellow. we've got a yellow sector, middle sector of the circuit. So where is turn 12 these uh, days? Turn 12 these days is uh, Fania. Yeah. Now okay. we're riding on board with Kevin Estra. He's right on the tail. He's got a new person to chase. No longer is it Marcello, but it's Daniel Serra, who was second. Is third. He's running wide and kicking up the gravel in the face yeah. of Kevin Estra's GPX Martini Racing Porsche. Over the curbs they go, but now let's take a look at the handling of Daniel Serra. Well, it still seems fairly OK. Not washing out too much there, but yeah. uh, again, you know, if you run out to the edge of the circuit, you'll find a bit of gravel here, but you'll also find an awful lot of uh, tyre debris there to not help your handling whatsoever. Well, all of these guys are within three or four laps, and it rather depends how, uh, uh, I can't do the maths, of their next round of pit stops, because everybody stops on the same lap. They've all done 54 minutes and a few seconds. So far for Sarah Marcello, Est, Tandy, Maxi Boot, James Collado, Luco Stoltz, Nico Farhagen, Patrick Niederhazard, I mean, just all of them will all steam into the pits at the same time. Uh, and then a lap or two further back will be, or later than that, will be uh, Nicky Team, uh, Matt Campbell, and, uh, and the next group of cars who sort of came in a lap later, three minutes later or so, so they've got a little bit less driver time under their belts. And that means that we have <coughs> gone green, gone green, uh, since, well, for very nearly an entire hour. And again, the, the clement weather conditions are definitely helping. Much warmer and dry here than at Knock Hill in Scotland, where the British Touring Cars and Jamie O'Leary are this weekend. Um, so hopefully they will continue to have the rain. Uh, there are, there are two, two sorts of weather in Scotland, raining and just about to rain. Yes. Don't pack the brolly away. Right, did we actually mention the fact that Lorenzo Petrese does not continue in the race? That uh, number 11 Audi means that is out of the race. The badge of retirement has been placed alongside. It's listed ah. as 56th position, but we saw it being pulled out of the gravel. Yeah. Ran wide on the exit of Pouin quite a while ago. But uh, so for car collection, both their cars, the number 12 car was out quite early on. Uh, Christopher Haase uh, parked that one up in and back in the pits. But uh, for Lorenzo Petrese, his first Spa 24 hours will have great memories, but unfortunately not all yeah. of them great. Other ones no. are counterbalanced. But, you know, when you're, you're that age, 16, did I say 16? Uh, uh, it makes me feel quite strange to think that you could be competing against the top GT drivers. Well, and, and, and when his dad was racing here three years ago, he was just 13 years old. I don't imagine that at that stage he thought, yeah, next time I come here, I'll be racing. 
in this race. He's probably thinking, next time I come here, I hope my parents let me stay up through the night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one other car in the pits at well. That's our uh, racer gamer, James Baldwin. The Garage 59 car. Now, uh, I would suggest yes, there has been. I would suggest there was going to be a driver change. I, I'm not sure, even at this stage of the race, that double stinting James Baldwin through the night is, a, is the greatest idea. So uh, Nick Kiergaard has taken over. Okay, on board well, with Daniel Sarah has just dropped from third to fourth. Kevin Estra has gone through. Gosh, almost another hour clicking by. And uh, it seems a long time ago that it was light and bright. But let's go back and take a look at how it all kicked off at 4.45 the afternoon. The total energy spa 24 hours it was bright sunshine the grid was packed with 66 yes 63 of the best gt3 cars in the world raffaele marcello on pole in the silver nosed uh, mercedes but right in front klaus backler just got it on the run did he jump the start we've seen no penalty accordingly no. but anyhow it was a, what we call an optimal start and he put his uh, dynamic motorsport porsche into the lead of the race but martin the key in the opening stages of the race didn't matter where you were looking from looking on board at the moment from michael christensen gpx racing porsche it was close but so much respect between the drivers and we got them all around the first lap without any damage whatsoever i reckon that's a record 65 cars unbelievably tight and it did stay clean through not just the first lap or the first hour but the first two hours but with so many well-driven cars of such equal performance inevitably they incidents and accidents started first car in trouble 107 bentley in the gravel that sort of really um gave an indi early indication of how their race was going to work out uh, likewise a couple of cars loris spinelli there getting a little uh, helping hint from behind sandy mitchell the first car with a major drama crawled in with a puncture and in the background there you can see stephen gore the aussie driver having the fright of his life here with a huge high-speed lose. That car continues. Lucas Stoltz and Com Ledegar. Ledegar taking to the grass and just about everything else to try and get by as he lost that place to the Mercedes and a further one to the Merck of Raffaello Marcello a few laps later. Uh, the car had been in the lead of the race. Eddie Chiva the third making some great moves in the sky, Tempesta racing. Mercedes and unfortunately for Cesar Gazzo that wasn't the best of moves that was coming out of uh, Blanchimont fly, flew across the track and that's uh, a car with uh, the Santa Lot Racing Audi with three very good corners but one very very bad corner yes. that was out of the race first retirement uh, first contact of the race for Jens Lieberhauser as he got tagged off into the gravel the Sky Tempesto Mercedes clattering into the number nine Porsche behind the safety car, not clever. And a familiar sign, Jens Lieberhauser being clattered off a little earlier in the Lecom complex this time. Uh, for the second time, he continued. Antero Al spun out by contact from behind that also took out another couple of cars and brought out another full course yellow. By this stage, we had had three safety cars as we headed towards the first points paying uh, position at six hours. The racing was still just as frantic. The yellow iron Lynx Ferrari battling with the Porsche for position. And then drama for the 21 Porsche and for the Mercedes as uh, a contact from Al Faisal Al Zabur uh, put both of their cars out. Marcus Winkelhock looking as busy as ever. No wonder he's won so many 24-hour races, but when it came to push and shove, he was prepared to dole it out. The Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes still having a, a little more fun than it possibly wants, but one of the, the best battles in the race. Look out for the number 47 Porter. It started stone last, but with Dennis Olsen at the wheel, building on the work that Nick Tandy uh, put in, it was working its way ever further up the order. And another spin for... No, not another car. The same car, Jens Liebhauser, just in the walls, but not as much as Karim Moje, who caught a bit of gravel going to speaker's corner that someone else had just hooked onto the circuit in front of him and was a passenger thereafter. The car did continue in the race, but that was quite a setback for him. Another full course yellow and safety car for that. And uh, the Sky Tempesto car again finding itself uh, mentioned in dispatches, running out very wide indeed. Antonio Fuoco dive bombing Klaus Bachelor's Porsche. The early race leader had dropped back down the order. Allied Racing taking, well, it's seven kilometers around yeah. the circuit, but you can make the lap longer if you go wide on all the corners. And uh, the car that was just in the wall so much, the number nine 
Porsche just having to keep out of the way. That's Herbeth Motorsport, one of their two entries, but uh, again, just trying to keep out of trouble. Now, this is the battle, the KCNG Porsche, Dennis Olsen, yeah. Norwegian racer, alongside, who was that at the time? Nick it was Nielsen. James, it was Nicholas yeah. Nielsen, not yeah. James Collado at that point. No, right. two young charges, Nick Nielsen and Dennis Olsen. Uh, as Marco Mapelli ran out very wide. And why did he do that? He was leading the race. He did it because he had a puncture. Yep. This was the slow limp home. And this was a real setback for K-Pax Racing. Their second setback. But then a brilliant evening sky. What a sight. One of the world's great motor racing sights as Spa goes into darkness. And then Adam Itecki limping around in the Busan Ginian racing. The car that we saw, the Audi we saw going off the speaker's corner. And then spinning at the top of the hill and facing the traffic that's unsighted as it comes into Les Combe. That was a, a scary moment. I think that was the number five, Hubert Howe, so it might be the number Mercedes, four yeah. uh, Mercedes from the team. Regular pit stops under nighttime conditions. 71 Ferrari, one of the two Iron Links cars in there at the time. The Iron Dames are also taking fuel. Uh, slow run back to the pits for the 74 Mercedes, making it in though, despite a little bit of drama. And un as yet unidentified, nobody's put their hands up to that and claim responsibility for that wild run across the gravel trap at the uh, Jackie X curve. And the race continues to be just as close, just as fast and just as furious. We had uh, a safety car just a little over an hour, a little, under, no, a little over an hour ago, in fact, an hour and two minutes ago. And uh, that was the last interruption of racing. Everybody stopped then, and the race continues with Augusto Farfus leading now from Raffaele Marcello, Kevin Esch and Daniel Serra. There's been a big change around in the lead group as we are currently under green. The concert is continuing to keep the drivers awake as if it, as, as if 60 odd loud cars wasn't enough. A bit of banging nosebleed heavy handbag uh, is also doing its job and the pit stops have started. Everybody is now fast approaching the 65 minute maximum. Lucas Stoltz is in uh, from eighth place, and there goes car number two. That is a uh, driver change, do I think? Well, that's Lucas Stoltz's car number. It's come in from eight, but yeah. it had 20 seconds eight, eight wow. extra at the pit stop for an unsafe release from the previous pit okay. stop. So that'll drop it down the order. Right, the leading cars will come in this time around. But uh, Raffaele Marcello's got the gap down. It was seven seconds when he got past Daniel Serra. But now it's only half of that, 3.6 seconds. And so Marcello catching Farfus, but they're all in they the pit lane in. now. Farfus, okay. Marcello, Estra. Driver change coming up. Kevin Estra wrestling with the belts in third place. There is the race leader, Augusto Farfus. Now, he's only been in for one stint, so I think that will be a double. 71, same deal for Daniel Serra. Driver change here, Est out. And that's not Michael Christensen's helmet, is it? Unless he's got a special... No, it's Richard, Richard Leeds. There you go. Well, that's not Richard Leeds's regular helmet, either, is no. it? They've got... Uh, obviously, his is normally uh, red and white because of the Austrian colours. Uh, so they've obviously got a, a special GPX Martini liveried helmet going on. There it is, the car with the silver bonnet that's almost obscured just down in the bottom left. The Rover racing colours always so easy to spot. Thank you for that. Um, and this car... Yeah, Martini colours on silver, not perhaps the most classic of liveries. On white, definitely. On red, more frequently in recent years, but originally on silver. And there he goes, out just ahead of the 71 Ferrari. So the Rover racing car came in in the lead from the 88 Mercedes, the 221 um, Porsche. And that is now Richard Leitz. And 71 was Daniel Serra. I think that might have been a double stint. Don't have a strategy computer to tell no. us these things and was not clever enough to write them all down. Right, um, the card that's going to come up the order, of course, is the one that's out of sync. That's uh, the Valentino Rossi driven yes. number 46 Audi down in 50s. But by the end of this lap, it should have vaulted back. So we think about fifth or sixth position. That's fourth, where it was sixth, before. Somewhere like that. Absolutely right. Uh, Nick Tandy in the pits as well from what was uh, fifth place. Uh, Maxi Book stays out, James Collado stay out. They can't really do more than one lap. They mm, No, one lap more they'll do before they come in. So Maxi Book is the de facto leader from James Collado, so it's Mercedes Ferrari. Uh, Patrick Niederhauser would be third right now, or will be third right now in 
the number 25 Audi ahead of Nicky Team in the Dane train plus a Belge. Uh, so Nicky Team, Marco Sorensen, and Maxime Martin, who is an honourable Dane train member for this weekend. Uh, Maxime Martin's father and uncle won this race together. Indeed, we um, saw Jean Michel walking through the paddock uh, just. Well, as the, as the pressure built up, the tension built up, but the sun carried on shining, and then we all piled down to the grid. What, I don't know how many people were on the grid before the start of the race. Quite a lot. They've widened the grass birds. There was plenty yeah. of space, but it was absolutely it was, maddening. It was, it was just a sea of humanity, and, and, and yes, I think in, in next year, the ideal will be to not allow people on the grid until the cars have arrived, because getting cars onto the grid once they'd allowed people to fill every square centimetre of tarmac was not the work of a moment. No, but we're, we are big fans of people being able to get oh, down near the cars, take a yes. look, and uh, yeah, a little bit more management, but it was a fantastic atmosphere down there, and uh, a lot of people would have really cemented their love of motor racing. Race leading trio, Maxi Book, James Collado, Patrick Niederhauser, assumed the lead as they came into the pits. They have made their stops. And there is the white Iron Lynx Ferrari, and that it was Georgia. Uh, James was, Collado at the wheel. It uh, was James Collado, sorry, yes. Uh, no driver change there, so he stays in. Uh, don't see what happened with the 55 Mercedes. Uh, so whether there's been a Grupper M driver change. Mauro Engel handed over to Maxi Book at the last stop, didn't he? So I think Maxi will stay in. It's not the time to be single stinting. It's not that. It's not that hot, it's not that warm. Everybody outside has got a sweatshirt or a jacket on. I mean, it's not freezing. We're not in Knock Hill, but it is, it's just a little bit nippy for shirt sleeves only, I think. So it's probably, yeah, low teens out, maybe 13 degrees, maybe dropping a little more. And actually that will help the tires because the temperature will disappear from the track a bit and it will also help the, uh, the charge temperature through the intercoolers of these cars, and that means the cars will be a little grippier and a little quicker as well. Yes, sort of kinder all round, but of yeah. course, don't forget what we can have at this point, are drivers who are gonna take over after all these pit stops who haven't been out in the night in the race so far. You, though we've had a couple of hours of darkness now, maybe actually three hours of darkness, um, of course, in that driver rotation, if you've got uh, drivers double stinting, that's two hours, two hours, 10 minutes, also to us 15 even with the pit stop included in the middle but uh, so some of those who've uh, we've got some sleeping before the concert started so they'll be the lucky ones <laughs> they'll be the next ones to come into the car next time around yeah. but to go out onto a circuit that necessarily not only is it dark but of course there are many more things on the racing surface than there were when they were out there the, the amount of rubber debris on the outside the marbles will have increased enormously and of course there'll be more gravel as well just for fun well imagine being in this car having just got into it first time in the dark and you don't even have a good line of sight because you come out of the pits 10 meters five meters three meters behind the car that's immediately in front of you now obviously daniel Serra has stayed in but there will be all the way down the 60 cars that are still running 55 cars that are still running cars that come out in a solid wall of traffic and they don't get a chance to bed themselves in. There, there is no time to ease your way into this. You've got to be absolutely full on it. Race leader Matt Campbell in the pit lane. He stayed out two laps longer than everybody else, which means now that Maxi Book is the race leader in the Mercedes. James Collado second in that white Ferrari. In the white Ferrari, not the yellow Ferrari. And Patrick Niederhauser, I think he's going to drop down the order. He and Marco Sorensen currently shown as third and fourth. This is Matt Campbell in the AMO Motorsport Porsche comes in as the race leader and actually have barely mentioned this car throughout the race so far. And, and that's a good thing. Totally. Okay. Not necessarily for the sponsors, but for the result. Yeah, another but car. The more we... you get mentioned, the worse your race tends to be going. Yeah, exactly. If you're on all the highlights packages, you know full well that you, <laughs> either people have been attacking you or you've been attacking other people. Right, one car we haven't talked about very much is the BMW Junior team entry, car number 50, with um, the driver on board. Dan Harper, probably the star in that car. Neil Verhagen, Dan Harper, and Max Hess, just outside the top 10, second best of the BMWs. That is one of those cars that's going to keep on coming up the order, and certainly, in fact, since uh, Dan Harper's taken over, he's, in fact, just put in that car's fastest lap of the race. So that'll be in the top 10 fairly soon. Is that your 10 euros now, condemning it to instant retirement? No, I've got to think about the 10 euros. <laughs> it's, it's either putting it in the kitty or perhaps some 
frites. I wish I hadn't talked about frites no, and mayonnaise frites and right mayonnaise. now. That would work very nice if anyone wants to come up to commentary box right. number six. I, 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 I went down earlier uh, when I went for supper and I thought, I I'm going to have frites and mayonnaise. The queue was so long, so long. I thought, I've only got an hour. I can't join that queue. It's not going to work. Um, so Augusto Farfus now leads for BMW, the 98 Rover Racing BMW. Raffaello Marcello second in the 88 Mercedes and Richard Leitz third in the 221 Porsche. Fourth is Daniel Serra in the 71 Ferrari. So James Collado has dropped back down the order in the white car. It's Daniel Serra in fourth place. Ah, oh, trouble. Big trouble. Ooh, a someone with a rather shorter big car. Incident. It That's started him. life as a Lamborghini. It's, it's the now, 63 car. Oh, it's dear. now this a is, Borghini. It, it is indeed. This is the car that's had all sorts of problems. And unfortunately, that is a full left hand, uh, sorry, front right, right so, corner has been yeah. given a massive bash. The front right wheel is hanging off at a, right, a, a so rather over jaunty angle. What, what happened? Has he what tagged? did it hit? Now he comes into sight up the hill. Now, has he just gone off or has he clipped it on somebody in track? And that's a big clip. If he's hit somebody and done that amount of damage, there's another very damaged car out there. Yeah, well, that was Albert Costa who's bringing it in. It's flashing and uh, Giorgio Roder in the pit lane has come and gone, so it's not him. Albert Costa is in the pits. We have no warning of any yellow zones, right? No. Well, I could talk about the front end of the car, but there's not that much to talk about. The front right-hand corner has gone completely. The front right-hand wheel is um, back at about 40 degrees off true. I have nothing against your left front wheel. Yes. Unfortunately, neither have you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, that's a, that is a very... <sighs> It's a very major rebuild, but realistically, it's not coming back out, is it? It's just not, because you're going to lose so much time that it's almost just point. I mean, look, they're just looking at it to see if it's rescuable. Let's get down to somebody whose race is going a little bit better and hear from Kevin Est. Well, Kevin just told us he's back in the car in about three and a half hours. Probably should still be a little dark out here. We've been talking about line of sight in the booth. Where is it most difficult on track? Uh, breaking for Lecombe, it's quite dark. Uh, also arriving in Pool. Um, but actually, we have a lot of cars on track, so you always have somebody in front of you where you can kind of see where the track is going. And, uh, and we've done a few laps here, so actually I know. But uh, yeah, there are some track, some some parts of the track uh, like Les Combes, Pouon, which is which is pretty dark. Arriving to Blanchimont as well, which are very fast corner and critical one on, on track limit and, and such. So uh, not easy, but uh, I think it's uh, it's pretty cool to drive here in the night. The same GPX Martini Group won in 2019 right here. Why can you do it again? Sorry? Why can you win here again? Ah, because we uh, we have the same team, the same drivers. We have a good preparation and we have a Porsche. <laughs> Company line, but just so beautifully delivered. Nice work, Kevin Est. Well, Albert Costa in the garage with that Emil Frey Lamborghini. That's their remaining car, isn't it? We, do we have more here? Oh, is this down at campus? Well, I don't know. The first time we saw it was coming through the exit Out of, of Mont On the dirt and just gets, I mean, yeah, just gets sucked out into that. Again, there's a gravel trap there on the exit of Piff Path. Get sucked out into the barrier. I haven't seen anybody go off in that barrier in years. And yeah. Well, Albert's explaining yeah. what went wrong. And it, we all know Albert's a massively attacking driver, but that was a car sitting in a fairly decent position in the race. Mirko bought a lot. He just doesn't know where to look well, in the background. What's happened there is he's got wheels out wide over the curb. And it's, you know what happens when you hit standing water at, with one wheel and it, it just rips. pulls the car because it basically stops one side. And that's what happened. He just pulled him into the gravel and then into the barriers and you know you are hard on the noise coming out of piff path there and that's a that's a really tough break and all the body language is going okay we're going to get some sleep tonight that we didn't really want and yeah that's tough and, and Mirko in the background ugh, ugh, 
that. You know, but at least he's going, at least I've got the works Lamborghini contract along with Andrea Cordarelli to race the prototype. But, you know, they're all competitors. They want to win the, win the race here and now. But, but you know, you, when you talk about that, when you talk about cars getting to hypercar, you've got to look at Albert Costa as being a potential contender for that as well. You know, he's, you know, he's absolutely on the money. So that car, well, it's not official yet, but that's out, isn't it? Uh, Alessio Piccariello is in the pit lane as well as Jim Pla. So only two other cars in the pits, although number three is shown as in the pits and also not shown as in the pits. Jeff Kingsley, the Canadian driver in the, the uh, Get Speed Performance car. So I'm not quite sure if that Mercedes is in the pit lane or not. No, it, it doesn't say it is. Right, Augusto Farfus is absolutely flying in the lead of this race. 1.2 seconds to go, oh, but no. he's just banged in the fastest first sector of the lap of anybody. His second, not so much. But just 1.2 seconds clear of Raffaele Marcello. Let's see if Raffaele can respond around this lap. No, he's not. He's lost about seven tenths. And they're only two thirds of the way around the lap. So it's going very well indeed in the middle of the night here. Uh, Spa Francorchamps, Augusto Farfus, the 98 Rover Racing BMW leading by 1.2 seconds. He's going to go out to probably two seconds on this lap over Raffaele Marcello's Mercedes. That's number 88 from a CODIS ASP. You're right, there's nothing wrong with Jeff Kingsley's car. I'm, I can't read across two screens. It's Thomas Brining's car that is still in the pit lane. Uh, no fewer than 17 cars served a penalty for track limits violations during that last round of pit stops. So that's one in three. Wait, which is not bad going. That means two thirds of the field didn't serve penalties for track limits violations. So there's that. Yes, I prefer that way around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. uh, on board with the second place car, Raffaele Marcello. I wonder what the illuminated two means. Your second. Second place, I suppose. And it's asking him to get ready. Little little sign in the middle. Ready, ready for the attack. Well, that's what he's oh, trying to do. Then. But he's losing time. Last lap, he lost half a second around the course of the lap, yeah. improved in the final sector of the lap, third and final sector. But this lap, again, first sector, he's lost a lot of time to the BMW of Augusto Farfus. I wonder whether the ready light is something that you press when you are coming into the pit lane ready for a driver change. That does something different. Could be, but he's not going to have another pit stop for about 55 minutes. No, but I wonder if when you when you press it on your steering wheel, it changes the ready light to a different colour, like green or something. I'm not sure. But it, it had one on the Ferrari as well, so it's not exclusively a Ferrari thing. It's just not something that I particularly remember seeing before. However, uh, answers on the postcard. If you do know, then do let us know, and we'll inform everybody else. Um, I think we're assuming, aren't we, that the 63 Emil Frey Lamborghini is going no further. Well, I've However, already put a line through it, but I'm thinking, what are they going to do? Well, let's find out from the driver who was at the yeah. wheel at the time, the driver who's struggling, because we're going to catch up very shortly with Albert Costa, and uh, clearly he will be the driver with the long face because his car is uh, dropping down the list, down to 41st position. Is it out of the race? Let's find out. Well, Albert, we can see that the car is covered here in the pits. What can you tell us about what happened? I, I don't really know what happened. It's, it's uh, my first time I crashed alone in a race. I have no words, to be honest, because it was my first lap. Um, I know it's an endurance race. I'm, it's not my first time here. And suddenly, in the exit of the corner, I'm ready flat out. Uh, I think I touched oil, grass. I don't know what, what happened. But just over the curb, I, I land and I went to the wall. I don't know what happened. I mean, if I do a mistake, I say, but now I, I did nothing wrong. It was my first flying lap. I'm so sorry for everybody, also for myself. The car was looking good. We were recovering some time to the first guys, even with two laps less. I don't know. I'm, I'm really surprised what happened because I, I don't understand. How tough is it to see the car with the black car cover on it? <sighs> I'm, I mean, I don't like to see the car like this because also we have a race next weekend and I don't know when it's going to happen. I think the chassis is, uh, is a little bit destroyed and not a good moment for me. I, I can't believe what happened now, to be honest. I think we're going to, if you want to take a look at the monitor, we're going to show you the replay of what happened. Well, there he is. I mean... He goes a long way over the curve, first hot lap, and 
yeah, you know, he bounces over the kerb, but then you land in the gravel trap, and off you go. Look, I mean, his, uh, Albert's point there was it was very deep into the corner. He'd sort of done the corner as far as he yeah, was yeah. concerned, but... Uh, the problem is he ran out wide, wide, did. wide, wide, and uh, as you can see in the, in the headlights there, there is gravel out there, and, and it's just ripped the car out of his control, and, and it's just flown across into the barriers, and, you know, poor guy is... Uh, you could hear it in his voice, you know, really actually fighting back the tears. He is absolutely distraught. And, 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 and that's, that is a very honest racing driver reaction. You know, he said, you know, if it was my mistake, I, I'd say so. But he's clear. I mean, you could see it in his facial expression. He's got no idea what, what went wrong there and why that happened. Look, having watched Albert racing Lamborghinis for years, he's always such a spectacular racer, but he's not the sort of driver you see putting, putting it off at all. And in fact, if anything, he's the sort of driver that you really want in the heat of a battle because he's a really good scrapper. But there, he was on his own. He wasn't under pressure. Except that you are, every second you're in the car, you are under pressure, you are pushing every single yeah. second in the car. Yeah, but not under pressure from anybody else. No, no, exactly. But it, it's not like it's his first, first go round the block here. Anyhow, out of the race. One of the, it was a car that already had its problems, so it wasn't going to go on to win this race unless everybody else was hit by a meteorite, because it, it had its problems. It was on the second timing page for quite some while, yeah. and that tells you a story. We started with 66 cars, and I think at the moment we're looking at having... 57 cars remaining. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe 56 may, cars. Uh, 56, because Thomas Brining's car is still shown uh, above 58, which is Ross Gunn, the last running car, uh, but it is not going any further. Um, Valentino Rossi, by the way, to complete our circle, who's now halfway through his stint, in fact, three quarters of the way through his stint, um, sagged when he stopped or when that car stopped and he took over down they were down to 16th 17th place it's currently in eighth spot so that again you know early in the race if you stopped out of sequence you went from fourth to 24th you you, you literally looked like you had no idea and shouldn't be allowed out there and then suddenly came straight back up to fourth when everybody else stopped so that's what's happening with that 46 car he just lost another place though because dan harper's place. gone past yeah. in the bmw number 50 so that's gained a position valet's lost one and so uh, he's down to ninth place but again his job as the quote amateur driver in the car the silver driver the lowest rated driver is to lose as little time as possible and to allow his teammates the best chance to make up as much time as possible. So he's doing, and, and exactly as Nico Buller said, and just have fun. If you're not having fun in good weather at Spa Francorchamps, then you need to be doing something else with your living. Yeah, because next, if you're here in 12 months' time, it probably won't be such good weather. So yeah. seize the moment when the track's in a good condition. Generally, the, the weather's been kind. It wasn't too hot through the day. It was warm rather than hot. This is probably about as comfortable as you'll be in the Spa 24 hours, because we all know it can be savage here. It's probably the best weather I can remember here in, uh, yeah, overall weather that I can remember here in Spa in years, because as you, as you say, you know, it can either be filthy, you know, lice frogs uh, for horsemen or sweltering i mean a couple of years ago three or four years ago now we came here it had been 41 degrees the week before and remained in the high 30s and that's just hellish for right. everybody trying to survive this race right what's happening at the front of the race it's still augusto farfus leading in that number 98 uh BMW from Rover Racing, the sister car has just moved up to eighth place. That's Dan Harper in the second of those Rover Racing BMWs. But the important thing for the BMW fans is that Raffaele Marcello is falling away very slightly. In fact, the last lap he gained back a little bit, but he's more than two seconds away. And actually, in a race like that, that's not too bad. It means that Farfus could actually take his time when it comes to the traffic or at least have some lassitude about where, where he can put the car well, and what well risks a, he has to well take. Well, a little, except when we saw them going through Eau Rouge there, there is no one between first and second, so the gap will come down a little bit. Then Augusto will catch the next car, and, it, and those gaps, are, are, as we always see in any endurance race, grow and shrink depending on where you catch the traffic and, and how things fall for you. So, yeah, 2.1. It means that Rafael is not close enough, there he is, to have a lunge, but he's dangerous enough that if Augusto gets held up, there is only one slower Ferrari between them, um, if Augusto gets held up, suddenly he's right on him. I mean, right on him. And then he will be in lunging position. 
So yeah, that's Alessio Rivera in the Pro-Am Racing A, of course, the yeah. Ferrari, but he's the quickest driver in that car, so he's not far off their, their pace at all. In fact, he's, he's matching their pace. So that's very good news for Farfus. He's got past. That cost him about a second. That's why the gap's down to 2.1. Yeah. Oh, in fact, it's been dispatched very easily by Raffaele Marcello, but well done to Alessio pulling out of the way. But again, the Ferrari doesn't make great speed in that center sector sector of the track compared to the Mercedes and Raffaello Marchiello just ate him up alive there and that's not because as you said the Ferrari driver is sort of out of his depth Alessio Rivera is very much a top quality Ferrari driver he's won the GTM title two straight years in uh, the World Endurance Championship as the pro driver in the car so he is absolutely among the very quickest how many cars are still on the lead lap? When we looked uh, a while ago, it was 17. 17, 18. Right, this is Alessio Picariello, who's leading the Pro-Am class. He's been really flying in that car. He's, he still has the fastest lap in the race. That was set about 30 laps ago now, but he's up to 27, 26th position overall, but he's half a minute clear of Dean McDonald in the 188, garage 59. Uh, McLaren and third in class is Rivera just been talking about him he's another position behind but that's a tidy lead for Picariello and the number 24 has been working its way ever further forward and uh, it's very good news for his teammates that's uh, Nicky Leutvilla who was the last driver into the car Stefan Aust and Nico Menzel who was, was quite a late signing for that always a bit of horse trading ahead of 24-hour races but uh, if you've got Alessio in your car you know you know what the ultimate pace is and that's whatever he can achieve in it. Uh, and, and obviously, despite the Italianate nature of his name, he is a, a local here as well. He is a Belgian, uh, domicile Belgian driver, so very much a home race for him. As you say, he's got that half-minute advantage over Dean McDonald in second place in the uh, 188 McLaren. Again, that car has had a, a few mentions on the uh, Headmaster's notice board, the 188 McLaren. It's been tagged in a couple of uh, incidents. Uh, by the way, the uh, 911 three-way incident. Who was it? Who was involved in that? Uh, 911, 55 and 83. The Iron Dames, uh, 55 uh, Porsche. Uh, no, 55 Grupa M uh, car. That's uh, no uh, no further incident. Uh, no further action in that incident. Now that's the one, unfortunately, that put the uh, Renauer. Porsche a long way back after a long pit stop to rectify dramas. We didn't see the incident, so not quite sure who triggered it. Dean McDonald, second place in Pro-Am in the Garage 59 McLaren. And again, that gap hovering around half a minute. And, and as with every other battle, it will grow or shrink depending on who's in front of you and who gets between you and your rival. Yes, a certain duty, of course, on, on, on drive. the lead drivers. If they're a pro driver, they've got to be careful when they're going past the, um, the AMs, of course, that if there's any doubt, they get pinged for it because they're supposed to be good enough to get by without causing any trouble at all. But, you know, you can see a lot of the AM drivers. We just saw, in fact, uh, Alessio Rivera. He's not an AM, but he's in a pro-AM entry keeping out of the way he knew his place wasn't to interrupt the race leaders he let Marcello through quite tidily as he gives chase to the race leader in fact the last lap has been a good one because it's down to 1.6 seconds the gap between Farfus leading the race and Raffaele Marcello in well, second a, a lot of that with Alessio Rivera is intelligence from the team because he just sees cars lights headlights and and some may be fractionally faster some may be more than a little fraction faster but he's got no idea who it is behind him. And so the team will say to him, the leaders are right behind you, let them go, that's not your race. And again, the deal there, oh, somebody in the barriers, and that is up at Blanchet, is that exit at Blanchemont? It is, it's on the run up to the bus stop. So who is that? Well, it's pretty much where Cesar Gazzo it's went a nine, in. It's a Porsche, isn't it? Yeah, just trying to pick it out. And just, just want to pick up a point on Alessio Rivera as we try and work out Oh, oh, is that, oh no, they've already had the problem, and for the Renauer brothers, that is really sad. That's Alfred Renauer who's taken to the ball on the outside of the circuit. Now it's then. very hard to pick out the level of damage. Almost looks like yeah. it's just pulled against the barrier, but there's look no like power he's just except run the lights down and on the screen. Hmm. 
Well, so there is power, but he's, yeah. That might be on a separate pack. That, exactly. That, that actually, uh, exactly. Oh, the headlights are on. He's found the switch. He's right. Found, he's, he's prayed. He's so had a little prayer there. there. Had to power cycle Four. through it. We're going Two. full course yellow. One full course yellow now. Yeah, full course yellow. And look at this battle. Right behind. Ah, OK. So the ready message is actually on the race control information screen. It showed full course yellow and then went back to ready, then went back to full course yellow. So it's an indication that the system is working. What do we see here coming up towards out of Blanchimont? Spin oh. tagged from behind. And that was a firm impact with the barriers. He was tagged from behind, I think. Ah, 71. Um, that's the white. No, not 71, 71 51. No, 51. It's th that was the white Ferrari. Okay, the Iron Lynx white Ferrari. Yeah. That's for James Collada running in sixth place. So you, uh, you pointed the finger that way. So no wonder the, the, the yeah. power was cut because uh, when you clip from behind, of course, the car is pretty unbalanced when you're coming out of Blanchemont. But more than that, it's a very, very high speed indeed. Okay, I, n I need to see that original angle again. It did sort of look like the car just got turned around. It's entirely possible that it didn't, and he had just maybe lost it coming off the curbs because he was distracted by the cars well, behind. Well, look, but the camera angle was from a long way away yeah. into the dark, into yeah. the headlights, so it is very hard to see if there, if Here we there go. was Let's a Let's take a, a look a again. Caused by somebody else. No. No, it wasn't. No. It looks like he was on his own going no around. So he's, yeah, so he's probably dropped a wheel off the exit curb, and it's just spat him off. So apologies to James Collado. He was the next car through, but it does not look like there was contact there. I, I don't think there was. I think that was uh, an unforced error. Leaders are in now then. Here we go. So uh, halfway through a stint, 26 minutes in. Right. So, however, who does need to come in is Valentino Rossi, who's done 54 minutes and one hour and three minutes, Kelvin van der Linde. So those are the, those are the outliers. Those are the guys on the half a, half a, a session away, half a stint away, uh, stint length. But interesting that Augusto Farfus chose to pit. I find that really quite interesting. Absolutely no, no complaints and full understanding. Kelvin van der Linde, 18th place overall, but he couldn't do another lap under full course yellow because he would exceed his uh, one hour and yeah. five minute time. Yeah. They had no choice, but it may work for them. But then again, if others just wait until it goes to well, safety car, indeed, if it does, it may not yet get to safety car. They were due that stop anyway. So it's a lap earlier. Doesn't matter, neither here nor there. BWT Mercedes is due to come in as well. Yeah, that's Lucas Stoltz. Well, Lucas getting, Stoltz on yeah. the wheel at the moment, but They're driver change driver coming up. Change. So who's going to be taking over after Stoltz? It should be Maxi Gertz. Can't quite see if that's Alex, him looking Alex down Medall the pit Alex Medal is in. Dominic Bauman is in. David Perel is in. Uh, Jeff Kingsley is in. Antonin Borger is in. Just taking over from Maxim Sule. Back into the garage goes the 21 AF Corsa Ferrari. That's not a great sign. It doesn't necessarily mean major drama. It just means they need to do something that they can't do in the pit lane, which is something other than fuel tires or possibly changing a door. Nick Yellowley's taken over the 98 car. So he takes over, but only 26 minutes in that stint. There it is. Uh, no, that's not the Rover racing car. That's uh, Dan Harper is in as well. Who else is in? Dries Van Tour. Uh, Calderelli, uh, Miney is in, Rossi is in, we're expecting him in. This is pretty much, I mean, he was actually three quarters away around the lap. When we went full course yellow, he was probably already on the climb up towards Blanchimont, because it's only been a minute or two. Full course yellow at 1.19.25. It's funny, it's now 1.23, so four minutes, okay, so half a lap away. It's funny, isn't it? The nervous ticks with such a long pit lane. It's the double pit line yeah. pit lane at Spa Francorchamps. Drivers have little nervous ticks, things they can do when they're not fully out at, out at full racing speed. He was adjusting, Valley is adjusting his drinks bottle yeah. tube under his collar, just trying to make sure it's safe and not, not rubbing on his neck, but just little things. It's funny, isn't it? Because he's only had four races to develop any, uh, any car racing ticks. Now, d before he gets in the car, does he do what he always did in MotoGP, which is squat right down to stretch the leathers? Does he do that with a racer or, or does he, or was that just purely not a habit, but something that you need to do to be comfortable in, in a set of racing leathers? I don't know. I always assumed it was for comfort, but 
Maybe it's just a thing he did. It, you know, drivers getting with their left foot first into single seaters or their right foot first. They put their left glove on first or, or whatever. You know, everybody's got their own little idiosyncrasies. And to be honest, Martin, a lot of drivers have little things they don't even know they're doing. No, I know. It's it's the subconscious. They're focusing on the on the bigger goal, but they have no concept. It's it's amazing how many drivers I've spoken to. I said, oh, do you always do that? Yeah. Do what? Do what? You know? <laughs> I yeah, stopped it's, asking, frankly. It's, it's not the David Coulthard lucky pants, is it? You know, it's, it's, uh, a lot of them do uh, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Rafael Nadal when he's waiting to return a serve. He's got all those little ticks, you know, mm. with, his, with his thumbs. It's, it's the eyes, it's the eyebrows, it's the shoulders, it's the pulling the shirt, it's the heart, you know, the, and goes through about 17 or 18 motions before every single return of service. Yeah, or, or, uh, or the Welsh fly half in rugby, Dan Bigger, his, his little twitches before he comes to kick mm. the ball, and he didn't yeah. really know who's doing those, but of course he was just visualising what he needed to do next, which was put the ball between the posts high in the air. So, Raffaele Marcello leading the race, the Acodis ASP Mercedes number 88, but with a big flurry into the pit lane that has juggled the order yet again. So we're now having that uh, full course yellow number seven of this race unless we've missed one out but uh, we think our list is a little ambitious that it seems to have 24 slots we don't think we're going to have a full course yellow every hour but also Mar Martin now we've got eight cars that have retired from the race there are fewer cars that nine cars retired from the race fewer cars out there fighting over the track but to put it around the other way we did start with a, a record field of 66 I starters think, it's I think been a busy piece of time Matt. missing Okay, so uh, from the top, 9, 10, 11, 12. Blimey. <laughs> that's, that's a tight grouping in, in a game of battleships, isn't it? We haven't crossed out 10. So 10 is a goner, Benny Lesen, uh, the last man to drive What's that. What's 10? Is it the aircraft carrier? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and ships terminology. and uh, the Herbert Motorsport Porsche is on the back of a flatbed because that's probably the only way it's going to move, I'm afraid. I think that will be a retirement. Okay, However, so I just want to put one thing into the mix there, Martin. Where that is, it's just before the bus stop corner. Yeah. There is an access road to the left, and if they don't think they want to put it there, it's not far to drag it into pit in. However, no. If you had cars suddenly scrabbling into the pits and you've got a flatbed taking it into the pits, it's a curving entrance yeah. and it's not a place that you really want to be having a car being moved very no. slowly. So I think that will go to the outside of the circuit at the bus stop. Right, so car number 10. So 9, 10, 11 and 12. That's some pretty intense grouping. They have all gone. Uh, then 26. Done that. We've crossed them out. 54. Done. 54. That was the dynamic motorsport Porsche with steering yep. damage after the, the contact. 63, the Albert Costa. 54, though, the car that led the race from the start. Yes. So it, it's an important car in this race. It was. 54, 63, the Emil Frey car. Uh, and then... Uh, 91, Alex 91. Malikin hit up the back uh, by the 777 Mercedes. Both of those cars out of the race. 97 out, have we got that? To complete, yeah, yep. no, that's there, and then triple seven. That's it. So that's it. So one, two, three, four in a row, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten out. So 66, I counted them out, and 56 still remain. But we are also going to have to count out 911, I think. I don't see realistically any way that's going to continue. Um, I would think that probably took as much of a hit as uh, the Audi of Cesar Gazzo. You know, it, it wasn't any slower when the Porsche went off than it was when the Audi went off. So I would think that is absolutely a, a hors de combat. If you've been away for a moment or been away for a while and you've come back looking at the screens, wherever you are in the world, whether it's morning, evening, middle of the day. I'm John it's... Watson. <laughs> <laughs> I just made a mistake. I am someone else completely different. Right. Full course yellow out on the circuit. That is because the number 911 Porsche, one of the two Herbert Motorsport Porsches, has hit the wall on the exit of Blanchemont on the left-hand side of the track. Hopefully that car will be removed to bus stop and beyond. So for the drivers, it's the seventh full course yellow period. Some of those have turned into safety car periods. In fact, uh, so far out of the six, no, no, five have. Five there, was, there, there was the fifth one okay. was no safety car Ooh. period. Well, if the if the Herbert Motorsport car is already on a truck, we might not go safety car this time. I think.
we, we, again, uh, and I always slightly regret trying to second guess race directors because they've actually they've got a lot more information than that what we see on the cameras. Yeah, what we have seen though is when when the race director has uh, worked out he is going to go from full course. Yeah, we now are going to safety car. Message yeah. just comes on the screen. They often get those course vehicles out, the, the tractors with the big brushes on them to try and clear some of the debris off the circuit. Not the debris necessarily from the point of impact, the debris, the tar debris on the outside of the circuit and the inevitable sort of um, swathes of gravel that are increasingly being put out on the circuit. So there's the safety car leading the field around. Who is it leading? It's leading the number 88, a CODIS, I keep wanting to say Acker ASP, but we know this yeah. year it's a CODIS ASP, Mercedes Raffaele Marcello, who's desperate to win this race. He's leading the race uh, from Richard Richard Leitz in the number 221 Porsche that's been such a strong feature in this race. And we know Kevin Esther is waiting to take that over from his Austrian teammate and is in the pit lane in the moment. Third place, Daniel Serra, the number 71 Iron Links racing Ferrari. Don't forget Iron Links came through to win this race on the final lap last year. Colin Edgar, Nicholas Nielsen and Alessandro Pierghini with the winning through that time around. But at the moment, it's the 71 car sitting in third place. And there is a sweeper just gone past us, uh, past the pit lane, past the uh, Formula One pit lane. So he will be heading down to La Source. And, and the race director, courtesy of, of the marshals post around the circuit, will have a bit of a shopping list building up. And when we go full course yellow and safety car, well, full course yellow particularly makes it safer for marshals to go out and do things like that. Behind the safety car though, you know, cars are going a lot quicker than they would be at 80 kilometers an hour um, under full course yellow. So you then have to be a little bit more cautious about what you're asking your marshals to do. And the advantage of the full course yellow, of course, is that it does freeze the race. Nobody gains, nobody loses hard one advantages. Um, but as soon as it goes to safety car, then there are the start to be winners and losers. One thing I'm thinking, yeah. Martin, OK, what have we got left in this race? We've got uh, 15 and a quarter hours. Give it a few more hours. If there's a big moment that's going to involve quite a long safety car period, that's when teams start to think brake change. Yeah. They've got to get one in at some point in this race. But at the moment, it's not likely this safety car period is going to be very long at all. Therefore, you'd be caught with your caught wanting and waiting if you were doing a brake change and of course if it went back to, to green suddenly you would be hemorrhaging the time that you spent well the first 15 hours building up can you do it under safety car good point better check the rules we do have the rules sent to us somewhere in the dim and very dim and distant recesses is something saying you're not allowed to start that under a safety car if you the have to be sure which championship out. you're talking about. Of course, uh, each yeah. championship has a different set of rules. Yeah. But I, I, I am thinking Spa 24, I think. I don't, I don't think N24. They, do, they, do they have mandatory brake change in N24? I can't remember. I can't remember. And it can't, it can't be in the first half of the race either, can it? Um, safety car is out. Rafael Marcello, the race leader in his Mercedes from Richard Leitz in the Porsche, the Ferrari of Daniel Serra in third. Nick Yellowly means four different marks in the top four because he's driving a BMW. Then the Porsche of Lawrence Vantor, the Ferrari of James Collado, the Mercedes of Maxi Buch, and the top Audi, still Patrick Niederhauser, but in eighth place ahead of Lucas Stoltz and the uh, remaining healthy Aston Martin of Marco Sorensen in 10th. Dan Harper 11th in a BMW. Rob Bell, the best of the McLaren's in 12th place ahead of Valentino Rossi and Matt Campbell. So let's hear from Danny Junkadella and see how things are going. Well, Danny, as you get ready for your stint, that 88 Mercedes right at the top of the pack of this uh, biggest GT3 class in the world. And when you look at your stint ahead, what are you preparing for? Well, I'm looking into uh, probably the longest stint of the of the race. I'm probably going to go in for a triple. Um, so yeah, I had a bit of a slip. I feel ready. I feel fresh. Uh, the first couple of hours I, I drove in the car, I just tried to save some energy. You know, it's a big race. It's a long race. And nothing what happens now is going to decide your 
a, like in a positive way. I don't think you can do anything that makes you win the race right now. You can only lose it. So it's all about saving that energy and getting all out for those last four or five hours. Can you talk about at this point you can only lose it when you look at redemption that you guys can have together as a team? How meaningful would that be? That would be special for sure. I mean, it's a, it's a race we've been wanting to win for many years. Uh, we stood on pole the last three years, well, con counting this one for sure, and um, we didn't seem to make it happen. But uh, I think this year it feels just somehow different. There is something that is clicking for, for now, at least. And uh, yeah, I'm quite quite excited for what's coming. We're looking at an onboard right now, and in that electronic monitoring thing, there is the ready. What does that mean? Yeah. I think it's just that the um, uh, monitoring system is ready, like it's working. Um, because actually, when you when you mentioned it, I wasn't entirely sure, but I think it's just that that it's working, and you can basically whatever it says, you can trust it. Okay, so maybe all systems a go, guys. All right. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Thank you indeed, Amanda. Yeah, we, we kind of, uh, actually the clue there was when it suddenly flashed from ready to safety car or for, in fact to full course yellow. So it is the, uh, the driver safety system and uh, yeah, the, uh, the current safety car for the Herbert Motorsport Porsche, Albert Renner having a very big off. Uh, after the exit of Blanchimont, excuse me. <coughs> choky, choky, coffee, coffee. Um, that, that is a distinct lack of uh, frites and mayonnaise, that's what that is. Nothing to do with the air conditioning or the lateness of the hour. So Albert Renner, uh, yeah, heading away on a flatbed. And the reason that we go, uh, to complete the thought earlier on, you can see some lights in the background, some uh, course vehicles doing some work. The reason that we go to safety car is to allow the cars to pick up the pace, which they can't do under full course yellow. And that is to allow them to build some heat and um, pressure back into the tires, particularly, and also get a little bit of heat into the brakes, but particularly the tires. And, and that's a real safety issue. Now, you could potentially look at doing that by increasing a full course yellow speed. So you could start at 80 kilometers an hour, and then perhaps once all the homework and tidying up had been done, you could then give the message to increase speed to the drivers to a second limit, say 110, 120, maybe 150 kilometers an hour, just so they can start to build speed. Because at 80 k's, 50 miles an hour, you can probably appreciate that the only thing that's gonna to happen to a racing tire even on the hottest day, is it's going to lose all its temperature and drop out of its operating window. So that's the reason for the preponderance of full course yellow to safety car changes. If you can't get things cleared up within four or five minutes, it is a guaranteed safety car. What it means for the race leader is that your hard one advantage disappears. What it means for the race fan is races tend to stretch out a little less. And because there is only one safety car, you don't get that sort of splitting of the field that multiple safety cars produce. And Bruce, it, it's less idea, ideal when you're leading or in, you know, having eased away from a rival in a tie battle. And somebody's got the, uh, the hardcore banging tunes going in the garage at KCMG. Well, they're pretty happy too because their car started Stone Lasters is in fifth position yeah. overall and they've got a, such a top crew in there. <laughs> so it's still absolutely banging away from the bottom yeah. pits, which no doubt KCMG are. They fact. definitely are. They're right across from the Safety stage. Car in this lap. We did, I, I did come across someone from KCMG who was in a bit of a panic because they'd forgotten to bring any English tea bags and he was thinking, you yes. know, a British team yeah. operating through the night without the proper tea bags. You can imagine <laughs> it, was, it wasn't ideal, but yeah. they're going well enough for them to forget well, the tea the, at the, the moment. British team, Hong Kong team, sort of depends on, on uh, your take on that, really. But yeah, KCMG. But with a lot of British operatives. Exactly, exactly. So safety car will come in this lap at the end of... And again, as ever, don't forget, you are not allowed to pass before the start-finish line. We don't go instantly green everywhere. Well, we do, but you're not allowed to overtake. So if you are in a battle, and as we saw before with Giacomo Alto, there is a uh, lapped car between you, which is not necessarily any slower, then that can be a real bind, and uh, that's...
how it worked out in the end for Daniel Serra. So safety car due to come in, and as it's about to get loud, let's rejoin Amanda in the pit lane. Well, if we go back to the beginning of the race, the 47 started 65th on this grid with Matt Housen, who overlooks for the team. How happy are you with how the car is performing? Yeah, I mean, really good. Uh, the, the first couple of stints by Nick Tandy was amazing. It really kind of got us in the mix uh, because we've had a lot of safety cars. Of course, the, the gap's closed every time we have a safety car. The team are doing a really good job with strategy, and that's the key to this race, you know, is really just playing the strategy every time there's a new safety car. So, so far, we're doing well. Uh, we're just trying to get to the midpoint of the race, the technical stop, and uh, we have good car speed. So we think it's between us and four other cars, and yeah, we, we, we're just going to keep pushing till the end. Thank you, Matt. Good luck. Thanks very much, Amanda Busick, down there with Matt House. And I mean, what a phenomenal achievement. You know, even if in a field as close as this, Martin and I have been talking about the fact you can get close, but these cars are balanced for performance, and Nick Tandy gaining 40 something positions to work his way up the order. But if they think. There they are running in fifth. They think it's between them and four other cars, presumably the four ahead, therefore, the Acodis 88 ASP Mercedes. That's uh, Richard Leet, Richard Leitz and the 221 uh, GPX Martini Racing Porsche. Daniel Serra, the 71 Iron Lynx Racing Ferrari. And Nick Yadoli, the number 98 Rover Racing BMW. And in fact, looking, to be honest, I don't think they can discount the other Iron Lynx Ferrari of uh, James Collado. That's just five seconds down. Behind Laurent Vantour, Laurent is the driver in the KCMG's Porsche. Green, but green. We are going green. The safety car period is over, and Alain Adam, the race director, say green, green. And that means Marcello is leading the trail of cars around. Richard Leitz was uh, just under two seconds behind last time around when the safety car was leading them around. This time it'll be rather less than that. 1.3 seconds is the gap between first and second. Up to La Source they go. Raffaele Marcello with that little advantage, just enough to turn in and turn out of the corner in the lead of the race, but uh, Richard Leeds in second place has now got company because uh, Daniel Serra, that bright yellow Ferrari, getting very close indeed. But uh, as we've seen many, many a time, the restart is a time when things can happen. But for race leader Raffaele Marcello, he's got that tiny advantage. And by the time he turned from Eau Rouge into Radion, he had clear space between him and uh, Richard Leeds' is, uh, two, number 221 Porsche. And up to the top of the hill to Le Combe, go clear gap between the race leader Marcello Waving the flag for Switzerland in behind Richard Leitz and Daniel Serra. Close company to each other. That's allowing the race leader to make good his escape. And Nick Yaloli not too far behind in fourth place overall. Again, this great spread of manufacturers. It's Mercedes leading from Porsche, from Ferrari, from BMW. Another Porsche, another Ferrari, another Mercedes. And the best of the Audis is really looking to be set square, set fair. It's Santelot Racing's number 25 entry, Patrick Niederhauser, just before the full course yellow led to safety car uh, period there. He was one of the quickest drivers on the track, so expect him to, to move beyond eighth place overall. But he's got a quick Mercedes behind him. That's Lucas Stoltz, the number two Mercedes uh, from uh, Get Speed Performance, AMG team. Get speed, number two car. Uh, that's just the tail end of the top ten, just ahead of the best of the Aston Martins, Marco Sorensen, car number 95 from Beach Dean AMG. That's completing the top ten, just ahead of Dan Harper's uh, number 50 Rover Racing BMW. Well, so far, the, the, the cars in the top sort of 15 or 20 have remained... Uh, this is, uh, again, curse the commentator, have remained relatively trouble-free, haven't they? It, it's sort of a little bit further down the order that we've seen a few more of the issues. Although, um, yeah, Albert Costa, I mean, that, again, that was a car that should have been in the top ten, or top six on speed, perhaps, but they'd already had a little bit of an issue. And, and it's just that sort of, when your luck's not in, your luck's not in thing. Um, and Albert Renard, that Herbert Motorsport car, they'd had a problem as well, and so... Yeah, they, they also succumb to, to further problems. And again, as we go green behind the safety car, everybody bunched together. There's the white 51 Ferrari, James Collado. He's in sixth position. Was that Maxi Book? No, yeah, 1.1 seconds. That was Maxi Book. There he is, 55. And Patrick, right behind. Patrick Niederhauser catching the pair of them in the, in yeah. the, the lead Audi, the number 25 car from Santelot Racing. Nose to tail around the top of the circuit. That, when I say the top, I mean La Source. You do go higher, that's when you got to Lecom. But as they go up towards Lecom, up the Kemmel Strait, it's Raffaele Marcello 
He's had a very good uh, first lap after the restart. He's gained a little bit more, just under three seconds clear of Richard Leeds, but Richard's got lots of pressure from behind from the Ferrari. Number 71 from Iron Licks Racing, but at this point, Martin is still that brilliant low shot from O'Rouge, looking at the cars flashing up. One of the world's greatest sections of time makes up to Radio into darkness. You go, there's lots of light as they come down past the concert, past yeah. the enormous new grandstand there at Radio. Then you go, oh, well, not so much between the trees. A lot of them have been cut down to make way for, for more things being put in well, place I, for the Grand Prix. Uh, east back, I think. And, and actually, it's quite evident this year, especially, that there is a, a little bit more room around the racetrack than there would have been in previous years. And actually, one of the advantages of, of clearing some of that forestry back will be in wet weather it allows a little bit more air you're not so you're not so much in a tunnel of trees that keep the spray hanging over the track there is room for it to dissipate all right over the crowd but you know at least it allows a little bit of, of a chance for things to clear a little earlier we're on board with Daniel Serra so he's just yeah. a second uh, under a second down on the GPX racing Porsche in the magnificent martini race but getting towards the end yeah. of the stint 50 minutes in all of them are the first three cars yep. came in uh, line astern but Nick Yanoli of course the BMW team did it differently yeah they they stopped Still haven't caught my finger on why they did sequence. that no I don't know either so Nick Yellowly in fourth place is only 20 minutes into his stint uh, and it's the same then for Dan Harper. Who else was... Um, yeah, Valentino Rossi is 20 minutes in as well. So they're a sort of half stint out of sync, if you like. Um, half an hour away from, from where everybody else is. But the top three uh, and most of the top 20 will all stop on the same lap. Yeah, um, it was an interesting thing. I still... I, I just wondered if Augusto Farfus was getting towards the end of what he wanted to do in the car, but, uh, you know, certainly there will be... Rover Racing haven't won so many races, both here and the Nürburgring 24 hours, with just going for random no, tactics. But it just seemed no. a weird one. The sister car from Dan, Dan Harper's car, down in 10th place, that, that, I think, was a more logical run for them. But suddenly, you're in the lead of the race. I, I wasn't really sure that that was the point at which to take a risk, just to keep things simple when you're leading. But then they run a racing team. I sit in a commentary booth. Marco Sorensen's just lost two places in about as many minutes. Dan Harper's now 10th, Rob Bell 11th. Marco Sorensen in the Dane Train Aston down to 12th place. The 95 car being run here by Beach Dean AMR. Uh, they have the car, 97, David Pittard, Charlie Fagg, uh, Tuemue, uh, Teomue and uh, Roman De Angelis. That one out very early on. In fact, did it make it through the first hour? Um, did it make it? Made it yeah, almost it to hour two, but uh, yeah. Uh, back on board with the silver car of Maxim Usten for Samantha Tan Racing again. Uh, this car has had the world's most trouble-free run. We mentioned the Samantha Tan Racing uh, quartet a couple of times. So, uh, and, and, unless you're talking about a tough battle, uh, it usually is not good when the commentators mention you. Great for your sponsors, not necessarily for your luck. Uh, because of the safety car, we have a number of very tight battles. Uh, the biggest gap in the top 15 is first to second. Raffaele Marcello is now 4.4 seconds ahead of Richard Leeds, who is seven tenths ahead of Daniel Serra, who's 4.3 ahead of Nick Yellowly. And then the battle, Patrick Niederhauser has dropped away from the James Collado Maxi Book battle because he's got Lucas Stoltz knocking at the back door trying to get by him. Five seconds behind them, Rob Bell is closing on Dan Harper and has not quite shaken off Marco Sorensen. So I'm not sure what happened to Sorensen in that Aston, but clearly just either got held up, went off wide a little or something, but it's cost him two places. And when you're only three laps out from a safety car, everybody's still behind you. It's not like there's any free, you know, any breathing space. You, you know, you, you make a mistake at, at that stage and you just hemorrhage time. And it's also that moment, if you're watching out around the back of the circuit, you do get a period of darkness when you've got all your cars covered, coming yeah. past you. How many cars have we still got? We've got more than... 55 Just now, 50, 54. Yeah, 54 cars out there. There will be a large, there'll be a minute or so where it's full darkness for a handful of laps, and of course the field will really, really string out. However, leading the race by 5.7 seconds, another good lap, gaining in 1.3 yeah. seconds over the chasing Richard Leeds. 
Well, that's an enormous mount in, in, in I mean, it's not over seven kilometers, but in, in this ca uh, category, in this company, that's an enormous amount for Raffaele Marchetta to pull away. It is, because I mean, that was a, well, it's only a tenth of a second down of that car's very best lap of the race, which is on lap 64, this is lap yeah. 209. But the important thing for Raffaele Marcello on the restart, he had about a, an advantage of about 1.3, 1.4 seconds when they crossed the start finish line once the safety car had withdrawn, but he had no one close enough to challenge, and then no. he really put the hammer down for the next two laps, and that's why the gap went suddenly vaulting upwards. 5.7 seconds now his margin over Richard. And again, to a, a little degree, I think we saw a, a, a touch with Daniel Serra early on um, before we went dark. When we went away from safety cars, the Ferrari suddenly just seemed to be so alive. But the Mercedes there, Raffaele Marcello, either he did a really good job of getting heat back into the tyres behind the safety car, or he was fearless on cold air tyres or he just had clear air and a bit between his teeth and he went, but he did go and he's, and he's still leaving them. Um, in fact, he is on a personal best lap now, not best sector time in sector two for anybody, but a personal best for that car. Right, one of the cars that would have been a favorite coming here is running in 15th position overall, in fact, listed as 19th position actually, uh, Dries van Tour, but that's the 32 Audi, the one that from the quartet of cars from Team WRT, you'd expect to be getting the results yeah. because he shares it with Charles Vietz, and they've had so much success together, and with Kelvin van der Linde, who doesn't need to be taught anything by anybody about yeah. how to drive an Audi, but they've had their problems early on, they had penalties, just a lack of position, but you know there is still time for this one to claw itself back into the mix. It's, is it just 18th a place down? overall, 15th place in pro? So yeah, and and that's the that's the killer, isn't it? They're a lap down, unless something very freaky happens. And and now all of their undoubted, hugely talented WRT brains trust will be looking for the the, the incremental gains, not in tiny margins. They need a big leap. They need a full course yellow, a short full course yellow to fall for them. They need to be almost a pit in when it comes. They need to be able to get in and get out before everybody else has had a chance. And at least part of their outlap is green and part of their inlap is green compared to rivals. So it, it, it is good. I mean, he's just picked up a place from uh, from Thomas his teammate. Neubauer. Thomas Neubauer let him pass. Of course, Thomas but, is running in the Silver Cup class, so he's 18. Yeah. His next target is a second up the track, and that's Patrick Kujula in the Mad Panda Motorsports, uh, the Mercedes, the, the white and black car with those fantastic That's not going to be an easy ring. pass, is it? I know, I know it's not class position, but it is an overall race position, so the Mad Panda car is not going to be an easy pass. So... Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing easy in this race at all. Whether you're watching it, trying to, trying to outthink your rivals at the front or the middle or the back of the field, and whichever class you're racing in, there is nothing easy about this race. Right, the pace that Marce Marcello is absolutely on it. Best part of seven seconds clear. He was faster by an entire 1.2 seconds than the chasing but dwindling Richard Leitz, and, and he's going even faster on this but lap. He's less than, a, he's a few thousandths down that car's very best lap. In the last two laps, last two laps, Raffaele Marcello has pulled out nearly five seconds on Richard Leitz, who, by the way, is neither rubbish nor has forgotten how to drive, and he's not blind at night either. That is an enormous amount of time, and it's not because he's had breaks in traffic. For Raffaele Marcello, there is no traffic. There won't be for about 10 minutes because everybody was bunched up behind the safety car. Cars are not liberally dotted around the track. They're all in the queue behind him. Did you say 6.9 seconds? Let's call it 8.6 seconds. What? Another 1.7 seconds what? gained. You could say, oh, yeah, Daniel Serra is all over the tail of Richard Leeds, but he's not. He's just under a second down. That's not that close in terms of, you know, Richard Leeds has got so much experience. You go, that's fine. If you're a third of a second down, I've got to really watch you. But I've got you under control. Uh, and that was the best lap for Marcello in his car. One minute, he did 2 minutes 18.6, 2 minutes 18.6, 2 minutes 18.4. I have just figured out, we've taken this on board several times down the hill from La Source, and about halfway down, it looks like a police car has just lit up behind you. It's the lights from the stage that are flashing. That's what it is. I've, I've been watching it for about an hour going, why does it look like there's a police car suddenly and then the lights go off on the police car? Obviously, after you've caxed yourself, but it's because he's going by the stage and that's the lights from the stage. Good call, Martin. Ah. Right.
Who's looking on? Danny Juncadella is looking on. We heard an interview with him. He was with uh, Amanda Busick. He will be taking over from Raffaele Marcello very soon indeed because they're nearly at an hour's yeah. point in these stints. They can go to a maximum of getting 65 minutes, an hour and five minutes. So, so they won't come in this lap. Laps, It'll be, suggest. yeah, maybe two. Maxi Books just lost, lost two places, dropped from seventh to ninth without coming into the pits. Uh, yeah, he, did a, two, uh, he did a lap that was pretty slow, two minutes 25. You should be below two minutes 20 if you're going to be yeah. quick. So he's gone off somewhere. Mm. Yeah, because the car behind him, Dan Harper, 221. Dan Harper gained four seconds on that lap on Maxi Boot, or rather, Maxi Boot lost four seconds to Dan Harper, lost three seconds to the two cars that were ahead of him, Patrick Niederhals, uh, that the are now ahead of him, Patrick Niederhals and Lucas Stotz. Um, also, Valentino Rossi got dive bombed by Matt Campbell somewhere on the lap. Um, possibly not a surprise that Pro Factory Porsche driver Matt Campbell uh, got the better of rookie Valentino Rossi in his fourth race, Valentino, fifth race. Uh, nobody, he's been doing... Still, still on the fingers of one hand. Oh, yeah, probably, no, 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 well, yeah, yeah. I think it might be his sixth. He's, I think we've sixth. had three sprint rounds, and this is, you know, the, the other, other rounds as well, the endurance yeah. round. But this is by far the biggest endurance round. But he has done some long-distance racing when he dipped his toe in the GT pond uh, at the end of the last couple of years. But Dries Van Tor still in 18th position. What's her his lap times? Pretty respectable. Two minutes, yeah. two minutes, 20 point six. But look, the gap between first and second is now 10 entire seconds. It's been a remarkable number of laps. Just super, super fast from Marcello. Dropping leads as if he's dropping an AM driver, which he isn't. Well, look back and listen to the car as we go down and plunge into Eau Rouge. and on the limiter and again halfway down the hill suddenly there was that flash of blue light from the stage those lasers the, the people in the garages or pot actually potentially in the in the suites above must be going okay would you please stop searing my retina with those flipping things uh, Patrick Niederhaus has just lost three spots Lucas Stoltz has gone by him Maxi Boot he's and made Dan a mistake Harper. his lap was two minutes 27 Previously, he's doing two minutes 21. So okay, so where are they slip. going off where they're losing four or five seconds? I'm just wondering if they found that patch of oil that Albert Costa reckoned he hit, because you can imagine trying to collect a moment just coming out of uh, Le Combe, but uh, they're all coming towards the end of their stint. A lot of the front-running cars have done more than an hour. They can go to an hour and five minutes. Change of lead in our... Silver class. No, it, that's the prime class, uh, prime and that's because class, Dean right? McDonald has just yeah. come into the pits He's in the 188 McLaren so, from Garage 59. So Nicky Lloyd Vila yeah. goes into the lead of the class in the number 24 Porsche. Yeah. And the uh, Constantini driven Ferrari still in third place. But yeah, that battle, um, Dean McDonald was not far ahead, but again, because the safety car of Nicky Lloyd Vila. Uh, so. Here's a question okay, for look you. Look at this. One car on its own. Who do you reckon that is? Well, could it be R. Marcello? I think, I think it might be. Race. It's like he's on a sprint on a circuit in the yeah. dark on his own. Yeah. Extraordinary. At certain points, halfway around the lap, there is area of, of immense darkness. But oh, the fact yeah. nobody else's lights are on him. In fact, that's him coming through the final corner, the bus yeah. stop. It's amazing how dark that is. A yeah. high shot looking down onto the track. But the fact of the matter is he's got up to last source. He's turning in. And only then are Richard Leitz and uh, Daniel Serra just turning out of the final part of the bus stop. That is a tidy advantage. If he keeps on doing it, he'll be out of their sight. So let's listen to Raffaele Marcello at full speed. So full darkness for Raffaele Marcello, but he wasn't 10 seconds clear. You could tell that he's gone even faster. 12 seconds to the good. Now, this is a potential race winning stint. It's yeah. coming to an end because next time around, he's going to be in to change over to Danny Juncker. Well, I'll tell done... you what, he's done. Leaks 60... is already in. That's why the gap's yeah, yeah. got so much bigger. 63 minutes and 10 seconds, and he's doing 2 minute 18, 2 minute 19 laps. That's going to be very, very close. Very, very close. That's going to be within seconds. I mean, and, and maybe single digits of well, seconds as yeah, well. Yeah, but if he, he misses out, Daniel Serra is going to be coming in behind him, and he has. He actually might be even tighter for Iron Links because yeah. he's uh, yeah. 12 seconds down on the track, and his stint is six seconds shorter. Imagine if we suddenly lost the top three because they didn't 
get their pit well, stops they, done. They Richard will, Leitz has done it. They'll get penalties for it. They will Raffaele get a Marcello, tiny penalty. Daniel right Serra, yeah. Nick Yelloli, the first three cars still well, on the track. Are still on the track. That's Don't forget, Yellily won't be coming in. Of course, because he they he's stopped halfway out in the stint. Sink. He's yeah. only 35 minutes in, you're quite right. Now, I wonder whether they did that because of their position in the pit lane and because of who else is around them. And they've had a couple of situations where they just go, we do not want to be stopping with all these guys at the same time. Right, looking down from Blanchimont, the headlights come through the corner. That's Raffaele Marcello. He's got a one hour and four minutes, 23 seconds on the clock. Okay. He's coming in. He'll he should do it. just squeak into the pit lane. He's turned through the first no, part of the bus stop. He's got 30 seconds to get to the stop line, so he's got plenty of time. But you're right about Daniel Serra, who is six, 12 seconds back. But has six has seconds in hand relative to... Marcello, because that was uh, when he started his stint just that little bit later, but it's going to be very tight. But uh, for Iron Links, they're very waiting tight. for their man to come in, but it really is going to be super tight. Yeah. Nick Yellily will assume the lead. Richard Leitz uh, has stopped and gone. Maxi, uh, Maxi Gertz now aboard the number two car. Right. Raffaele Marcello yeah. had 21 seconds in hand and... Daniel Serra, only 13 seconds yeah, in hand yeah, before we yeah. get a time penalty. But that's the way, to, you know, it's like every other element of this, you have to push it. End of a double for Daniel Serra, so he'll go off for four hours. So who takes over? It's Antonio Fuoco, I think. Uh, Lawrence Vantor is in as well. So Marcello, Serra and Vantor in the 47 car, they're all in. Nick Yellowly leads the race. James Collado, is he coming in? Yes, he is. Maxi Book is coming in. Dan Harper is coming in. Patrick Niederhauser will not. Marco Sorensen and Matt Campbell. No, Harper will stay out. Niederhauser uh, will come yeah, in. Sorensen that's right. will come in. So the two Rover Sorensen. racing BMWs are yeah. effectively running half a stint away from everybody uh, well, else. And, and that, again, is possibly why Rover have decided to do something different so they're not both stopping at the same time. Now, what it does mean is that the crew don't get an hour off, they only get half an hour off, half an hour off, half an hour no, no, off, no, half no, an no. hour off. But they are coming in two minutes apart. Oh, two One minutes apart. apart. The Rover Racing. Rover Racing, car number 98 in second place, Nick Yololi, still has effectively half its stint to do. Yeah. The sister car is, has probably an extra lap to oh, do sorry, beyond yes, that. So I'm, I'm, I haven't read Your lines correct. haven't yeah, quite line joined now, up no, across no, no. the screen. But anyhow, my, my what we have in the pits now. is Raffaele Marcello. He'll be out of the car, and Danny Juncadea, the Spanish driver, will be taking that over. We heard from him, but that was a super, super impressive. What was yeah. it? About 10 laps since the safety car came to an end, and yeah. every single one had that advantage stretching in the favour of the Acodis crew. But it was a big double stint, wasn't it? Because he piled all the pressure on from behind and was just relentless and got himself into that position where he could attack. And then when he had the lead and the safety car came in, whoa boy, he was all over it. So Danny Junkadea takes over. Nick Yellowly is the race leader. It was Antonio Fuoco getting into the 71 car. Lawrence Van Tor, James Collado, uh, just about to stop Collado on this lap and Maxi Book from sixth place on this lap. Dan Harper will stay out. Then Patrick Niederhauser and Marco Sorensen must also stop on this lap. And Matt Campbell will stay out, so he will vault up to effectively third behind Dan Harper. That's the way it works. Look, Collado's in now. Right, we've got an extra. Full close, 10 seconds. Oh, full oh. course yellow, oh, right, in the first part of the lap, full Turn course yellow, who's again. at the moment? Looks so like some lights are missing off the top. Full off. course yellow now. OK, that's a very quick flick to full yeah. course yellow, so that, hold on, I've got it right on the chart, that's full course. The Bentley is oh, stranded at the well. side of the circuit, the 107 in the hands of Antonin Borger, he had a problem with the car earlier, but... Uh, that's their race all over, isn't it? I mean, it's not all over, but that is their race all over. So that is down at Pifpaf, corner 12. Well, that's not down at quarter 12. That's not what the initial... No, it's coming out, it's coming out of last La source. It's halfway, well, two yeah. thirds of the way down to Eau Rouge. Yeah, so but it's... we've got yellow flags out at turn 12 and then go to full course yellow. So there is another issue. And yeah, we, know a, it's, a we knew path. it was in the first and the second of the sectors around the lap. Yeah. So someone else had a problem out at Fania. We'll try and pick yeah. up who that is. But that was the, the one at Fania, Pifpath, that was the one that actually uh, caused the full course yellow. 
um, and the Bentley is collateral. And I wonder whether the Bentley is actually collateral damage of, of everybody suddenly coming down to 80 Ks. Yeah, just trying to see who's falling down the order. Well, might have to wait a few more moments. Uh, to that's going to be tough to read because everybody's who's falling down the, the order. Because yes, half. The, now then, those who just had to stop under green, those who had who had one lap in hand, suddenly, oh, hello. So Marco Sorensen, Patrick Niederhauser, all those guys. Nick Nielsen, the 51 Ferrari, he's taken over from James Collado. They get half of their... That has just flipped the top 10. On, on, their, on, the, on their out lap, they'll be doing 80 Ks, but everybody else's full out lap will be at 80 Ks. So, and then, and then do they gain ground, Martin, think? Does that mean they'll be further up the safety car queue, you idiot? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Right, yes, it I just, does. Right, Ian McCarthy, long time member of the Twitter RT. First Point, time caller, long time listener. Exactly. The, the screen reading ready is a Lumirank device. It's yes. race controls linked to the driver, essentially showing flags and warnings. Yeah. So that's pretty much what Danny said. But Ian, thank you very much for mm. just clarifying that. Well, it, it, it's a, a similar system to the one that's used in WEC, but WEC does not have a sort of standby message on the screen. Right, oh, so this is Valentino Rossi, and this is a piff path. And unfortunately, that's the sound of the rear wheel spinning yeah. around in the gravel and gaining no traction right. whatsoever. So that's on the exit of Fania. Yeah. So that's, uh, it's not quite two thirds of the way around the lap, but it's getting towards it and you've gone through Puha and then you have the right and left hand and unfortunately between the pair of them, he is off at the side of the circuit. So falling out of the top, facing the wrong way, here comes yeah, the cars come through. So he's got it wrong on the right hander. Not a nice place to be at any time of day, but in no. cover of darkness, at least his headlights are on, they can see him there, but uh, under full course yellow, of course, they can't pass slowly at 80 kPa. So at least thank you for and, that. And this is frustrating for a motorcycle rider because you can pick your bike up. And turn it around. You, uh, you can, <laughs> yeah, you know, if you go off into a gravel track. I, I was sort of pondering earlier on when we were riding on board with him, some of the changes that were made here were to try and facilitate MotoGP coming here. They had a Spa 24-hour bike race a couple of months ago, which was a, a huge success. Uh, and and mm, I, it, it seems possibly as though MotoGP is now not actually going to come to Spa. But I did wonder if having driven it, Valentino might be going back to all his motorcycle racing mates going, man, you need to come to this place. I, yeah. well, it's I a totally need to different come to be this place in, in MotoGP. Yeah. Right, so, Anthony Borger in a Bentley. Yeah, that's... I've just seen a very, very funny tweet. It's not the first time I've seen funny tweets from uh, Nick Tandy. And there's, a, there's an image of a little graph on the, on the garage wall at KCMG, and it just has written in two words at the top, beast mode, and it shows their starting <laughs> position of about 60th, and you advance several hours, and he's up, in, up into the top five. Yeah. A very basic, rudimentary chart, but uh, yeah. you get the point. Excellent, excellent stuff. So rescue vehicles are down there for, well, that's a Blanchemont, so... Somebody else has stopped there. Let's get down to the pit lane, catch up with Amanda, who's with Raffaello Marcello. Well, Raffi, after those, uh, that safety car and the 10 minutes that you had before you came in for the driver change, talk to us about just having all of the circuit here at Spa with no traffic. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was nice. The car is, is doing well. We've not been super lucky with uh, full Corsello because it came out just uh, up after we pit, but I mean, it's still 14 hours to go, so there is a lot, a lot more action to come for sure. We talked to Danny before he got in the car, and he said that this year just feels a little different. Is it too early for you to say that? Different in which way? That it feels special. It feels like every year. Any information you transferred over to Danny as he got in the car for his stint? No, I mean, he drove already in the dark, let's say, so, you know, we know what to do, so it's okay. Enjoy your rest. Danny, throw her a freaking bone. <laughs> Don't just straight back back everything. How is it different? Well, it's the same as every year. I, okay. I, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is. OK, um, the doctor is pointing in the right direction. He's out of the gravel trap. So car number 46, the Audi, will be distributing. Now he's got it the right way around. He's going to be distributing gravel, unfortunately, onto the circuit. But he is back into the race. So we've still got uh, 14 uh, and a half hours remaining. There is time for a fight back. Don't forget, this is a car that got up into the top five on merit, chipping away 
Ooh. Now then, message on our screen. Car six. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Valentino came out at speed there and definitely did not immediately stop at 80 kilometers an hour. I think he had sort of missed that, that, that we're full course yellow. 16 hit the wall. Matthew Payne, the, the New Zealand racer. And at turn 17, which is... The most of the world. That, that's the one on the exit of um, Blanchimont. Yeah. OK, that ties up everything. Yeah, then. yeah. OK, okay. so, so uh, we will go safety car at the end. Uh, and I'm assuming it's when the leader comes by at the end of his... When he comes by for the second time, and, the, and that's when the safety car picks him up. Uh, what's on Valentino's dash? 81, is that a sector time? 81.20, 81.30. Um, so that uh, completes uh, that. Uh, Michelle Gatting brings the car in. There is a driver change, so that's Mikel getting out. I think it was Rahel Fry in before her. So that leaves Dorian uh, Pan, Dorian and Pan, or Sarah Bovey. Sarah Bovey didn't see the height of the driver getting in. That would have been a dead giveaway uh, because yes, Sarah if, it's Bovey, if it's tall, it's either Sarah, Bo Sarah Bovey or Michelle Gatti. If it's small, it's Rahel Frey or tiny. very small. It's Dorian Pan. Pan. Have you uh, seen some of the yeah. footage of uh, you know Michelle Gatti just roughhouses Dorian, picks her up like a rag doll, carries her around the garage, and puts her down again? <laughs> yeah, roughing up the uh, no the, dignity. The, the the youth opportunity kid, uh, Patrick Niederhauser in the pits. Dorian Pan has taken over the Iron Dames car, and the Doctor is in. Uh, not where he, actually how long had he done? Forty-four minutes. No, so he was halfway through the stint in that car not where he would wish to be, but he's undoing the belts. So it was his second stint after taking over from Nico Muller. Uh, so I mean, Fred Vervi should be uh, standing yeah, in the garage yeah, waiting yeah. to get in because the belts are coming off. Uh, yeah. Valentino Rossi getting out and there is Fred in the background saying, out you go, never mind about that. Yeah. But the car has dropped down to mid twenties now. Bear that, in mind, it was up to about 12th, unfortunate spin there. That Nürburgring 24 hour win, uh, Two years ago, three years ago, he also was on the podium in both WTCR races that weekend. So, yeah, he was he was batting a great average that weekend. Uh, a, a really big, big purple patch for Fred Vervish, who now takes over from Valentino Rossi. Two o'clock has come and gone. But let's wind it back to 4.45 in the afternoon and the starting of the Total Energy Spa 24 hours. Brilliant start from the outside the front row from Klaus Backler putting his dynamic motorsport Porsche into the lead of the race ahead of the pole starter, Raffaele Marcello. And everyone behind the next 60, the next 60 plus cars really neat and tidy around the opening lap. And some of the onboard footage, fantastic. Riding on board the GPX Racing Porsche with Michael Christensen, neat and tidy, but the front six cars were able to run line astern not trouble each other too much but in behind they were running two sometimes even three abreast around the opening lap of the race it was exciting and nobody seemed to make a mistake it was uh, really enthralling and the driver drivers putting on a great show for the people sitting high in the new rally on grandstand unfortunately not long after that nigel Bailly, his uh, the bentley was shoved around by kenny harbel the Bentley was dragged out of the gravel and Kenny Harbaugh was given a penalty for that contact. But uh, some of the race action, superb. The Iron Lynx Ferrari Martin constantly work its way a little further forward. And the Sky Tempesta Racing Mercedes seemed to be in the thick of the action wherever you look. But then we started to get a run of punctures. Sandy Mitchell, the Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini, the first to fall. And St Stephen Grove with oh, the first to fall off at uh, Blanchimont. He got back onto the circuit, but then the, the change of drivers and Lucas Stoltz fighting super, super hard down the hill they went and uh, fighting so hard with Cohn Ledegar, who'd taken over from Klaus Backler. But not only did uh, Backler lose. Blackler's replacement, Ledegar, so lose out in that, but Marcello worked his way through as well. Conditions. And then we had uh, Ross Cheever making the moves. And then uh, a moment for Cesar Gazzo. It was the final moment for the number 26, Santalot Racing Audi. And uh, that was into the wall on the outside, well, uh, between Blanchimont and the bus stop. But uh, the bus stop was a corner. It's the, the, the slowest point onto the circuit, on the circuit. A little bit of bodily contact. And then, unfortunately for Jens Liebhauser, he was shoved around by the 188 McLaren. Sky Tempesta in the action again. That was Jonathan Kui giving uh, Antares our spin around at the top of the hill at uh, La Source. And then again, the number 57 Mercedes again, Jens Lieberhauser 
uh, pitched into a spin. He must have thought the other drivers had it in for him, but he kept on going in the race. Uh, Isek uh, Tutumlu Lopez also going around and ending up into the gravel. The sun started to go a little lower in the sky, but it was a beautiful afternoon turning into an even more glorious evening. And all along, 71, Einlix racing Ferrari, Antonio Fuoco pushing ever further forward. Patrick Niederhauser showing his hand yet again in his attempt at racing Audi. And then, unfortunately for Alex Malikin, hit up the back by the number, well, the treble seven Mercedes. And that was the end of the race for the pair of them. So things just can go a little bit wrong. And uh, then Marcus Finkelhock showing he too could be robust as he was on the charge for Audi. Through the final corner of yet another lap. And unfortunately, a spin for the Sky Tempesta Racing Mercedes didn't delay them too much. At this point, the other Iron Lakes Ferrari, the white one, was the one that was really in the thick of the battle. The KCMG Porsche, have I mentioned that? It started stone last and was working its way ever further up the order. And it's not a repeat of a repeat. It's the Jens Lieberhauser again being shoved around at Le Com, and then unfortunately hitting some gravel down into Speaker's Corner. Around went Carrie Moget in the Busson Gignon Audi, but gravel on the circuit was becoming ever more of a problem. And uh, certainly someone else's little moment could become your very large moment. And again, rubber debris on the outside of the circuit. That's Chris Froggart getting it slightly wrong, but uh, recovering out of Radion, the Sky Tempesta crew. Iron Links fighting again and again. That source always a possible point of overtaking. Down the bottom of the circuit, the curve Paul Frere, a possible point to leave the circuit, which is what the Allied Racing Porter did. It did at least rejoin Martin. And Raffaello Marcello in the number 88 Mercedes working his way relentlessly through the field. A battle between Nick Nielsen and Dennis Olsen, two real young chargers, one in a Ferrari, one in a Porsche. In this instance, Nick Nielsen. First getting the advantage, Dennis Olsen running over the curbs. Uh, Marco Mapelli, the race leader, immediately picking up a puncture. Little luck going their way and heading slowly back to the pits within moments of taking the lead. A beautiful evening sky at the end of a beautiful Saturday, but trouble for Adam Atiki in the number 10, <coughs> excuse me, number 10 Audi. Struggling slowly back to the pit lane as night fell, came increasingly hard for the cameras to spot who had spun. Well, that was Sebastian Bow being spun around or spinning around in front of traffic at Lecom. Mm. Such a tricky corner, particularly when the, the visibility became harder and harder. Then it was the run to the pits. Iron Links, their yellow Ferrari, that's the number 71, was the pick of their pair at this point in the race. Always work its way towards the front of the field, but it was the Rover Racing BMW that uh, made its way to the front, but they were all running slightly different uh, sequences through the pits, and then we still haven't identified who went for the long run through the gravel, the whole way through the gravel bed. At Speaker's Corner, they somehow got away with it, but they didn't help the, the rivals because they covered the track with yet more of the gravel. And again, another safety car bunching the field up, releasing everybody into some frantic action. They say that heroes are made at night at Spa-Francorchamps, and Raffaello Marcello has certainly turned himself into one of those with an epic stint easing away from a second in front behind the safety car to a huge 12 second advantage then a big impact for the uh, bentley coming back uh, for the uh, a big part of the lamborghini albert costa uh, losing it out of piff path uh, a an incident he could not explain albert renauer losing it on the exit of blanchiment putting himself in the barriers another safety car incident there for those two and then going back to green flag racing and this is where marcello in the 88 mercedes checked out absolutely cleared off now while we were running through those highlights the race director has brought out the red flags cars have returned to the pit lane so the circuit has fallen quiet and we will now wait for hopefully the resumption of proceedings uh, a lot of work being done out and around the circuit as well we've already seen the sweeper trucks going past and uh, lots of track working vehicles out on the circuit so it is now 2 17 on sunday morning uh we're not halfway through the race yet 14 and a half hours to go and to bring you up to speed with what happened with that sudden flurry of pit stop just after all the front runners came in that has left danny Junkader, who took over 
from Raffaele Marcello. The car that had a 10, 12 second advantage, that is down in eighth place. The ones that didn't come in, and that means both of the Rover Racing BMWs that were sort of half a stint out of kilter with yep. the others are now sitting in the lead of the race. Nick Yololi in 98, and the sister car, number 50, with the Northern Irish racer, Dan Harper. They are first and second. It's landed in their lap. Plenty more distance to go, but we've got the red flag. They can be cool, calm, collected right now. Third position, Felipe Nazar. We've hardly mentioned the number 74 Porsche, and yet there it is. By dint of a flip around yeah. in terms of yeah. uh, when the pit stops came, when the safety car was out, and of course, safety car has just turned uh, into, uh, sorry, that period has now just turned straight into red flag. So well, that, and, and that 74, again, you know, you, you say this occasionally, when you don't mention a car, that's often a very good thing. Uh, it, it normally means they're not right in the battle for the lead, but it also means they're not falling off, getting hit, getting clattered. I mean, how many times have we seen Jens Lieberhauser? That car has been knocked off no fewer than three times three, in daylight. Three times caught by the camera. There could have been yeah. others beyond, but anyhow. Well, and, just, and, and every time at Lake Com somewhere. Yeah. So, now, bear in mind, um, the crew in the 74 EMA Motorsport uh, Porsche, Matt Campbell, Mathieu Jaminet, Philippe Nazar. What did they do earlier this year? They won the GTD class, the GTD Pro class in the Daytona 24. So they've got the 24 hour race win under their belts already. But what they were. <laughs> Again, talk about Twitter. A great little bit there. There was, a, there was a Twitter piece this afternoon talking about them and Felipe Nazar saying, yeah, it'd be really great to win here again. Uh, Lawrence Vantor bounced back with, <laughs> and, uh, with uh, uh, sort of a quote replying to that. And his, his message was three words, not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I just love, I love the way that they have that sort of respectful baiting of each other. There's so many of these guys just, I mean, they understand what it takes and how brutally difficult it is to win. And yet there's, you know, a, a, another, another thing that, you know, respect among drivers that, that you get at, at this level because they have to part their egos at the door. And, and yeah, I just love all that. It, it's it's so, so much an indication of, of how human these people are. No, totally. And they, they deliver their human, uh, their humor in different ways. You look at Raffaele Marcello, he's almost like a statue when he's interviewed, but there's yeah. a little movement of an eyebrow and you know the humor's <laughs> there. But then you follow his Twitter feed and he's seriously funny. But I honestly think that Laurent Van Torre is the funniest of the lot. He's a master of finding the right meme for the right moment. And, and that's and it's a great indication. I always say the ultimate indication of how good somebody speaks a foreign language is when they can tell jokes or when they can be sarcastic. And boy, he doesn't half speak English well. I mean, as you expect from anybody from the low countries, it's almost all, almost inevitable that you will find better English speakers in, in Belgium and Netherlands than, than in much of England, so uh, in, in much of the rest of the world. So. Well, but also bear in mind, you know, See, Lawrence spent a few seasons over in the States and he certainly yeah. honed his uh, humour and craft over there. But um, yeah, very funny when Raffaele Marcello was taking the mickey out of the, the Van Tor brothers for their clash in the Nürburgring 24 hours, which, <laughs> to which Laurent had to put his hand up. And uh, yeah. a very quick riposte was, um, we have 11 24-hour victories in our family. How's yours going? <laughs> <laughs> It's sort of just immediately yeah, backed yeah, back. Yes, exactly right. And take that. Well, there's Valentino Rossi. Uh, it's actually, no, we saw Valentino no, get out. Fred Vavich on board now. Yeah, so Fred is in. Yeah, so I think he had just left the pits at that stage. Uh, Park Ferme will be open in 15 minutes, it is estimated. So at the moment, uh, under red flag rules, uh, this isn't a Formula One free for all where you can basically uh, put an entire new car out. Um, yeah, you're not allowed to work on the cars. Um, although there does appear to be uh, the sound of air hammers. It really shouldn't be because Park Ferme um, is meant to mean that you don't do anything to the cars. You can have a very good eyeball. The Mark One human eyeball scroot at this stage can save you several minutes if there is work to be done. Um, and they will get time, I think, to re-prepare before they head back out. So um, the list of, uh, and, and potentially actually in a couple of places, some barrier pairs. I mean, you think where those, the two cars um, hit on the exit of Blanchiment on the driver's left, both were in the dark. I know one was in the daylight, but the second one was in the dark, the, the, the Herbert Motorsport Porsche. So 
were I the race director, I would want to have somebody go over and cast an eye on that and just, say, just absolutely reassure me that the integrity of the barrier hasn't been uh, compromised in any way, shape or form. And you can see, you know, the flatbed has brought back... Uh, oh, that's probably the car, the, no, not the Herbert car, uh, who else? Antonin Borger in the Bentley, that pulled off, remember, on the exit on the run down ah, to Eau yes, Rouge, it yes, could have yes, been that yes, one. Yes, 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 could well have been. But you're, you're quite right, at this moment, I mean, the pits look fantastically colourful, the cars are all parked in their sort of echelon formation, and the lights really strong down from the gantries. It is that chance to do the visual check around, it, or around your cars, can't yeah. have too many yeah. people working on it. Really. Now, Antonin Borger... I think we are going to have to cross off the 63 Bentley as well. So I shall wield the Sharpie of indeterminate fate over 63. Oh, we've done that already. Let's get down to the pit lane and uh, catch up with Enzo Caldarelli. Back on the lead lap, Andrea Caldarelli comes into the pits on this red flag 16th and... Uh, when you think of these red flag situations, how do you maintain the energy to get back in that car? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I hope everyone is, is safe. I saw it was a, was a big crash. Um, we're just back in the pit. I was having fun, actually. Uh, made quite uh, good progress from, uh, I think we pit on, uh, I think we were like P30, P26, 27. And uh, the important thing is we are back on the lead lap. So how I maintain concentration and motivation? Well, that's uh, first step was uh, take back the lead lap. And now it's, uh, it's time to, to start to push again and try to, to get some position back. Uh, we had two puncture already. So we, I think we just uh, need to be careful. We, uh, we adjust tire pressure and we, we try to push uh, a little bit less, compromise bit the performance, but uh, important that we don't have any more puncture. We have heard that everyone is okay from that wreck. And just when you digest this race, do you break it down in phases for yourself? How do you how do you assess the full 24 hours? Yeah, definitely. It's uh, I try to every time I, I go out from the car, just uh, go back at the motorhome, just have a shower, uh, watch something watch the phone a little bit, some movies, play something and uh, and go back in after like uh, three, four hours. So I try uh, really to think as small races, otherwise <laughs> your brain is completely gone. Thank you, Andrea. And to a degree, that, that's what it is. I mean, drivers will often say that they have to talk to the team or to their teammates, aren't they, Dorian Pain, afterwards to find out what happened. Because you only ever know really what happens to the car when you're in it apart from maybe the final half hour when everybody's watching and and a lot of the time you won't know what happened when your teammate was in the car sometimes you might be further up than you expect oftentimes you'll be further back than you expect but you don't have time to well what happened there you just get in and and do your bit yeah and it's um, there's a lot goes missing in, but it's a need-to-know basis. The team yeah. will tell you what you need to know. The small details that haven't affected anything, they don't need to clutter you with it. But then some drivers insist on knowing everything they possibly can, and others are quite happy to be told what they need to know. Right, Rover Racing BMW is a 1-2. I'm going to issue a formal apology to Kiran Hurt, who is the strategist. Uh, I suggest it, it was Lisa Crampton who said it. Uh, that apparently caused great hilarity. I, 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 I don't know that Lisa Crampton is incapable of a strategy. I, I think that's, I think she's entirely capable. She's a, 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 a very good team boss and uh, a very good race director as well, but it is not her that does the strategy. Uh, Although I'd love, uh, I'd like to think that she'd probably love to claim that right now as they are lying one, two uh, with, we are, are getting ready to go back. So uh, 2035, so maybe about another seven or eight minutes before Park Ferme is opened. And then we start a countdown uh, to getting cars back out tra on track and, and heading back to racing. And the good news is, that the car on the exit of Blanchiment, Matt Payne, in the number 16 car, uh, is OK. So there were uh, medical crews there with him. And uh, he goes off on the outside. At the top of the there. shot, oh, yeah. he's lost it yeah. relatively early or run wide. He should have been turning to the left and the car quite possibly just ran yeah. slightly wider, maybe onto the marbles on the outside, and then you simply are a passenger. And you just saw in that shot, closer to the camera on the right-hand side, the moment the car is going off, the marshal's post there is immediately alert. Now, you know, it's 
ungodly cold. It's 0200 in there. It's two in the morning. They've had a long week, possibly a long week and a half, because I think most of them were here for the British GT weekend at the beginning of Speed Week last week. And it's the middle of the night. It's the wee small hours. And yet, they know that when they are on duty, when they are on post, somebody's life m literally might depend on how fast they react. And so, again, huge kudos to all these guys, all the boys and girls in orange, in white, who are helping to keep the race alive. Now, I said those blue lights were all the lasers from the stage, which is out of shot on the right-hand side. But there is a string of blue lights there by the bridge stanchion as well. What so I noticed, Martin, when you talked about that, that you, you had two flashes of light. The first, yeah. I presume, would be the blue lights that we can see on the, the, the edge of the pit wall. And the brighter light was the second one, which yeah. is coming across yeah. from the concert. I think the concert well, that's would have now, come to well, an It has now stopped because all the lasers and everything on the stage have stopped and, and the, uh, the, uh, the interval, area Martin. in front of the stage. <laughs> Yes, they've all gone out for a, a tub, um, a little ice cream and, a, and a, a cigarette round the back. So plenty uh, of activity in the pit lane. Every team ready, you know, get, making sure they're going to be super ah, ready. Because for when Park Ferme has been open. Just now. So, yeah, yeah. So they are now allowed to work on the cars. And from this, we start then to uh, back time from restarting the race. So the cars will be allowed to be worked on. Then the pit lane will be opened. Um, Rescue vehicles are being repositioned and track workers will be still working. Let's get back down to the pit lane and hear from Amanda's latest victim. Well, here at almost 2.30 in the morning local time, Mick Renouet just said good morning to all of us. And how hard is this part of it? You're out of the car, you know you gotta get back in. Where's your energy at right now? First of all, I just hope that uh, the guy involved in the crash is fine. I heard, I think he, he's okay. Uh, I mean, it's not too difficult to stay focused uh, as part of the job. Uh, good thing his car is in one piece, we're in the top five, so still a long way to go, but it's going well. How's the Mercedes been for you so far? Where do you think that it really performs where hit here at Spa? Uh, we are very good in clean air, uh, and traffic is a bit more difficult as we miss a little bit stop speed. But I still think we have one of the fastest car uh, overall over one lap and uh, very reliable. So, yeah, hopefully it stays like that till the end and we can fight for the win. Good luck. Thank you. Well, that's an interesting comment, isn't it? You know, we've got a very quick car in clean air, but it's not so much in traffic. And that kind of plays out with what we saw from the 88 car as well. In the queue, hard work to get by get in front by by now checking out so there's something about that turbulent airflow that the car's not quite as happy with as nice fresh clear air yeah both of those cars the 55 group m racing entry that michael grenier will be getting back into and uh, of course the number 88 a codis asp car that Raffaele Marcello put such a masterclass on but again both mm. achieving that once they've got to the front and I wonder whether it's a temperature issue or whether it's an aerodynamic issue or possibly even a, a combination of the two but you know either is just as likely now everybody is suddenly now rushing to get back into the car so Alex McDowell getting himself helmeted up uh, there I'm assuming you're allowed to do driver changes um, I'm afraid my tired eyes aren't, I'm, I'm not even going to look at the regs because it's white on black on my computer and it's just too hard. I, I'm, uh, I'm assuming you can in Park Ferme, but there you go, a little bit of uh, housekeeping work going on on some of the cars as well as around the circuit. Guys, if you've got a lime green car, don't use black gaffer, just, uh, you just buy green gaffer. I mean, that's all I'm saying, just buy green gaffer. Cars, you know, further down the order that you'd expect, the 563 Lamborghini, that hasn't had such a bad run. Michele Barreto's at the wheel, just in the top 20, the top 30, so the but, top half of the race, but the body repairs. Well, look at the yawning gap thing. where there isn't a wing. 
that there, there's mm. there's that huge i mean you can see that the 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 ties there that are the the braces that are holding the front end together because there should be some bodywork there that is quite hard actually because that tape is going to become incredibly flexible under speed under braking and turbulence say, and i'm afraid that's probably going to pop out again fairly soon there's nothing to attach it to. i i wouldn't trust that little amount of gaffer to keep the bonnet down on my morris minor never mind to hold the front of a lamborghini together at 165 miles an hour that's not going to last two laps. It, it'll still be there at the end of the race now that I've said that, obviously. But well, at least you fixed the problem for them. I suppose that's very kind. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, 52 Ferrari there. You can see the 51 Ferrari right beside it. The white uh, Iron Lynx car. Nick Nielsen will take a... So, now, Nick Nielsen has shown in that car. Had he just taken that over at the pit stop? I think he might have done. Um, we just heard from... Uh, Matt Grenier, didn't we? Uh, the 55 car, uh, Mike, uh, Mikael Grenier, that he shares with uh, Mario Engel and Maxi Book. I thought Maxi Book was in that car when we went to it, but then, anyway, there we go. Uh, JB Simonau in in a uh, Jean Baptiste Simonau. I've, I've seen racing in Porsche Mobile One Super Cup very effectively last year, and has now sort of become a bit of a, an, an Audi convert. So. That'd be an, an interesting conversation to have because that, that that you would think would be a very very different handling uh, piece of kit to a, a 911. But they do say if you can race a Porsche, you can pretty much race anything. Again, you know, one of the young guns, a 21-year-old. I mean, mm. the face of GT racing is so so different to, to, to what it was 10 years ago and we mentioned earlier in the race we've got teenagers in this we had lorenzo Petrezzi at 60, 16 yes i'm not just uh, reading across the screen inaccurately 17 year olds yeah, 18 job. year olds that's <laughs> your don't, job don't tread on my toes <laughs> it's the way you stand yeah yeah and you know and, and there are and, and you're absolutely right and and the reason that's possible is that it, it's it's multiple but the increasing and enormous cost of paying for a single seater career is out of almost everybody's reach and secondly the wealth of opportunity to go gt racing that that has happened because of the success of gt3 it's a it's it's a virtuous circle the more gt3 cars are raced the more second-hand cars are available as teams convert to another brand new car and can afford to because their car still has a market value and that trickle down effect it just allows more and more cars and more and more teams to start out and the more that do the more seats are available and the more young drivers come into it and you get a dad like Jean-Marc Gounon who knows that he's never going to be able to afford to put his son into any kind of top flight single seaters gets him into one year of Formula Renault Euro Cup to give him a bit of close racing experience and then right into a GT car go and earn your key and hasn't and, he hasn't he had and hasn't fantastic. he ever but you know had he not won the spa 24 hours on the, on his first attempt or whatever else that was always the career plan you can earn a living as a GT racer you cannot earn a living as a single seater racer the hole is so big that no amount of money can fill it Ask Lawrence yeah. Stroll. You, you just cannot fill the hole that that single seater is with money. Um, whereas, if you become a sports car racer, either in prototypes or in GTs, then you can earn a living, and you can earn a living from your teens to your fifties. Yeah, and in fact, you could you could expand the network there. A lot of drivers are coming into GT4. A lot a lot of the the gentleman drivers yeah, are yeah, in GT4. Yeah. That's where you get the pro am. Uh, lineups and therefore quite possibly the GT the the am the gentleman wants to step up to GT3 yeah. and it's rude not to go with them and well, that, 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 that is why yeah. it's expanding all the time Lord, the GT4 teams yeah. are stepping up to GT3 and so on and so forth and that's how you bait the hook isn't it you know it's even more affordable less extreme more driver friendly for for newer drivers not necessarily younger but newer drivers and so you get them involved and then the ambition is to step up and and whether it's in uh, sro racing or whether it's in aco racing or whether it's an imsa racing you know you start at the ground floor with an inexperienced team an inexperienced driver lineup or both and you know every, it, it breeds ambition because you then look at people that 
move up from the category you're racing in and go, well, what makes them so much better than us? And the answer is often not much in our opinion. And so there the ambition is sown to, to move up. And so, yeah, it, it's, it, it means that there is a burgeoning and, and, and has been for, this is the better part of 20 years now that this has been growing and growing and growing. And We've gone past half two in the morning, but let's go back to 4.45 in the afternoon. Raffaele Marcello didn't make the best of starts from pole position, or maybe I can redress it the other way. So Klaus Backler made a fantastic start from the outside of the front row in the Dynamic Motorsport Porsche, taking the lead from the Acodis ASP Mercedes into Eau Rouge, up the crest, over the hill at Radion, and everyone behind behaving very, very well indeed. Michael Christensen started in sixth place and was sixth place into the first corner. That was neat and tidy, but behind, the racing was two and even three abreast, but the track condition party were absolutely perfect, and maybe that had a helping hand as well. Certainly doesn't hurt, does it? You know, fabulous circuit like this, a hugely competitive field, and actually, despite everybody expecting safety cars in the first couple of minutes, the first couple of hours were safety car free. First car in trouble, the 107 Bentley got tagged into a spin. 71 yellow iron links Ferrari in the thick of the action and on the receiving end of an awful lot of attention were about half the field. First of a slew of punctures was for Sandy Mitchell in the Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini. That continued, as did Stephen Groves Porsche after a huge high speed off at Blanchimont that probably gained his attention. Coming down the hill past the, the pits, Luca Stoltz put Colm Ledegar's Porsche onto the grass. That was the car that led the early stages race in Klaus Backler's hand, but the second stint not so good. Raffaele Marcello also moving past, moving back up into second place. And still the action went on uh, for the Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes. This time it was Ross Cheever diving through. Then Cesar Gazzo got it wrong just by a small amount, but the outcome was large and it was an exit to the race for the number 26. Santa Lot racing Audi, spreading debris everywhere on the exit of Blanchimont. Yeah, that was the first time of the race and also the first safety car. And as they went back to green flag racing, the first of, well, interminable number of incidents at the top of the hill for Jens Lieberhauser, nudged off. And then behind the safety car, the Sky Mercedes clattering into a Porsche rival. Naughty, naughty. Back to green flag racing and the same again for Jens Lieberhauser, this time a little earlier in Lecom, getting tagged into a spin. The, uh, Incident there with Ant uh, uh, Alberto Al, Arturo Al rather, a four-car pileup brought out another safety car. And again, as the late afternoon shadows lengthened, back to green flag racing, Antonio Fuoco with a bit between his teeth, making an aggressive move down the inside. And then this huge Porsche, Ferrari and Audi battle in the top half dozen. A double retirement here with uh, Al Faisal Al Zubir running into the back of the 91 Porsche, damaging both his car and the Porsche so much that they were both out on the spot. Marcus Winkelhock uh, using his shoulders to get his Audi working its way up through the pack, but it wasn't the first half of the race uh, looking really that good for Audi at all. Or at certain stages for Sky Tempesta Racing, but they kept refocusing and repointing their Mercedes in the right direction. The battling continued between the safety car periods, but uh, generally fairly clear. But again, number 57 spun around for the third time in a double stint. He must have thought, what's happening to me? None of them were his fault, which is the most extraordinary thing. And then, unfortunately for Carrie Moshe, he found a, a fresh batch of gravel on the downhill approach to Speaker's Corner, now called actually Jackie Hicks Curve, and round he went in the Boussaint Genion. Uh, Audi did continue in the race, and did Chris Froggard after that uh, big off-track moment at Radion, right in front of the big new grandstand. Again, attacking action from the 71 Iron Lynx Ferrari. And a, uh, a very wide run out from the uh, Porsche, returning from somewhere in the Low Countries back to the Spa tarmac as the number 88 Mercedes started to work its way right through to the very pointy end in the field. Two young chargers, Nick Nielsen and Dennis Olsen. Olsen in the Porsche, Nielsen in the Ferrari. Who gave an inch? Well, neither of them did, actually. But Nielsen had the slightly better run down the hill and managed to squeeze in front. Having just taken the lead, Marco Mappelli lost the lead as the car picked up a puncture. 
You can't write this stuff. That was the KPX Racing Lamborghini. He already had its travails when its uh, pole time was taken away. It had to start furtive, but it wasn't the only car working its way up through the field. Of course, we just mentioned the KCMG Porsche. And then more problems for the Boots and Gini on our, our Audi team. And this was Adam Itecki's turn to have a moment that caused the car to slow to the edge of the circuit. Sebastian Bow span in the dark, had a spin in the dark right where you're blind around the corner at the top of the hill at Lake Con. But then it was time for more pit stops. And it really was uh, very tidy in the pits, it must be said. But the partying happening up on the roof, <laughs> those lucky people with a, a drink in hand and a brilliant view over one of the best circuits in the world. And racing continued into and past the midnight hour. The first tranche of points awarded after six hours. And uh, there was a degree of out fumbling there that uh, caught a number of teams by surprise. Uh, the, the pit stops didn't quite fall the way that everybody had hoped. Uh, little action, rubbing is racing, and again, the Sky Tempo, uh, uh, the Sky Car <laughs> Mercedes, right in the thick of the action with uh, Benji Goethe's uh, Rothko Audi and battling for supremacy in the dark. Change for second position. Well, it was the first time, that really, that we'd had the 71 car going backwards down the order, and then a spin, a rotation, clattering the barriers. That's Albert Costa on his outlap, believe it or not, in the 63 yeah. Lamborghini, and that eventually had to retire from the race. He still is at a loss as to why the car went round on the exit of Lake Comp. He thought the corner was behind him. And then a series of incidents up at the top of the hill. Alfred Renner losing control of the Herbert Motorsport Porsche. And that hit the wall heavily, bringing out a safety car. Again, we're back to green flag racing. And this time, the 88 Mercedes uh, out front and disappearing. Then, uh, a, again, a little group of incidents, not the least of which was this crash for Matt Payne, which will have put the car out of action. That brought out the red flag. Uh, the Bentley also stopped to the side of the track. And do we think the Bentley has continued? Has it made it back round? It's sure. uh, not Borger, made it back. Well, well, Antonin Borg has shown as not retired. Right, so what have we got? What are we looking at now? We've got uh, cars lined up on the grid. That's opposite the Formula One pit lane. Yes. And uh, being They're pushed Right outside position. our window, Bruce. In fact, if you look around the big screen, um, they are right outside the window. So there are a couple of gaps because they are going to be positioned two by two in the in the race order in which they were when the red flag was thrown. Right, and if you're a BMW fan, that's very good news indeed because the 98 car from Rover Racing, Nick Yololi at the wheel, is on the front position. That well, was first at the time of the red flag. Two, the sister four, car, number six, 50, Dan eight. Harper, is going to be second on the restart order. Then comes Nicholas Nielsen in the 51 Iron Lynx Ferrari and Mikio Grenier, the 55 Mercedes. First seven rows are in the right positions, but behind there, uh, well, that's one of the ART, uh, WRT Aldis being repositioned. Behind there, it's all gone a bit not according to, to plan. So uh, that will take a while because you don't want to restart people in the wrong order and then have to start trying to do little wave buys behind the safety car, car by car. Uh, U94, give a place to 16. U16, take a place, of, uh, uh, you know, better to do it station with the marshals on the grid than to try and do it behind the safety right, car. Right, what, what I'm thinking, Martin, it looks like we've got 13 cars on the lead lap with Rob Bell in the number 38, Jota McLaren at the back of that grouping. And okay. it looks like the first, uh, the first car that has been lapped is the number 14, uh, entry, Emil Fry Racing, Lamborghini, Stuart White, Thomas Tuchel, who's at the wheel, and Consta Lapalainen. But just wait to clarify that. Mm. But importantly, from my point of view, it's the fact that the car that was desperate to stay on the lead lap, well, they all are, of course, the number 32 Audi, the favourite from the Audi cam from Team WRT, Dries Van Tour, looks as though yeah. that is the wrong side of that margin. Really unfortunate for them. They've had all sorts of setbacks, but that whole element about staying on the lead lap is such an important element in endurance racing. But we still have 14 hours to go. So there is that. There is that. I, I mean, it's... It, whenever you have a problem five in a race, five this can be... Five minutes to restart. Yeah. OK, five so... Five minutes until the restart. Alan, Alan Adam is confident that in five minutes they can get all the cars in the correct position or enough of the cor correct cars in the correct position. Uh, but there you can see how many rows we've got. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight rows. So that's 15 cars currently 
of 50 in the right position. Now, behind, there may be more cars in the right position, but there may also be more cars in the wrong position. So Porsche being moved back one would be... Well, we can see the number 32 Audi. That's, oh, no, sorry, there's a 30 Audi sitting sitting down there. That's in 19th position yeah. overall. That's about right as to where it should be on the grid. And the Porsche, I think, is the top sport car. Number 100, which is 18th. OK, that's starting to make some sense. Yeah. <laughs> see the number on the door scrolling as it, its rate of flicker and the rate of flicker of the camera lens aren't quite synced in the same way that stagecoach wheels go backwards in movies. They're not actually going backwards, of course. It's just a, a trick of the way the lights work. But front row of our grid, and, and they, I'm assuming then, will restart two by two by two by two as a... Well, they can't, can they? Because that, that's not how you run a safety car. The safety car will be in single file, you would think. Well, let's wait and see. So we've got the red flag that's been out for some while. And on the lap that happened, we had Antonin Borger pulling off in the 107 Bentley. That was the first one we saw yes. on the run down to Eau Rouge. We then had Valentino Rossi in the gravel at uh, Fania, halfway around the lap. And yeah, then that, Matt that had Payne, happened before, the 19-year-old Kiwi, yeah. Yeah, yeah. at uh, the outside of the circuit at Blanchimont. Yeah. And that was... Uh, that was and, the old and, EBM Giga Racing Porsche. Yeah. Five minutes to restart. There's the confirmation from race control. So for BMW, looking very good. 98 and 50, the first two cars in the race. The only two cars in the Rover Racing Camp. So they're doing pretty well. Their batting average is very strong indeed. Right. Just past the 14 hours to go mark. So in two hours at 4.45, 12 hours into the race. We get another tranche more of points. points. So it's basically a double stint to try, or two stints, to try and stay in the lead for the 98 Rover Racing BMW and to keep the 50 car in second place as well. Right, shall I explain how the points are allocated? Go. 12 points for first place at the second six hour interval. Nine points for second, seven points for third, six, five, four, three, two, one. It's not first through to 10th, it's first through for ninth that gets points. And then at the end of the race, after 24 hours, the top 10 get points, 25, 18, 15, 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, 1, that far more yeah, regular so, scoring system. So there's half of a normal race points at 6 hours, half of a normal race points at 12 hours, and normal race points again at 24 hours. And that'll be for the top 10 overall, which will likely be all... Mm, likely be all pro class but also uh similarly in each of the other categories okay but let's go gold through cup, silver yeah. cup pro-am and, and yada yada so let's go through the other categories we've got a gold cup car in seventh yes. overall that's up that's bucking all the trains the Hout racing team it's Yanis Fitcher at the wheel he's showing that with Swiss racer Alain Vallant Frank Bird British racer and Jordan Love from Australia the next class leader is in Dorian Pain Sorry, Arjun Maini in the... No, that's also in the Gold Cup class, just double-checking. Double yeah, that's no, number he's, five. Uh, they, yeah, car number five. They are the Gold Cup leader, aren't they, from the Iron Dames and... Yeah, sorry, Yanis yeah. Fitcher is in the Silver Cup class. It's, my eye's getting tired looking at the screen. Yeah. Pro-Am is easy to pick out. That's bright blue on the screen. That's Nikki Lloyd Villa, car number 24. And for Herbeth Motorsport, that came here with three cars, two of them already out of the race, the 911 and... Uh, the number nine car uh, out of the race. So, um, you know, for them, <laughs> things are tricky, but at least Nicky Lloyd Vila leading that class. So Look well at that to them. long shot there. All heroes do not wear necessarily capes. Some of them wear bright orange. Um, and hopefully they will all remain dry all weekend. Uh, quite hot and sticky, though, in, in all their protective gear. But You talked about the temperature. It's still 18 degrees, which is isn't really? too bad doesn't, doesn't for feel getting on for three warm. in the morning. Didn't feel that warm uh, when we were outside before we came on air at 11. So, But uh, for the marshals, they're all wrapped up in their safety protective gear. It was a bit of a breeze. But it's only two, one, two, two metres per second, but I yeah. guess, you know... <laughs> When you've got that the gear, is. you wear it. You just don't want your body temperature yeah. to drop, do you? Well, and the other thing, it is, it, it, it is protective gear for them as well. So um, not just waterproofs, but, yeah, you know, to, to, to help them and also highly visible. Um, that's a strange noise. It is. I think it's the drummers from the front of the grid. One of them <laughs> is still playing somewhere around the environ of the circuit. So the onboard view from our race leader... 
So this is the 98 Rover Racing BMW of Nick Yellowly. At least we're assuming it's a hello, everybody. And thank you very much indeed. I know they're not listening to us. Are they? If they were listening, they'd be listening to our French colleagues or our Belgian colleagues. Uh, or hearing on the tannoy, but to everybody here at Spa and everywhere else around the world that volunteers to make motor racing happen as a marshal, thank you. Um, lots of people have really depended on marshals to help them out of sticky situations that they have involuntarily got themselves into, and uh, millions more rely on marshals so that we can actually watch motor racing happen because without their volunteering, there would be no motor racing. Again, more cars being shuffled from side to side and back to forwards and left to right and up and down. Um, so I do sense that possibly that five minutes to uh, getting going might have been um, a little ambitious, but shoot for the stars. Yeah, we can still see cars at the tail end of this grouping. We've still got four. Oh, we're going to do the maths in a minute, but let's let's call it we've lost 11 cars, so that means we have 55 cars yep. still out there are playing, but uh, waiting for it all to go. And uh, out of the back of the circuit, suddenly it's very dark indeed, so probably a very good time to put a firework in the sky. <laughs> Just so you can find people who've wandered off into, into <laughs> through, the, through, the, through the forest out there. Or, or all yeah. that phrase from Valentino earlier described the racing as being in the jungle. It is a little bit. It is a little bit. Well, and, and again, something that in his motorcycle career he's never experienced because he didn't do 24-hour races, didn't do uh, endurance racing. He's never raced in the dark. You know? and, and this is... It's darker here than it is at Le Mans. It is, it is really dark here. Really dark. So... Yeah, for the Spa 24 hours, for the Endurance World Championship for the motorcycles, they installed about a dozen light pylons because these cars have lots and lots of headlights. As you'll appreciate on a motorcycle, far less room for lights. And although they put more on, the, the riders were definitely not keen on the level of darkness uh, when they came for the test week or a couple of test days and so the circuit installed a lot more lighting around the track right interesting little little position there just saw the positional numbers on the windscreen of the 74 ema motorsport porsche Felipe nazar at the wheel is saying zero zero three but on our timing screen it's got him down in fifth place maybe that's yeah. one that needs sorting out michael grenier should be just in front of him in the 55 grouper m racing mercedes and nicholas nielsen we know is in third place in that uh, number 51 Iron Lynx Ferrari, that's their right one. Still readjusting the cars. Dominic Bauman being moved into position in the Sun Energy One. Mercedes still being signaled. You go forward, you go back. Leipert Motorsport Lamborghini moving back to accommodate them. These are cars towards the tail of the pack in the 43rd, 44th position. Well, they've done their level best to wave cars out of the pit lane in the order in which they hope they will arrive at the grid. But as anybody in PR will tell you, it is easier to nail jelly to the ceiling than to try and get a racing driver to do what you want him to do, no matter how simple the instruction is. So um, it doesn't always work. Probably easiest for Nick Yellowly and Dan Harper, since they were going to the front row of the grid and they both knew where their respective positions were. For everybody else, yeah, it's a bit as you were. So we're getting close to three o'clock in the morning. Still a warm evening at Spa Francorchamps. We've had this uh, red flag. It uh, came out at uh, two minutes and 12, uh, two, two hours and 12 minutes, yeah. I beg your pardon. So that's uh, nearly 45 minutes ago. Looks like we're getting very close. If they're sorting out the cars in the mid 40s, and we've got 55 runners. They should have everybody who is out of the pit lane mm. ready to go racing for the restart. We were told a while ago, start within five minutes. It's uh, exceeded that just however i think we're very very nearly there definitely think that we will be rolling off within probably four or five minutes maximum text bob see what's going on that's a good idea uh yes so we are getting ready to go to 11 and 50 seconds was reference. and and again from the marshals on post ah oh, somebody's steaming that's not good uh, from the marshals on post up there at Blanchemont instant reaction I mean we we went 
instantly to red flag and and with some degree of urgency from the race director um, and and again you know the, the guys there on on uh, on all of these marshals posts and radio communication with race control and they are the eyes and ears of the race director particularly in this weather because even if you've got a view out of the window of one tiny bit of the track or you've got security cameras in the dark they're not going to tell you as much as as the eyeballs of of the crews on the ground and so really really uh, swift work by all of the marshals to make sure that um, yeah, the highest level of safety was was applicable for any driver in distress and so um, yeah very quick turnaround for safety that. car procedure so safety car procedure forward. okay so one last car at the tail of the field being shoved around and whittled further backwards and forwards and yellow flags waving and we are getting ready hopefully to get some fire in the hold in the hole in the hold whichever and uh, start to get this race back underway so the safety car will lead the field around and we'll wait and see whether blimey somebody needs to adjust their headlights uh, whether or not we then go into single file or whether they're going to try and run them as two by two of course, if you're looking down the order, the middle order of the cars, quite a few of them parked a little diagonally. It doesn't yeah. matter. They're going to have this lap. They'll straighten up. But uh, two by two, you're quite right, Martin, is the desired run. So it's the two BMWs from Rover Racing, Nick Yololi and Dan Harper on the front row for the restart. Cars go up towards La Source. It really does feel very dark yeah. away from the pit areas. But uh, for these drivers, they'll actually get a bit of relief when they get into the area of darkness because all those bright lights, particularly the lasers coming across from where the concert was going on, it really does start to strain the eyes a little bit. In the yep. We'll have minimum two laps behind the safety car. And the reason for that, of course, is to allow the teams to build, or the drivers to build heat into the tyres and the brakes, but particularly the tyres, to get them up to speed, to get them up to temperature, because the, the track temperature is down to what now? Uh, 24.5, so that's, yeah, that's, Oh, no, track temperature 38.4. Boy, that's held the heat. That's Still, what happens when you heat it for day oh, after yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolute 38 degrees. I mean, that's right. I mean, Still, the operating window of the tyre is 90 degrees plus, so you still have to work it hard to, to retain that temperature because, of course, whatever temperature they had when they came out of the oven, that was 25 minutes ago. None of that remains. They'll barely be even warm to the touch, so... Um, you, you're going to have to work them hard. And because you're in a safety car queue, because you've got cars um, ahead and astern, you can't really be leaping on and off the pedal and leaping on and off the brakes in the way that you might ideally want to. So that's why a lot of weaving goes on. But what happens when drivers have a restart? Do they all just think, you know what, I reckon I'm a bit better on cool tyres than anybody else. This is my moment to make my move. And of course, a handful will make a move and not get it right and uh, things may sort themselves out but this is the yeah. best opportunity for a lot of drivers to gain positions once they're all up to full speed all tires up at full operating temperature then the passing maneuvers are all the harder in the rover racing camp it's all a case <laughs> of uh, trying not to smile too much of course 13 and three quarter hours remain in this race so plenty to play for but they've risen to the top they've done a really really good job on their tactics they were out of kilter with the others and actually had the confidence to keep both of their cars not just have one of them out of kilter but effectively before the red flag came out they were half a stint out of arrangement with all the other drivers around them in the top 10. it is three o'clock in the morning central european summer time 0100 Greenwich Mean Time, wherever you are, thank you for joining us for our continuing coverage of the Total Energy 24 Hours of Spa for 2022. We are behind the safety car, getting ready to go back to racing after a near 45-minute red flag delay. And the weather is set fair. Uh, wind coming in from the north. It's just swung around a little bit, actually picked up to a whole 2.2 meters per second. So it's barely even a breeze. Certainly wouldn't be trying to sail anything in it. Nick Yellowly, the race leader, 
And that is a legacy of this car being on a very different stint pattern to most of the field. Now, of course, everything is pretty much reset because everybody is now shown as having a sort of 26, 28 minute stint underway. And just to, just to point out again, reiterate, if you will, that uh, it's two laps behind the, the safety car, so the tyre temperatures can be brought up to a, a sensible operating level. Ah, now, one car diving through the pits Not the just moment. one, there are a number in. Dries Van Torre is in, oh, yeah. Andrea Caldarelli is in, Leo Roussel, Sven Muller, um, Kelly Beretta, and there's seven, eight cars in the pit lane. And that will be because... I don't know. I was going to say, it's good you've got a theory, because I can't quite work working out for that. No, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. I, it's not a stint length issue, because everybody was shown, was shown, as having, a th a, a, you know, with are now at 30 minutes. So I, I'm assuming that when Park Ferme opened, the stints were all reset to zero, either intentionally or accidentally. But how about the refueling? Yes, maybe they were just desperate you know, for fuel. We'll see how quickly to come out of the pits. The first one who went in was Dries Van Tor from 16th place in the order. Yeah. He's been in there for nearly one and a half minutes, waiting to see that comes back out. My, my well, hunch is it was Nobody refueling. on the lead lap went in. Dries no. Van Tor was the first car off the lead lap and, and he went in. Um, but not everybody else on the lead lap went in. So two cars behind, for instance, Dorian Pan stayed out because she had only literally a lap or two before the red flag got in. Um, and there are our stoppers. Yeah, but it's the 32 car coming down. Is it number 30 in the pits as well? Oh, Thomas the... Brown's pits? No, it wasn't. It's the Bentley, Bentley getting is ready back to go back out. In the pit lane. I was just double checking that. That's sitting down near pit exit in the yeah. lower pit lane. That's Antonin Borger is shown as at the wheel. So the cars that went through, Dries, a one minute 58 stop. So that was a stop. And so for uh, Marco Mapelli and two minutes for Leo Roussel. So those were genuine full fuel stops. Marcus Winkelhock, is it Marcus has taken I'm reading the wrong line. No, it is. Marcus Winkelhock has taken over uh, the 66 Audi. That was a full two-minute stop. Exactly. Quite a lot of tyre debris on the start finish. Well, not the start finish straight, the Grand Prix yeah. uh, straight, sitting right in the middle of the track. I'm amazed it hasn't sort of been cleared away during the course, unless it, it fell off the cars as they well, got no, going. I, I, I think that's exactly right. That was exactly where I was going with that, because we saw the sweeper going out. I'm sure it was swept. But yes, as soon as stars, cars start moving, great lumps of rubber possibly falling off somebody. Yeah, well, possibly just uh, you know deposited high in a wheel arch, not spotted uh, when the, the, the yeah. mechanics looked at the car. So the silver class being led by Yanis Fitcher. He's in a very impressive seventh place overall. So for the Hout Racing team, they'll be super pleased with that. Definitely. Seventh for them. Next runner in class, somewhat further back, Thomas okay. Tuzula. And our timing screen tells us why Fitcher is so high up the order, because he's half a stint out of sync. He's done one, one stop more than everybody, almost everybody ahead of him. So he had done the Rover racing trick of stopping earlier and, and sort of risen towards the top. But, you know... The... Actually, you know, one almost needs to pull the race apart. It could well be they had an extra pit stop because they had to replace a punctured tyre. We uh, had so many of those that is possible. in the first couple of hours. It was literally the last few minutes of the first into the race, coming up toward just over an hour point, and then we had, I think, four punctures in the space of about uh, 25 seconds, so it seemed. Yeah. You look from one, oh, another one, and another one. Yeah. In fact, in the top 20, two cars, three cars, have made 12 stops, four cars, including the leader. Now, we know one of them was to get them out of sync with the others. And at that stage, three and a half hours away from the next troncher points, 
Do we think maybe that Rover Racing were looking at what happened at six hours and going, right, and we've, we're now back timing this from there so that we are in a position where we can juggle a strategy and maybe throw in you know, a late, a, a long stop where others are having to do a, a, a fuel stop just as we're getting up to 12 hours. So a, again, you know, all of these things, that's why they're cleverer than us, because they think of these things in advance. We only sort of slowly grasp them once they have happened, and we go, well, how did that happen? Oh, that's that half stop they did they're that three thing hours called ago. Proactive, we're that thing called reactive. Yeah, they're that thing called clever, we're that thing called commentators. So, so that's that's the big difference there. Is they do it for a living, we just try and guess what they're doing. Lights remain on on the safety car. So this would be the end of the second lap behind the safety car. That's the second time they've crossed the line, no? Mm. The stint is already... Yeah. Uh, well, another, another pit visitor yeah. trying to see who's coming and in. It's now, the Anis Fitcher, so that yes. was the car leading the Silver Cup class, so suddenly not in seventh place anymore, tumbling down the order. But others around it, if there's another lap behind the safety car, may well be coming in. Well, they were out of sync, though, weren't they, with everybody else? And so the problem now is they have had to stop, and that means 45 cars will go by them. Now, not all of them will be on the lead lap, but that will put them two minutes behind the leader, and then, if anything happens, suddenly you're off the lead lap, and, and you know, they're still way ahead not way ahead, but ahead of, no, they won't be ahead of their rivals, they'll, because some of their rivals are still in the top 20, and still on the lead lap, so they will actually lose positions because of that. But the only reason these two cars, for instance, are in is because they absolutely have to for fuel. So you've been allowed to fit tires during the red flag, or put them, take them off, put them in the oven, then put them back on. I'm not sure if you're allowed uh, to have new ones, but clearly, full fuel not allowed in red flag and that's where it should be a red flag should be an absolute stop park ferme get back in get out on the track and if you needed to come in that lap you still need to come in you don't get to rebuild the car fully and, and restart a la formula one that's 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 again part of the formula one race that really need to change on board in third place with felipe nasa now that's got to be the first time we've said that sentence i said it once under cover of darkness but just pointing out the fact I that i was amazed <laughs> amazed that they were up into that position because yeah. they had been the sleeper in this race but don't forget that just before the red flag was thrown. We'd had the front handful of cars, the top four cars had served a pit stop and Danny Junkadea took over the 88 to CODIS ASP Mercedes in a clear lead from Raffaele Marcello after that astonishing run after the previous safety car where he opened up a 12 second gap at the front of the field. But by dint of May serving their pit stop when all was green out on the track, in other words, there was no safety car at the front of the field, no full course yellow, and then suddenly to go to a, a, a moment like we had, suddenly they're not first, they're down in seventh position overall. So how the pendulum can swing can equally easily swing the other way. But it really seemed after the first really dominant stint from a driver in this race, which was Marcello's stint, <laughs> for that to be scrubbed, he's going to have to have everything crossed. But just Lights. remember, he's under control. Yeah, he, he was, definitely. Lights still on on the safety car. So safety car headed off at 2.59. It is now 3.11. This is lap three behind the safety car being completed. So there is clearly another issue that we are not seeing or not aware of necessarily that is... Uh, not allowing our race director to release the field. OK, we could we could start taking guesses as to what it might be. It may well be that they've just had another look at, let's say, the barrier repairs or whatever they've been doing at Blanchimont and uh, just checking it out. There are a host of things, but unless we see them, yeah. we simply do not know. But the good news is the cars are going around the circuit. Their yeah. tyres are definitely more up to temperature than they would be if they'd only done the one or two laps behind the safety car. It does mean when we come to the proper restart of the race, when we go back to green flag racing, hopefully we'll have fewer incidents. But in fact, to be honest, looking at the stream of cars, they're spreading out rather than closing in. And 
really the drivers, their job, their duty is to stay as close as they can to the car ahead of them behind the safety car so that we don't have a straggle of cars, that we do have a proper race. And if you're a little further back in the pack, you'll be getting frustrated. If your name is Danny Junkader, you know, you're five seconds, you're seventh overall, you're five seconds down on the lead, but the gaps are starting to open up in that line. They should be only half a second or so apart, but some of them are one and a bit seconds, some are five seconds apart. So they Mark, need to do a better job. Marcus Winglehop back in the pits. That car has only been out of the pits for seven minutes. So why is the 66 Audi back in? Also, why is Richard Leitz lost places without going into the pits behind the safety car? Richard Leitz has dropped from where he was, which was 10th, to 14th. He has not been in the pits. So, okay. Again, no clue whatsoever. Uh, one car that went into the pits and has not yet, sorry, not uh, just dead on Bruce's toes, not yet come out is car number three, uh, the Get Speed Mercedes with Valdemar Ericsson. And it's shown as having spent an hour, over an hour in the pit lane. Now, so did that go in? on the red flag, which was no. over an hour ago. But yeah, it is just over an hour ago, you're, you're quite right. But we know what? it's over an hour, but I think it must yeah. have been in just before that. I think be it must have been. So that car is showing no signs whatsoever of coming back out at the moment. No, and still waiting for the Bentley to come back out. So in fact, we've had a place change in the last lap. Uh, the heart of racing team, Aston Martin, had all the problems early on, has finally of the runners that are still in the race, of uh, the 55 runners, it's moved up to 54th because Antonin Borger is going nowhere. He's in the pit lane at the moment, in, uh, but he should be. We've seen him in the pit lane, haven't we, in the, in the 107 Bentley. So that has but, fallen to 55th position. But it's overall. not shown as in pit. But we've seen it in the pits with our, with our eyes at pit exit. But that was a while ago. That was two or three laps behind the safety car ago. So is it moving? Tail light spotters of the world unite and tell us if any of the rear lights that you see going past obviously not in this shot are bentley shaped because they are quite distinct aren't they although i noticed that the new generation of mercedes is worryingly similar to the uh, rear lights of the bentley yeah but the bentley it's got that uh, l the, the, that large sort of central grille, if you will, doesn't spread the whole way across the front of the car with the yeah. orange surround, and that's what I've seen yeah. down towards pit exit yeah. of the lower pit lane. Yeah. Well, it's... I was thinking more of if you see the rear, rear lights, because they had that lodging shape, but they're... Yeah, unfortunately, there are far too many Mercedes that look like it, so it's... It is the head-on view that we need, or maybe even just a view from our race director of the pit exit so we can see if the Bentley is still there. Still waiting for the restart. No, the no Bentley. The... Of Bentleys, there are none okay. in that well, shot. It might be pushed in the garage, of course. But uh, it strength... might have been pushed in the garage. Uh, is, he, is he doing sectors? No. no I'm now, sure no... he's not. He's, he's listed as having 187 laps on, on the board. Let's t take a look and see how things change. Yeah. <clears throat> Ah, uh, there is a car in the pits, however, and that is... Ah, uh, now, this is the 33 car that we're talking about that's been stationary for over an hour. So it looks as though whatever ailed them, as somebody else goes by, has possibly been fixed. So... Well, yeah, back Nick in the pit lane. Kiergaard has handed over 159. So that is the Garage 59 car to Itan Simeone. No, just, just to clarify there, Martin, the 33 Audi from WRT, that's Riachiro to meter, that has actually, it's in the pits, but it's only been there for oh. 1 minute 30 seconds. Yeah, no, the other was, one that had a lot three, longer. not 33, wasn't yeah, it? Correct. Yes, correct. Idiots. Two, yeah, it's, it's just double vision. Ladies and gentlemen, just to point out around here, it's just gone quarter past three in the morning. Gives a tiny bit of slack because it is well, it is so difficult. You this know, is normally the time I've been waking up for the last three or four days, so, yeah. Hang in there another 45 minutes and he'll be as bright as a button. I'm, I'm not actually waking up very much at the moment. What we need is a little bit more, A, coffee and, and B, adrenaline, so... Um, Still quite fancy those frites, actually, but... Yeah. I'm not, sure, park that idea. not sure the fritery is open. I, that, but I did think, actually, that might be breakfast. 
Yeah, could well be Som something, be to, something to aim for. So, yeah. still waiting for the safety car to release this field. Initially, we were told it would be two laps behind the safety car. However, it's clearly it's a minimum of two, but it's uh, stretched stretched on out. And Martin is actually having talked about coffee, about to go off and get another little cardboard cup for the each for the pair of us. So, still the BMWs leading the way. Nick Yadoli and Dan Harper, the two British drivers for Rover Racing. They are waiting at the front of the queue, the best place to be for a restart. And the car's going around. The EMA Motorsport Porsche, we've scarcely mentioned it in the race. It's got a, a stellar driving lineup, the number 74 EMA Motorsport car. And uh, it's Felipe Nazar at the wheel, and he's sharing with Matt Campbell, the Australian racer, and uh, Mathieu Jaminet. And there's not much they haven't bombed between them in Porsches, and they already took a 24 hour race victory in winning the GTD Pro class of the Daytona 24 hours at the start of the year. And uh, they know what they're doing. And they're sitting up there waiting for the restart, and they're going to desperately see uh, the Brazilian racer Felipe Nazar if he can get a jump on one, maybe even both of those Rover Racing BMWs at the front of the queue. Track looks in pretty good condition as the cars go round. In fact, when they were running behind, uh, 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 just as the, the stoppage happened and looking around the circuit, you can see so much gravel on the racing line, just off the racing line, lots of rubber debris around the circuit. So drivers having to tiptoe to an extent. They can't see so well, the headlights pick out various things, but certain nuances and uh, almost warnings of peril ahead just that little bit harder to pick up still cars in and out of the pit lane and uh eddie cheever the third sitting in at the moment just double checking is that the uh no it's chris froggett on board the 93 uh, mercedes from sky tempesta racing but uh, half a dozen no getting on towards 10 cars in the pits at the moment so while the safety car is still going around at the front of the field it's still giving an opportunity for people to come in and make a pit stop without too much punishment. But as soon as it goes all green around the circuit and the cars are back up to full racing speed, if you're then at a standstill in the pit lane, that's where it really starts to bite chunks out of any advantage you build up, Martin. Uh, and that's where we need to know how deep in the stint Nick Yellowley and Dan Harper are, because if they're now starting to get to the go, OK, we really need to start thinking about fuel now, they don't need the safety car to stay out because that will properly torpedo them. Now, here's the other issue with coming into the pit lane off the back of the safety car queue, is you have to wait for the safety car to come by again and the entire queue before the pit lane red light is switched off so that you just saw the last car coming through the queue and everybody who was in the pit lane now gets the chance to exit. Also, just to point out, the lap here is seven kilometers in length. It's not a short little five kilometer lap. Now, just looking down who's been in and who's been out, it looks like the Dries Van Tour car, the 32, which was the favorite from a WRT camp, has come in again. That is the problem child, isn't it? But they're a lap down. Maybe they're just trying to do something in a, in a WRT sort of fashion to sort of plan ahead to, no, to, to no, make an advantage. <laughs> but. Well, they, it, it's just done a, a sort of a, a five lap safety car stint. And how long was the stop? It wasn't enormously long, but uh, well, no, no, now it's removed that element from a the minute pit. 36. So that's a short, that is a short stop. Fuel only. I'm being safety told. car in this lap. OK, right. Here's okay. the indication. In fact, that's a good example of uh, trying to get your pit stop done at the right time. Anybody who's coming in now, there are still cars coming in. The safety car will be in this lap, but it's only driving down towards Eau Rouge. It's still got a long distance to go, about another six <sighs> kilometers to this okay. lap and more to do. So those who are going in now, say they're, they're at a stationary for two minutes, they'll be back out before the safety yeah. car comes yeah. back here. But anybody who, co who goes into the pits in half a lap time, they might not be laughing so, so much. So our WRT then just topping off, topping off, topping off, topping off. But can you do that? There's a minimum short stop time, isn't there? And so you have to go long enough either to be able to put that much fuel in or if you're putting less than that amount of fuel in you're wasting time yeah but there are certain you know you're wasting less time than you would do under green but yeah oh, 
Oh, yeah, there are certain teams I've watched over the years in the various championships that have different rules and, and that they succeed more often than not. And what yeah, they tend to do yeah. is every time there's, a, there's a, an element like this, they just come in and top up the fuel. As I, long I, as they get onto the back of the pack, and if you're already at the back of the pack and no one's behind you, you'll catch up again and no one will have overtaken you. You won't have lost yeah. a position. Again, I defer to my original statement. The people at WRT are much cleverer than me. So if they're doing it and you just saw them doing it with JB Simonar in the number 30 car, there's a reason. Exactly and and so. it won't be a rubbish reason. So right. they are now 30 and 32, 20th and 21st or ish, but a lap off the lead. And chock full of fuel. Right, so yeah. Nick Yanoli and Dan Harper, the two British drivers who are both racing for Rover Racing at the front safety of the queue. Safety car is at the end of this lap. Extended. Felipe Nasser, the best of the rest, the lead Porsche driver in third place overall, car number 74. Nicholas Nielsen, the top Ferrari driver, don't forget he's been a winner here as recently as last year for Iron Links. He's in fourth place overall. And the car that was leading and pulling clear before the stoppage, Danny Junkadea, unfortunately, he just took, took over from Raffaele Marcello. They did a pit stop under green. Their rivals have done it in far better circumstances. Okay. They've fallen to seventh. Now then, let's talk about Rover Racing, who we know were 30 minutes out of sync with most of the cars behind them. How long have they got before they have to stop? And is this extension now, the safety car, actually going to help them rather than crucify them? Uh, because now, if they need to fuel, they're going to have to give away track position, and they'll be right at the back of the safety car queue, but they do get a safety car fuel. And if they don't need to, for how many laps can they continue to stay out? Oil on track, turn 10, we're hearing that as you turn into poo. Oh, oh my yeah. lord, it's dark yeah. down there, you're fast, it's a double left-hander. That is why the safety car does not come in as planned and continues for a further lap or more to the front of the field. OK, so oil on track. My question is, who has leaked oil? Because if there's oil on track, it tends to be a large amount, not just a little bit of a drip. So somebody is losing oil at a very major rate, and that should, given the fact that these things are highly tuned thoroughbred race engines, probably make itself evident fairly quickly. Uh, I'll give you a choice of 55 cars. <laughs> we'll try and whittle it down from there. Well, 55 cars still running, but potentially if as the oil is being uh, uh, covered up with uh, powder that will dry it out and therefore negate the problems. Yeah. But uh, it's the distance they're going to be covering. What we can't see under the darkness there, we can see the actions of the marshals who are putting the quick dry material down. What we cannot see is just How the, much? the sheer amount of oil that has been dropped. So at Puhon, you're committed. It's a double left-hander going down. It drops from entry through the first apex, through the second apex. A lot of drivers we've seen. We saw Lorenzo Patrese getting it wrong through the second part of the Puhon, going off and uh, eliminating that number 11. Audi. And in years gone by, that would have been less of an issue because there was 100 million acres of tarmac. Now there's nearly 100 million acres of gravel traps. So if you go off there, you are in a world of hurt. Lucas Legere in the pit lane, um, but was that him just leaving? Or that was that talented Pierberg Pierberg. leaving in yeah. the number 20 Mercedes so, SPS automotive. Okay, well, Lucas Legere has now left the pit lane anyway, so it's clearly not him. At least the team are not aware that it is him that has got an engine that has lost oil. But somebody has not thrown oil out the window, but somebody has lost oil out of the car. Well, I'm just trying to think if we had anybody limping in slowly. And before we had the red flag, yes. we hadn't. We had, OK, yeah. that's a Pujol. But a lot of cars went round. Just just before the red flag, we had uh, Valentino Rossi spinning at the next corner at Fania. But yeah. I, I think so many cars would have been over the surface, circuit since then, that, and the surface would have been dried out if he'd been the one dropping the oil. Ah, uh, he may have been the one that spun picked on his own. Up the be. oil? No, no, picked up somebody else's oil on his tyres. Got to Piff Paff, and suddenly. No, he got through Piff Paff. He, he was at Fania, so he, uh, someone could have yeah, dropped yeah. oil. It could have been him dropping oil, and then he spun on his own oil at the where, next corner. Where did he go off? In at Fania, the, in which the first is the corner right after Puhon. Hander. Yeah. So it's only the corner after after where the oil yeah. had just been dried up. OK, yeah. this is supposition, but someone has put yeah. down something that is... What we couldn't see under the cover of the darkness there was whether that was the racing line, yeah. but someone has identified it, and to identify that in the dark is pretty remarkable, yeah, yeah, yeah. frankly. Absolutely.
Uh, and and it, it will have been because they've seen it in the headlights. So safety car due to come in at the end of this lap. Lights are off it on has, the safety car. It's withdrawn. It's the two BMWs at in. the front. The Audi safety car pulls off into yeah. the pit lane and nicely controlled restart from Nick Yellowly yeah. with Dan Harper in behind. So BMW fans, cheer right now. Your cars are first and second. Half a second between them as they head over the finish line up to La Source. It's 98 ahead of 50 as it should be. And in behind, very close behind, Philippe Bin Nasser. He's shaping up to try and make a move, maybe somewhere like Le Comte, but he's getting the drag down the hill behind Dan Harper. That and was into a, where Rouge they go. That was an hour and 20, 25, 26 minutes since we had a full course yellow that went red. So it's been a, a sizable stoppage. We are now back to green flag racing. Nick Yellowly and Dan Harper are 1-2 ahead of Felipe Nasser. Then Nick Nielsen in fourth, the lead Ferrari, ahead of Mikel Grenier in the 55 Mercedes. Marco Sorensen, the lead Aston Martin, up to sixth position ahead of Danny Junkadea in the 55, 88 Mercedes that was the race leader. And Antonio Fuoco, Lawrence Van Tour, and Maxi Gertz round out the top 10. 12 cars on the lead lap, Rob Bell 11th. And our outlier in the uh, Gold Cup, which is uh, in fourth place, uh, at first place in the Gold Cup, and tenth, uh, four, uh, 12th place overall, idiot, uh, is the Halp Racing at Mercedes. So that car doing sterling stuff. And right behind them, 13th place, the first car not on the lead lap, the Iron Dames, Dorian Pan leading the Gold Cup. So we've got three. Four, four class leaders um, in 12th, uh, three class leaders, 12th, 13th, Cup, and 16th. Gold Cup, Dorian Pan, and then 16th place overall, Nicky yeah. Lloyd Villa, the remaining entry of the three from Herbert Motorsport. That's car number 24. That's yeah. going increasingly well. But Nicky Lloyd Villa, what a safe pair of hands. And uh, he's GT racer through and through. He'll be enjoying this stint. Right, what's happening? The car I'm looking forward to is the if any progress will come from the 88 Acodis ASP Mercedes. It's chasing down the Aston Martin of Marcus Sorensen. Great to have an Aston Martin in the top 10. It hasn't looked like their race, but you know what? If you put your money on any of those Aston Martins, it would be the 95 car. Yep. And uh, Marco Sorensen is the driver at the wheel at the moment. He's hunting down Mikel Grenier. And the other thing, although it's always disappointing to lose your teammates, is that you've now got a two-car crew of mechanics looking at one car working on one car and all the all the brains there will be working on one car as well so and it does yeah. also mean martin that you can actually allow some of them the mechanics to actually sit down close their eyes for a bit because yeah. it, it means you can double their potential time yeah. in which they can sleep they'll be starting to work out a sensible revising their shift system to just cut them so slack so you don't find them leaning against the ball or, or just asleep standing up it has been known in the pit yes. lane here at Le Mans and, and, any 24-hour race and in the commentary box there is your race leader nick yellowly for rover racing with Dan Harper, his teammate, in his wheel tracks. And don't forget, the first dozen cars started, I think, in order, didn't they? They were no... Because they started in race order, so they were no interlopers. There are no lapped cars in the group. And you could... Well, that keeps it clean, but what it doesn't... It does remove the possibility that someone could gain an advantage. But uh, busy out on the track. It's also busy in the pit. They let's go down. And here from Richard Leitz, he's down the pits and he's had a good run so far. Richard, we've been trying to solve the mystery of the oil on track and I understand it's come from your car. What's happened? Well, uh, it was quite suddenly. So um, first of all, the oil is from our car for sure. Uh, we were, well, I was warming up the tires, preparing the restart and then suddenly we had no um, drive anymore. So I guess it's the engine and uh, also, then when I restarted it, it sounds quite quite weird. So we had to park it. There was a lot of oil, a lot of smoke, but uh, unfortunately for us, the race is over. And uh, it's quite sad because a lot of effort from everybody. Uh, we were running not too bad at this moment. The car was good, but uh, to finish first, you have to finish. Absolutely. Very disappointing end for you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank in you. the blink of an eye, yeah. one of the race favourites. Bear in mind that was running not so long ago before the red flag period. How did we not notice that position. they were in the pits? 
Well, because we, you're looking at the lead screen and it just we just I didn't was, see... I was desperately it, trying to find anybody in the pit lane. Is that car shown in the pit lane now? It's not. No, they didn't make it no, back. No, they didn't it's make it probably back. Stopped oh, just that's after Puma. why. That might also be how they managed to get the marshals to realise. Was They probably yeah. reported back saying we've dropped... That would be so responsible. Yeah. That would be a typical Richard Leeds pro driver thing yeah. to do. Tell people, tell race control there is coil on the track. My and engine just went bang. Yeah. That's it. And again, you know, yet another really strong lineup. When, when you look at the lineup of the 66 cars that took the start, there's 25 that could easily win this race. Uh, and Just then, easily win this yeah, race. Yeah, and you've got drivers in other cars beyond those 25 cars who, in their own right and their own ability, yeah. Yeah. could win the race, but they're in a pro am driver lineup or, or something against yeah. the all pro lineup. So the spread of talent is absolutely phenomenal here. Yeah. Earl Bamber would be a, a great one in question. You know, easily capable of an outright win, but is is part of you know the, a strong pro part of a pro am lineup. So uh, again, it's you know they're looking for a win, but not an overall win. They're looking for a class win. Actually, quick question from uh, 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 a, a PR uh, around the world saying, when the cars were lined up before the safety car restarted, were they lined up in race order? They were lined up in race order. So he said, how does that impact cars that were ahead on track of a class leader, but a lap down? Do they get the lap back? No, they don't, because it wasn't in their position. It was if you were 13th and the class leader was 9th, you're still behind them. He starts 9th, you start 13th. That's the way it was. So whatever the race order was, none of the lap gaps disappear. If you were five laps ahead, you remain five laps ahead. But if the guy that you were just five laps ahead of, if you were following him and about to go six laps up, you don't suddenly start behind him you he starts behind you so everybody went in race order so nobody gained a position and nobody lost a position but the gaps between them if the leader was half a lap behind you he suddenly two-thirds of a lap in front of you when you start again and, and then he'll have to catch you again and, and so on and so forth so there was I mean <sighs> It was almost like a very, very long full course yellow, except the gaps between the cars closed up, but no positions changed at all during the red flag, because nothing happens during a red flag. It is race suspended. So, exactly. Well, yeah. nothing has happened in terms of the top 10 changing positions since the restart. It's still Nick Yellowly from BMW teammate Dan Harper, first and second, Felipe Nasa, third in the 74 EMA Motorsport Porsche, Nicholas Nielsen, fourth in the... Uh, 51 Iron Lynx Racing Ferrari, Michel Grenier, the Group of M Racing Mercedes in fifth place, and Marco Sorensen in the Aston Martin from Beach Demos oh. AMR. Shop in, take a breath. Yanis Fitcher, who's leading the Silver Cup class, has got uh, Marcus Zug, Marius Zug getting very close yeah. to him indeed. Uh, and that is a position and a class battle. So that is for the Silver Class lead, number four and number 99. So that is a Mercedes-Audi battle, and right behind them is Fred Vervish in the 46 WRT Audi, somewhere in the midst of all that lot. And, I mean, you know, pick the bones out of that. Luckily for the teams, they have a GPS tracker, which gives them some indication of, of where everybody is on track. But at this stage, unless you've got it expanded over a 50-inch screen, it's basically just one enormous lump of multicolours. You can't tell who's where and, and what's what. What you need is a car that's got a light array like that, which then immediately allows you to know who's near your your own car. Uh, and, and, and that's, to, for, to a, a greater degree, those light arrays have got nothing to do with the fans or the TV commentary or anything else. It is purely so the teams can spot their own car. Entirely, but it certainly helps the fans that most of the cars will come past in a blaze of headlights, but something that has a distinct, distinctive, particularly those lights that run over the top of the roof. Yeah, uh, it really is a helping hand for all concerned, it must be said. Right now, the lead two cars will be the first that need to pit, and they will get one more lap before they need to come in. They have just done 62 minutes of their 65 maximum. So Nick Yellowly, Dan Harper will be in at the end of this lap. Nicky Leutweiler then leading his class, but he's just been passed by the Lamborghini of Leo Roussel. 
that's an overall position, but not a class position. So the remaining Herbert Motorsport car leading in Pro-Am, and I've just lost him. He's 17th. So these are the guys that aren't one, but are in fact two laps down. There are only four cars that are a, a lap off the leaders and everybody else, well, there's another gr group that are two down. Gemma Scott in the pit lane. Let's join her again. And it was quite nice, we just bumped into each other and you were grinning away, eager to get in the car in the next 10 minutes. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, it's a great race. It's always one of the big highlight ones. Um, you know, we're still circulating. It's a shame for car 16, but the most important is Matt seems to be OK. So that was a really big one. But um, no, it's great fun. What else are you going to do on your Saturday evening <laughs> apart from joining the disco down there? <laughs> and you're going to get in for a double stint, right? Yeah, I'm going to get in a double. I think I've got five minutes. And um, yeah, I'll get the sunrise and the happy hour. And then, um, and then I think uh, Chris gets back in. And then uh, we're going to see where we get up. It, it's kind of an odd one this year with the fact that the race is finishing so late, like nearly five o'clock yeah. in the afternoon. So it's kind of, we were used to that three o'clock in the morning type of, oh, it's going to be over and we're not even halfway yet. And you got the technical stop still to come. Yeah, that's going to be obviously the top. It opens in an hour. So um, let's see how that plays out. That's a big part of the race. We're missing two laps to the podium or one lap to the podium, two laps to the leaders. But hey, there's not even halfway yet. And there's still a lot of stuff to play out of all this. Get out there. Enjoy happy hour. Thanks. Cheers, Elle. And that's a very valid point, actually. Thank you, Gemma, from uh, Bambi. It's a, it, it is, it, when daylight comes up in a 24-hour race, you go, right, we've broken the back of this thing. No, it's nearly going to be supper time before they finish. So never mind, you know, lunchtime is, it's, it's the final hurrah. No, it's going to be afternoon tea and, and uh, you know, and then still heading nearly 5 p.m. I, I can't remember being in a 24-hour race that has finished that late. No, me neither. It really, it, it does PM really start throw you. It, it plays quite with your late, mind. But, but near, you know, 4.45, and again, you know, it's, it's, it's not a round number. So for stupid people like me, subtraction is very hard. You have to remember that it it's not at the top of the hour. through the course of a 24-hour <laughs> yes, race. Yes, so, yes, right, yes, Tanner Sathian yes. Thiracol is the driver in the car, the Porsche, the number 39 Porsche that Obamba will take over. It's in the Pro-Am class. They're running fourth in class, some distance behind class leader Nicky Leutwiller, which will slightly vex them because he also is in a Porsche, but it's from a rival team. It's from Herbert Motorsport. That's 17th overall. And uh, Tanart is in 36th position, but then Earl Bamber will get on board. And is that car in the pits? Not just yet, moved but up just to 35th. About to come. Yeah. But next time around, it will be coming into the pits. Well, and that's because, about, maybe two more times. That's, that's because I think we have a major problem for 159, the Garage 59 car. Said when we went green, Itan Simeone was in the pit lane and has been in the pit lane for ages. Four minutes in the pits at the moment and rising, so it's not a regular pit stop. Ah, so actually he's only just gone out and come back in again. It's not been a stellar race for no, because McLaren. Be no, it hasn't. I mean, we've still got the Jota car just at the tail of the top ten, Rob Bell. But, yeah. uh, that's the only one that's, only one that's healthy. Dean McDonnell, I mean, that, that car was right up with Nicky Leutweiler, uh, but it somehow lost a lap. But and it's I got don't pace. It's where. just said its fastest lap of the race last time around, which is only a tenth of a second slower than the race leader Nick Yololi did on that same lap. So the pace it's is there, had, but they've had penalties. Yeah, it had, it had collisions on early Saturday, well, late Saturday afternoon, but before it got dark. Um, and, and serve penalties for that. And so suddenly that sort of plunts them a little bit. OK, let's be the race leader. This, I think, is my in-lap, but I'm going to enjoy the last moment of it anyway.
So um, that's the race leader, Nick Kiloli, yeah. nearly two seconds clear from teammate Dan Harper, a lap of the circuit. It's uh, nearly it's getting on towards four in the morning. Just had news, unfortunately, for Garage 59, <laughs> Ethan Simeone brought in uh, the 159 McLaren, and unfortunately that has retired from the race with radiator damage. Ah, uh, OK. So, so he picked that up well, but we just needed a reason as to he, why that. He'd had, had a long long stop and another couple of stops. And that view actually from Nick Yellily, one set of lights behind him and the whole of Spa-Francorchamps as his playground. Good weather, nice dark track, but clear and ready to go. Uh, just having a quick chat with the team, actually. And uh, being stupid, I've just been led by the stint length time on the screen, which unfortunately includes red flag time. So the stint lengths are wrong, which is good news, because otherwise almost everybody in the entire field is due a penalty. Um, what it doesn't change, I don't think, uh, is that the two BMWs are still out of kilter with everybody else, because they didn't all top up. Um, uh, the stints were paused, or were supposed to be paused at the time of the red flag. The same stint will resume when the race restarts. Note that the stint times will be incorrect on the timing screen, but will reset at car's first pit stop. Nevertheless, the correct time will be registered. So that was from uh, the organisers to the team, saying that the timing system does not have the facility to recognise that, that that is what is happening, but manually the timekeepers do, and so it will reset itself. So the timing screen currently showing drivers in 70 minutes and plus of drive time, that is not correct. Um, so, right, but, we, but as you say, we have lost uh, 159. And so. we've lost 107 now, just had uh, confirmation. Ah, confirmation. The drivetrain is what was the undoing of the 107 Bentley entered by CMR Classic and Modern Racing. There you go. Getting their full name. So, and also, did we mention that number three uh, get speed performance Mercedes is... No, we haven't crossed that one out. That's also dropped out of the race. Now well. we that was the one that Valdemar Eriksson yeah. brought in. No, didn't... Yes, it brought it in. It's been yeah. more than an hour in the pits. It has now retired. Ah, uh, OK. No, so we didn't have official confirmation of that. We were just questioning why on earth he'd been in pits for quite so long. So number three has gone. Um, and again... So, OK, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven... 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 cars gone. 15 and still to play for. And we have just passed the 13 hours remaining mark. So that's less than one, fewer than one an hour. Less than one an hour. Less than one an hour. Uh, and that means we should still have 35 cars at least at the flag. Yeah, ni nice maths. Right, the maths that are even nicer <laughs> is if you name Nick Kiloli because you were 1.9 seconds yeah. clear. Scrap that, you're 2.4 seconds clear of your own teammate, oh. Dan Harper. But Dan's got a comfortable margin, five and a bit seconds yeah. over Philippe and Azra in third place, so it's really good news for the BMW okay. Cruise. Bing, 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 bing. Rob Bell is in the garage in number 38, uh, in the pit lane in number 38 McLaren, not in the garage. Panic not, McLaren fan. So he has had to come in for fuel. How long then before Nick Yellily and Dan Harper do, because I think they were similarly out of kilter uh, with the McLaren. So we'll wait and see. I haven't had a reply back from uh, Rover Racing's non-strategist, my correspondent. Uh, she hasn't said. Uh, so that was Nick Nielsen. Was that a pass on Felipe Nasser? Well, let's double check there. Well, that was Nick Nasser Nielsen was going by somebody. Are they now in traffic? They were half a second apart, so it very likely could have been it, the move. It just looked like such a straightforward pass. I was quite surprised to see him just sail by a car. And Marvin Kirchhofer takes over the 38 McLaren from Rob Bell. And here, this is the queue, basically uh, third down to 10th, which is now Maxi Gertz. So third is seven seconds behind the leader. Maxi Gertz in 10th, 15 seconds behind the leader. In fact, this is not Maxi. Who is this? This is... Someone who's been going for... I'm thinking this... Is this on board with Lawrence Van Tour? Is that Danny Junkadella? Just ahead? That's like a third of a second, isn't it? That's definitely not two seconds anyway, which is how far Maxi Gertz is behind Lawrence Van Tour. 
you could be right. Or, it's, or is that Danny Junkadea? No, that's not. I was going to say, that's not Antonio Fuoco's Ferrari right in front. No, that's Fuoco's Ferrari ahead of that. So that's the other car. So that is Junkadea right in front of us. So we are on board with Maxi Gertz. There you go. Uh, although it's now, oh, this is no, now saying not. that's Fuoco. So that's Fuoco looking at Grenier and Sorensen. And going out the oh, inside oh, of yeah, Grenier. No, yeah. So now the Iron yeah, yeah, yeah. Ferraris are running in order. And Fuoco picking up positions. The, uh, the reason it's not Junkadea is because Junkadea is uh, in the pit lane. But that bright yellow is, of course, oh, 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 down the outside there between the pit wall and Fuoco. That was uh, Grenier coming back at him. You just saw him edging alongside. Brave stuff. Didn't because we don't see the door mirrors. You didn't see him there, but that's where he was. So there's the uh, that's uh, Samantha Tan car. He's driven very yeah. well by Maxi Mouston, a young young Dutch racer. But that's in the pit lane. That's down in fifth. Yeah. It's almost the last position in the race. In fact, the car's down to 53rd position. The, the uh, reason still in this race. Recent people are shouting at their TV screens is that of course. The 95 Aston Martin is in full grello, so that's why it looked yellow at the back, and that's why I thought it was Antonio Fuoco, who's uh, not Antonio Fuoco. Um, no, uh, yeah, 71 is the yellow one, isn't it? 51 is the white one, so. Yeah, that's the right yes, way around. That is the right way. Right, uh, our race yes. leader is 2.8 seconds to the good, but this time around, Dan Harper is uh, starting to try and close back in. But for Rover Racing, their BMW is sitting pretty, but a whole flurry of pit stops are going to be coming around. It's getting on towards 4 o'clock in the morning. 4.45 in the afternoon, a beautiful day after a beautiful week of weather at spa Francorchamps. And uh, from the outside of the front row, from the grandstand side, Klaus Backler, brilliant start for Dynamic Motorsport, went from second into the lead even before they got to Rouge, but it was very tidy. Raffaele Marcello went, OK, you beat me where to start, I'll tuck in. Maybe I'll try and catch you as we go running up the hill. Michael Christensen started sixth and was neat and tidy through the opening sequence of corners, through Eau Rouge, up, through the compression, over the top, over the crest to Tornadion, and on up the hill, up the Kemmel Strait. In behind, neat and tidy. Against all predictions, we were predicting cars would be in the gravel traps and uh, the safety cars would be brought out. Three abreast up the straight, the Mad Panda Motorsport Mercedes pressing on, and then unfortunately pressing too hard, Kenny Harble clipped the back of the 107, uh, Bentley from CMR, Nigel Bay put into the gravel trap, was brought back out of the circuit. Kenny Harbour was given punishment for that uh, with the first of a number of penalties issued to the drivers through the course of this race. Track limits were certainly leading to penalties, but penalties came in other forms, and that was including punctures coming to drivers at the end of the opening hour. The first one to be slowed was Sandy Mitchell, the Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini, and then a driver went off the circuit. That's Stephen Grove. He got back on, but that would have been a scary moment at Blanchiment, and then a brilliant battle at the front of the race. The uh, car that was moved into the lead of the race uh, by Klaus Backler was handed over to Colm Ledeker, but he seemed to struggle a little bit, and first he had the battle with uh, Luca Stoltz, and then through came Raffaele Marcello in the second of his two stints. Always a magnet for the action, the Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes, and the first car to really hit trouble and hit the ball on the exit of Blanchiment, Cesar Gazzo, the Santa Loc Junior Team Audi, got back to the pits, only had 100 metres left to go. However, the car did not go any further. That was the first car out of the race. Then a pattern emerged. If you were driving a white and blue Mercedes, you seemed to be fair game. And the most fair game of all was Jens Lieberhauser. That was the first of three moments in which his car was spun around. And there, unfortunately, Antares Al being uh, tipped around by Jonathan Cui up at the top of the hill at La Source. And there's Jens Lieberhauser again, slightly different corner, but the same outcome. Rounds he went got back in the race. He still had more in store. And Isaac Tutumlu Lopez also off into the gravel at the top of the slope in the light of Motorsport Lamborghini. And then as the sun started to change its nature, the light getting a little lower, the sun getting lower, but it was still a brilliant light here. And this wonderful weather at Spa Francorchamps for the Total Energy Spa 24 hours. And it was a story of cars coming ever close to the front of the race. The 71 Iron Links Ferrari being challenged really seriously by Patrick Niederhauser. And then unfortunately a clash the back of um, Alex Malikin's Porsche was given a clatter. That was retired to the garage, as was the 777 Mercedes that gave it a clump with uh, Al Zuber at the wheel. The sun got lower. The action certainly got no less hot and hectic out on the track. A little, little rotation there for the Sky Tempesta Racing Mercedes. 
And then it was the story of the, the Iron Lynx Ferraris continuing to work their way towards the front of the race. And one car we haven't mentioned as yet was the 47 car, the KCMG Porsche that started stone last. That gained 40 plus places in the hands of Nick Tandy. Jens Lieberhauser, that was the hat trick of spins. Every single one of those caused by another driver. I suppose he had to put a brave face on it, as did Karim Oje, because he collected someone else's gravel. And that was why he went around in the Boots Engineer Racing Audi at the Curve, or the newly named Curve, Jackie X. The yellow number 71 Ferrari. Antonio Fuoco, Davide Rigon and Daniel Serra having fierce, fierce battles. That was up at uh, La Source, and not every driver managed to stay on the track. This is the Allied Racing car fooling the camera crews by taking a far wider line than the, they're used to panning around. We're constantly working the way up the order. The 88, uh, the Codis ASP Mercedes working its way ever towards the front of the field. One of the best battles was be between the two Scandinavian drivers, the Dane, Nicholas Nielsen, the white Ferrari, and the Norwegian, Dennis Olsen. A little bit of push and shove as they went through Radion. Always a scary place to go. And then, having just taken the lead of the race, having started 30th and worked its way to the front, the K-Pax Racing Lamborghini didn't keep 001 for the first place, flashing on its screen for long because a puncture caused them to limp back to the pits. Then a magical summer evening turned into summer night, and the magic didn't extend as far as Boots on Gineon because Adam Iteki had to limp back to the pits with uh, one of a number of problems to hit that car. Then Sebastian Bow spun the number three Mercedes. Not a good place to do that. That's just on the blind exit of Le Combe at the top of the hill. He did get, get going again, but now it was properly dark on the circuit. It was partying on the roof terraces above the pits, a brilliant view out across the circuit and down to the pit lane below. And then unfortunately we had a few cars coming in slowly. And uh, at that point it was the EMA Motorsport Porsche that just limped back to the pits, but that got going again and has been featuring ever closer to the front of the race. Still a mystery runner through the gravel at the exit of uh, Curve Jackie X somehow stayed away from the tire wall, brought gravel onto track, for which it won no friends, but uh, anyhow, under cover of darkness, their embarrassment has been spared. Running to the edge of the circuit and beyond, that was a, a regular feature coming out of the final corner of the lap. But it was a case sometimes in this race of uh, timing your pit stop. If you were fortunate, you managed to get it uh, when we had full course yellow, but one of the best drives of the race came after a safety car period got to the front of the race, it was the 88 Codis ASP Mercedes, and we've heard since then that they run very nicely in clean air, and that is why Raffaele Marcello was able to get 12 seconds advantage, and no advantage at all if your name was Albert Costa, just gone out in the number 63 Lamborghini, got it wrong, still convinced he hit oil or whatever, but a really unusual mistake, and that was over and out. The Retirement started to mount, but for the Spanish driver, he simply couldn't work out. Under no pressure from other drivers, but he thought he'd exited the corner. He wasn't the only one to go for a spin, because there is Alfred Renauer retiring one of the three Herbert Motorsport Porsches. And uh, certainly for him, it was over and out. As I said, the got past midnight, got past one o'clock, and the retirements started to mount. But the circuit really, really came into its own. And then suddenly we had three cars off in the space of lap. The 107 CMR Bentley pulled to a halt. Further around the lap at Fania, we had Valentino Rossi in the 46 Audi out into the gravel. And then the red flag was thrown because, uh, unfortunately, Matt Payne went off in the number 16 Porsche at Blanchimont. Since we've heard he's OK, but then, of course, we had to have the restart, and eventually they were allowed to get going again in race order. With those two Rover Racing BMW starting first and second on the restart, they are still there now. But in fact, the second of those, Max Hess, is just his car has just uh, arrived in the pits. He's jumped on board that, but Nick Yololi probably in next time around. But uh, he is out front in a BMW 1-2. So it remains very dark indeed here at Spa Francorchamps. A few messages coming in from out in the boonies, reminding us just how pitch black it really is. And Nick Yellowley still the leaders, but uh, leader. But as you say, the number 50 car from Rover Racing has made its scheduled pit stop. Felipe Nasser remains in third. Nick Nielsen in fourth place. Uh, pit stops just completed for the 51. Ferrari and for 55, Mikel Grenier stays in. They have now left the pits. Felipe Nazar in the pits. Nick Yellowley appears to be running on 
oofle dust or something. I'm sure he must need fuel, but the leader remains out. Marco Sorensen is in the pit lane because he's handed over his Aston to Maxine Martin. Marco, you've just come in from a little bit more than a double stint, and it was a tough one, right? Yeah, I have to say it was quite, uh, quite eventful all the way through with the red flag and everything. Um, but in the end, uh, we caught a, a, a full course yellow at the right timing. And after this, we were able to, or we were P6. Uh, and then I was a bit worried for the restart if we had the pace to actually, to actually stay up there. Uh, but it looked all right, to be fair. Uh, we're not there on outright pace, but as long as we keep on getting these good uh, strategy calls and all this, then uh, we should be okay. It's consistency that really counts from now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. we're trying to stay off all penalties that we, that we obviously can. And, and not make any mistakes and avoid contact and all this, the normal stuff, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we'll see. It's still long. What are we now, halfway or something? Coming up to halfway. And you need to get some rest. Are you going to be able to sleep? It's a good idea, right? Do you think you can sleep? Probably not. I did something with some caffeine, which did, it's not going to help me, let's say. <laughs> so, Head off and yeah. meditate. Yeah. Cheers, Marco. <laughs> well, the good news is, thank you, Gemma, thank you, Marco, the good news is that the uh, banging hardcore party has, uh, has dispersed, so a little easier than it might have been earlier in the stint. But, you know, and that's the deal. If you get a break, don't squander it. Just cling desperately to any little advantage that Lady Luck might throw your way. Nick Yellowly remains in the lead. Matt Campbell has pitted from second in the 74 Porsche. Don't forget that is the car that started last on the grid. And then in third place, again, the number four Mercedes. And that is... Is that not the first time it's been in the top three? Oh, yeah, definitely it is. Or, yeah. or, did, or was it? I, I don't think it was before in a, in a pit stop cycle. So, again, you know, that restart where everybody was on the grid and in, in race order and very close together has really helped them. Leader is in, finally. I mean, it's, it's almost like they had to dynamite him out of the car, Nick Yellowly. He has been... I, I, I don't know. I don't know how he's managed to stay out for quite so long considering they were half a stint out of kilter with everybody else. So maybe they had just fueled before we went red, but they were still in the lead. So I, I don't see how that happened. Anyway, whatever, that is the 98 car that was the race leader. Well, hopefully we'll find out from Nick Yololi because it's been a driver yeah. change. We've seen him getting out by process of elimination. I think it should be Nicky Katzberg at the wheel rather than Augusto Farfus. Remember, Katzberg complained yeah. that he wasn't getting any sleep because his caravan was vibrating in the paddock Rocking. because of a speaker and, alongside and, and it. And actually, Augusto was in before Nick, I'm pretty sure you're right. So it should be Nicky Katzberg. Uh, Dorian Pan, by the way, has just stopped in the Iron Dames car. Now, she had just got in before the red flag, so that will be the end of a double for her, I think. Nick Nielsen is on fire in the 51 I was going to say Air Corsa, I mean Iron Lynx Ferrari. He has just set that car's best first sector of the race. And three cars have just set their best race lap. Maxime Martin in the Aston, Antonio Fuoco in the 71 Ferrari, and Dennis Olsen back in the 47 Porsche. So those three cars who are currently 6th, 7th and 8th, or 5th, 6th and 7th as Matt Campbell stops, this is the happy hour. That's exactly what the drivers are talking about, where the light starts to come back a little bit, but the temperature of the air is still cool and the track temperature is still good. You know, I'm really wondering about that earlier track temperature figure we had of 38 degrees about an hour ago. It's now yeah. down to 19, which is far more representative. The air temperature is 18 degrees. I can't yeah. believe it suddenly halved its temperature. No, I think, I, I think it was probably reading. I think it was probably early 20s, but 19 degrees is still entirely acceptable. Um, and yeah, the, the tyres will be hot and the drivers likewise, but the air is cool. What's the air temperature? 18, 18 degrees. I mean, that's a pretty warm summer's day, you know, in most of Northern Europe, certainly where you and I come from. Um, so it is Nicky Katzberg who has taken over the number 98 BMW and in second place now, is the number four Haupt Racing Mercedes. And Yanis Fitcher, 
I don't know how long he's got left in the car, but he's not going to become the leader before he comes in. Antonio Fuoco, seven minutes into his stint, so he is recently fueled in the number 71 Ferrari who ride on board in sixth place. But Fitcher, 43 minutes into his stint, so he's got another 20 minutes in second place overall, and he is 36 seconds ahead of the third place car, which is now the number 50 Rover racing car, which has got Max Emilian Hesse at the wheel. So uh, I don't think Hesse's going to up. Oh, Fitcher is now the race leader because Nicky Katzberg stopped. So uh, here's 46 in the pit lane. While, while you're just looking at that, you know, you, you, we do not have enough eyes to watch all the things that are happening. And, and some of our regular uh, Twitter followers yeah. have caught something in the pit lane. They reckon a Lamborghini hit the back under a, with a red red light at pit exit hit the back of a Mercedes. So we hey. can watch out for that, but it, we've got so much going on. It, it's entirely really possible. Awesome. And if they can do it in Formula One, then everybody can do it. You know, these things happen. And uh, it, yeah, it's a steep downhill pit lane, and it shouldn't in the same way that you shouldn't tag somebody at La Source behind the safety car, but these things do occasionally happen because racing drivers, this just in, are human. Some PR men would say barely, but uh, <laughs> that, I think that's unfair, but they, they are absolutely, you know, normal human beings. Well, not normal human beings, but they are as, uh, as fallible beings. as humans. Freddie Vervish has, yeah, we saw him stop in the 46 car. I think he's going to stay in, isn't he? Uh, that'll be a full service. I just remember that we're not looking at double stints here. We heard from Danny Juncker Day, who's running in fourth place. He's expecting this to be a treble, a triple stint. That, that's quite big, actually, because a, a triple stint in the GT car at Le Mans, they will do just about an hour. Here, they're limited by the regulations to 65 minutes. So that's 195 minutes. That's two and a half hours. That's a big, uh, three and a half hours. That's a big triple stint. Three and a quarter three hours. And a quarter hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, <laughs> yeah, three hour, an hour and five minutes times three. Uh, but it is still. I mean, that is a long, long time to be in the car. It will go from pitch black to broad daylight midway through your stint at this stage. Although, actually, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. So we say, oh, we're still halfway through the race. No, but 12 hours and 59 minutes still to go is not we're at the halfway point. It means we've just clicked over 11 hours done. 12 it's, hours, and you've got that quarter of an hour problem. It's 12 hours and 40 minutes remaining. Remember, we started at 4.45. Exactly, exactly. That's catch that. Now, bear in mind, around here at 5 o'clock in the morning, the last couple of mornings, I've been woken by the light. It's uh, just gone, it's five past four in the morning. Uh, so not the church bells then, obviously. <laughs> them as well. Woken by, them as well. At, woken by them at four o'clock and five o'clock and six o'clock. Uh, yeah, so what is lighting up time? Let's have a look. Sunrise, officially 6.02. 6 so so we will light get in light the in the sky by five. Yep. Yes, exactly. Right, Nicky Katzberg in second place. Janis Fitcher leading the race, however, Yanis Fitcher will be owing us a pit stop. Well, in, in 20 minutes' time, but uh, Nicky Katzberg lapping way far. In fact, so much faster that he's actually just set his fastest lap of the race, the BMW wow. 98. In He was very quick when he came out of the pits, having taken over from Nick Yellowley, and clearly liking what he's finding out there, the track conditions. Yeah, there's debris on the outside of the circuit, but the track temperature cooling down now. Knight still saying, actually, no, fairly stable, 19 degrees as it was before, but a 2 minute 18.2 second lap, that is a quickie. And that is why he's uh, stretching clear of the sister car, which has Max S on board now, four seconds between them. And what a variety of racing he is doing. Two weekends ago, Corvette racing in IMSA. Last weekend, ETCR for Hyundai. This weekend, racing at the Spa 24 hours for BMW. Just can't help himself, really. Well, and last weekend, actually, had a really big weekend. It's only his third weekend in the electric touring cars, which are a very odd beast, um, and was within, le I'm going to say, 400 metres of winning the super final in his group and had a puncture okay. on the last lap, one corner from home. Martin, explain ETCR. ETCR. In a nutshell. Uh, TCR touring cars, so sort of family hatchbacks, in his case a Hyundai Veloster, um, with 
electric power and rear wheel drive. They weigh, because the battery packs, they weigh around 1,900 kilos, so big, heavy cars, on treaded all-weather tires, and they produce 500 kilowatts. 500 kilowatts in old money is 670 brake horsepower, so they are the most powerful touring cars ever built. So wow. it's, it's basically the weight of a Range Rover with 700... So it is an Aston Martin DBX 707, basically, on treaded tyres, being driven by nutters with rear-wheel drive only. They are go. insanely fast. In fact, some of the drivers, frankly, when you get them onto the full 500 kilowatts, quite frightening. Um, they're, they're a big old beast, so, yeah, he's developing well to that. Right. So, meanwhile, our race leader, Jana Fitcher, what a good time he is having. Yes, Nicky Katzberg is lapping quicker, but he's on brand new tyres that are only two laps old, and Jana is on tyres that are a stint old. Right, just, just let's go down through the classes. So we've got Yanis Fitcher leading the Silver Cup, leading the race. However, he will be in the pits, and that will put the two BMWs back yep. into the lead. In the Gold Cup class, 16th overall, really impressive run for the Hout Racing team. It's looking pretty rock solid in that class. It's a uh, good run from Hubert Howe, but Indian racer Arjun Maini leading that. Yep. Uh, only a lap down, that's impressive. Leading car in Priam, Alessio Picariello working his way he came into the bottom of the front type, front page of the timing screen. That's 35th position. He's now up to 24th position. Rather fitting. He's in car number 24 and uh, having a really rock solid run. Quite a long way clear of Stefano Costantini, who is second in the class. Bronze lead, as you can see in the screen, is the Falcon Horse Motorsport car, Donald Yount, currently at the wheel. They're in 35th place overall. So just gone off. Uh, According to our timing screen, they have 35th. Either that or he's not driving it. 44th. Yeah. Car number 35 from Walken Horse Motorsport. Oh, sorry. Yeah, car number 35, first in, in the bronze class. And. With George Kurtz uh, a lap further back. And George is uh, yeah. driving car number 20, which is the SPS Automotive. It's the black and, and silver uh, Mercedes in class, sharing that with Valentin Pierberg, Tim Muller, and Rima Jafali. And George's company, CrowdStrike, will be the event sponsor next yeah. year. So yeah. he's he's into the Spa 24s in a big way. Yes. So great to have, I must say, in recent years, so many people crossing the Atlantic to race. We've got a lot of Canadian races, but even more American races. Just yeah. enjoy.